Great Thursday. Not good Thursday morning. Not good morning. Great morning. I don't know. We've had a lot of big weekends, a lot of big days, but this is right up there. Now, playoffs and stuff notwithstanding. But we have got today, this morning, the Houston Open is teeing up. (laughs) Teeing up in just a matter of minutes, the Houston Open, which is, oh, is Scotty Shepard? Yes. Is Wyndham Clark? Yes. Okay. Do we have huge names because the Masters is two weeks away? Yes. Is the course beautiful? Yes. We heard from Scott Saginet this morning, our uh, our Australian buddy who's a caddy. He's caddying for Daniel Berger. We'll hear from him at 8 o'clock. Do we have Astros opening day? Yes. 3 o'clock right here at Minute Maid Park. Yes, we have that. Do we have the NCAA tournament? Yes, we have that as well. The Cougs play tomorrow night, the late game. Is That's okay. We can wait. Holy crap, what a great time. What a great time. And I just don't know how many Coors Lights I would be destroying if it wasn't Lent. It's the last. It's Holy Thursday today. Happy yeah. Holy Thursday to you. I know. <clears throat> you going to church tonight? Going to church tonight and, and um, what? I don't, what are you? What? what? Oh, tonight's church. You're going to church tonight? Yeah. Yeah. You have to. Yeah. Well. You switched. Yeah, I'm not. I, I, go, I don't flipped. go to a Catholic you're church less, anymore. You're team less church no i'm not less church i go go every week but it's a different church okay yeah it's not catholic church anymore i'm going to the church of Jalen green right now because the lead it is a great day but it's one of the reasons it's a great day is because the rockets won what was probably their most entertaining game yeah and frankly and frankly to me this is their best game their best game from a standpoint of who they are, what they've become, uh, winning on the road again for the sixth time in a row. This is a team that couldn't win at all on the road. They've won 10 in a row, six on the road. They beat a very good basketball team without Shea Gilgis Alexander. I get that. So there's no, you know, you don't have, you don't have one of the top players in all of, you know, in all of basketball. But with that said, Rockets don't have Alperin. That and Chet Holmgren fouled out with eight, 18 minutes. Well, they fouled him out. Oh, yeah. I mean, right. they, they, you know why he fouled out? Because they still had – Chet Holmgren, the Rockets are – if you're tall and skinny, the Rockets yeah. are going to ruin Destroy you. Destroy you, yeah. Wimby, you didn't have a chance. If Manute Bowl still played, if don't let – okay, Bowl Bowl did have a big game against him earlier this year. But don't let them see Bowl Bowl now. Don't let that happen. Because if you're tall and skinny, you're going to get wrecked. And yesterday it was uh, – it was Chet Holmgren who the Rockets took it to him, got him in foul trouble. He had a couple stupid fouls too. But, man, it was like it. you can't pick out. Amen Thompson had such a bunch of just winning plays. You had Jabari Smith with no fear. It's Robert Ori like with no fear on the big shots. And, of course, Jalen Green. Uh, Jalen Green, another huge game for Jalen. There were some times he had some bad possessions. But it was because he's not because he's fearless right now. He's playing with tremendous confidence. He took the ball in his hands, and there was a couple of, of possessions where I thought you got it, you got to let it come to you. But then there are other possessions where he's one on three on a fast break, pull up three, bang, got it. And it was just a game with tremendous confidence, tremendous shot making in the in the extra stanza. Well, and, in the overtime, and his, the overtime was was incredible back yeah. and forth. Well, yeah, and Dylan Brooks, his two threes yeah, to Dylan start Brooks overtime was 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 tremendous. I mean, there were so many guys that you could point to that had big games. Yeah. This is a but J- truly a team effort. Jalen giving the ball up, Jalen in crunch time in a tie game, hitting Jabari in the corner. And Jabari, who did not have a uh, didn't have a great game, uh, knocking down that three to give them the lead, which they needed. They ended up going to overtime, but it, because of, of Williams' shot that that when Alman should have fouled. Oh my goodness, that was he such felt a mistake! Terrible too. Such a mistake. You could see him on the sideline; yeah. his head was yeah. down. He felt terrible. <laughs> he did. He and he had his orders. He had his marching yeah. orders going yeah. in, and he just let him take the shot, and he, he, he tied Nothing it up. Nothing better than having a this learning is, experience in a win where you don't lose because of it. So much like the Cougs, where you the dude hits a huge three, and you're like, oh my gosh, oh you worked this hard. And they came and they and they and they hit the three and now we got to go to overtime. 
and yet you came out firing. Dylan Brooks with those two threes to start overtime were just so huge, and you just outplayed him. You just outplayed him. Now, not having Shea, that was that was huge. That was big. But regardless, this team would not There is something different. Did you see after the game where they were coming in and everybody's uh, going to the locker room in the tunnel? T- Tillman was there. The guys are jumping up and down. They're, it, it, uh, and Jabari said it in the post game. Jabari said it earlier this year. We wouldn't have won this game. Well, no, he was asked by Vanessa. Yeah. If he Vanessa, said, he said, what's she the said, difference? What is the difference? He goes, not every, he said, we didn't want to win. We all want to win. Not everyone yeah. wanted to no, yeah. win. He made that point. Yeah. And I, I reached, I searched back again because I wanted to hear him say it again. I want to make sure I had proper context. He basically said everyone's buying in, but yep. he also was talking about, you know, buying in and wanting to win is where they are now. Jalen Green has said this in post game. Man, I just really want to win. Yep. Like they they're having fun winning games. You know what? It doesn't have to be about vibes and your pregame fits and all that. A lot in the parties afterwards. Winning is fun too. Playing at the highest level, playing meaningful, important basketball. You can do both, by the way. And the Rockets and Emay's helped turn it around. But what a gutsy win yesterday! What a gutsy win on the road, and. uh you know, I don't want to turn it into the Jalen Green show where you, you talk about, well, what do you do with Jalen Green now? Let I, I want to enjoy this because Jalen Green is playing phenomenal basketball and decisions will be made after the year's over. But right now, Jalen is carrying this team. Uh, you have to have an explosive score in the league. Yeah. If you're going to be a great team, you got to have an explosive score. And he is their explosive score right now. Yeah, and and he's doing it all. Like I said, driving the lane and dishing and rebounding, and rebounding. His, you know, what started this was the rebounding. Yep. When Ime, it was a month or so ago, or maybe even a little bit more, where Ime talked about. Yeah, we, we, Jalen had talked. He was asked about Jalen's rebounding. He goes, "Man, we I, I took him aside. We showed him video of himself just standing there and not getting involved. All of a sudden, Jalen got himself involved in rebounding and." Man, I, I for it just took his game to another level where he I, I think he got more enthusiastic about the game well, or in, something. Yeah. Now his shooting though is phenomenal. It's like it, it's night and day from what he was. He's seven out of eleven for three. again. What is the deal? How is he over five hundred? It's like for a month that he's over five hundred yeah, from three. Okay, why? Uh, let me. I'll tell you why. Let me ask you this: Why sometimes do you not shoot? Why do you sometimes do you not hit? Shots well, and other times you get locked in, and, and because it can come and go in golf, right? Yeah. Why is oh, yeah. that? Well, focus, uh, or yeah, and you get a good swing thought, like yeah. a mentality where you know you're going to hit it well. You're just in that zone. Yeah. It's not different for shooting. If somebody played a lot of basketball, it, there are times where you just get a good swing thought. I mean, it's very, very similar. Where you know if you catch it and get it off, you're going to make it because you just you're you're locked into your to your the physical side. You're locked into whatever your mechanics may be. I think he's feeling very confident with his. And, you know, a big part of putting, for example, is confidence. Yeah. A big part of shooting is confidence. It's yeah. a big part of shooting. And I think Jalen is locked into good, quote-unquote, swing thoughts. He's got mechanics are, are working well for him, and he's not doubting himself when he shoots. It's a reactive state. It's not a thinking state. And that's why he's making three. And that's it's great to know that he can get into that state. It's not just a game. He's in that zone right now. Like, this is more of a consistent thing for him. Yeah, but this and when is, that happens, yeah. and, and, you know, guys get better as shooters. Everybody that you look at. Yeah, and, but this is ridiculous this. how well he's shooting. I mean, well, this, yeah. is, this is ridiculous. Well, I mean, it's, he, it's he, a there's no way. There's but no his way. new norm may be. Yeah, no way he can sustain over 50%. No, 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 I'm not saying that. But his yeah. new norm may be 38 39%. Yeah, that yeah. may be the new norm. Yeah, but I wish you wouldn't, com- you know compare how d- d- golf is so much more difficult than no. NBA play. Well, he said a lot of egregious things. He just put Jalen above like a new God. He said, I, you know what God says, no other God above before me. And he already, he's already done that with Jalen. Uh-uh. His first words were Jalen's kind of like a God. And now this, yeah, it's a lot of blasphemy. Wait, in the where first did segment. I say that? Very quickly. Cause John was talking about church and then, you know, and then oh, you, I, and I just you, said church of Jalen, mm, church uh, of Jalen, church of yeah. Jalen. Well, Okay. That's blasphemous. Well, there are saints that have churches. Oh, you've never been on Twitter. He could there be a people... saint, not a god. Saint Jalen? Saint Jalen. He could be a saint. Ooh, well, There's a lot of saints that have churches. So it's a little early for him. Yeah. So well Saint 
is his. It is. He is getting a little. Sa- I mean, trying to compare a basketball game to, to golf? the great game of golf. Saint of procreation. It's the same thing. It is appropriation. No, I said thing. no. I said saint of procreation. Oh, saint of procreation. No, saint of procreation. Oh. Oh, saint of procreation. Oh we God. don't know that yet. That's for the sure. Pa- the He's- patron saint of procreation. <laughs> You're working off of some nasty rumors. That's a, yeah, that's oh. nasty work you're doing, Dell. No, there's one. Yeah, you're rumors, doing the devil's work. One right of now. the things is confirmed. He will. He is a new father. So. Well, he is a new father, but we don't know if it's with the, all three. Everybody. I didn't claims. say anything about that. I just yeah. said my wife was like, <laughs> "We're watching the game." She's like, "Now, which one has has been getting everybody pregnant lately?" <laughs> lately, <laughs> that one. <laughs> that. One. Yeah, that one. Jaylen, oh. you know, you don't have to have kids every time you have relations. <laughs> like, you know? Yeah, uh, that one. Oh, he's cute. He's cute. I guess. Yeah, no, he is. He's he is. pretty. He's a pretty boy. Yeah, yeah he's he is pretty. pretty. Boy. Yeah. Oh, now we're, we're getting back into this, too. <laughs> I, I, well, he's not a god, though. He's not god But he has a church. Yeah. Okay. He's spreading his seed. But Well, Jalen would say, didn't the at points the Catholic Church say you're not supposed to have contraceptives because that's a sin? So he's like, look, uh, just following the rules. That's I'm all. I'm we ain't doing to, that. I'm we ain't family to, planning. Yeah. I'm it's God's will. You. I'm Thank about you. To surprise you. I'm about to surprise you. What is Jalen averaging for the year? What's his points per game? 28, 29? 19.8. What? Oh, yikes. He was hovering around 18 I for a while. I knew you were going to sh- overshoot that. By well, what, is he, pr- what, is, it, what is he this month? Too. It's 30, isn't was, it? 30-something. I would have figured he was 23 points a game. What, what is he? And what is he for the month, month of, uh, let me see, 31, for his splits? 32? Well, it's got to be in at you least got game. This you have to do is go to game log. Uh, it's going to be, for the month, it is going to be 28.5. 28.5, really? Uh, wow, that's what I'm looking at. Yeah, 8 and 19, wow. Yeah, he, again, this is a relatively new <laughs> uh, circumstance. You think about, listen to this, 13, but he's locked in. Listen to this. His three-point percentage is by month. I'll leave out October as three games. November, 37.5. That's fine. December, 32, no good. January, 30. February, 26.2. And that's where it was really the roughest for me was – he shot 36% from the field, 26% from three, averaged 15.8 points a game. It was bad. Yeah. Uh, and what, what, month, what month was that? That's February. That was last month. Oh. And then this month, he's shooting 42.9% from three, averaging 13 more points a game at 28.5. Uh, and his field goal percentage is at 50.4, uh, as opposed to 36.8. And to your point about rebounds, John, this is the most rebounds per game that he's averaged this month. 6.1 per game is what he's averaging last month, 4.8. I mean, you know, there's been arguments about – if you look at how Jalen played in, in really in December, January, and February, it wasn't great. But his march has been unbelievable. I mean, just absolutely spectacular. So you're having to kind of work through and parse through in your overall comments of Jalen. But the larger point I try to make to people is as everyone continues to – update their Jalen and their Alperin and how are we going to do how about just enjoy Rockets win yeah, this so, is about the Rockets winning this isn't about one play so fun last night one that was court. such Jaylen a good game was phenomenal before we go to break considering what people have attributed to his success does he have to have a kid every four months like what mm. what do we need I to don't keep this it really I inspires don't, him hold on that's what we were told if this is inspirational form he will go broke. watch out ladies he will go broke <laughs> Jay, he will not be in the league for three years. Oh, for three 40 million years. a year? 40 no, million a not year? not for three. At first this rate, okay. he's getting 50 all, million now, a year. Now let's subtract. No, you can't. There's a cap. Let's subtract. No, well, this subtract. guy's making 50 a year. He'll he's be not, making 50 a year not, soon. Not soon. He can't. He can't get into there until he's been in the league a certain well, time. Well, if he goes all NBA, it so could we'll change. cut. We'll cut. He's not all NBA. Well, so well he, he will. If he continues match. to have kids, he's going to hit. The, he's going to be the highest paid player ever. No. Yes. We're going to cut it in half. And now we're going to start chipping into it with all these kids. Mm. And it's going to be what a little What are we cutting in half? What did he say? His I guess salary. His salary I guess. You know oh. the taxes? No, okay. How many Irish twins c- can he create in the next <laughs> Why year? are we? He was 7-11 from the three-point line. Why are we talking about Irish twins? I was told. The You're folk, getting involved in this haterism. I was told because of the ch- his child, he's at a new level. He told right. you that. We he need to keep this going. Irish twins, let's keep let's, that going. We're not going to keep it going. 
There's apparently a few Irish twins. Coming. Yeah, there are, there are a few. At 715 ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Y'all got thoughts? Let's go. Uh, not thoughts. You got thoughts. Well, that's yeah. appropriate, y'all got, too. It y'all is got kind of appropriate. That's appropriate. It is appropriate. If y'all got if y'all thoughts, got thoughts you, can you can get in here, too. about your thoughts. Tom, Tom, Eric, get your thoughts in here. <laughs> the first two I thought of. <laughs> 713-780-3776. Right now, I got Chastain for it. I got me some Chastain for it. I, I was thinking about, I really was thinking about it this morning, how I love my, my F-150 Lightning. It's my favorite vehicle ever. I was thinking about how I am a Chastain guy, and I'm going to be a Chastain guy forever. I really enjoy because there the car business. I mean, you've seen it before. I've been taken before. They just want to. They want to. to there's a lot of car dealerships that they just want to sell you a car. They want to get as much as they possibly can. They want to add on. They want, and I've been the victim of it before, and it's not good. Be, be, don't be a victim. Get on over to Chastain Ford and be part of a family. You're going to be part of the Chastain family. That was one of the first things that they told me when I was going to start reading these, uh, uh, doing their commercials was, that we want everybody to feel like they're going to be part of the family. And you will be part of the family. They've got the 2023s on the lot right now. That they, It can't be better prices. Up to 12000 off. 0% financing on the Bronco Sports. 1.9% financing on the uh, trucks. 2023 new trucks you're looking for the best way to get into whatever vehicle it is new used whatever the chastain ford is going to give you the square deal you're going to be part of the chastain family you're going to love the deal chastainford.com on 610 at homestead not hempstead just five minutes from downtown chastain ford You're back in the Veritex Community Bank Studios with John and Lance. On ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. All right, welcome back here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Man, there's a story about the Chiefs signing this rugby guy, watching the highlights of him. Holy crap. This dude, this could revolutionize the game. They get these big dudes from Australia coming in here. Holy crap. This guy can run. You mean like He's the, huge. Uh, you mean like the... 23 years old? The starting, well, Jared Hyde, they had the 49ers sign one that they thought was going to be that a few years ago, and he didn't end up doing anything. Uh, the Eagles have a starting left tackle who had never played football, Jordan Maialata, uh, who came over from rugby. Never played football, played rugby, and now he's their starting left tackle. Crazy. They got him in the, like, seventh round when they drafted him. This guy is a super, oh. a tremendous athlete. But he's from Wales, not from Australia. Same guy. Same well, 
It's no, close. They're actually on different sides of the world. They but would, that's yeah. close. Way I mean, different, they, they look would. like the Let same people. Let me tell people. you, both of them would beat White? your ass for saying that. Is that what you're saying? They look a lot alike. So. The Wales people, the Welsh and the Aussies would Ugh. beat you to a point. I'm going to ask our, our, our caddy that's coming out, Scott Sajanak, is from Australia. I'll you, ask him about him. You, you think he's going to agree that Wales and Australia nah, are the close. same? He's close. He probably can. He's confused by it, too. They talk. They all talk funny. I just hope he doesn't call you that name that you like to call people. <laughs> <laughs> they both Jim do. Jeffries? They both do use that word. They do. Yeah. Yes, they both use that word. Let's get uh, Chalky Stafford in here to talk about Jalen Green. Anybody else wants in? Someone three seven eight zero three seven seven seven. Stanford. Is it Stafford? Hey y'all, what's going on? What do you say? I think it is Stafford. Yeah. This me, Stafford. What's going on? Yeah. What's up, say, man? Stafford? How are you doing, man? Hey, I'm doing all right. I I called in about three weeks ago. Three weeks ago. And I had, um, no, I mean this with all due respect, but what, what is the name of the of the other guy on the show with y'all? Dell. My, my name is Dell. Dell. Okay, Dell. Dell. All right. I I, I can. I, I've never been able to catch a name. Um. Now, yeah, I don't know if y'all remember, but I was, we were talking about Jalen Green and uh, you know, all of the trade talk, and I was like, man, he's so young, and this and that, and um. And, you know, we were just talking about how, you know, eventually the Rockets are going to have to pay him and right. possibly uh, you want Al Perrin and, and possibly, you know, Jabarsu and all that. And we were saying that, you know, Jalen hasn't – Jalen just hasn't uh, – you know, by 23, you know, or 20 – what was it, 23 or 22, we knew Jason Tatum – was a bona fide star. Anthony Edwards was a bona fide star. So I, I bring that up to say if if Jalen Green continues, the re- at least finishes the rest of the season like this, and who knows, the Rockets may get into play in, Golden State starts, has kind of started winning now. But if Jalen Green continues like this, like it, it, is that enough for us to – Say he's a bona fide star, bona, like you know, as a bona fide star, you know, not just. Well, a- again, let's go now, <sighs> Stafford. This is awfully difficult because his ceiling mm-hmm. is through the roof. We're seeing a ceiling, but his floor has been most of the season. You heard earlier on, Lance mm-hmm. is like, "Well, how many points does he score a game?" He is a scorer. And he's averaging just over what 18, 19 points was, a game right he now. He was he's nineteen point nineteen right points now. a game right now. So that is not what we're now. It, 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 we're this is a this is a smallish sample size for us to be calling a guy a star. He is phenomenal when he's at the top of his game. He may have turned a corner, we don't know. Yeah. But calling him a star right now is a little premature when he hasn't done it over. He hasn't done it over a season yet. Well, yeah, his yeah. his post All Star games in all three years have been fabulous, but 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 the season is an entire season, and pre All Star game is much longer than post All Star game. It's, it's once again, I want to try to avoid just making this all Jalen, you know, like deciding on his future because it was such a great win. <laughs> However, I mean, since we're on the topic, yeah, he's been here three years and doesn't have a complete season yet, mm. and this won't be a complete season. With that said, the ceiling we we saw flashes as a rookie when he went down the stretch and was averaging he scored over thirty points a game I think for ten straight games or more than that. This year he is on one right now that's incredible. In the same season we had three months that were frankly forgettable. Uh, you know November December January it's a big chunk of the season, but there is turning a corner for players. He was getting used to and and you know he's not taking as many bad shots either like right now i think he's kind of figured out letting the game to come to him and uh, last year he was averaging this year he's averaging 16.2 shots a game last year he averaged 17.9 he's shooting less too yes he's scoring less than last year but he's also shooting less than well, last year he's also better because, than he was last year right now because yeah. of the winning the, he is he is definitely contributing to winning as opposed to what he has done in the past it, and listen, because we've started it, – it's it, it, it started down this road a little bit. What's interesting is he has played his entire career with Alpi. This small sample size without Alpi 
is interesting in that Jalen Green has actually come into his own without Alpi on the floor. It's it, I take what you want of it, whatever the case may be. It's in it's undeniable. He is different right now than he has been, even when he was playing great last year and the year before post All Star game. As a primary option, he's, a, he's a, as a primary option, and as far as as far as contributing to winning, he's different than he's ever been. And Alpi's not on the floor. You got to take with, and the Rockets are going to have to take that for what it's worth as well. Take this, take this into account, John. Last year he played thirty four point two minutes a game. This year he's playing thirty one point six. Right, so he's playing two, about two and a half minutes less per game this year. Last year his rebound total three point seven. This year five point one. Rebounds get him into the flow of the game. Yeah. Rebounds get him engaged with the game, and and that's a big you know that's a big jump. You need to look for little signs. What are some signs over the year that that show that maybe he's taken a step and. And frankly, you can just tell. I mean, it's the whole team's taking a step. It's the whole team. It's having Amen. And this is why I knew Jabari was going to be the right guy. It just it was hard to sell it last year. His attitude about basketball, like he's a ball player. That that that's what he does. Jabari is about ball. That's what he's about. You heard it in the post game interview. Amen Thompson's about ball. These guys, you don't there's not a lot of extra with them on the court. I mean, they're competitive, and they'll get into it. They'll scrap a little bit if you need to, which Rockets had a couple little dust-ups again yesterday. But um, Ahmed and Jabari on this team is the perfect balance of what you need. Yeah, you've got, you know, Fred Van Vliet. Did you see the video where they they were using it where it's Jabari, Jalen Green, and who was the third? And Ahmed Thompson are all looking right at, like, they're into, they're intent. Fred Van Vliet is on the bench. It's during the timeout, and he's imploring them, and he's telling them different stuff. They're all looking in his eyes. I remember when Stephen Silas would talk to him. It's like nobody even – no one would look at him. Yeah, no right. one even – a lot of times he didn't do anything. Remember just he would walk come away. Out, just, he would walk yeah. away, and the other coaches would handle right. it. Now Fred Van Vliet is in there, and these guys are looking at Fred. They're talking to him, and Craig Ackerman, they showed the video, and they said he's an extension of the coaching staff. <laughs> Craig Ackerman. This is the, like the first time that we've got Craig Ack- Ackerman excited. Oh my! In holy crap! Oh, he's been excited before, no. but not for a team that's went like no, not this. Not this is, he's on, he's on a different level oh right my now. God. He's screaming every play. He is Craig Ackerman. Is I mean I don't know that so anybody. I don't know that anybody's having more fun right now than Craig Ackerman. Lance, you talked about the minutes being down overall. Well. I guess if we're talking about what he is now without Alpi, the minutes are he's nearly at thirty seven minutes per game. So with, without, yeah, without, without Alpi, Alpi so yeah. he would be top six minutes leader it, it, overall if this was stretched over an entire season. Well, they're so asking him to do more. He and, has to do more because he has yeah. to be their focal point. Yeah. So we've seen with the minutes increase, he's become a better right. player because uh, their other best player isn't on the floor. And John talked about it. How do they balance that? What decisions they gotta, are made? The, yeah. he, the, both of those guys have got to figure it out. They've got to figure it out. And Oklahoma because State, Al, because you want this Jalen, you want Alpi at his best, but you want this Jalen as well. They're going to have to figure out how the ball distribution is, who's going to bring, who's going to start the offense, all of those things. Because there was a time earlier this year, the offense has got and players, not just not us, forget us. There have been player after player after player said the offense and for the Rockets opposing players saying that Al, the offense has to run through Alpi. Maybe that's not the case. Maybe that's not the case. Well, we'll see. We got to. We got to. Yeah, we'll we got to break it. Underdog fantasy right now is what we need to. Underdog talk about. fantasy. The tournament's here. You're playing. Uh, you're you're watching already. You got your brackets. If your brackets have gotten busted or whether they're still doing good, it doesn't matter. You can jump in. You can jump in today. Download the app. Use promo code Lance, and I'm going to tell you how you can play. But first, I need you to know you use promo code Lance. You are going to. Um, Use that, and they're going to match your first deposit up to $100. You can start as low as $10, but why would you do that if they're matching your deposit up to $100? You want to go at least to $100 and get it doubled up, and then you start playing your uh, pick em challenge. This is there's it, You win. You can win frequently. If you watch ball, you know ball, you can, you can really win, especially when you're using basically their free winners. They're giving you, in many cases, there will just be a day where they say you've got you know a bonus in your – uh, in your or you got a special in your uh, lobby for the pick'em, and you go there, 
and it's like a player needs to get higher than one uh, or 0.5 shots or Scotty Scheffler. How about this one? Golfer. They had him. All he has to do is go over 0.5 strokes. That's it. As soon as he tees off, that's a winner. I mean, and that's just one of the advantages that you have. But you go higher or lower than the stats they have indicated. You have to pick between two and five players. And you're going to win multipliers of your original play. You can win up to 100 times your original play. You can even play with their insurance feature, which gives you a chance to win if you pick three out of four or, or four out of five. Make sure you're playing Underdog Fantasy. Play along while you watch. It's underdogfantasy.com. Use promo code LANDS for double your original deposit. You must be 18 or older and present. The state where Underdog Fantasy operates. Terms and conditions apply. If you feel like you have a gambling problem, call 1-800-GAMBLER. Go to ncpgambling.org. Hey, time to talk about uh, my peeps over at Home Bank. Personal and business banking solutions for nearly any need. Local bankers ready to help you meet your financial goals. Competitive rates. Competitive rates. You want to hear a competitive rate? A five month CD. Listen, if you've got your money just laying around, not using it, it's just not working for you. Why not put it into a five month CD at 5.05%? That is a great way for your money to be used. It's just five months. And if you're not going to use that money in five months, man, don't let it just sit there. Let it work for you. How about an 11-month CD? If you got more time, 4.5% APY. Now, the minimum balance on both of those is $2,500. You have to put in at least twenty five and keep $2,500 in there. Talk to one of the local bankers. They're going to help you. With, if you've got money laying around, they can help you, okay? River Oaks, Sugarland, Gulf Freeway, Friendswood, a new location in the Baybrook area. You're looking for the best way to use your money, or they've got personal banking solutions for you. They've got business bank banking solutions for you as well. Visit home24bank.com home -home for more information. Home Bank, member FDIC. You are listening to Houston's longest-running sports radio morning show. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's John and Lance. Uh, welcome back here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Someone 3780-3776, the number to get in here with us on a wonderful, wonderful Astros starting the season against the New York Yankees. Starting the season against the New York Yankees in Minute Maid. If I'm not mistaken, the Yankees owned them in Minute Maid last year. 
Wasn't as good, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't no, it wasn't it wasn't good at all. The but Astros, they didn't like it when we went there. No, they never. Well, you know you can't get the t- Astros can't win at home. I mean that's not that doesn't happen. I mean that just okay that just doesn't happen. So, um, will the Astros win one of these games against the Yankees this weekend? That's that's a pretty good question. I mean, do you think that the Astros can possibly win a game at home? I, what, I, it's so inexplicable what they did last year in the postseason at home. It's just ridiculous. It's okay. it's 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 really ridiculous. As good as this th- team is, how they could have possibly just folded in the postseason the way they did at home down the stretch as well. I mean, they were just so good, so good on the road and at home, just ridiculously bad. So that's got to change. Um, the rotation is out. Renault Blanco, game four, and J.P. France, game five. Yeah, I was a little bit surprised to Me see too. that. But, I mean, I don't know that it means anything necessarily. Here's why. There's a chance that Renault Blanco is going to be potentially out maybe when Verlander comes in, and so it might be easier to keep J.P. France in the same spot he was. Like, why would you not have J.P. France there unless unless you just like the way – Renault Blanco's pitch. Well, you know spring. these guys. They've got all day. So, Joe Espada is looking where, when Verlander comes yeah, back, he probably, where he'll f- slot. You're right. He probably did that. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Or maybe he just thinks Renault Blanco's throwing the ball better. Let's not forget, J.P. France started slowly this spring because he had a shoulder issue. So, maybe Renault Blanco's just throwing the ball better right now, which he has been. Now, J.P. France had to face the Astros the other night while Renault Blanco faced Sugarland. So that was a little bit, a lot tougher for J.P. France, but he didn't fare nearly as well. Although he did say, I thought I was throwing the ball really, really well, and Alex Bregman's actually the only guy that hit me hard. But Renel Blanco has been fantastic this spring, and maybe Joe Espada is going by that. And maybe J.P. France is built, I don't know. I, I know J.P. France was fantastic last year as a starter. Out of nowhere, J.P. France came up and was great. Um Maybe they feel like J.P. France is better built for going to the pen. Might be. You got to do what's best for the team right now. Yeah. So um, right now, what do you think is better for the team? A, a fifth, a certain fifth starter in a certain spot or having a guy in a bullpen? Like, do you think J.P. France offers more value as a, in a battle for a fifth starter role or in a bullpen? Oh, well, if it wasn't for J.P. France last year. I don't know the year, answer to that. If it wasn't for J.P. France last year, they don't get in the postseason. I mean, eleven wins. That. Eleven wins out of a guy that was in the minors. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was crazy. Yeah. I mean, JP France took us all by. It was shocking. Now, Nile, not Nile, because right. Nile knew. Yeah, it's one of our listeners who yeah. looks at minors. Who's stuff. a minor league savant? Well, not really. He just goes to the game. He just goes. Yeah, he loves minor Pays league attention baseball. Attention to him. Um, but. But but he took us. It was like crazy. Yeah, you without JP France pitching the way that he did last year. I mean, they won the division by one game. So, yeah, that, he, he was a key, key role. And, again, his shoulder hurt him earlier this season. So, he's maybe not maybe not ready for this. Maybe not as ready as, you know, he would have been otherwise. So, you know, Renel Blanco throwing fourth, that's great. That's great. We'll see We'll see how it all works out and whether Blanco's going to be. And let's not forget, Garcia's going to come back at some point. McCullers is going to come back at some point. Uh, maybe. We'll see. Um, but they've got the, – this team's loaded for bear. It's just early on here we'll find out what's going to happen, especially with the way that this 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 schedule early on is the first 20 games. The only the easiest out is Kansas City who's favored, who's one of the favorites to win the the uh Central Division. So this is going to be this is going to be uh uh if they finish 10 and 10 after these first 20 games, that'll be a nice start actually. 7137803776 is the number. Let's get uh, La Raza. ¿Qué pasó, mijo? The shortest wait time in the business, gentlemen. Deportes. ¿Cómo están? <laughs> bien, bien. ¿Cómo estás? Todo bien. I got a little problem with Lance for that I handle. Lance, this establishment charged me $20 for a shot of Master of Bell. I said, let me take two because they're soft and smooth, man. But $20, no, 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 no. ¿Qué pasó, mijo? No. Well, look, this, I, 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 was, I was thinking about something you guys talked about yesterday about Caleb Williams with the pink case and the fingernail tips. And 
Didn't Chicago have Dennis Rodman, and he was wearing a wedding dress at one point, and he was, oh, that's just Dennis doing Dennis. So I had a question that popped into my head. Who's the most zesty? Is Dennis Rodman, Caleb Williams, or Paul Galan of the gag show? Who's the last one? Paul Galan, Paul Galan of, of the gag. Oh, no, come on. G- Galan and George, yeah, the gag the show. Acro- the, yeah. That's not the gag well, show. Well, G-N-G, if you want to shorten it, no. G-A-G. Yeah, as opposed to when Vanessa was there. We're not doing that. Well, that was t- yeah. not so great either. So we're yeah. talking that name. zestiest. Dennis Rodman was well, okay. What about Ricky wearing Ricky Williams yeah, wearing a wedding dress? Go, he wasn't in Chicago, but yeah, you could go if you want to just because Ricky wasn't. Well, we're just talking about zestiest. I think athletes. Dennis Rodman. That was Ricky just agreed to do that. This is a personal choice for Dennis. They're like, you guys are married. I I at the documentary they talked about Ricky. They said you're basically married to Mike Ditka because he traded a whole draft for you. So why don't we do you're the groom and. And you're the bride. Ricky's like, what, what? There's not a football player alive at that time in 98, yeah. 99 that would have said, you know what? Yeah, let's get a dress on. Ricky did that because he's that comfortable. Dennis Rodman said, I would look good in this dress, this wedding dress. I'm definitely going to do this. <laughs> yeah, Dennis Rodman. No, 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 no. He, well, we've had other athletes. I mean, Joe Namath wore pantyhose back in the early 70s. Commer- well, well not- that was, I'm going to tell you. That was like wow, well, was but he could get away with it. It yeah, was for a commercial, for a commercial yeah. but even still, back then it was like what? Um, we've, I mean, listen, if we're talking about zesty, Russell Westbrook has been zesty his entire career. Uh, why are you backing up, Dell? <laughs> Dell's not comfortable with this. No, he, the, I don't think so. Wait, think his dressed, outfits? No, he just dresses poorly. He thinks it's stylish. He's. I don't. I wouldn't. Oh, call, I wouldn't call him zesty. zesty. Yeah, I mean, he's worn like distressed tank tops or crop tops, but that's just him dressing. I don't. I don't think he, he would consider that zesty. Wait a minute. If he was coming out in this in, in, in this NFL draft coming right out now, is a nah. interesting phrasing. Yeah. Well, if he was if he right. was going to be in this NFL draft dressing the way that he dresses, but he, there would be a lot of comments. Yeah, about but, him. but there's no, a not, lot of dress. Not really stuff he because wears. no. The thing about Caleb isn't the way he dresses. At least it was the image of the fingernails and the color of the i the iPhone. It wasn't about dressing. People have accepted guys with money are going to look a, a way that isn't the way we normally would dress. They all go to Paris Fashion yeah. Week now. Like somebody said something yesterday about D Hop. D Hop. Oh, D Hop has been with his dog and his man purse. I, okay. and- I don't think he actually have his, has a dog. That was something we created. That's not a real thing. He doesn't have a dog in a man purse. Oh, I'm pretty That's sure he does. Real, no, we just said it so much Wait that you think it's true. I don't think D Hop carries a dog around, <laughs> a little dog around with him. That's something that's been created on the show as like a vibe of what you feel like you get from him. Um, yeah, he likes bulldogs. Yes, he does. I'm looking at a bulldog. Uh, yeah, he's got a little dog. Yeah, what kind of dog is it? It's a little bulldog that he brings oh. around with him. Well, that's not a dog. In a carrying case. Yeah, it was in a puppy a, at the time. That's a bulldog. And here he is with his ba- his bag. No, D-Hop is, no, D-Hop never misses Paris Fashion Week. <laughs> yeah. This is a different time, John. This Fashion Week is, you don't know. These guys are fashionable. They When you call a player zesty, you got to be careful now. You call Russell Westbrook, you get in trouble. Yeah, but that's just a puppy. That's a bulldog. Yeah. That's not a Shih Tzu or something. Oh, I thought you. That's were gonna... not like a tiny, like you can't just call Russell Westbrook zesty. You can't even call Westbrook. Oh, he dresses zesty. I'm Do sorry, you know he, he does. You, you will never go if you say zesty fashion. or Westbrook. You will never go to a game that he's at. Westbrook. He dresses ze- uh, zesty. Westbrook. That's a, okay. Oh, there it is. Wow. There it is. I said it. Man. Okay. If, oh my God! No, 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 no! You insulted him a little bit. You got a little out of order yourself. Zesty Westbrick. Oh, I heard him. I mean, that's it. It was pretty clear. He already said you're you're basically coming after his family. He's already. No, got pe- it's yes. not after his family. That's what he said. It's a description of how he plays. No, no. that's what he said. He's a bricklayer. You, you no, changed that's what his he said. name. He's not a plumber. He's a bricklayer. They call he him said, a bricklayer. You, Don't change his name. You're going after his last name. He doesn't like you're it. You're coming after his you know mom that. and dad. Okay. Oh, that you're comes dis- after his you're family. You're disrespecting his family name. Oh, stop. If you want to tell, talk to him about not being able to shoot, call him a bricklayer. Don't say Westbrook. Would you like it if people called you Grenado Don't instead of Grenado? <laughs> so I, well, I don't well, You're asking the wrong guy. He doesn't yeah, care about anything. I don't care about anything. I really don't. Don't. You can call me whatever you want to call me. Well, you me. can't call Russell Westbrook. Can we start a list of things we can call John? Hey, yeah, whatever. Everyone, everyone call in. What do you think we can call John? <laughs> Let's go. Yeah, and, see, and see if it insults him. 
That's it. Then there's nothing. Okay, go ahead. Now you keep it clean. Keep it oh, clean. All of a sudden we got standards. Well, no, we don't want to be swearing well, on I, the I, air. I hit the button. Uh, time for me to talk about HRP. You got to keep it. Speaking of keeping it clean, listen, we got to call HR on you if you call into the show and say something egregious. All right, now maybe I'll get called to the carpet with HR about my zesty West Brick, but I <laughs> doubt it. I doubt it. Here's the deal: is are you acting appropriately at work? Are there females there that you're inappropriate with? Keep your <laughs> keep your inappropriate behavior at home. If you okay? got to take care of those people, that's why you need HRP. Well, yes, you need yeah. HRP. You absolutely have to do something about that. You can't have inappropriate. You need you need HR training. HRP can supply that for your people too. Because you know what? Maybe you don't know what it's what's appropriate and inappropriate at the job place. Don't make it uncomfortable. Don't make it so you're going to get sued by people at the workplace because you didn't have the standards that you need to have at your workplace what is your workplace i don't know what widgets do you sell what's your business your business ain't payroll your business ain't hr your business ain't taxes that's what hr's business is hrp's business is hrp is going to be there for you taking care of all that stuff and you don't know about it they do they've been doing it they're experts at it so if you're looking for an hr and payroll company hrp.net 281-880-6525 or hrp.net You're back in the Veritex Community Bank Studios with John and Lance. On ESPN 97.5 and 92.5.
All right, welcome back here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Uh, the number, what is Robert? Robert, does Robert have an insult for me? Robert, what you got? Bring it. Hey, John, man, I'm not I'm not going to give you insult this morning, man. I'm going to give you high praise because you're the man of the people. Thank you. Russell Westbrook used to be my favorite player. But after I seen all that way he, he dressed as, you know, all zesty and whatnot, man, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Dennis Robin was the only guy that could pull that off. And all these weirdos doing this brainwash dressing like that, I don't think that's the way to go. All these kids listening this morning, listen to the man of the people. Thank you. Dress right. Okay. What is right? I don't uh, like that look either, but I don't think that makes Russell Westbrook zesty. He's well <laughs> He's looking all zesty. I love that. <laughs> yeah, listen. Don't. <laughs> how long before zesty gets banned, though? It, it will. Too. Well, when people like you are using it, it right. doesn't have long for this world. No, no, no. It's just, it's it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous how zesty he's been I'm in just his looking, career. I'm, I just typed in Russell Westbrook fashion. I mean, yeah, it's I zesty. wouldn't say. It's, he's never, I haven't seen him put on a I was going to say never seen him put on a skirt. Then I got to 2000. <laughs> uh, and there he is in a skirt. Um, uh-huh. That's uh-huh. one. But usually it's tighter clothes and there's a, yeah. and a, maybe holes in it that you don't think I belong. Think he just dresses poorly and he thinks it's fashionable. Look, I know fashionable. Mm. And Russell's not. You it. know. Jalen is fashionable. Yeah, this usually- is the most fashionable shirt you own. Every day he's here in a t shirt. He's got a golf shirt on. Why I'm are you why are you all dressed up today? I'm comfortable. I'm not. I just put a I, I know. You put a golf shirt right on, now. which is I'm going golfing today. No. You've... I'm going to Carlton Woods. Uh, Russell's No, you're not to go see they're they're not there yet. Russell's mostly a they hit slacks too. and jeans guy. <laughs> those people. Did you just drop a those people hit <laughs> no, well too? What did you say about Russell? I said he's mostly a slacks and jeans guy. Yeah, he just cuts holes and everything and thinks he's doing something. Yeah. Or he wears glasses with no, with no glass. Yeah, I mean, there's when he's at when he's out and about, maybe at a fashion week, you'll see something that John would consider zesty. But for the most part, no, he's not when he's walking into. Oh, an NBA, I think rock. I think we've had rockets dressing zesty. When he's walking him. into an NBA arena, you're looking at oh those maybe those you think those jeans are a little. You ever weird. seen Kyle Kuzma? Well, that's not even see Kyle Kuzma. Either. They just dress weird. Like, it's just super – Kyle Kuzma does some of the – he wears some of the stupidest stuff I've ever seen. Ever. Does he? Oh, my God. I've never seen Have him walking. Have you seen the super a... long – oh, Kyle Kuzma maybe is the worst. I mean, he's really – he's honestly more – have you seen how bad Washington is? He's honestly more concerned with what he's wearing than how Well, he's it's like the Rockets wore. I, I honestly don't think Kyle Kuzma. Wait. He just can't wait till every game check comes in. I don't think he at cares about basketball at this time last year, that was the Rockets. At this time two years ago, that was the Rockets. Okay. At this time, that's all they cared about was the drip. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Well, that's what was so. And that was the Rockets. And now look at the difference Here's in this one team. Of, Here's one of Kyle Kuzma's. Oh, that's so stupid. Do you see the new suits that are coming out? You know that commercial with. Um, uh, Carmelo and uh, uh, Kendrick Perkins, where they got the giant 1990 suits on. You see that one? Yeah, that's one. The of 19. Cruises. Are you listening? Yeah. The 1990 suits on. You know that's a real thing now. Have you seen Justin Bieber at some awards? His the the, the sleeves are like two feet past his his, his hands. So it's basically. Um, it's real. So it's this is now the new well, look. But that joke is is about it's it's a long standing joke about the 1990s. Right. Basket, the suits that guys were yeah. wearing. It's a long-standing joke, but actually, uh, the big baggy pants have come back again. Like the shows jeans, the suit jacket, the jeans. I'll have to, I'll have to take a look at that. I have not seen that, but yeah. it doesn't surprise me. It doesn't surprise me. But we used to. I remember when it was baggy everything, and I have seen. I definitely have seen that coming back. Yeah, Kyle Kuzma's just. Yeah, here is. <laughs> look how stupid this is, Justin Bieber. Yeah. Look at how stupid it is. I mean, it's a gigantic suit. The, the sleeves. Uh, oh you go into a game. What, I mean, what is this, yeah. Kyle Kuzma? You t- you God's t- sake, do you care mm-hmm. about anything? You two have never sounded older. No. I know, but I, oh, I, I, really? 
Nah. Gigantic suit Look, with the man. At some point, you dressed away, and your and your parents were like, "What are you doing? Yeah. No, you this doing? is stupid. It always this it, is it's stupid. A, why are you rolling up your cigarettes in your sleeve, John? It's a cycle all the time. It happens all the time. You were dressing stupidly to your this parents. This can't. This can't last though. There's well, no way this we'll, lasts. We'll see. Yeah. Every, everything recycles like now. Yeah. Like mom jeans were a thing, and <laughs> yeah. they'll go. No, away no, and that I get. It'll all mom recycle. Jeans? No, I don't know how that. Comes uh, back. Wim, yeah, women. You I can't don't know, look good. When will those, this come back? You can't. What know. is that? I don't know what it is. I don't know why not. Why it's on me? Why it's in my time? Look, oh, it's Drea. Drea Michelle. Yeah, Drea Michelle. Uh, uh, you mean the woman who is. Who has spurred the Rockets towards the greatness. A, a playoff run? Thank you, Drea. Uh, w- allegedly one of. Thank you for your service, Honestly, Drea. Honestly, if Shea Gilgis Alexander and his 30 points a game were there, it wouldn't have mattered yesterday. They still would have gotten beat. Oh, you I said one what of the I best said. closers in basketball wouldn't matter. I said matter? what I said, Dell. Okay. If well, I'll tell you, you this. Jabari Smith? I'm sorry. Did you mean, mean to say Jabari Smith, one of the great closers? I He's don't know how he could have been closers. much better than Josh Giddy was down the stretch. Or Williams. Oh, Jalen Williams God. was fantastic. Do you like this? So. My kids, like the whole family was in the bedroom watching a game. We hadn't done that since the Harden Rockets, where we're all sweating the game at the very end. And Snacks is getting so pissed off at Josh Giddy. He goes, I've never seen, or maybe it was Mason, I've never seen a more bagless player in my life get 30 on a team like this. Nothing in any of his bags. Uh, he made a shot sitting on the floor. Yeah. yeah. I know. Was that, that was a, a top 10 shot? That I was a look. horse bag. I'm not what? interested. Okay, which is tougher? NBA player dunking <sighs> or dunk. making a shot okay. sitting on the floor. Okay, Jaylen now you've Green never sounded older. Up and under in between yes. layup. Oh my gosh. No. Shot of the day. Whatever. It's just a layup. Well, <laughs> NBA players make layups all the time. That wasn't just oh, a layup. No, that was fantastic. Ah, oh, it's just a layup. A, a dunk. NBA players make Oh, he dunked an NBA it, player dunk. NBA players make shots through contact all the time. Stupid. Better not be on the top 10. Stupid ESPN. 757 ESPN. But you're trying to put Jamal Shedd's dunk number one. Ridiculous. Well, that was ridiculous. A 6-1 guy going up like that, yeah. grabbing a board, grabbing a board and, th- and throwing it down. Yeah, it's never happened. We've never that was oh, over 6-8 guys. That's ridiculous. Nate Robinson never That's did my that. Guy. He's like five. Don't nine, even five, don't eight. even start blasting. Stop me. it. It's it was a putback dunk, John. Okay. It's okay. I uh, know. It's time for you to take a break right now. You this need is, to to compose yourself. Look at this. Okay, so I did say you know I was at the church of Jalen last night because he was playing well. Just a little play on words, and then you said he's the saint of procreation, Dell. The patron saint. and then patron saint. And Tom said, "There's a lot of people right." There's a lot of people there. Uh, there's a lot of people that are calling Jalen our father right now. That's not not yet. Well, no, there. Are, there's a lot of people calling him father. Our father. <laughs> yeah, that's not. There's the three joke. new newbies. That's not the joke. Three newbies calling him our father. Good. Guess time what? to talk. A uh, time to take a break. Seven one three seven eight zero three seven seven six. Your Florida team suck, by the way. Yeah, I don't root. Suck. I don't root for. Oh, you, why did we yell at the magic? We're not going to yell at the magic. Yeah, the magic. Suck magic ass blow too. too. We can't get any help from. Can we anybody. break it? Thanks.
What a great day. What a great weekend. We got it all going on. We got the Cougs tomorrow night in the Sweet 16. We got the Rockets on a 10-game win streak. We got the Astros opening day. And we got the Texas Children's Houston Open. Joining us now, an old friend of the show, Scott Sachinek, who is on Daniel Berger's bag this week in town for the uh, big event here just a couple of weeks before the Masters. A lot of great players out there. If you haven't made plans, get on out there. We're going to have a perfect weekend uh, for golf here in the city of Houston, and maybe it'll attract even more guys in the upcoming years. Scott, welcome back to the show. How you doing? Doing great, guys. Thanks for having me, as usual. We appreciate you being with us. You're on now. You were you, you're on Daniel Berger's bag this year. How'd that come about? A uh, little switcheroo. Um, very tough decision to make. Obviously, Brant Snedeker, um, love the guy like family. Um, Daniel Berger, known him a long time, and um, decided to make the make the switch. And um, Daniel, obviously, coming back from uh, just over a year of, of no golf with a back injury. Um, but prior to that, he was, you know, President's Cup, Ryder Cup, won a bunch of times. So looking forward to the uh, getting a new team together and starting up here at the Houston Open. Yeah, that is, that is uh, awesome. And how's the – okay, so you've been out there. How is the course looking and what's the, what's the response from the players been? Absolutely amazing. This is the conditioning of this course, obviously shifting the date to, uh, to the springtime is huge because they could overseed. But this is literally as good a conditioned course as we play all year on tour. I mean, it is lush. It is green. The course is going to play a little longer with the overseed. Had a north wind Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday for practice. So it was playing incredibly long. Um, should warm up today and definitely by the weekend, south wind. It's going to make the par fives gettable. But I have never seen this course. I live in Houston. I've played this course 500 times, and I've never seen it so good. That That is awesome to hear. And so you're hearing that from the players as well. we got a nice field. We got uh, Scotty Scheffler here. We got Wendell Clark here, and amongst, uh, and amongst other guys, Tony Finau and whatnot. Um, do you think with two weeks before the Masters now that this is going to be, and, and when, once it, the word spreads with the PGA uh, amongst the players, that, that more guys are going to be showing up in years to come here? 100%. 100%. I've had probably two or three dozen players come up to me in the last few days saying, cannot believe the transformation of this course. We've got uniform one-inch rough everywhere, just like Augusta. We've got the overseed everywhere in the chipping areas around the greens, just like Augusta. Now, nothing's truly ever going to replicate the Masters in Augusta, but this is going to be as close as you can do, even more so than we played the Golf Club of Houston. So I've had a lot of players, a lot of caddies come up and give really good feedback on the setup, um, the look and feel of the course, and I can see this event kind of becoming like it used to be, that little niche before Augusta prep. It'd be great to get the week before Augusta again, but... I think that's a conversation with the Valero Texas Open that snagged yeah. that date, but we're close enough. You know, it's, this is still going to be a great prep week for for the Green Jacket. Well, but we had the week before, before, and you know, a lot of guys don't play the week before the Masters, before a major. So that was a this one. I, I think might even be a better date for that because guys do want to play a couple of weeks before and then hand it over to Augusta and get ready for that. So uh, we'll Absolutely. see. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, we'll see how it works out. Listen. Finau shot 16 last year, but, you know, Scheffler uh, over four rounds. Scotty Scheffler shooting six under, and Justin Rose at six under, Jason Day five under, Wyndham Clark five under. <laughs> that means the course is really tough. Why is this one, why is this playing as difficult for these guys as a lot of courses we see throughout the year? Um, I missed the first part of that question. I'm sorry. Well, they, yeah, you know, the Scotty Scotty Scheffler over four days shot six under. <laughs> Scotty Scheffler is going to shoot a lot lower on a lot of different courses. Why is this one tougher? It's long. Um, it's long. It's it's a it's a second shot golf course. It's a, it's a shot makers golf course with irons, and the greens have just enough going on with slope and and forced carries that there's no real room for error. 
and you, you're not accidentally winning this tournament like you can some others where it's soft and you can get away with, with errant shots. You have to be on, and you have to be on for 72 holes. There's, there's no backing into it to a win or, or a good week on a golf course like this. It's it's a lot of the data says, you know, and this week we've been prepping with 175 to 210 yard shots, which which statistically is, is longer than a lot of courses we play on tour. So that was where we concentrated our practice on. Um, a lot of five irons, a lot of six irons, five irons, four irons. And no matter how good you are, that's, that's a lot of club to have back to back to back holes. So that's kind of how it's going to play out this week. You better be spot on with your iron play. Yeah. So what's the talk? I don't want to talk about live so much, but, um, but, but without those players, the John Roms and, and the Kepkas and whatnot, um, what is the talk out there on the tour lately? It, I, I haven't even, I don't even watch live. Do you watch live? And when you get a chance, I don't, I don't even, I don't even watch. I, I've, I've seen about uh, 10 minutes of live my whole, uh, since it started. Um, I'm the same. I, I, I've, I've never watched it, and it's not because I'm anti-live per se. I just don't even know, really know where it's on or how to watch it. I've got a lot of good friends that, that, that took the plunge out there, players and caddies. But, no, I haven't really tuned in, um, and it does. The reality of it is it sucks not to have John Rahm and, and DJ and Brooks and, and Swafford and Taylor Gooch playing on the tour. They're, you know, they're, a, they're an asset to the tour, but... At the same time, you know, no one's bigger than the sport, and the PGA Tour still has a great product with a lot of great players. And I'd like to see some point everybody come back together, and and I think that's what they're trying to work out in the uh, in the back room right now. But and I think if they do come together, you know, golf is going to be unbelievably strong. But we might be a year or two away from that if it happens at all. But it was a hit to the tour, but none of them, none of them are bigger than the sport. So the tour can only just keep chipping away with what they have and and see where the where the cards fall. How much? I mean, there was a stat that came out this week that Scotty Shuffler's caddy is making more than Rory McIlroy this year. How? Yeah, um, <laughs> I haven't really paid. I mean, obviously, I know Scotty's won a lot of tournaments this year, and and a couple of them being elevated events where where the prize money is massive. So we can all do the basic math, and and that seems to be the case. Uh, but, you know, we're in it's still March, and Rory hasn't even begun yet. You know, he'll uh, he'll find his stride here in the uh, in the summer months. But I think uh, I think those figures will start to balance out a little bit here over the next six months. But how much better is – is, is – okay, since Tiger – is he the biggest difference uh, from everybody else on the tour since when Tiger dominated the tour? Yes, certainly right now. The difference between between Scotty Scheffler and Tiger is, is is Tiger's longevity. Like he did that for over a decade. Scotty's done it now for you know a year or so. So that's the big difference. But yes, he is right now. You know, probably a football field length ahead of everybody else as far as like statistically. His driving, his putting is is not great, but it's still pretty darn good. He gets criticised as being a bad putter. He's not a bad putter. Um, wedge play, he is just miles ahead of everybody, kind of like what Tiger was. Um, but Tiger did it for 15 straight years. Yeah, so we'll see how Scotty goes. Is that good for the sport? Yeah, absolutely. It's good for the sport. It's good for the sport because it pushes everybody else. Because you know, Scotty Scheffler played junior golf. And, and college golf with probably 30, 40 guys that are currently on tour that probably beat him at some point in time as a junior and in college golf, which wasn't that long ago. So it pushes those guys to be better and because they know, hey, I've beaten Scotty 10 times before down the stretch, not that long ago, and I can do it now. So it gives that next tier of players something to push for. It's like, I can beat this guy. And that helps the product, helps golf. That's Scott Saginac, caddy for Daniel Berger here this week for the Houston Open, a huge, huge event here for the city, and it's going to, just going to get bigger over a couple of weeks before the Masters. That's our slot now, and that is just perfect. And the weather, you guys are, you got it. It's going to be great. It's going to be great out there. So uh, we're really looking forward to it. 
Is Daniel Berger hitting it uh, in his practice rounds? Is he? What do you think about his chances this week? This is a really good course for Daniel Berger. Great. His weapon is distance control with his irons, which is needed on this golf course. We had a great three days of prep. I'm talking really good. He's just a little rusty, so the practice has always been okay, and it's getting a little better each day. So it's just a, a function now of everything coming together. But this is a shot maker's course, and Berger's a shot maker. Yeah. And um, I could see him playing well this week. I really can. That's Scott Saginac. We appreciate you being here. Good day, mate. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you having me. All right. There's uh, Scott Saginac right here. Uh, friend of the show. He's been on a few times. Gets a great perspective from from uh, from the caddy room right here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Where we, did you take a break? Or I don't have anything to add. I don't know any of those people you're talking about. <laughs> I'm just here for opening day in the rock. What about, okay, if we have a Frisbee caddy on. What, Never heard of them. They don't exist. You don't have a Frisbee caddy? <laughs> no, you carry your own backpack or whatever. Okay, so it's a backpack thing. So it's well, not like whatever a, you're carrying. It's not like a hip thing. thing. It's like a purse, like I, DeAndre. I, I assumed it was a holster where you had like slots for your your different frisbees. Your frisbees. Yeah, yeah, like a little waistband thing, and you oh, had and you a just, little satchel and you just on the grab side. One and yeah, throw it. it's not like that. It's an actual backpack. Yeah, yeah. It's not like. But what if you need to grab it right away? Don't deflect. Yeah. What if you need? Don't deflect. You don't deflect. That was Wait, caddy talk. Is it a? Is it a? He's back- trying to put it on me. Well, I, I got questions to... because you are. I didn't put him on the. I didn't put a guy on the radio. I'm not talking about disc I'm, golf. I'm not talking about Scott Sajanet. I'm talking about you. Do you, are what? is is it is the backpack like open no, at the top? Like so you arrow. can like where you can pull like Legolas. Yeah. No. Where you grab your arrow and right? No. <laughs> And frisbee is? I, I'm not even telling y'all about that. <laughs> you said to bring it up and make it a topic oh. now. You okay. said it was a backpack. I'm no. trying to ask. It was a back, yeah. Yeah. So it's like Legolas. I mind my own business with so it. So when you go out to one of your toughest courses, do you have a hip satchel or do you use a backpack? I bring, frankly, I bring like. Is can, it stylish? Like carry, Russell Westbrook? I carry like zesty? three of them in my hand and just walk. Do you have a zesty satchel for your frisbee? No. It's just a regular. It's not zesty. I don't even bring anything. A lot of times, just three in my mm. hand and walk. Oh, regular oh. shoes. You need a caddy. I didn't then. have a segment for you oh. about disc golf. Well, you've had. So segments. why are y'all trying to turn it on me? Because I couldn't had... say anything to that guy. I don't know Dan- if Daniel Berger spit in on my kid's food. I wouldn't know who he is. Like, stop it, Daniel Berger. I'd say, hey, this guy just spit in my kid's food. I you, wouldn't know it was Daniel. You wouldn't Berger. know it was Daniel Berger. No. You don't know who Daniel, Daniel Berger, Berger is? Wow. Do you know da- Daniel Berger, Dell? No. Um, next Friday, Lance, can you bring on a froth caddy? And we can talk they about don't the, exist. the ins and outs. Can you they bring, don't exist. Can you bring on a backpack to talk about? <laughs> Backpacks can't talk. They carry the Frisbees. But they don't talk. I like that John appropriates white guys, too. Was that guy even an Aussie? Yeah, he was. I don't know, G'day. Somebody's asking if he was. Good day, man. Just because you say good day doesn't make somebody an Aussie. He's an Aussie, yeah. He's a did he not sound like it? He did. He's from Australia. Why did he? he came, matter of fact, he texted me, hey, mate. That's how he texted me. Oh, well, then that make, that's definitely yeah. Australian. Uh, you don't just say mate. No. You, you, no one says mate unless you're from Australia. You know who liked that interview a lot? Art. Our listener, Art. Art loves that. Art loves that. Are we talking about grass again? <laughs> I mean, Art the undulations like of a golf tweets. course, <laughs> the rises, tweets. the falls, the gradients of a of a golf course, riveting. It's awesome. I mean, it doesn't get any better. Art does not get any better. Golf I interview. I don't know why you're allowing Art to take all all the hits. I was I was we fine had with multiple it, guys, but who, you can't look to me to add something. It'll be so obvious. Like, what is this terrible? So question? not Dan Holden tweets us of a baseball fan snoring, falling asleep. You've got. Brian, Homer Simpson snoring. Um, yeah, so it was a big hit. Uh, listen, it's, it's it's the Houston Open is here. It's a, a huge sporting event in the city of Houston. And whether uh, because Art doesn't like golf, you know what? It's not the only one. Tough, tough toenails, I don't, Art. I don't think it's the golf per se. It's the and okay. I want to see. All right, I want to I want to hear from all you people that do love golf. Okay, oh, no. let's go. Well, can we talk about opening day? And the Astros or the Rockets? <laughs> we don't have to turn this uh, into. I want to hear from everybody uh, who likes okay, golf. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Okay. Do you think Jim Crane on the other side, who's also owns the Astros, right? You think he might like a little golf talk too? I think he'd like a lot of Astros talk. No, today. he would like. 
He owns the Houston Open. He would like that as well. What about Astros? Do you know yeah. I can get a ticket to the Astros? Uh, at Simple Seats, they had them for 133 off. I could get two tickets for $134 on a lower level. Lower level? And I'm sure Tillman would love us to talk about one of his many restaurants. We don't have to do it, though. No. We're going to talk the Rockets. We're it's not, talk, that's not a sporting we're event. Talk that's not a sporting event. Jim Crane and Landry. Landry. That's not a sporting I mean, event. Hold on. Coons Whether Jim Landry Crane talk. wants us to talk Houston Open or not, he didn't program our station. Yeah, he does. He's not the boss of us. He kind of does. What I mean, does he pay for? What does he pay for in this station? Mm, Nothing. He, no, he owns the the, the biggest like, event in the city. This Houston guy said, today. "I like the golf interview. I'm white and 47. I fit the golf demographic." That's right. Coming up next, and that's the, where the money is. Thank you. Coming up white, next, white and 47. The we'll re- see how much mm, money that is if we rich. keep it golf. <laughs> you don't know. We don't know that. Uh, I do know Gulf Coast Chevy is is pretty I do cool. Know, I do know Gulf Coast Chevy's for everyone. It's not an elitist uh, car dealership. They want everyone to come out there. There is no demographic that they don't want. They want everyone out there. If you want to buy a vehicle, if you want to buy a brand new uh, Chevy Equinox, if you want a Chevy Silverado, let me talk about the Chevys for a second. The Silverado pickup trucks right now going for 09 percent APR financing for 72 months. Holy crap. That is a great finance rate. It is something you're really not finding very often anymore when it comes to, you know, when it comes to looking for uh, the vehicles that are that are going to um, and the pickup trucks that are going to have the cargo space you want, the stylish interiors. You you're usually having to deal with high high finance rates right now, high interest rates, but not the case on the Chevy Silverado. The Chevy Traverse. My wife and I both have Traverses. They are great. They are they are they look great. They're very sturdy. They have great safety features. The interior carrying space that you need, they can seat seven uh, and, and handles very smooth, just like a standard SUV might. And, of course, they have vehicles like the Chevy Equinox if you're looking for something that's a little bit smaller. There's a lot of different types of Chevys, but I promise you Chevy is going to be right for you. And you can find the Chevy you love at Gulf Coast Chevy Buick GMC. Shop online at LanceZCars.com. Chevy, find new roads. You are listening to Houston's longest-running sports radio morning show. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's John and Lance. You can join Gallant and George and the Killer Bees live at the decoy today as the Astros season begins. While the Astros season gets underway, you can get $10 Shiner Box 
100 ounce towers and two dollar mexican candy shots go watch the astros and hang out with gallant and george and the killer bees today at the decoy all right 822 ESPN 97.5 and 92.5, You want to talk about the Houston Open? You're more than welcome to do that. You want to talk about the Rockets? You want to talk about the Astros opening day today? You want to talk about the Cougs? Let's go. <laughs> Cougs playing tomorrow night. You were at? Oh, no, you weren't asking a question. You were talking about Jim Crane wanting us to talk Houston Open. I think he'd like for us to I think the listener, I don't really care what Jim Crane wants to talk about. I don't care what the listeners want to talk about. I think. Do you think they're more interested right now? In the Rockets or Astros? I think it's Astros. You do? I, I'm more Rockets. Not everyone's <laughs> oh, yeah. a Rocket fan right Here's now. Here's the problem with... Not everyone's a three-sport three, three sport fan like they used to be. And, Rock, and Astros fans are pumped that the season's starting. Yeah, 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 yeah. But Rockets fans are pumped that they've got their basketball team back. Yeah, there's just not as many basketball fans no, no, right. right here. I no, mean, no, there's, no, plenty, no. Well, uh, there's, there's plenty, <clears throat> but the demographic is much younger for basketball. But that's, that's strong for basketball. You don't think that this team is starting to catch the... Is starting to catch take, the attention of people? No, I think it'll take more. Po- I, I mean, I think some, yeah. I think some, but this I is, think in our own bubble, I think the the Rockets, to to get the Astro fans, like the ones who, the, the, they pulled Astros by winning. You pull in the casual fan who wanted to maybe go to a game once or twice a year, and they don't really care that much unless the team's winning. They're now full-time Astros fans. It takes a long time. There were Rockets fans like that, too. When they won championships, there were a lot of Rocket fans who were like that, who... Didn't really care. Then they became big, and then they were diehard. I'm all in with the Rockets for years and years, and then they lost them. Uh, I think the Rockets are going to get that back because their fan base is a very young fan base. With the Astros, they have the Astros have what the Texans used to have, and the Texans are still trying to get back. And that is, they've got black, white, Hispanic, younger, older, male, female. A lot of a lot of women at uh, Astros games. I know you see that. Yeah. A lot of female Astro fans, hardcore. My sister-in-law, she didn't used to be a big baseball fan. Now she swears by the Astros and has for the last six years. This Rockets team, though, I think is start. It's a very, they're, listen, their trajectory is very Texans-like. And I think it'll be very important for the organization if, like the Texans, the Texans finished it off in the final game, won won a playoff spot, Yes, got into the postseason, won a playoff game. I think, listen, it's it's a big, this is a big deal what they're doing right now. And if they get into the postseason, if they should beat the Lakers in that one play-in game, man, oh, man, oh, man, you want to talk about this is going to be, this is some kind of fun. Well, for, they wouldn't be done. They still have to go win one more. No, right? I know, but, well, the the – the Texans just want to play off game mode. Just getting in. Just getting in. A big no, but deal. but but winning winning the game would be awesome too. Freddie said, "Freddie's a big sports fan." Freddie just said, "I watched the entire fourth quarter and overtime for the Rockets yesterday, and that was the first in a long time." I think people are just starting to right. I, I really do think getting into the postseason, uh, the play on the play in postseason, is huge for them. I don't know. I don't think the Rockets are are back. I think the Rockets still have a long way to go to get their fans back. I don't really care. Like I'm not in their marketing department. That that's not my business. They winning will do that. I just I just know this much. It's a fun team. When people do come in, when people come back, they're gonna see a fun team. They're gonna see a team that competes. They're gonna see Amen Thompson, Jabari, Jalen. They're gonna see a team that's got some dog in them. That's got some fight in them. When they come back to the the Rockets, either for the first time or you know for hardcore. Uh, and really start following them, they're going to find a team that is really, really it, – it's a it's a good team to watch. And yeah. You can be proud of this team. You can be proud of this team. But like I said, how many people show up or what percentage? I mean, that's us for us talking, but the marketing department will obviously – listen, if you win, look at how the Texans postseason – I'll give you an example. The Houston Texans dropped the hype video of Cal McNair. Did you see this yesterday? The Cal McNair uh, hype video? Missed that. You need to go to Texans Twitter, the the Houston Texans Twitter account. It's Cal McNair in a race car. It's Cal McNair throwing up H's. It's Cal McNair as part of the, you know, giving a game ball to Miko. It's Cal McNair talking on the phone about, yeah, we're going to make the trade, where is obviously the trade to bring up Will Anderson, you know, to, 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 to draft Will Anderson. It's all this Cal stuff. And the Texans even said it's a Cal McNair hype video. I read the comments because I was very interested to see what I thought I would see. 
that's my owner. My owner's a bad MF. This is my, like, you last year, At this you time? could never <laughs> post a Cal McNair video. No. You couldn't <laughs> post anything about Cal McNair. <laughs> he would get tortured. <laughs> right now, it was probably, there was the John Granados who would do that. There was, like, only one or two that would go, Rrr. But the rest <laughs> of them were very, very positive. No. All of the tweets. Listen, are like, you people kidding love me? Them now. Are you kidding me? The 180 that they, the, the team, the organization, the Cal has done, every, yeah. everybody involved has done, it's incredible. Under the, under the tweet, the hype video for Cal, they're also asking people to throw up the H, and if they do, they can get themselves a Cal t-shirt. It's his shirt of Which Cal, is just yeah. Cal on a t-shirt throwing up the H. I mean, hmm. if you... No, the branding. If you respond and really want a t-shirt, you're on the level of people commenting under Texans cheerleaders tweets yeah now that's to get it now no no ironically if you shirt, want an ironic cow you want to wear up a the cow shirt, shirt i could see that it's like people who like yeah i could see people doing it ironically not if you actually yeah they're giving away cow t-shirts yeah that's where his brand is people want him. john there's no one who has a dell shirt you're people not want cow a, shirt. i would love would you wear yeah, a cow polo I'm being honest with you. <laughs> I would love a Cal How shirt. Tight would Cal... Are you kidding me? The mustache, the H. The H. I, Del, don't. The gigantic head. I mean, yes. that's. I, I, listen, I got to have one. I got to put myself in. They would never send me one, though. They would never, ever, ever send me one. No, you have to respond under the tweet, and they may send you one. No, they would not send. If I responded under the tweet. Why wouldn't they send you one, Throwing John? up the H. Wouldn't it be great? Okay. Pro- promotion for them if you of all people wore a shirt on on youtube <laughs> i would love that i mean that would be my favorite shirt i ever owned if i had a cal shirt i mean look <laughs> at this cal mcnair shirt i mean how tight is that it's so tight it's a picture of him at the at the race car place wherever he was and he's throwing up the h and it's like i no, mean yes, i want it's the ironic. one where it's just an outline with his mustache so they made i that. love that they made that. That's my favorite. The truck. family, like oh, they did. Yeah, my uh, uh, Sean Tier's right here. I want that. I Sean want Tier that. has. Yeah, it. that. Yeah. Was that, now that's Cal. All right, I don't know if they made it, but yeah, Sean Tier and Tony Pugh have it. I know I've seen them wear it. Where that's they got. I it want from, that. They got, I, want that I think shirt. they got it from the McNairs. Oh yeah? yeah, I want that. That's my Where favorite it's his shirt. Outline. Ever. Yeah, it's just, just his outline, right? All right, we got we got everybody wants to get in here and talk about Cal. We'll do that on the other side, right here on oh my God. ESPN. No, just one guy. Ninety-seven five and ninety-two five. Don't go anywhere.
You're back in the Veritex Community Bank Studios with John and Lance. On ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. All right, welcome back here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Someone three seven eight zero three seven seven. We got a full board. We got a full board. So let's get it going on. Uh, Julian was first up here talking about Caleb Williams' dress. Hey, Ju- Julian. Good morning, gentlemen. So Dale was talking about, you know, you guys are sounding like old men and yada, yada. Okay, so yes, when we were younger, our parents did say something about we dressed. I was in the baggy clothes echo era, and then yeah. I went to the Abercrombie and Fitch era. But the thing is, as I got older, I stopped wearing those kind of clothes. These guys are in their early to mid-20s still dressing like they're 18, 19. So, I mean, at one point, do you start dressing your age? LeBron still carries his man bag. He gets, he walks off to the press conference with his little purse like Lance carries for a disc golf. Um, I just don't get it. Like, at what age are you supposed to dress the right way? Because, I mean, damn, you're a grown man now. As a kid, I get it. Yeah, yeah, your parents are going to yell at you like you look stupid. But when you get older, well, I mean, hell, come on, big dog. You got to start dressing like a man. You got to understand. Man, right? Money allows you to do things the I guess, quote-unquote, mm. the normal man wouldn't have to. John has to dress a certain – well, John's a kept man now. But at, at points, John had to dress a certain way to get a job. LeBron can dress whatever way he wants. Caleb Williams will be able to dress whatever way he wants because you know what? The bag is secured. You don't have to change the way you dress when your bag is secured. So, yes, we have to adapt because we're trying to look, quote-unquote, imp- appropriate to get a job. These guys don't have to dress that way. The bag is secured. Money changes, Julian. That's all it is. And they'll dress, and they'll continue to dress. Doesn't have to change it that much. You can still dress like a regular like a person. What? No, you not if you got money. You don't. Oh, baloney. I gotta find, be honest with you. Find the man the- bag. Th- I, <clears throat> I I just I never. I get that's the fashion, and that's fine. I'm usually like, yeah, that that's just one I just can't. It's not. It's not homophobia. It's not anything. I just think it looks so try hard to have a Gucci bag or a Louis bag around you. For, I mean, it looks. What if you actually carry things and it's no, functional? No, it's, it's functional for sure. No, I wish I could. I, w- I mean, it'd be great. I would lose less things. I would lose less. You things. of all people. I'm just never going to have because you won't ever see a guy doing it if it's not Louis or Gucci or. Prada or whatever. It's, it's got to be it's status symbol. Paris fa- yeah, it's a status symbol. That's mm. what it is. Yeah. It's status symbol. So if high fashion, if people with money generally, not everyone, obviously some people are putting on their loafers or whatever, but uh, people with money go with fashion trends. Hold on. And if hold high on. fashion, if high fashion is selling those clothes, but who, who you, you know what high fashion them? is? The combination. You can't call it quote unquote high fashion. You cannot have that man. And this happens a lot. That high, that high fashion, which you're right. The Prada, the the Louis, the Gucci man bag, but then your white socks and flip flop, your white socks and slides. Who who does that? Yeezy. Okay. Oh my. Okay. The Astros are in the opening day, and you two are talking about man person. Uh, Now you want to talk about golf? Time to get Stan in here. Let's talk about the Rockets' defense. Hey, Stan. Hey, good morning, fellas. One thing I want to talk about is the Rockets' defense. Everyone's concentrating on the offense with Singoon out and how the lanes open. But defensively, they're able to switch at every, all five positions. Yeah. But they're good in the game. Teams like Golden State put them in a pick and roll, and the big stiff can't do anything. So I mm. think the defense has improved, especially with DePaul at the five, mm. and that's where he may have finally been, been able to implement the defense that he's been wanting to play. The but whole you year. can't play. So there's a lot to, lot to decide this next year. Hold on. Well, first of all, this is a really good call because you are talking about a specific basketball. It's a specific basketball ability that they can't do with you can't do it with most centers on the on the court. Most centers you can't yeah, unless you have like a Robert Williams or you know, you gotta have a very specific yeah, a band. rim runner and they're not and they're not usually gonna be good players. It Cat, Joel Embiid, all these guys are gonna have those issues. But uh did you see the team out there that was a closing unit, John? It was Amen, Jalen, Dylan, Van Vliet, and, and Jabari. Jabari. Yeah. That was their closing unit and they can all switch out. Oh, well well, the thing with Van Vliet is you wouldn't think he should switch out. That guy gets so many steals. He is such a heckler uh, if you try to dribble anywhere around him. So you can switch all those positions you're able to switch. It's an interesting closing lineup if Jabari 
can get you. And, well, when Jalen's rebounding, because Ahmed is maybe the fastest leaper. I, he's maybe one of the fastest leapers I've ever seen. He's an unbelievably explosive early leaper. And he and him and Jalen make up for a lot of the rebounds you miss from Shingun. And then you got Jabari. And then Dylan, you know, is a big wide body guy for his position. You actually can survive with that. But are we really going to start talking? Like, do we really have to start talking about Alperin not playing? That That's not, not an option. It's not about not playing. No, it's not about that's not, not playing. It's about diff- being different defensively because, uh, listen, this has been a knock of, uh, on Alperin is his you know, defensive liability. If, him not being able to switch out, not being able to get over the top yeah, of screens. That's right. All of those things have been a, a, an issue for Alperin Shangun early in his career. And we're seeing the difference now defensively with them having guys who can switch. Yeah, I guess. I mean, but they were getting baskets on baskets on baskets yeah, Oklahoma in the was fourth make, was and in overtime. Shots. So it's but, not like they weren't getting baskets. No, they were getting bad, but not for not not the duration of the game. But the, I mean, at the end, it was it was a, there was a lot of easy. But they had baskets. Landale, they had Jeff Green, like they had more traditional. I mean, well, Green Jeff Green's is just, a small ball five. Uh, yeah. The, it isn't about Alper not playing. The question is because we talk about Ime and his coaching and all about winning. When it when all the guys are back, yeah, you, we're talking about a, close? a closing lineup. How do you, Alperin, you, are you if keeping? Alperin's not closing a game. How do you pay him max dollars? Are you keeping you Shingun off the floor him? because of his defensive liability? Let's 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 assume Jalen continues to be this guy, so he can lead he can lead your offense down down late. And I'm not even just talking about his ability to score. He was distributing, getting. He's got Jabari shots. He got other guy shots beyond his scoring. So if that's the guy he's going to be, then there's a question. Do you need a smaller guard like Fred Van Fleet on the floor when you have Jalen Green as your lead guard? If you want a defensive lineup where Jalen Green's the focal point of your, your offense, you can have Tari on the floor. You can have Amon, Amin Thompson on the floor. You can have Jabari and Dylan. That's that's a big-time closing five who can switch, and then you got your guy who can lead you offensively. These are the questions that will come when you at, you're at full stream. Then where, where does Cam Whitmore go? But it's go? a good thing for winning. Though, yes, that's right? what I'm saying. When you can be a hybrid team and you can morph into – who you're playing so against? This it's leads, what the Warriors did. So this, yeah, they're they're deaf lineup. Yeah. So this leads to the bigger questions. Well, there's a lot of questions. About, Tari Eason, Cam Whitmore, the Warriors. Saying, all never, of these guys are but, questions. But the Warriors though. never had the Warriors. Uh, okay, Tari Eason's playing in crunch time, but where? Well, he would probably be your three, and Jabari will be your five, and go. On, and I'm saying because yeah, you can, I, I, you can they're take. They're not taking. I'm in Thompson is going to be is what, a, a. He can be your two. You're right. He can switch Fred from Van two Van to four. Vliet may be the guy. Who, no, Fred Van Vliet won't be here after two years. After well, he, I'm he even talking. What about himself. next year? No, I'm even talking about next year. Oh no no. As far as a closer, no, no, I know he'll be here. As far as a closer, no, he'll be. He'll be a closer. Yeah. Well, if so, Amen's not. No, Amen can be on the floor. And listen, he's got a lot of. There's a. I want you to work through this. Is Jalen on the court? Yes. Yeah. Is Dylan on the court? Now listen, it depends on the night with Jalen. It, it, uh, right. Earlier this season, Jalen wasn't well, on the hope, court. I would say well, Jalen po- is the guy that depends on the well, night. Well, we hope not. Absolutely. The point they, is. All of them, it depends on the night. Jabari hasn't been a, no, a, a, a closer. Alpi hasn't been a closer. He sits them down when they're not having a night. Yeah, that's true. Well, this is the thing. This is like the that. thing going forward for the future of this team and, and their ceiling. It can't be depends on the night for Jalen if, if they want to get where they want to get. He has to be a guy that no matter what, He's on the floor because he's that good. You're not a max player. You, nobody is. Alpi, nobody. If you can't close games on a regular basis, then you're not in that Jason Tatum conversation. You're not in the Jalen Brown conversation. You're not in the Shea Gilgis Alexander. Like anybody that's a max dollar player, you can't. How can you be that if you're not even considered good enough to close games? Those guys can't be dependent on the night. Jalen has to right. be a guy who's always there. You want all man Thompson to grow into that. Obviously, Dylan Brooks is your defensive guy, and Jabari, being a top three pick, needs to be one of those guys too. Fact if we're talking is, about the future Tari of the team. Eason more than likely is going to be depends on the night guy, depends on the foul trouble. I really do think it's going to be the two best that make sense with with Tari, Dylan, and Jabari. Those three guys. There'll probably be two of those guys. Alperin will sometimes be there, and sometimes Alperin won't. That's just going to be the – I just think it, de- it was going to depend on the big – he's the guy that could get squeezed by by what the lineup looks like. Um, I wouldn't read too much into yesterday just because, you know, and they didn't have Shea Gilgis-Alexander. However, I mean, too much into it in terms of who was closing. But I do think when we start talking about it, Tari Eason feels like a closer, right, John? Yeah. Okay. Well, but again – Maybe. I, I know. Maybe. That's what I'm saying. This is Maybe. this is not this is like having a fantasy football team. There, you know, you know the, when you have a fantasy team with five 
receivers who are all about the same, and you can't decide who to start. Well, That's what this feels like. And again, like. I think even with Jalen, it's going to depend on you. Got you are you are literally going to be eight to nine deep next year. That question is, is this what we're seeing right now? Is this the beginning of a team, the team going forward that is going to be, or do you, are you going to add pieces when Fred goes away? Do you add somebody else to that 43 million out there? Although Jalen and Alpi are going to, are going to eat that up. Um, is this an, an iteration of a championship basketball team? That's the question. Or do you have to make moves? The thought was you had to move Jalen. Listen, they looked into it. Shams, Shams said it. They looked into it. But there are people in the organization think Terry Eason is the best player on the team. They believe that Tari is the best player on the team. I would say Tari and, and Amen are the same players. You just, you don't know it yet, but they're really the same players. They both can get baskets out of nowhere, loose balls. They get on loose balls. They rebound. They block shots. Like They play the same kind of ball. And that's not duplication. That's you know, Tar Jabbar, or how man, how tall is Ahmed Thompson? Is he six seven? Six yeah, around there. He plays yeah. Is he really six yeah. seven? Yeah. Oh no, you he plays like he's even bigger. He plays like he's six oh, nine. Oh I, I thought he was shorter, but I thought he played much no, bigger. He's tall and long and he is like he is gonna be a real problem as his offense comes along. Uh, do not listen, I, I, I thought you. they were BSing BSing right after the draft. When they said we had Amen number, we had number him two, probably. number two. Yeah, we had Amen number two. God, we and I was like, us. "Stop! Can you? You're believe- saying that he was the fourth pick. You're saying we had Amen number two. Can you believe we missed out on Scoot though? <clears throat> what a disaster! We could have had Scoot Henderson. Well, we're in a city where has Scoot played? The, like, yes, he has played. He scored this year. Yet? Yes, he's played. Look, we're in a city where we were talking about Jalen Green as a potential bust. Let's leave Scoot alone. No, at, leave no. him alone. Leave at that this man point, alone. leave that Let man him alone. Play. Scoot is already a bust. Let him play. Uh, is it too early to call yes. Scoot a bust? Yes, Click it is. Click this yard barker link. Do a shot. Do a shot of tequila. Yeah, we could. You heard what La Raza said earlier. <sighs> he said he was going to get one, but it was so smooth he decided to get two. There you go, way. That's what you can do. You can jump in on some of this. Maestro do Bell. Uh, I, I, look, if you want to take a shot, that's fine. That's that's your business. I think it's better to drink it as a smooth sipping tequila. It doesn't have that burn. It is going to be uh, if you buy your own bottle of Maestro do Bell. I don't know what I don't know what the the stores are going to charge. I mean, I don't know what the bars are going to charge you, but I can tell you at the stores, at the liquor stores, you're going to find a very reasonable price on this bottle of tequila, no matter the type of tequila you get from Maestro do Bell. Um, you're going to get a very reasonable price for a premium tequila. And they do have the standard silver. They've got the smoke silver. They've got the humit, which is called the humito. They've got uh, Reposado, Añejo, Añejo Extra, the Cristalino, the Añejo Extra Cristalino, which is their really expensive bottle that's phenomenal. Like, this is a baller tequila, and I've had a sip of this one, and it is unbelievable. Believable. I don't care what type of tequila you're looking for. Just make sure it's a Maestro do Bell. Go grab a bottle, take a picture, send it to me on social media. I'd love to know what you think about uh, the uh, the biggest up and coming tequila in this country. It's Maestro do Bell.
Broadcasting live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, it's John and Lance on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Now here's John Granato and Lance Zerline. All right, 850 ESPN 97.5 and 92.5, seven one three seven eight zero three seven seven six. Chris has been waiting a while to talk about the Astros in the opener. What up, Chris? What up, John? Good morning, everybody. Um, you guys were talking about being excited about the season. Lance is trying to talk about the big three there from the, you know, making the shift from uh, grass talk to the big three. And I was thinking, you know, I'm, everybody's excited this time of year, no matter what baseball team you root for. I remember being at Minute Maid with the roof open, watching Roy O pitch opening day. So I was thinking, okay, besides that, what are we excited about this year as Astro fans? Is it Jordan hitting in the two hole? Or could it be Yonor Diaz getting his first shot as a pro, being the everyday catcher and and watching the, the next Pudge Rodriguez uh, you know, catch for the Astros? Or could it be a new coach? I'm looking forward to that. But I really think what we need to be excited about as Astros fans is watching the Alex Bregman farewell tour as an Astro. He's going to he's come into the season in the best shape of his life. Why he wasn't in the best shape last year when we could have used some offense at home in the playoffs, I don't know. But, yeah, watching Alex for the last time uh, in an Astros uniform, uh, having the best year of his life is going to be a lot of fun to watch. Good show, guys. There's, a okay, a ton of storylines this year, and we can rank them. You're right. Joe Espada, managing for the first time. Alex Bregman's farewell tour. Kyle Tucker keeping, keeping it going. I think Bregman's going to be a top five MVP guy. Kyle Tucker, he's got a chance to be a top five, top ten MVP guy. Jordan has a chance to be a top five, top ten MVP. Uh, MVP guy. Three out of the top five? We think? we could have three of the top five. We could. Now, no, no, I said they have a chance to be. All all of them. But you believe But Bregman's I the think we'll likely. have a we'll have three in the top twelve. So if you think that yes. and you think this is do you still yes. think this is the best Astros team? Yes. So how many wins do you think they get? Over a hundred? I don't I don't know that they will yeah, they'll they'll have a hundred wins. They'll have 100, maybe 101. They won't win more games than any Astros team, but I think this is the best Astros team they've had. Why do you think they won't? Uh, because uh, Just because. I mean, I don't, you know, well, first of all, you got to get some guys, you got to get some guys healthy like Garcia and McCullers, and you lost Urquidy, and you got to get Verlander healthy. What did you say? Pardon me? You said McCullers? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got the best back end that you've had since Lidge, Dotel, and, and Wagner. And Wagner. Yeah. You've got your best back end since then. You and you're better than those teams anyway. All of those teams. Are you deep? Because you you've got a Brayu who came on strong in this in after his back. And was really good in the postseason. But you think everything's going to go well? You think a Braves going to play well? The bullpen. I do play think great. a Braves going to play. I think you've MVPs. got Yiner now in the lineup as opposed to Michelle. You don't think anything goes wrong? You think it's a clean season? I think it's. I think everybody has career years, <laughs> and it's the it may be one of the greatest teams in baseball. Ninety-two history. and a half wins this year. Yeah, is there over. Over. Um, On Mopey and Mates, we talked about it. ESPN had their predictions. The Astros had the. The least amount of first place votes for winning the division. They everyone in cross baseball well, the, had more well, first place. Well, votes. the World Series team comes they, from the same di- division. Yeah, the Astros weren't predicting yeah. by anyone to win the World Series. <laughs> yeah, according okay, to ESPN. Good, good because they're always right there. I'm just pointing out that you have a differing opinion from a, a yeah. plenty of people. No, 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 no. But the Astros always get to the ALCS. Well, they did have them. Enough people I mean, had them getting there, but not winning at all. Well, you can't like. Let's see if. The Rangers can hold up to the scrutiny. Oh, the oh, the Astros are are the favorite to win the division. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm just saying they're not, of all of the division of all winners. The, of all the division, they winners, had the fewest. They votes. have the fewest votes. Well, they've yeah. got the Rangers in their division, and the Mariners got some first place votes too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they. Uh, let's face it. That probably is well the AL East with Baltimore, 
The Yankees suck. Yeah, Bal- the, Ast- the Yankees suck. Baltimore's a, a strong favorite. The Astros. Who? Baltimore's a, a big, big favorite. favorite. Yeah. The Astros be. to make the playoffs minus four fifty. Do not make the playoffs plus three twenty five. Yeah. You like plus three twenty five? I mean, I just from a value standpoint, you Justin Verlander's age catches up with him. Uh, I just think it's, well, I think that's an interesting number. Let's not forget how many playoff teams there are now. Two competitive teams along with you there in the division. Yeah, let's not forget how many playoff no, teams there are no now. Question. So. There's more. That's why the number's high. Yeah, uh, I mean, make the playoffs. Braves not win the division. make the playoffs minus sixteen hundred. Yeah, the Braves are well that division. I mean, they're yeah, by they far. have to. The Dodgers minus twenty five hundred. Actually, the Astros are relatively low. I guess Yankees are minus two fifty. The Astros are a bigger favorite there. Uh, Phillies are minus 240. So, yeah, the Astros are like the third biggest favorite to make the playoffs. But, man, when you look at teams like, I mean, they they said, sorry, but the Braves are definitely making. How about the Orioles minus 220? I actually think the Orioles are, man, that's a team to watch this year. If they get they get a little spry. They're very Astro-ish. Yep. 2018 They got some Braves vibes to them also. Yeah. They're very Astro-ish. Yeah, and the Braves, too. Yep, 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 yep. Um, now, this is going to be this gonna be a great baseball season. Man, I'm yeah, I'm pumped. Every position. You don't have that Maldonado automatic out. you got Chaz, who's going to be actually in the lineup as opposed to he's going to be in there every day. I don't know what Jake Myers, I don't know you know how they're going to use Dubon, whatever that the case may be, whatever. I, I, I'm really, really high on this baseball team. I'm no, really, I know. Really, I almost don't want to do props because I feel like that's. I feel like everything's an over. With me? Yeah. What do you mean? If we did player season. Okay, go go player prop. Well, I have to. I have to look, and I'm pulling up. I don't know how many they have that are Astros, but. um, All right, I'll I'll make them. Jordan, under over thirty five homers. I'm on. Oh man, that's actually a good number. I'm gonna go. I don't think he's going to have knee hand. Silly. I guess I'll go over. This oh, thank you. What's the most I mean, he's no, ever did had? You even st- instead of, instead of you know putting all your chips a, a snap call, you went. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, I'm trying to think if he'll that's play. E- that's easy. I have to see that's if he'll play. That's the easiest bet on the board. Is it? Let me see what his real number yeah. is. Kyle Tucker. Oh, his real number is 37. Yeah, 37 and a half. Okay. Is his real Kyle Tucker 30 30 this year. Well, let me get to another Jordan for you. Over under RBI is one oh nine and a half. Unders minus one forty. Kyle Tucker actually led the league last year in RBIs, not him. What's well, a lot? That's a lot. Who's of hitting in the two hole? Jordan. You're gonna have some eight and some nine who don't get on base this year. Yeah, or they do, or they well, do. You have to hope they do. Uh, Reggie right. Jackson was working with Pena in his swing this year, this sp- spring. Good. Niall texted me about it. Good. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. Good. You caught your. Kyle Tucker stuff. Here's Kyle Tucker's number. Over, under on home runs. What do you think the number is? 30. 31. 31. Over. 31 and a half. How many steals for Kyle Tucker? They don't have it. 31 and a half. Altuve. uh, Jose Altuve, his total hits is 150 and a half. Over. And then his uh, total. 150 and a half. Yeah. Total. No, go look at him. That's, That's the number. He's not a 200 well, hit guy Dude, anymore. you know, he, he had 150 well. last year. He didn't play a, about his, a third of the season. His new thing is not playing as much. No, he's going to play every day. No, he's not. They don't play him every day. Yeah. Jose Altuve, total home runs, 23 and a half. The under is minus 140. I would go under on that one. Jose Altuve is 23 and a half? Uh-huh. That seems a little high to me. Over. <laughs> you don't mean it. Yes, I do. You wouldn't bet over. Yes, I would. Yes, no. I would. I'm going to do it right now. Yes, yes, I would. Over. Would you? Yeah. Why so, would you go over? So you're, you're, you're dude homers now. Your prediction of him going over on everything seems to be bearing out. Yeah. Well, it's just because these are stupid numbers. Oh, okay. stupid low. Ah, I gotcha. Yeah. I mean, these are stupid low numbers. Stupid low. Yeah. There's no Jeremy Pena numbers. I think those are the. Uh, oh, Bregman. Let's do a Breggy. No, they don't have any Bregman numbers in here. They don't have any Bregman numbers. The, well, not the on future this side. MVP. They don't have his numbers. A top five MVP guy. Well, I'm just saying for individual for individual prop bets, I didn't see that. No, that's stupid. Uh, season long player futures, maybe maybe on this site they'll have it, but I I do think. Oh, by the way, uh, Five Star is going to join us at nine thirty. He needs a big week, and we're going to see if Five Star can deliver the big week. All right, 
for we'll us. Do, we got that at the bottom of the hour. Right now, though, we got to take a quick break. 713-780-3776. Get in. All right, if God could give you one superpower, you could hit you you could hit a hundred on the gun pitching consistently. You could shoot forty percent from three consistently. You could hit three hundred plus yard drives in the fairway consistently. Oh, 
Which one would you take? I mean, you almost it depends on how old you are when you answer this question. Once you get to a certain age, you're taking golf all day. Well, yeah, a 300 yarder down because the pipe you could do that day. for 30, 40 yeah, years, forever. The the shooting thing is great, but if you got a knee issue, a back issue, whatever, like I guess you could just sit around and shoot all day. Now nah, the shooting thing doesn't work because sure you could if you got the shot off you could shoot forty percent, but you're if you're five nine like I am, what does that matter? In NBA, I'm taking the hundred mile an hour fastball. I'll if I could do that, I'm making money and I don't have to play golf. But you have to play baseball uh, better you, than golf. You don't automatically you, play if you can throw 100. Uh, but it helps. You got to cheat. Well, you you got a okay. shot, yeah. Yeah, but you well, listen, you could hit 300-yard drives, but you might suck with your iron. Yeah, I'm taking the 100. But you might not. Listen, 100-mile-an-hour fastball, if you don't have a curve, or if you don't have a changeup, yeah. they're going to no, smoke you. As a closer, the easiest of they're going to smoke you. 100 with movement, I'm taking my chances. Golf's the easiest of all those, right? You don't have in baseball. You've got people. You can throw a hundred, but you have to throw strikes. What does a drive do for you? Unless you're in the long drive I mean, there's competition. There's nobody who's getting you. Well, no, no, no. There's you nobody who's going to hit you. You can actually if work on th- your game at your yeah. pace. You can't putt. It's it's leisurely. It's golf is super easy. Nah, you take baseball. Basketball is hard because now you're right. You can't get shots off. You got to be in shape. You could get knocked down by people. Uh, you could get choked by certain players. Like okay, Draymond. what if you could also throw a Frisbee accurately for 100 yards? What does that do for me? Do I make money doing uh, that? 300 foot is – it's fine. I don't hit 300 feet. I'm, so, I'd like it. Yeah, I'd like that. I'd take that over all of them. <laughs> so st- I mean, that's it's not that's not a superpower. There's lots of people who can throw a lot further than that, but I'd take it. Yeah. <laughs> If you throw a hundred, because I can play gun, frisbee golf for free for the disc golf for free the rest of my life. A hundred on the gun for twenty years equals eight hundred million dollars. Thank you. Not you sure, now. You, sure no. you, have to, you have to work on things. Obviously, you just can't do that. But okay, you got so a real you have shot. To say when you're twenty years old. Yeah. When you're twenty years, let's just say when you're twenty years old. And you're diligent and you work. I'm taking. So you. I'm taking a hundred miles at, at age twenty. I'm taking a hundred miles. A hundred miles. Okay. So in all these scenarios, you are six three and two hundred and fifteen. No, you can't. Pounds. No. Why? No. Why do you have to be six well, we three? Have to, because well, if I'm six three, whatever you said, I'll play basketball because I can. Well, I'm a forty percent shooter. Well, this, but this evens it out. You're at a you're at a pl- you're at a number that no, makes you, sense in all these sports. You are what you are. Whatever you weigh and well, your height not, at twenty. That's not fair. Sure yeah. it is. Whatever you are, your weight and height at then twenty. Then I want to be taking? Rocco Sofredi. The porn star. Did you see that yes. movie Super Sex? Yeah. Did I, you watch I know, it? I know of it. I didn't watch His it. His superpower lasts for a long time. This man just chose to be a porn star, a European no, porn star. No, I just want his superpower. Uh, you said Rocco Sofredi. I know. European. I want to be his superpower. I want to have his superpower. He's what's, got lots of superpowers. What's his superpower? You know what it is. You saw it. <laughs> you, no, I didn't see it. You hey, tell me. You it's tell Italian. me. He's Italian, too, John. You'd like him. I don't you know if I'd it. like him. You saw the show. I'm not going to say. I haven't seen it, actually. What is it? What show? It's called Super Sex. He has sex. He's a porn star who has it's sex a lot. It's not like, he's a real guy. Like, he's a real, it's based loosely on his life. So, uh, yeah, but Rocco Sofredi, it's on Netflix. It is. Yeah, they do things on that show now. <laughs> yeah, there's Let me nudity. tell you something. It is, it, is an, it is an aggressive show. Yeah. There's some scenes. There's some scenes you're like, huh. Huh. That's interesting, so, Rocco. So you'd rather be Rocco than he was Mark- a star, at least in the TV show. You'd rather be Rocco than Mark Wohlers? Uh, the, than John Rocker? Oh well, yeah, he, I'd rather yeah, be Rocco well, than Rocker for sure. He's got some stuff. Rocco some greater stuff. than Rocker. I could do that. I could be, do both things. I could throw it hundred and one, and I could just go to Pound Town. I could do them all, baby. <laughs> what about them people Here. on the subway Where, though? Oh man, those dirty, filthy animals. He got off on that blast. <laughs> I mean, he got off on subway people. Hey, hey, really. John Rocker did not. John Rocker would be, I guarantee you, somewhere he is extremely. Look, I don't like the fact that we have, like, our borders are mean nothing and anyone can get in and blah, blah, blah. I mean, that's not the way it should be. John Rocker would be down there actively with. John Rocker would be handling that himself right now. If. I guarantee he probably lives in a border town right now. Is like actively <laughs> looking into that. That that's what Rocker gives me that vibe. Like, I'm not gonna stand there and just take this while our country goes to crap. I'm gonna get down there and do something about it. You know, John. Strap Rocker. up. We're rolling. 
3776 is the number two. So, well, John, I just like to see some policies change. I don't care about policies. I got my own policy. I change my policy. I got a policy for you. Punk ass. So, any no NFL news other than the uh, the rugby well, guy? No, actually, Malik Neighbors ran a four three five at his pro day, which was anticipated. I truly believe Marvin Harrison Jr. made a calculated risk because he knew that he's not going to run real fast. He's probably going to be in the four four seven range. You know, it's funny to hear all these people start coming around now. And I took all the bullets for having Malik Neighbors over Marvin Harrison Jr. because they hadn't heard that. But now all of a sudden, Adam Schefter came out. Personnel people, as many that believe that Malik Neighbors will be the first wide receiver drafted. So now it's becoming much more Daniel Jeremiah came out and said that. Now after I took a bunch of bullets in the back of the skull for this because people were mad at me that, their narratives weren't, hey, look, Marvin Harrison Jr. could still go first. He didn't work out at all in the postseason. Didn't catch passes, didn't jump high, didn't run, didn't do anything. He, in fact, said, I'm not meeting with anybody. I'm not doing anything. I'm just getting ready for, you know, I, I, well, I think he may have met with teams. But he just said, I'm not working out at all for anybody ever. I'm not preparing for the draft. I'm only preparing for football. And people said, good, his game tape is his stuff. And that's fine. That's his prerogative. But I will tell you. Don't get upset when Malik Neighbors makes more money than you because he actually put it on tape. I mean, he, not only did he put it on tape, but he also worked out, showed people that he was an explosive four-three-five player. He jumped like almost, he's almost a forty-inch vertical right, right there with the long broad jump. He just showed how explosive he was, and uh, so now we don't know if JJ McCarthy is going to be the second pick. Is he going to be the third pick? We don't know where Marvin Harrison Jr. We and now ESPN tried to say this. I think this is just stupid. But they had, do we have a new QB1, Jaden Daniels? Why? Because he threw it his pro day? Like, what What would change? There's no way. I don't think there's any way the Bears would draft Jaden Daniels. I don't think there's any way. Caleb Williams is their guy. No, that's. But who's the second pick? Are we sure that it's Jaden Daniels and not J.J. McCarthy for Kirk Cut for, for uh, your boy, uh, um, Oh, Cliff Kingsbury? Are we sure that he wouldn't go with J.J. McCarthy, who's actually a little, even though he's light, he's not as light as 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 uh, Jaden Daniels. He's younger than Jaden Daniels. He is, um, he's played in a pro style. Excuse system. me. Yes? Before draft season, watching J.J. McCarthy, at any point did you no. think that's a top two quarterback? Never. Never. And yet, here we are. Yeah, it's a tough one because talking it, you know, I can kind of usually ferret out. I can usually sniff out guys who are just getting hot because just a narrative rolls downhill and everyone just keeps pushing. I feel like J.J. McCarthy's stock has been pushed a little extra, not on purpose, just because the group think is rolling downhill. But the problem with that is I've talked to enough people who, like, they just love – his that they think he's a winner they think he's a gamer they think that he gets along great with players on his team and at the combine he was gi- he was really vibing with everyone he reads the field well they think he's you know they love his mobility like i almost feel like they can't find as many holes cuz you can say Jaden Daniels is 190 some odd pounds he's going to get hurt cuz he doesn't slide he always gets hit hard outside the pocket so we can bury him and Drake, Drake May, ooh, tape is gross. Uh, Bo Nix throws a bunch of short passes, didn't look good in the senior bowl. You can start to – and then the fewer things you – but but that's also reminiscent of Daniel Jones, where Daniel Jones, people are like, well, he's a leader. He came from David Cutcliffe's offense, and Cutcliffe coached Eli Manning. He came from – you know, he, he, he basically came from the school of, of Eli Manning. That's who he reminded people of was Eli Manning when he came out. Kind of quiet, but look at Eli – and the fact is, Daniel Jones is not that guy. He's not a great player. Mac Jones got hot in the process. Not that guy. I'm not. This isn't. So maybe JJ's not going to be that guy. I don't want to take. I don't want you to take this as an insult because it's not. But I've noticed people who watch film, it's they remove themselves from game situations. They're just like, okay. Look, he on this play he did this. On this play he did this. Route combinations. Where did he? Yeah. Where did he find the the open guy? Do you remember a moment watching Jason McCarthy in game where you're like? 
he has it. He made he so, wanted he made a drive to a really change the game. Question. And I know one I know of my you're weaknesses, watch- Dell, is I only watch like I watch. Okay, show me all the intermediate show, throws. Show me. I want to see all of the touchdowns. I want to see all the interceptions, and I watch them in groups. You're watching games, and I do think there's something to watching games because you get a feel for the flow of the game. And did a guy become better in the second half? I think that J.J. McCarthy against Alabama, there were moments where you said, okay, he wasn't good in the first half. He really wasn't good in the first quarter. But J.J. McCarthy got better and got more comfortable in the game. I think that that was one of the ones. But they didn't – I mean, they faced some adversity. They faced some adversity. But even in games where they were le- tight games like in, against Penn State, they just ran the ball. They were to hand the ball yeah. up, play defense, and win. They didn't say, hey, J.J., go out, go I don't out and know get us a he, win. Yeah, I don't know that they have put him in – look, he benefits from not – being in those situations because you don't have negative like I'm looking at like I can't find them. I don't yeah. I don't see enough of it. I just find, other people say I don't see that I don't see that he can't. I just find it interesting that we talk about the best players, quarterbacks in the game. We laud Pat Mahomes. Obviously he's got all he's got the skill to be able to throw the football, but what he does when it matters. That's what he that's the superpower he has currently. That's what we, that's what Joe, that's what uh, <laughs> CJ Stroud has. Even even as we take shots to Joe Burrow on this show because we think it's funny, Joe Burrow does Show up and play when it matters and makes plays. But, you but, that, but in college, did we see that out of Pat Mahomes? He, well, his defense no. was terrible. Sure, but we did. Yeah, but but Pat but, Mahomes, but he had it. Everybody was He had it in that, his heart. No, and he had all of the. Th- he he had all of the ability. He had all of the he throws. Had the but Pat he had, he had he, moments, yeah. and he had unbelievable t- arm talent. But he's got unbelievable arm talent. But so did Jay Cutler. It's it's the it's the intangibles that make you and special. Pat Mahomes was, Joe Burrow has intangibles. Yeah. Josh Allen has intangibles. Lamar has intangibles. Like, all these guys have certain intangibles maybe that are different. And and the one thing I hear about him all the time is intangibles on J.J. McCarthy. I'm with you. I was started with a second-round grade. I'm up to, like, borderline one, two on him. I get why people are excited. I just can't I can't see it. I can't see top five. But it doesn't mean I don't think he's going top five. I think he is. I think he's going top three. But I, I just... I don't know. I didn't see it with Daniel Jones, and I think I was proven right on that. I didn't see it with Mac Jones, but I also didn't see it with Josh Allen, and Josh Allen's been really good. All right, we got to break it. And well, one of the reasons was he played at my own Wyoming, though. That yeah, was, and, yeah, and that's you know. But do you hold that against? But look at Michigan. I mean, they had everything good. How does he handle adversity? You can see a lot of adversity for. And JJ McCarthy hadn't had to put a team on his shoulders. Yeah, right. No, yeah. CJ Stroud did against Georgia and balled the freak out. All right. I uh, got my shipment of oh. the Texas pecan. Oh, shipment. I said shipment. Okay. I got my shipment of the Texas pecan. And my wife was like, so I got a box at the door. I ordered it online, 975coffee.com. My free rain coffee came in from the free rain company, free rain coffee company. It, it, it was great. And I opened a box, and here's a box of Texas pecan. Wait, here's another box of Texas pecan. Wait, here's another box of Texas pecan. I ordered four boxes of Texas pecan because you know why? Because that's my favorite coffee ever. It can be your favorite coffee too. Now, you might like the American Dirt, the Homestead, the Mistino, whatever it, whatever it is. Get up and get after it. 25 years plus now, they've been doing, and out of San Angelo, this is America coffee. This is Texas coffee. Full bodied. It's ripped. From Yellowstone Coffee, smooth, un- un- unbeatable smooth coffee, full, rich flavor. That's what it is. And it just is, uh, to me, the best coffee I've ever had, and it will be for you too. 975coffee.com. Put in ESPN20 for 20% off site-wide, whatever it is that you want to buy. I got the pods. You can get the beans. You can get it uh, already ground, whatever you want. 975coffee.com, ESPN20 for 20% off for free rain coffee.
You are listening to Houston's longest-running sports radio morning show. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's John and Lance. Did you see an S. Sainz is in town going to the Astros game? An attractive woman is going to the Astros game? Is that the report? She put out a tweet. Her friend surprised her with tickets. What's that yeah. do for me? Well, I was just wonder if you were going to the game now. No, I'm not. And not, particularly because an attractive woman is going to the game, okay, that happens all the time. Yeah. She's changed over the years. She's gotten skinnier. Not great. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Everything's got to be about that. What? How about she's just, doesn't she work in media? No one knows. Well, I think she does. Hold well, I'm, no, she wasn't she a weather girl on television? Yeah. No, that's a, she was yeah, a Mexican I weather guess girl. a long time ago, but now she yeah. is. Now she works as a sports reporter. Yeah, that's her job. And I don't think it it affects her job whether she's gotten skinnier. How did yeah. she? She's 45 now. Is she 45? Yeah, she's been around. Wow, she's been around for a long time. She's long still, time. She's, still, she's right. still what? Four kids. She's still got it going. She's At, got four kids? Yeah. Really? Still married to Hector Rojano. She Good married for in her. 1998. Good for her. She's been married almost 30 years. Well, I mean, 26. But wow. That or is 24, I should Good say. for her. No, 26, 26. Still married. Uh, doing yeah. sports reports. Mm -hmm. She's in Houston today. Great, I That's guess. That's awesome. I thought you would go to the game now. Are you, aren't you going to the game? Hey, let's I'm look not at her going Instagram. to the game. No, I'm not going to the game. I want to watch. Let's I got, see what we the got, Instagram looks like. This is a huge thing. You got golf to watch? That's why you're not going? She looks look classy. You know what she is? She's Hello. classy. She is classy. She is classy. Yeah. Yeah. She's got a classy look, unlike Dell's Ice Spice. That's your Ice Spice. I don't ever talk about Ice Spice. I know, you but do. I just like putting you on Ice Why? Spice. Why? That's your girl. Know, it's kind of fun. You're obsessed. No. Uh, you talk about her a lot. I think she's yucky, and she's a terrible <laughs> rapper. I think she's yucky. You you love Ice Spice. That was zesty, you talk about her all it? the time. Yeah, it's a little zesty on your part. <laughs> <laughs> she's yucky? I think Ew. she's yucky. She is yucky, that Ice Spice. I don't prefer Ice Spice, and I definitely don't prefer her verb. I don't prefer her lyrics. Which female rapper honest. do you prefer? Female rapper? The Brat? No, MTS. Megan Thee Stallion? Yeah. I'm team MTS, obviously. She's yeah. a Houston girl. She's Houston. Did yeah. you s You know who else? You sent a picture out of her yesterday. Yeah. That was an older picture, 2018. That was... I didn't even... I, are you sure that's her? 100%. Yeah. There's a picture. It's just she was at this dance studio. I don't know that she went there thinking she was gonna get a picture taken, but she was there with some of her dancers in that picture. And uh, yeah, because uh, my daughter goes to a dance studio, and there's a picture of Drake there from 2017. That was Megan in 2018. 2008. Wow, uh -huh. she has transformed her body in a big way. What well, she did? I'm not talking about that. No, she's. Di oh, listen. That it couldn't even recognize that that was her for that same that same yeah, person. Yeah, she wasn't made up. She was just in some shorts, had her hair braided. She wasn't. I don't think she had makeup on. I don't think she went there thinking, okay, it's picture day. Now let's okay. You, we can't say what say, you want to say. No, that she she's lost a lot of weight since then. Yeah, she has. Yes, a lot of weight. Well, I think she just just and changed her body. I yeah, guess. she changed her body type. Is that okay to say? Okay, uh, yeah, it's okay I mean, to say. You can get in trouble for it. Adele got in trouble. Why? Because she she lost weight. She lost weight. If you if you get, you get in trouble for losing weight, yes, because you're not proud. You're you're I, shaming other women by getting healthier. Yes, yes. She took a lot. So of if heat. we lose weight now, we get sh it's well, bad. Well, only if it's you're, bad for oh, us that we're healthier. If you're a bigger, if, if you're, you're an icon big, who's yeah, a if bigger, you're a bigger girl, girl, icon, I guess an iconic. No one cares well, if because you lose it's weight. It, wait, it's better. It's bad not because men. you're healthier people, now. She, she it's not as hard on she, your heart. She, I guess she represented big girls in a great way, and she lost weight and didn't mm. tell them about it. I don't know. I'm supposed to be supposed Kelly to Clarkson lost great. weight. Is that a bad? This shit bad. Ask the girls who think it is. I don't know. I don't want to get into that logic. So she's healthier now. It's bad. Okay. Maybe I don't know. Okay. Here's an Ines, Here's a Ines signs picture that I think you're gonna like. Why don't you describe it right here? Hold on. Oh. Why don't you describe? You I don't. Say? I'm not gonna describe anything about Ines signs. Um, is that the NFL's computer? Is it? I'm just looking at her Instagram page. She just. Oh, she likes to play golf. That's awesome. Yeah, she's just a golfer. That's all, Dell. Yeah, that's all. And she likes to report weather, and she likes to report sports. Thank you. And she's Latina. What's the Ooh. big deal? Can we, can we not just appreciate people who do good work? 
Thank is that you. why this segment was how this started? Because of her good work? Yeah, she does good works. She does do good works. And There's no question. If you're concerned about a woman who does good work, she'll be at the Astros game, apparently. So yeah. Get excited about that. Yeah, we're excited. We are excited. You know what we're excited about? Five star coming our way next. You know why? Because he's going to give us winners. Rubia. We need we winners. Them. Winner, winner, chicken. Oh, I was watching. Do you see the Rockets game with John Daspa's commercial with the baseball team? I did, the Cougs yeah. baseball he team? did Cougs baseball. Yeah. And that's Sean that was too. neat. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's a really good commercial, too. Yeah, it they is. did a really good one. I think he did one with Texas baseball, too, I believe. But Cougs baseball was fantastic. Yeah. I'm trying to get him to that do something. That field is pretty cool with it the is red. A cool field. And yeah, yeah, the whole thing is Astros. I, li- I like that. Is this a John Daspit spot? It is. Good. Because John Daspit is, so we can flow right into it. Yeah, he does uh, get involved with, with his schools. He went to University of. Texas did two got two degrees there and then got a law degree at University of Houston. Worked at Fulbright Jaworski. He went to high school here. Like he's Houston. He, he has a house here out in Richmond. Um, I mean, my man is is about the city of Houston, but he also is about you know everyone around the state and even outside of the state in different states where he's got offices. He wants to make sure the people who have been badly injured have somebody who is fighting for them, somebody who is a voice for them. Because what happens, let, let me tell you what happens. When you get va- badly injured, you immediately start thinking, oh, my gosh, i got to go to the doctor. i got to go get x-rays. How am I going to pay for this? Some people don't even go get x-rays. They don't even go see doctors because they say, I don't have insurance. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. What you're supposed to do is call John Daspit right away, 713-CALL-NOW. They will start the process of getting you to the doctors, getting you looked at. They'll pay for you know the x-rays, the MRIs. If you've been badly injured, they can take care of that, help you along the way with, you know, if, you, if you're missing work because you're injured and you can't go work, that happens a lot. If you are dealing with uh, physical therapy you have to get through, the insurance companies need to pay for all of this and on top of that pay for your pain and suffering because that's what they're there for. If you've been caused, if you've been caused, injury by someone else's negligence, whether it's at work, on the roadways, in the water, wherever it may be, John Daspit wants to make sure that not a penny comes out of your pocket and you are compensated for your uh, pain and your suffering because for some people that's going to last a lifetime, unfortunately. John Daspit and the Daspit Law Firm, doing it the right way. Call 713-CALL-NOW or go to DaspitLaw.com.
You're back in the Veritex Community Bank Studios with John and Lance. On ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. 932 ESPN. ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Someone three, someone eight oh three seven seven. Oh wait, five stars with us here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. I don't have my phone with me, so I don't have any idea who you're going with this week, Five Star. But I got <coughs> I got news. We got the Sweet 16 here. We got, you, you don't do baseball betting, do you? Five Star? I don't hear him. I don't hear him either. Five no. Star, are you there? Turn your mute off. Oh, well. No five star. You want to redo it? You want to call him back? And see, he see calls we, us. He calls us. Call us back, five star. We can't hear you. Hang up. All right. We'll figure, you got to figure that out. It ain't us, okay? I know, y'all. Ooh, big feature. Uh, uh, that ain't us. That ain't on us. There, for whatever reason. Our phones have worked, right? They're working. Today yeah, they were? Work. Yes. And okay. He was... One in a row. We hit one in a row. And it's been four straight days. No, actually, we've been... We're pretty good. Tech... Phones. Technologically, we've been pretty good lately. Let's brag about our phones working. Yeah. He's a hole. Um, let's get him in here. Hey, Five Star, you there? Yeah, I apologize, guys. That wasn't on you guys. I stood up there and hit the mute button. And that's, what <laughs> that's what I that's said. That's what I said. That's on me, guys. I was sitting there like, hello, hello, hello. Then I looked down and said, damn, I might hit the mute button. Sorry about that. Okay. Do you bet on baseball or no? Yes, of course I do. I love betting baseball, but I will not be betting it uh, today. Today I'll be just viewing, making notes all week. I, you know, every year of baseball is different, like all of these sports. But you got to see um, who's really who this year, you know, how, how teams are working, the chemistry, the new managers, you know. So it's always a team that rises up and plays better um, than expected. But I'm very excited to see the Astros uh, this year on the new skipper and uh, see how those guys perform. So you don't bet, um, you don't make uh, un- under over season bets. I didn't this year. Sometimes yeah. I do. Before in the past, I, I the, the Astros were a little bit more known commodity, so I've taken them to win the AL West. Um, before I've taken them on the over on the wins, of course, to win the World Series. Uh, this year I didn't. Uh, this year I'm just going to jump in mid season. Uh, because as you saw last year, really the value for the Astros was best during this season when they had that little losing streak and they kind of got down a little bit. That was the highest number they got. Preseason, everyone knows that the Strolls are going to be good always, every year. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm telling you, over 92 and a half, bro. Go get it. Go get it now while you can. That feels a lot. Hey, but... Every time you tell me these type of things, John, you're always on the money. So I definitely think Don't I'll go put in at least, at least a one-unit ticket. I've um, given him a couple. Time. I've given him a few winners over the last few weeks. Uh, John's and, pretty sharp, man. John's pretty good, man. He, he's underrated at bidding. Um. So okay, do you like our Cougs this weekend or no? Definitely, I'm definitely on the Cougs. There's no way that I'm uh, going to face them. I love the fact that Duke played so well um, last game. They shot lights out first half, but guys, still at the end of the day, I know that everyone loves. Uh, James Madison, but it's still James Madison. This is the Cougs. You got grown men uh, on a mission who played bad and almost, you know, lost their tournament lives. Uh, Jamal Shedd, that was almost the last game he ever played um, last week against the uh, a and He's not going to uh, take this one lightly. Those guys are going to come with mash mode. You got uh, grown men against uh, painted fingernails. So we're going with the Cougs. I like the Cougs, man. I like the Cougs a lot. I think, I think the Cougs run off on this one, man. I think the Duke is too young. They face the type of situation that Kentucky did with a bunch of kids, and when the pressure's on, they're not used to dealing with this. This isn't high school anymore, so we're going all the way uh, with Houston. We got a great angle with the fact that they didn't play well last game and almost blew the end of the game. Yeah, I think, you know, so Kelvin Sampson having several days to prepare for an opponent, to me, for Duke, is something that's very favorable. Um you know, he's going to try to take away. I mean, he doesn't go to the Bill Belichick school of just taking away your best option. He wants to take away everything from you. What What can yeah. you tell us about the pressure that Duke has faced in terms of defensive pressure in the ACC? Do, do you have a comparable type of team that you can look at when you look at a matchup of, of two teams once you get in a tournament? Do you ever do you ever go through the scour the, 
the the game log and try to find a similar type of team that they've played? Well, they really haven't played a team with the type of intensity. I didn't think so, yeah. Uh, and the way, maybe NC State, you know, and NC State fared really well against them this season. So uh, I'd say NC State was probably the closest as far as, in, uh, you know, man-to-man defense that they faced because Kevin Keats kind of comes from the school of Kelvin Sampson with the pressure and the man-to-man. And if you saw they were able to take um, this game completely away from them because they got under the shooters. And that's the same thing that Houston's going to do. They're going to take away the three. And they're going to make some drive and finish at the rim, and I don't think that they can. Virginia wasn't very talented, but Virginia plays that kind of defense too. You know, Yeah, but... they, and they were down a little bit this year. Not yeah. as much uh, lateral speed on the wings that they've had in, in the past, man. So, no, yeah, right. but they do play good D, though. Yeah, the Virginia usually, usually this year notwithstanding. All right, so what else we got this weekend? Uh, first, we're going to start with Arizona. We're going to take Arizona and lay the minus seven against Clemson. I think that Clemson uh, played a little bit over their heads. You know, I gave you guys as a future last week, uh, Arizona to win the West at plus 195. So I still have that alive, and now it's a lot of value on it. Um, their favorite to win that uh, side of the bracket. I just think that they're too talented. I think that um, at the end of the day, Clemson picked out last week when they upset Baylor, man. So. Uh, we're going to go with the better team. Arizona is completely loaded. We're also rolling with Illinois tonight. Money line plus 105. I know Iowa State's a good team. They beat our Cougs. But when you're dealing with Illinois, just like the Cougs, you're dealing with grown men. Terrence Shannon is on a mission. He has a, a lot of help with Marcus Domas, great coach, uh, and Coach Underwood, who uh, you know really did his thing at SFA. And uh, now he's getting a chance to do it at a big stage. He's an old-school coach, and I think that – uh, those guys are peaking at the right time. That's another team we also had. I gave them out to you guys at plus 700 uh, to grab the future to win the East. So now you're in a position where you can start hedging on them. Uh, also on the UConn game tonight, I lean UConn, but I'm not going to give an official play. I like Tristan Newton, though, to go over 14 and a half points. I think that's a give me. He scored 19 against San Diego State last year. But since his first team All-American, he's the engine uh, that really makes UConn go, guys. So I'll definitely be on Tristan Newton to go over 14 and a half points uh, for UConn. And then uh, lastly, we're going to go with Creighton. Another future I gave out. I gave out Creighton uh, plus 400 to win the West last week. They're still in it. Uh, They had a (laughs) down-to-the-wire game last week. It was really a nail-biter, but they survived. Now they take on Tennessee. We know Rick Barnes' history uh, in the Sweet 16. He has not been good, and I think that Creighton uh, for sure gets the plus three, but I also let them put in the win money line as well. To win the Midwest. Yeah, I got Creighton in my Final Four as well. Uh, yeah, I like all of those. Yeah, how is – Iowa State is really good, but Illinois can – they can fill it up, man. They really can fill it up. That is going to be – I think that's a really interesting game, Illinois and Iowa State. That That's going to be the best game tonight because the, both of those teams are peaking at the right time, but I do think um, that Illinois has just a little bit too much that's going to put them over the edge. Um, Iowa State plays great defense, but you're not going to, you know, stop uh, Terrence Shannon. And the difference that Iowa State has had on everyone else that they play is they had an advantage uh, in the guard position. They don't have an advantage uh, this game uh, against uh, Illinois, man. I think the Illinois is a very deep team, very talented team. The most important is senior-led. It's a lot of veterans there. And I think that Terrence Shannon is on a mission, man. I also like him to go over 21 and a half points. Uh, if you guys see that prop, he scored 28 points. He's averaged 27 points the last 14 games since he's returned. <laughs> he's been stealing it up in the NCAA. He's averaging like 30 points a game in the last three games in the NCAA. Do you uh, you got Arizona in your Final Four? Definitely. Yeah, I got him at plus 195. I think that they beat uh, North Carolina or uh, who's it, or Alabama. Alabama's getting a short number on that game, so people better be careful on that one because it seems like they're begging you uh, to take North Carolina. And it shows you how people – how, how how these teams just get on runs and, you know, it's all about momentum. Alabama was not playing good coming into the tournament. Uh, they get a, some good matchups, uh, some upsets happen where they kind of get their confidence back. And now the books only had them at four and a half against North Carolina. That seems like a really short number, but Alabama can fill it up. Uh, they're the highest scoring team in the country besides Arizona. Them and Arizona are the highest scoring teams left. So I like Arizona's offense, but Alabama has offense too. So if you're leaning North Carolina, be careful on that one. Marcus Steers is uh, one to look at, too, uh, for over on his points. He'll, I think it's 22 and a half. He's been filling it up for Alabama. Yeah. And that Marquette-NC uh, State game, 
You didn't put out a play. You you didn't put out a play on that, did you? No, I'm gonna have to watch. You remember, guys, I gave out NC State. I get a beautiful head spot if NC State upsets Marquette because remember I gave out last week. Them as my dark horse, so I put a ticket on them at plus thirteen hundred, and then I have UH at plus one thirty to win the South. So if they face each other, I'm in a golden position. You know, I could just root for my guys, and if they get upset, I made a bag. So um, yeah, I'm in a good position with them. I hope that they upset them, but you got to watch Shock Smart. Really talented team. Tyler Colick is back for Marquette, yeah. and that kid can go, man. He makes the offense so efficient, and then you forget about Cam Jones. Cam Jones is probably the most pro-ready guy on that team. Cam Jones, was, it was interesting. He wasn't very good in the in their last game. He was great in the first game and then just kind of disappeared. But Colick, holy crap, yeah, he can play. I think that's what he's getting adjusted to. He has to get back to the role of getting off the ball. You know, Cam Jones is naturally a point guard himself. Colick's a point guard, but when they're together – Cam gets off the ball and goes to the wing. Now the last, what, two or three weeks since Cole has been out with that oblique injury, he's been having to, you know, run the offense. He's just adjusting. He's a hell of a player. He, they'll get it together. That's a great backcourt right there. Yeah. Oh, that's one. That's one. I hope NC State does win because I don't want to. I don't want the Cougs facing Marquette. I just don't. I just don't. I, yeah, I think that'll be a, a down to the wire game, man. You shock a smart, the hell of a coach in March and. They are a deep team, man. It isn't just those two that we named. They got players everywhere, and they really match up well against Houston because they really are kind of like similar teams. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's uh, that's a scary, that's a scary match. All, all these teams got to get past Duke first, but it, that's a that's a big number. That what is it? Seven? What are, what are the Cougs? Four. The four. Only four. four. Oh, it's four. Yeah. It's lovely, and everybody likes Duke because what happened is Duke plays so well against James Madison, man. Everybody buying into it and the type of game that uh, their backcourt had last week, they're not going the Cougs are not gonna allow them to go off like that, man. Stop it. They're, they like to shoot. They want to shoot. They're two guards, two freshmen, outstanding all Americans. One of them came from Australia and uh, the other one was one of uh, McCain, he has a twin brother, they both can go. So you got McCain, you got Tyrese Proctor. They're both lights out shooters. Both of them are gonna play in the NBA, man. They're really good players. Got to make them put the ball on the floor. They don't want to do that. Run them into J. Juan Roberts, and they're going to have problems. They just want to stand out there and shoot, man. That's what they want to do, and I don't think the Cougs are going to let them. There it is. It's Five Star in Vegas. At Five Star in Vegas, follow him. Get his picks. Uh, you putting them, What are you putting out there this week? I mean, you got a, another podcast or anything going on? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll have the Wave from World up uh, today. Uh, we'll do one this evening. We'll post it. It'll be on uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all those different podcast platforms, as well as on YouTube. And I'll be back over there with you guys on football season. I already set everything up where I'll be back there in the fall. So I'll be back on 97.5 in the fall. But for, you know, basketball season, off season, we're just doing a podcast. Wagering World. Find it. Podcast. Get your get all your picks. Hey, man, we appreciate it. As always, five-star. Great Good stuff. Good luck this weekend. I appreciate you guys. Best of luck. All right, there's five star in Vegas right here, ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. And you know where you bet them? You bet them at mybookie.ag. He just gave you the picks. So what are you going to do with them? What you're going to do with them, you're going to take them to mybookie.ag, promo code BET975. It's the place to play, win, and get paid. He just gave you the winners. Where are you going to play? Okay, so the best thing about this is if you've never been on MyBookie before, you put in $200, they're going to give you an extra $100 to play with. You put in five hundred to give you seven fifty to play with. You put in a thousand, they're gonna give you fifteen hundred to play with. Your your local bookie he ain't doing that. He ain't, he just ain't doing it. What you're gonna get at my bookie is the best way to play, win, and get paid. Please, please, I need y'all to get on and get get these winners. Get these winners from 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 five star right now and and get to mybookie.ag promo code bet nine seven five.
Go to the website, LandZCars.com, and start your car buying experience. Nothing could be easier than going to a website. I mean, you're doing it anyway. You can do it in your phone. You can do it on your phone. You can do it on your laptop, at home, wherever you have a computer. And the first thing you're going to find <clears throat> is you're going to start seeing all the great offers on the 2024 Chevy Blazer, uh, the electric vehicle, and, or the, rather the EVLT uh, all-wheel drive, $469 a month. That's one of the offers that they have going for you. Right now, you can start chatting with somebody on the digital side to start working on price, start working on trade-in value, and it could be for a brand-new Chevy Silverado truck with 0.9% APR financing available for well-qualified buyers. You could get a $1,500 total cash allowance on a 2024 Chevy Equinox, and if you love the GMC Sierra pickup truck because it's got that cool grill and it's just really, a, I think it looks phenomenal. 1.9% APR financing for 72 months. These are just some of the uh, opportunities that you have. And let me throw in this one because my son just got one. this one. 0.9% APR financing on the 2023 Buick Envision all-wheel drive. This is brand new. My, we didn't even have this when we got his Buick Envision just three weeks ago. And this is something that's available right now. So you can view, offer uh, on the website or talk to the dealer about that. It's all at LanceZCars.com. That's LanceZCars.com. Uh, a Nigerian woman reviewed some tomato puree online, and now she faces jail. Dell. Wait, 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 wait. Well, if this was a story about Italy, I'd ask me. If it was a story about Germany, I'd ask him. But I've never been to Nigeria. What but you have a Nigerian descent. I am. Yeah, and I've I've been to Italy. Yeah. But... but I'm I'm, a, I'm a, of Italian descent. You just think, oh, yeah, it's gonna be. Of course, I'm asking you about Nigeria. I'm not gonna ask him. Why not? He because he's not Nigerian. He but I watched if it was about him, or I'd ask him. I watched Olajuwon. What? Okay. What? <laughs> what? I don't know anything about that man other than what I learned okay. in school. Okay. No, you have. It, you Get have, your answer from him. No. Ask him your question. <laughs> no. I Ask him your question. I'm actually interested to see what the question is now. Go on. Okay, why are, in Nigeria, why can't you review an online tomato, a pure a puree online, and go to prison for it? I don't know the laws of the land there. Like I said, I've uh, never been. All right, Did well, she step out of line? Well, she said, apparently, that it's killing people. And that's not... Help me advise your brother to stop killing people with his product. Yesterday was my first oh, time well, of using yeah. it. It's pure sugar. Oh, she attacked a local business. Yeah. Put her in jail. Okay. Yeah. She faces prison. We don't play that. I mean. <laughs> a deceased man's body was found in New York water supply after 25 days. Authorities declare water safe for consumption. Do you want to drink dead guy water? I mean, how long does it take to purify the water from of the dead guy? Well, no, it's... Well, I, it, it's just he's got his body in there for 25 days decomposing, and you're going to drink that water? Well, if they clean it. How, well, I don't know how they clean are it. Are you off forever? not sure that they're going to clean it. Once somebody's dead in the water for 25 days, are you done with that water forever? <sighs> Do you want to drink it? No, but they can Honestly, end up bottling it. I'm telling you Frank know. you don't drink any water. That's it. You can end up bottling it and you don't know? Yeah. And all of a sudden, you're drinking bottled drink. Well, I, if I don't know, I mean, there's a lot yeah. of people, things people can do. Yeah, yeah. No, I. I'd Ooh, not there's know. a really bad story about an ice cream guy who. <sighs> Ooh, you. John He's Bernardo's in India. Sure. He's in India, and let's just say he added some stuff to the ice oh, cream. Oh boy. Well, I just don't. And want, what happened to him? I don't want any of that. Well, he went dirty, to prison. Filthy. Yeah, he's dirty and filthy. Yeah. Yeah. He's dirty and Why filthy. Why did we do that? That is dirty and filthy. Can you just Is it supposed to be lactose-free? And so you just, hmm. well, like, what are I we doing? I don't know, adding that? his lactose to it. No, no. See, you didn't have to. Yeah. I just <laughs> skated on it. He was arrested. You didn't have to. He was arrested. Thank goodness. I just, my, the moral of the story, don't buy any ice cream in India. No water, no ice cream. No <laughs> water in New York, no ice cream. I heard okay. their water is the reason their pizza is so good. Yeah, and the bagels. That's what everyone says. That's what they say. Because of the water? Yeah, the dough, New York yeah. water. Dead water. guy water? Apparently. People ship it down to, you think this is the first dead guy in a water supply in New York? Yeah. You think this is their first dead guy? Okay, now I'm asking uh, Lance about this one. 
Okay. Is it Hitler related? Well, is it related to a Cornwall, a Cornish pub? Okay. Cornwall is that Ireland or England? It's one of them. I believe it's the UK. It's where I I think it's England. Cornwall. It's it's Cornwall. I have some. I have. I have some English. Well, the pub of the year was named Pub of the Year in Cornwall. Yeah. But they lost the award due to Nazi memorabilia display. So you can't do that. What are you talking about? No, you can't do that. You can't put Nazi memorabilia. So I'm asking Lance about this. Okay. What's the question? The the question is. Yeah, what's the question? I just want to know, do you have any. (laughs) No, no, I don't. (laughs) You thought of the worst question you could ask. Displays. Yourself? No. 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 For showing people, your f- familiar ha- I heritage? Think the question, my people your were, German heritage? My people were long gone. Bavaria, sure. they were long gone. Yeah, to Ger- to to Argentina or Brazil. Um, yeah, the, Germany's had some mix of. They got out of there a while. They could already see this. The question this, is, this country's Lance, not right. If you were, get, if you were given a, an award and someone did some research on your home, would they have to take it away because of stuff on your wall? Yeah. Yeah, no. My no. wall's good. Pictures of a bunch of kids. You know, yeah, they wouldn't. No that, one wants that. There's some of those yucky. story, no one storybook wants people or whatever. We have some of that. My wife just got a Liz Fair concert uh, and a Wilco concert posters that are they're hanging up. Oh, that's, oh, that's not, not enough. That's not gonna. That's yeah. not gonna do it. Not no, typically, no swastikas or anything no. like that. Good. No. Good. No. A, a uniform? <laughs> nothing. <laughs> nothing. Like a Stoppo <laughs> leather jacket? Nothing. No, so this nothing. is not the gentleman. Seven Eleven announces a hot dog flavored sparkling water. Y'all want some? No. Why are we doing no. hot dog water? Hot dog again? water? What? That's hot terrible. dog flavored sparkling water. No, that hot dog water. I worked at a hot dog stand. <sighs> you did? Yeah, and yeah, in Buckingham uh, Park in Chicago. One of my first jobs. That hot dog. There is the hot dogs were green and the water was awful. Well, that's worse than here, dead guy water. Here, you want your hot? You put mustard on it. I can't even see the green hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> was it? Wait. I'm not surprised by this, to be oh, to, and, honestly. Oh, yeah. When I told the guy, hey, these hot dogs, are, just sell them. I Shut thought, up and sell them. Oh, so it wasn't your side business. You were actually working for somebody. No, I was working for somebody. Okay. Yeah. No, no, no. It, it wasn't, wasn't a side hustle where you're just showing up with hot dogs that you no. old hot dogs you bought that were discounted at the grocery store? Just sell the hot No, it was not my business. It was it's somebody else's. a pretty good business. John got there. was like, it. are we sure about this? And the guy was like, shut up. Just do it. Just do it. Shut up and do it. A possible moonshine cave was discovered at a North North Carolina NASCAR track. I mean, is this okay? Was it obvious that there would be a moonshine yeah, cave? It's one of the places at a, I, at, a, at, a, at a at a North Carolina NASCAR well, track. Well, I don't know if it's obvious, but it's not like it's not something oh, that you're going to bat an eye at. Me. Is that you're going to bat an eye at it? No, no. Of course there was. Of course there was a a moonshine cave. At a North Carolina NASCAR track. I mean, please, child, That's please. not even news. That's not even news. That's not weird. It's not weird Why is it news. in news of the weird? Uh, it, it's an assumption on my part. No one knows why that is. Uh, a man was put in a coma with a 4% survival chance thanks to an ingrown groin hair. What? Ingrown groin hair almost killed him. How? Well, Damn I mean, near killed him. Obviously... <laughs> Yeah. Wrecked him. <laughs> obviously. Wrecked him. Wrecked him. Damn near killed him. <laughs> right. So obviously that was some type of infection. Yeah. Yes. It, it turned was, into an infection. Yes. And sepsis. Boy, you and, can't go oh, down that, like that. No. You can't go down by He went into brain. septic shock. Uh, oh, my God. Caught a rare bacteria. It was rag- ravaging through his body. So uh, please do not. I guess he tried to remove it himself. He rem- tried to remove an ingrown hair from his groin. Do you guys want to remove ingrown hairs from your groin? No. I'd rather not have them to begin with. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Hey, clean yourself up. Hey, maybe you brought this on yourself, that sir. That might have been. you dirty and salty, <laughs> and you're trying to pick ingrown hairs. Maybe avoid it altogether. Well, dirty, filthy. <laughs> We're done. There All was right. some dirty, filthy stuff in that one. Mopey and Mapes next. Oh, the guys, all the boys are at decoy today, right? They yeah. are from 12 to 6. Go Get on over there to decoy. Watch your games. Watch the Astros have a big time over at decoy in uh, Spring Branch. It's in Spring Branch. We're done. Mopey and Mapes next. Have a great day, everybody.
Welcome into the show. And obviously, well, maybe not so obvious to a lot of you, but the man of the moment, the man of the la- the last month, did it again. Like, I'm watching the Rockets play, and I'm always someone who will throw in a caveat because I never want to jump to a particular thought or line of thinking over a sh- over a short span of games because don't be small sample guys. That's one of my things. But you look at what the Rockets are right now and why they're playing so well. There, there are multiple factors. A lot of guys playing well. I'm in Thompson in in his role as your 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 foreman as in the dunker spot. The guy his ability to find ways off of other people's playmaking to to score and even he did he made a nice turnaround jumper off the dribble in the mid-range that I said, okay, that that's something I haven't seen a lot from him considering where he operates. So he's certainly been a part of it. We can get into other guys and their contributions, but watching Jalen Green play in this stretch, it's like, okay, th- he's one of those. One of those guys where you, you can legitimately build a contender around be- – and it's about his ability to score. And not just that now. You watch his playmaking late in that game, getting Jabari Smith shots, getting other shots. I watched def- I watched defenses, particularly OKC's last night, try to try to trap him late because they knew they couldn't stay in front of him. Lou Dort is supposed to be one of the best defenders, perimeter defenders in the game. He had no no shot. Just his ability to operate in space kind of changes the Rockets' trajectory, have we seen. And here's my caveat that we all have to throw in. If he can find the consistency to do this over the course of a season, throw in the whole when Shingun comes back, all the things that will be part of the, the discussion, no matter what happens the rock to the Rocks the rest of the way, because the questions will be asked, the questions will have to be answered, what do they do with these guys? But for what we've seen, at 22 years old, like I've made the comparison to, well, when we're talking about a star at 22, look at Anthony Edwards, and he had a remarkable, he had a remarkable move last night. Where it's not, I'm gonna put John Collins through the rim. It was, it was footwork. It was the fundamentals. Anthony Edwards is still one of one of one of one probably. But you look at what Jalen Green's done the last month, and you're like, okay, how far apart are they really? And the the, the difference between the two is, Anthony Edwards at his best can be a, the number one guy on a one seed. Right now, because of the Rocket situation and the struggles early, we're trying to hope and pray that the state of Florida can help you out. And the state of Florida did the Rockets no favors the last two nights. Like, like think about it. The Rockets going to OKC, coming off how hot they've been, and going to OKC and win a ball game. And you're thinking to yourself, hey, the Warriors are going into Miami Sure, they're undermanned, but they'll have Jimmy Butler. And then they'll go into Orlando on the second night of a back-to-back. And the Magic have played well. They're fighting for a 4-5 or five seed. We'll get help in some way, shape, or form. And despite, you know, that bond that we have with the state of Florida, the no, income, the no state income tax, you know, that keeps us thinking we're, we're just like them. Facetiously, I'm saying that. The state of Florida said, nah, nah. That's just how the NBA is. You can't ever count on anything. And it was was a remarkable night in the NBA. Kelly Oubre is my favorite player in the world right now because of, because of what happened late in their game against the Clippers and what he said to ref, the referees. We'll get into that at some point. There was some controversy regarding the Warriors and Draymond Green's actions. You, Nurkic just may be the smartest man in the world. <laughs> We're going to play some sound he said, uh, he, he said about Draymond earlier. And tell me if it's not dead on. Because the man outside of predicting he was going to hit someone again, he also said Draymond needed some something. And Draymond k- kind of pushed back on it because how dare Nurkic diagnose him? Well, nothing since that point has suggested that Nurkic is wrong. But but I digress. We'll hear from Jalen Green about the celebration of the Rockets, them winning ball games, how the poise they had in overtime, and that's what I want to stick with. I'm in Thompson fouls Jalen Williams, one of the two Jalen Williams on, on OKC's team. And then he was supposed to foul him again. He doesn't. Jalen Williams gets off a shot that sends the game into overtime, and it didn't matter. It was much like what, what happened with the Cougs 
in their game against A&M. Gave up a three that you would have hoped not to have given up. And you responded to threes by Dalen Brooks, who had been shooting poorly in the fourth quarter. He he had a couple open looks in that fourth quarter. One of them was an air ball and, not, and a couple that barely grazed the rim. But he responded with, with big threes to start. And they keep and they keep rolling. They found a way to get stops. Look, when Josh Giddy is making a shot off his backside on the floor, you're like, okay, maybe maybe it's not our night. Josh Giddy had, Giddy had a great night in, in place of Shea Gill, just Alexander, but it didn't matter. That's where we are right now. Nothing matters regarding the Rockets. No matter who they see, no matter what the circumstance is, they find a way. And the problem is, Sean, that this, no matter how good, well they've played, I was looking at the schedule the rest of the way. Seven out of the ten the rest of the way are either against playoff teams or playing teams. So despite what they've done, I think it's still a tough it's still a tough road because at this point, any loss feels like really damaging. Consider considering what you've pointed out a couple of times, they don't hold the tiebreaker, and like the 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 Florida trip for the Warriors should have been something where, considering what the Rockets did last night, we're talking about them having a half a game lead, just giving them a little buffer. But instead, we've got we've got the Warriors still with the one game lead, despite the I guess you might what what you would call heroics last night for the Rockets. Yeah, the har- the hardest part uh, would have been the Rockets winning at OKC, even without uh, SGA. Yeah. That's still a really good team. And you'd think, well, surely, I, like you mentioned, at least split the one Florida of the, game. One of those Florida teams would have got the Warriors. They're both, they're both playoff, play-in kind of caliber teams. The Heat are trying to not be a play-in caliber team. They're trying to be a playoff caliber team. And like you mentioned, the Magic are in the 4-5, uh, trying to be on the four line for that young team. It's important that they have a first-round series uh, with home court advantage. And nope, nope. No favors uh, done. Nah. Nah. We're not interested in all that. Nah, keep it. <laughs> Don't care. Uh, so yeah, that that part makes it very, uh, you know, I I would say that short term the Rockets took a hit uh, overall the last two nights, but long term you have to be feeling way way like more so than the past 10 games you have to be feeling better because what was the common refrain uh every time you know the little uh, kind of whispered part at the end after every single one of these Jalen uh green huge games that came and wins the quiet part that sometimes was said aloud was oh, well the schedule look who they're playing uh, it's the wizards yeah the wizards it's the spurs it's the blazers so on and so forth and then then anyone who was very positive but they did it to the Cavs. That was yes. the one defense. And now you can throw in OKCs. So, yes, the short term, it's a bit of a hit. And the schedule doesn't get much, e- doesn't get easier at all. In fact, it gets harder if we're talking about the, the final stretch. But they're still in it. And at least for now, before we, what, whenever the offseason off season begins, you have a bona fide number one as, in your backcourt. And I'm always a guard guy. I believe guards matter quite a bit. Yep. Now, Jokic, you got Jokic and Giannis. But all those guys have a Jamal Murray um, or Dame Lillard. And, you know, the, t- the, the Celtics have two wings, uh, mostly Tatum. I mean, Brown, dr- l- learn to dribble with your left hand. But even still, the, the, the Celtics have two wings, uh, two, mer- two perimeter players. And up until the month of March, we weren't sure the Rockets had a legit one going forward. But as of now, he's not solo in, in what he's doing, but he is the catalyst. And uh, there's nothing to be said but positives about Jalen Green. And just the way he gets his buckets, you look at how he scores, whether it be off the dribble, his ability to change in the lane when he's challenged. Because, you know, Jalen Green wants to to dunk on everyone. He tried that last night, got defended at the rim, and found a way through being very creative, put the ball in the hoop with the layup. So he's a guy who can score in in multiple ways and and almost indefensible, indefensible the way he's playing. You can't guard him. I don't know how you defend him. You want to run two at him. He's found a way to be a guy who can – who, who can see that dribble either through or pass out of doubles and make decisions in the lane that result in good shots. And and Jabari Smith was, was a beneficiary late despite struggling. So if we are taking up, certainly we're taking a positive. You win a big game in OKC, but your biggest positive is the way overtime finished. OKC was making shots. 
or excuse me, the way the fourth quarter finished, OKC was making shots, and you couldn't get the stops you needed. But when it mattered, y- you kept playing, you kept making shots, and you got the stops in the end to keep yourself within a game. Because after the way you've played, and then you fall to two because t- fall two games back because you couldn't close out in OKC. I don't know if devastating is the right word, but it would have made the road pretty tough. And if we have real expectations of seeing this team in the plan, it was needed last night, and they got it done. So all credit to the Rockets. We'll hear from multiple Rockets going forward, including like Tar Eason. The Warriors got to be like, you don't even play. What are you doing? Like Draymond said, we played the sound before. Draymond was asked about his concern about the Rockets. He goes, I don't give a damn about the Rockets. He probably certainly doesn't give a damn about Tar Eason. And Tari is... Vocal, <laughs> look, I, I don't know how the Rockets handle things, what what their policy is on social media and what you can and cannot say. But it wasn't insulting to the Warriors. In fact, it's a callback to an old movie. In fact, Lance has done it. We have to sound. Maybe we compare it to and see who's better. But if I'm the Rockets, I'm like, Tari, we love you. We love you being our biggest fan. But the problem is you are a fan right now. You don't play, and your contributions are on social media. Please don't aggravate the four-time world champions. But that's going to be a big game coming up here shortly. And thanks to what happened last night, it'll be even bigger. We have opening day. We'll talk about that. I'll have, we'll give our old over-unders, not on like home runs or averages or MVP candidates, but the number of games Sean and I will watch. We talked about this before. I'm telling you, my, my belief that I will watch very few, very few Friday games, it's going to hurt, it's going to hurt my over-under. Look, the Saturday games, the Sunday games, cool, getting ready for the show. But the Friday game, ah, I don't see it. Monday through Thursday, I'm in. Sunday, eh, Friday, probably probably going to do something else. But we'll talk about that going. Sean, maybe you'll watch more games than me. We'll see. We'll see what our numbers are. And we'll also get into <laughs> – Sean sent me a text yesterday. And it's really, it's really the peak of fandom when it comes to college football. We'll talk about his text – if you don't know, he's a big Arch Manning guy. But this particular text and the con- and the context, amazing. He was talking to his buddy about Texas practice. So it's 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 college football season. If you love spring practice, so we'll get into that as well. But more Rockets, more Astros going forward, and some sound from a relatively big night in the NBA. And De'Aaron Fox had some funny things to say to a to a reporter. And just when reporters think they they have real importance and their questions matter. Aaron Fox was like, no, no, they don't. So we'll have that and more. We'll be back.
This is the Dell Olalea Show on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Broadcasting live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's Dell Olalea. I thought it was great. Um, you know, I feel like we've been having a lot of games like that where we showed a lot of poise recently. Um, and that's, that's just growth right there um, from everybody. And uh, we all stepped up when we needed to defensively, uh, hit shots, and we got the win. That was Jalen Green discussing the win in overtime for the Rockets over the over the Thunder. That's now ten in a row, thirty-seven and thirty-five on the year. They're they're up big early. They're up fifteen to three. the The Thunder looked like a team who was coming off a back to back and or coming off the first game of a back to back and were without their best player. Shea Gilgis Alexander didn't play. It certainly looked like it, it, it affected them. The Rockets' pace. And defense led to them getting buckets and kind of having OKC scramble. Like Lou Dort took multiple threes from the corner early, and the Rockets are like, go ahead, keep taking them. Eventually, OKC settled down, got back in it, and by halftime, they had a lead. It was only one point, but it was certainly a contrast from how the game started, and it was a back and forth the rest of the way, and the Rockets eventually got the job done. Jalen Green there. And after the game, we heard from Tar Eason. And you say, how? Why? Well, Tar Eason can only root and, you know, he's recuperating from what we didn't know how extensive it was, the injury, and it turns out it was a bit more, it was a bit more scary than we thought when we heard the news, but he he's going to be okay, and he's going to be back next year, but he is locked in on his team, and he got, he went on social media after the Rockets win and said this. Warriors! Come out to play! Warriors! Come out to play! Yeah! Just like that! For those of you who don't know, that's from a movie that was... Was it in the late 70s or early 80s, the Warriors movie? But it's a famous line from late 70s, 1979. It's a famous line from that movie. And in fact, it's so famous that not only did Tari Eason do it, our very own Lance Zerline did it. And probably years ago when the Rockets and Warriors were actually a rivalry, uh, this is Lance Zerline. Warriors, come out to play, yeah. There's a little bit more zest on that since that's been a word. A little sing-songy. <laughs> yeah, it's a little, certainly a little bit more sing-songy and a, a little bit more zesty. But, Sean, I don't know if you've heard Lance's before. You heard Tari's. Which one, or at least who did it best? I got to give it to Tari Eason uh, because, yeah, Lance's A, it was, uh, I'll just say sing songy. Sing songy. Uh, two, like you said, it came from years ago. So that was probably while they were like tied 1 1 in a series that the Rockets would go on to lose in five. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> that was. They all they were all losses, so it might have been it might have been that one. I, I seriously doubt that one came from a uh, a uh, happy Rockets moment. Hopefully, it's at least from 2018. Any other year, it's actually kind of worse if it's from uh, 2019 or uh, what was it, 16 or 15? I think Those, 15, maybe. 15, 15 would have been tough because I think they went down 3-0 and then won one game. Yeah, I don't think it was 15. <laughs> I think it was either him saying he wasn't scared of the Warriors or maybe during a playoff series. Oh, but, yes, okay. it was in that era where the, where the Rockets were the only team trying to challenge the Warriors in the Western Conference. Either way, bad vibes. Mm -hmm. I mean, not just not just Lance in general, but but <laughs> bad vibes from, from times in the 2010s. So get, get, let me get Tari Eason. Let me get at least the dream that one day we could be the 10 seed. This is this is how I know the Warriors are cooked. <laughs> Tari Eason, Eason is chirping. doing this, and you're still a game behind them, and he does he doesn't even play. We we're talking about the play-in, and Tari Eason, the the Warriors have been in a <laughs> they've won four they've finals. won four titles. <laughs> they, they they won one two years ago. They've played against the Rockets in in consequential games to determine who would go to the finals, and. Now they're in a back and forth. I don't. I don't think they'll respond. Maybe Draymond will at some point. They're in a back and forth with a young player who has had no part in this run, but is on social media taunting them. They are cooked. We need. Well, a we need the national guard in for uh, 
April fourth mm-hmm. uh, when Draymond Green comes in, or or we just need Draymond Green to like get suspended uh, he, in the in the like three games that they play before that. Possibly. Not off the table. It is possible. <laughs> not, we'll talk about what happened last night. It not is possible. Off the table, but yes, I all, I mean. You hear the, you know, don't want to poke the bears, you know, talk uh, actually made famous or not famous. But most recently you heard that from Dylan Brooks when he was on the Memphis Grizzlies. Yeah, look how that saying, worked out. Saying that he does poke bears. Yeah. But you don't want to poke bears. However, this Warriors team, I'm not sure if they're a bear. They're not I'm not a- sure if they're a grizzly. How about that? They're, they might be. They might be uh, a black bear. They're, little, they're smaller, a little bit more skittish. Uh, at this point, they're pandas, which aren't actually bears. Oh, wow. This is where they are right now. Wow. I was. I mean, they're four-time champions. Now. I, no, no, but this iteration are like our, our red pandas who aren't actually bears. That's what they are, until proven otherwise. Now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't test Steph Curry, and he had a— Steph, Steph Curry, I mean, if, if we're going with the panda analogy— Steph Curry, I don't know if pandas have sharp teeth. They're, he's the sharp teeth on the panda. He where, is. where no matter what else is going wrong with the Warriors, I mean, they literally won last night. But no matter what else is going wrong with the Warriors, as long as they have that guy, I kind of think that they're going to beat the Rockets. <laughs> Just, when it matters most? As long as they have that guy. I, I, don't, I never feel great uh, going into a Warriors match. Particularly in something that matters to them. And I don't know where they'll be depending on how the Rockets play leading up to that and how the Warriors play. But it'll, it'll be a game that matters. And, I mean, I kind of – I'm going to side with the Warriors until proven otherwise, as you have let us know. They do have four titles. I mean, but <laughs> but Tari doesn't care. And he, I guess rightfully so. No, Tari was in, like, high school and those yeah. titles were – Which is happened. another thing I'd be pissed off about if I'm the Warriors. We were great once. You, were, he, you still remember that. And you're coming at us and you're not even going to play. But so be it. We're going to hear – we're going to hear about what happened last night with the Warriors – uh, on the other side, because Draymond got ejected, Steve Kerr has some thoughts on it. I, someone really funny quote tweeted a picture of you know we know Steph's celebration. He puts people to sleep with the threes. He did it. Then he had an elongated celebration against the Magic. He knocked one down to kind of put the game away, and then ran all the way to the far end the, into the co- uh, the court doing this. I put you to sleep celebration. Then he he eventually kicked like a chair courtside, um, and then after the game you see. The, him and a ton of walking back to the locker room, and Draymond's waiting there doing the celebration. Someone said, if I was Steph, I would have punched Draymond in the face. Because if you if you watch the game in the first quarter when Draymond got ejected, Steph is, he couldn't believe it. It's like, what are we doing? What are you doing? You know how important this game is to us, and you're getting ejected in the first quarter within like the first five minutes because you can't stop talking to a referee? Steph couldn't believe it. He had some comments about we can't keep hurting ourselves. And uh, Steve Kerr, uh, we'll hear from him on the other side about it. But, man. Uh, Draymond's a special special player uh, in multiple ways. But before we go to break, Julian wants to talk about Shogun and Tari Eason. What's up, Julian? I'm not going to talk about Tari because it's just it's, it's annoying, to be honest with you. Oh, are you like, a Warrior? You're not even playing. Uh, oh, you're a 49er Hell fan. Hell no, I'm not a Warrior. Okay. I'm but, not a Warrior fan. Okay. I just think it's silly, bro. Oh, I got I think you. it's silly. You played a team without their MVP candidate. Y'all went into overtime. And, yes, y'all won. It was a good win. Absolutely. It, it, it looks good for uh, – on the optics, it looks good for your record and yada, yada, this this uh, winning streak and, uh, or the, the winning y'all been doing. It's awesome. But y'all been playing tomato cans. Let's just, like, wait a little bit. Wait till you actually make the playoffs or you're going to play them to say that. Or, I don't know, maybe wait till you're playing. Anyways, Shogun, are you excited about the Crimson Sky? I don't know what the hell it is, but I <laughs> – I can't wait to find out. Yeah, what he's talking about the latest episode of Shogun, there was a there was a, a, a multiple references to this this uh, I guess this battle plan that they di- that the leader didn't want to do because it meant a lot of people were going to die. But now he's been pushed into a corner where it's his only option. And of course I am. Uh, I love conversations in small rooms, but we're going to get people. A lot of people are going to die, and Shogun has done that well, showing people. And the brutality of war, the cannon fodder stuff, I still remember from a couple episodes ago. So, yes, Julian, I want to know what Crimson Sky is. Is it is it something sneaky? Is it just an out-and-out giant battle scene? Um, Shogun is, is, unfortunately for us, it's a limited series. that We're only going to get one season of it, so it's not going to be this long thing where we're going to 
we're, we're going to be able to enjoy it like we might enjoy other prestige television. But of course, let me see. I'm, I'm, I'm locked in on the show. Uh, Julian is as well. He's every time uh, we kind of talk about it, he, he, he brings something to the table uh, during the week of. So, yeah, Julian, um, I agree on both counts. The Tar Eason thing is funny, but it's a little ridiculous considering who he's taunting and what they're what we've seen them to be capable of. And the biggest thing is you're not even playing. If you could do something about it, I'd be I'd be more inclined to go. Okay, great, Tari, but the but the most you're going to do is sit there and watch, and hopefully, hopefully the other guys have to have to back up. It's, I guess it's a I guess it's a taunt. I mean, all he did was do a quote from a a, a, vit, uh, a movie, but yes, calling out the Warriors is interesting for a guy who won't play a minute in the game and hasn't played a minute in months. I uh, I don't normally agree with you because you know all that 49er stuff you do. But on this, well, on this account, I agree. Thank you, Julian. Would it be better if he if he taunted the Thunder? In fact, yeah, you be, you just beat them. Yeah, I think that's part of it. Is that is that you're you're already looking ahead? And it's so. funny you're taunting them when it's still the status quo. Nothing changed last night. It's not as if you even tied them last night. There's still a game up on you. What the, what the tiebreaker? So even if you beat them and you're tied. Say you're you go into that game a game back and you beat them, they still have the tiebreaker over. They still make the playoffs or the plan in that case of the season ended that day or that night. So yes, Rockets having fun. <laughs> Tari's just funny. That's all. That's that's all. We'll hear from the Warriors side. We got other things to get to as well. But I mentioned Draymond getting ejected. Steve Kerr talked about it, and we'll move on to other stuff as well. Plenty of show to get to. Opening day is today. Our over-unders, as far as games watched, we'll get to in the next segment as well. Astros, Rockets, anything else you want to talk about, just call us, 713-780-3776. And obviously, if you want to tweet at us, at Sean A. Mapes and at Del V2. We'll be back.
Broadcasting live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, it's the Dell Olalea Show on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Now back to Dell Olalea. Welcome back to the show. A lot of Rockets talk to start. They are the hot team of the moment. Of course, the Astros begin their season t- today. Did want to wrap up kind of the Rockets stuff. The team they're chasing is the Warriors. They won last night in Orlando, unfortunately. As we said, the state of Florida did the Rockets no favor over the last couple of nights. We thought we were getting some help, courtesy of the Warriors themselves, when Draymond Green gets ejected very early, early in the game for arguing with the referee. He's had an interesting 48 hours. He clotheslined Patty Mills, and they're reviewing that. They only ruled that a common foul um, in, in the game against the Heat. Last night, typical Draymond arguing and couldn't let it go, so, th- so the official threw him out. I talked about Steph, re- Steph Curry's reaction to it and how I guess everyone might, might be, simply just be tired of it, particularly in a season where things haven't gone the way they wanted to. Here's, here's Steve Kerr discussing the ejection and how his team responded. Uh, yeah, too bad. It was unfortunate. Um, he deserved it. Um, and, um, you know, he'll, he'll bounce back. I'm just proud of the guys um, for uh, stepping up. Moses came off the bench. Um, had a, a big game for us. Um, Guy made a big three. You know, Gary was fantastic. Um, so we had guys step up, and that's that's what it takes. Yeah, the Warriors win, remain a game up, and it made me think of an altercation. Well, Dr- Draymond's had a couple of altercations with N- Yusuf Nurkic. Nurkic is the center for the Phoenix Suns. The biggest one was where Draymond hauled off and punched him, and then they had a back and forth in in Golden State where they were both doing the two small celebrations to each other. Here's a, a bit of the initial press conference after Nurkic was hit by Draymond. And who knew? Nurkic, a pretty bright guy. That brother needed help. It's pretty simple. That brother needed help. Uh, and is he wrong? A lot of people. And Draymond was upset. He was talking about how step, how uh, excuse me, Kevin Durant and Nurkic were commenting on him and how they know about his state of mind and his mental health and so on and so forth. And well, kind of proven to be right. What's changed? What's changed? He's still hitting people. He's still getting thrown out of important games. And it's even more exacerbated because the team isn't that good and they need him on the floor. Hopefully, hopefully he'll get thrown out of the Rockets game very early. That would help. Or not, because they've won this one without him. That's true. And he is starting to get to the point where it's like not always a bad thing when he gets thrown out. True, uh, just because of the decline. He's declining as an older player, a lot of miles on, on those legs. And at points, he will lose his head as simply a basketball player and do things that don't help, help the team win as far as actual basketball. Yeah. Play. Forget about the stuff that gets him ejected. Yeah, when he's when he's in like it, it's kind of like Framber Valdez, where where it's like when he's in the right state of mind. Yes, positive, unequivocal, Definitely. positive for the Warriors. But it's I rather if you're a Warriors fan, you rather just have him out of the game if he's just going to like you said. It's it's back to back games where he's clotheslining Patty Mills and now getting kicked out five minutes into the game where it's like he just has these weird stretches where he just like cannot control himself it's crazy because he was pretty he was pretty well behaved I, I don't know when the last time we talked about a Draymond Green uh issue since the Nurkic stuff and it's the perfect scenario because the Rockets don't back down even last night no, that's why I call the National Guard uh, Jabari Smith was on the floor and and Josh Giddy reached out to try to pick him up, and Jabari really, you know, some guys, no, you're not going to help me up. I'll let my teammate help me up. And then Josh Kitty was like, no, I'm going to help you up, and yeah. he grabbed him with both hands. Josh and- Kitty not taking no for an answer. I'm going to let that sit, <laughs> and then we move on. <laughs> okay. Then we move on. He played you, well last night. You all know what he's referring to, and, yes, he had a great night last night. Uh, Josh Kitty did. But Jabari was like, no, I don't want your help. So Josh Kitty said, yeah, you're going to take my help. And, and then Dylan Brooks came over and said, no. You're not helping him up off the floor. So he shoved Josh Giddy out of the way. You know, pushy shovey. Nothing really happened. The Rockets move on. It was, I think, maybe the second of two things that happened last night in the game. So the Rockets aren't going to back down from Draymond. So you you might see fireworks or maybe 
one of the members of either the Rockets or the Warriors gets hauled off by the National Guard if if we need them if we need them to. So that game is down the line a little bit, but getting closer and closer, and it'll be pretty influ- influential. Okay, so before we go, we were long in the last segment, so it's a short one here. I did mention to Sean I wanted to get our over unders for the the Astros as far as games watch. The season starts today. Fromber's on the hill. And Sean, you you heard Sean mention Fromber. Hopefully, we we get good Fromber. The the got the Fromber who's great with his sports psychologist had a couple good sessions, and he's locked in for the season. Hopefully, we get the Fromber from twenty twenty two, not the not the not so great Fromber of last year. And the the extensions are gone, so we'll see if that if it's a reverse Samson thing, where without the extensions we get twenty twenty two Fromber. That be we'll see. We will see. But he's on the mound tonight. Um, he's on the mound today. And the Astros kick off their season. Or first. I don't know how. What's the what's the proper term for baseball? It's not kick. That's the football uh, thing. Oh, opening yeah. tip. Kick uh, off. Does mm-hmm. baseball have one for they, starting? We'll they, just call it opening day. They start their season. Yeah. I don't think baseball has a, a, a terminology for like football and basketball does. They start their season with Fromber on the mound. I did... Look at the number Friday games I talked about in the first segment. I don't know how many Friday games I'm going to watch just simply because sometimes you just want to do something else. And thanks to the handy-dandy schedule uh, on MLB.com slash Astros, you can break it down by you can break it down by days. So if I did my the math, and it's not really math, I just had to count um, and see if I if I did it right or I missed the game. It looks like there's 23 Friday games. Yeah, I was, I'm flipping through. It looks like they only have one Friday off. Okay, so 23, what, and that will, yeah. That's how, August 26th. Okay, 20. Or you, April, April 26th. How, how does that, why would they even have a Friday off? I don't know. That's odd. Okay, maybe it's a two-game but, series. Or, but, yeah, it is a two-game series at uh, Colorado. And also, there's a lot more days off early in the season for, like, rainouts for Northern Okay, to make teams. up games if yeah. you need to. Okay, so I think I see 23 Friday games. I got to be honest, I'm probably not going to watch more than four, which, and and I'm maybe, that might be high four. I I was thinking you were going to say you're going to go 0 for 23. <laughs> it's Friday. possible. It's possible. Friday is my night off from having to watch something um, for the job. Not that it's a real job, but you get, you understand. Maybe I want to watch something else. So, I'm, I'm going to give myself four, which means now I have 158 games. No, I'm going to – no, it's less than that. I'm doing the math wrong. Um, but I'm take, I'm saying four of 23 Fridays I'm going to watch, which certainly severely limits the number of games I will watch. Sean, do you think you get over 100 games watched this year? I think I do. I think I do. And, and I'm defining watch as – it's on a laptop as I'm watching something Yeah, I'm not else. saying you're locked in, but the game yeah. is on. If something happens, you'll know it when it happens. Yes, I, I think 100 is like the right number, too, because I, I think that it doesn't get too much higher from 100, but also if I fall short, it's probably still like in the 90s. Okay. So if I take away the 23 Friday games, and Sean might be right, I may never watch a Friday game. I just can't see you. Not even four? Maybe okay, I don't. I let me. So it's a hundred Rangers on Friday. I don't. That's not gonna. The silver boot's not gonna appeal to me. Uh, one hundred and thirty nine games without the twenty three Friday games. Let's say I only watch the four. That would be well over a hundred. I think I'm in the hundred ten, hundred fifteen range. Are you gonna watch many Saturday games? Ooh, yes. It it'll lead into work. Um, so Saturday games. Well. Will I watch Saturday afternoon games? Mm. Saturday night, I probably will. I think this is also a case of the first couple months, probably a little lighter. Probably going to be go have to be more intensive once we go June, July. Yes, because the show has set a standard that we we think the season doesn't really begin till June or July. And also because just the amount of things that we're going to be able to talk about go down that are quite a bit other than baseball we're on the last McCullough schedule his season doesn't begin to june or july either two so, excuse june, me so june would be nice yeah we we hope june <laughs> we hope it's june for lance mccullers and luis garcia so i think the number of 100 give or take 10 so i'm gonna say 105 over under 105 for me 
which means I, I, which is what I want the season to be overall. I'd rather have it. Be, why are we playing 162? That's my that's my thing. I stand on. It's too many games. Give me 105. 105 means it feels like a sprint the entire time, and even still, it'll be a marathon. Yeah, you get like what one day off a week, basically. Yeah, like every team gets a day off. A week. Sure, uh, but we know baseball is all about numbers and records, so we'll never we're never going to do that. They've they've done their part by shortening the games. So 105. I, I'm going to keep track. We're, I, I'm going to set the number at 105. And I think there's a chance that you get more than me. Although, eh, I might just throw it on a, on a Saturday or something. Or a Friday night. That might that might be enough. If I, can, if I can get like 12 Friday games, that might See, be enough. See, you threw a wrench in my number because the Saturday thing <laughs> is going to be a thing for me. Sunday, I'm definitely I th- watching. I think the first half, like, I assume there's also 23. Actually, there's probably 24 Saturday games. I don't know if they'll have a Saturday off. And so, so yeah, you'll probably, and let's just chop it down the middle. So you'll probably watch 12. No, I'll give you 16. 16 of the 24 Saturday games. Mm-hmm. And that's probably the last 16. To be, yeah. More yeah. more likely. Maybe, that maybe fir- not October. That fir- yeah, that up. first eight. That's up for debate. Particu- I'm not sure I'm going to be here. Partic- <laughs> particularly with the play, the NBA playoffs going on on Saturdays. That's, that's the key part. Is that after, that's why I'm saying like June. I think that the uh, the amount gets ratcheted up because through April and May you have other things on. Definitely. So if you have, I don't know, maybe some, you got some of you guys might be 140 game guys. I don't know. Let us know. Our under our over unders were right. Well, at least mine is right at one oh five, and that certainly can fluctuate. If you guys are locked in for the entire year, maybe you got like Astros, Astros fatigue, not in the sense that you're tired of them, but you kind of know who this team is. They're gonna be really good. You're not gonna be locked in every day. I know that happens. Uh you can call on seven one three seven eight oh three seven seven six on that. Eric, I see you. We're way late for a break. You wanna talk Rockets? We'll talk to Eric when we come back.
Broadcasting live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, it's the Dell Olalea Show. On ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Now back to Dell Olalea. Welcome back. We have some things planned, but we have a couple of callers. Eric's a frequent caller. Dr. Dre will get to you, too. What's up, Eric? Hey, guys. That was the game of the year last night with the Rockets. DC, uh, them to be rivals for a long time. And also, they found a lot of videotape of celebrities in P. Diddy's house. Will Diddy end up alive, or is he going to be okay? And is Lady Fritz coming back since her dad's the coach of the Cougars? I'm going to listen. The second part, well, the third part, I don't know about the second part about who did, who did he ask was going to be in Diddy's videos, or did he say he was going to wind up alive? I, I didn't catch that. Yeah, the third part he asked about Lanny Fritz or Laney Fritz because Willie Fritz is the head coach of the Cougars. She'll probably be around the program. I believe she's either engaged or married. I'm not sure how that that affects you, Eric, uh, in your in your I won't call it obsession, but interest in her. But she prob you'll probably see her on the sidelines. Her dad coaches the team in town. Why that matters to you? Why I know why it matters to you, <laughs> but I don't want to get into it. Um, as far as OKC versus the Rockets, possibly it all depends on the rivalries begin when someone takes something away that matters. Like a regular season game between the two, that doesn't that doesn't start a rivalry. If the Rockets are on the OKC trajectory, OKC was a playing team last year, I believe. If the Rockets make it or get close, and all of a sudden uh, they shoot to a level where they're competing for a top four seed like OKC is this year, and then they meet in the playoff series, then they're rivals. Up until that point, no. They're just two teams competing, and they played a great game last night. We all know the deal. Rivalries start when something matters to you and the other team takes it from you. I think Lainey Fritz is engaged. I, yeah, some I thought quick, so. Some quick uh, Instagram. She is engaged. And pregnant. She's engaged to a football coach. I don't remember who what is who he who he is or what his name is. I but can't click on the link without it without having to sign in. Ah, I, yeah. I don't care that much. Understood. In. You're not going to sign into the company's computer to find out. Unders- yeah. I'm right there with him. I don't him. care who what what football coach he's married to. Yeah, I think he uh, he w- he was a player at Auburn at some point. Yes, because there's pictures in front of Jordan Air <laughs> on on her profile. Yeah. Uh, we get a tweet from someone who I will not name. Maybe. Just be not a tweet, but a uh, a text. Um, I'll never get the obsession these dudes. Nah, I can't even read that. Oh, because it's not complimentary. <laughs> and then he mentions names in the in the text. <laughs> uh, you, you know what? Good good catch. Uh, Joe will sometimes Joe George of Galan George will sometimes just read a text without like reading it all the way through, and just at the end of it be like. That wasn't a good text, <laughs> like, but he would have already have read it. Yeah, you got to put your own filter on things sometimes. And I was going through it because this guy, uh, we were talking earlier about other things, and he texted me, and I like to, uh, <laughs> he goes, you can't read that on air, man. I know, I didn't. <laughs> I did not read started. it on air. You started. You had me in the first half. <laughs> you had me in the first half. And then I realized, nope, can't do that. Uh, not that I would give his name out, but then it makes me look awful if I, if I read the complete thing and then name the names he named. But, yeah, I agree, sir. I agree. Can you read it without naming the names? Uh, Yes. It was in reference to, like, we get, like, Eric and others will call in. Mostly Eric will do this. He'll call in about anchors and other women. And, you know, I'm not going to devol- get involved in it. Mostly because I don't even, most of the women, I don't even know what they look like because he, he mentions a lot of, like, News women that yeah, I don't local, know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, and and this wasn't specific to Eric, but you know, some guys will get obsessed with a woman because she's fa- mostly because she's famous. And this guy said, "I don't get the obsession. She's famous doesn't mean she's not mid. Why do Why do you care? Why do you care?" Um, that's what he was saying. He goes, "Okay, I get. It. Yeah, why are we talking about just just because she's has a name doesn't mean you have to be obsessed with her. That's all. Um, but he named some names and I can't can't do it." Cannot do it. Those some things you have to protect. And although it's it's we would call it guy talk, uh, but I can't read them. Uh, Dr. Dre wants to talk about Jalen Green, and who doesn't want to talk about Jalen Green the way he's playing? What's up, Dr. Dre? Hey, well, what's up, fellas? Uh, hey, Eric Wong, go go back to 
the, the bus and the tables at the China Garden, man. It's, it's lunch and rush hour, man. Get ready. Mm, this, that's uh, uncomfortable. <laughs> go, uh, go ahead. Well, no, I was calling in for the, pa- the patron saint of uh, procreation, Jalen Green. You know, uh, I find it unfortunate how he, he puts the kitty on a pedestal instead of putting basketball on a pedestal, you know. Uh, like they say, ball is life, and I think he's got a different interpretation on that. And uh, appreciate the time, man. Be- Thank you. If you don't know where that reference comes from, I said that earlier. We were joking about um, – he had a – Jalen Green quote mentioned after a game that he was – his added focus was about his baby. And then we saw stories come out that maybe there's more than one. I don't know what's real, what isn't. And, of course, because that show will get off the rails, sometimes because of me, sometimes because of the other guys, that I called him a, a saint, the patron saint of procreation. Uh, because apparently we were talking about the church of Jalen because of how good he's playing, and then it devolved into that. I don't know what he puts on the pedestal. All I know is, and frankly, I don't care. All I know right now is, he has played like one of the best players in the NBA. And that's all you can say. So we can talk about what he what he values more, but you can't you can't look at how he's played and say he doesn't value basketball right now. He is carrying this Rockets team without Alfred Shingoon, who was supposed to be what we thought because of play, their best player. They lose their best player, they lose Cam Whitmore. Tari has been gone for a while. And yet they are one of the best teams of basketball over the stretch. And even more validation last night. Despite missing Shea Gilders, Alexander, that Thunder team is still a pretty good one, particularly when Josh Giddey's going to play like he did. And Jalen Green carried them, made plays, made plays for himself, made plays for others. And the Rockets won a game in OKC, a game a lot of people didn't think they could win. So credit to them. No matter what, he's putting on a pedestal. Yeah. Keep it up. Yeah. I mean, maybe I, maybe he should have Irish twins and that should be his thing because if, if the baby is what's got him to this point, maybe we got to keep having more babies. That's all. I, I, I am one who doesn't buy into that because Jalen Green didn't find out he was going to be a father in March. He knew beforehand, and he stunk in February. This, this is really stretching the, uh, the baby bump theory because, yes— <laughs> He knew before we knew. It's like we're going off of when it was public. Yes, and posted and, and acknowledged. Yes, the, yes, and the kid has not actually been born yet either. So it's like a double. Yes, this, this isn't like happened. this isn't like when Fred Van Fleet went off in the playoffs after he was a new father. I know people. Oh, the baby. Look, how about Jalen Green's a really talented player, and the system fits right now because of the lack of Shingun, and he's taking advantage of it. If he wants to credit an added focus, great, but. As we said, the baby, he wasn't surprised by the baby announcement. He knew. In February, he was awful. So why now is the baby it important and leading to great play? Let's just give him credit for playing great basketball. Stop looking into other things. He ain't got nothing to do with that baby. But, but congratulations to, the, to Green and his significant other and obviously hopefully a healthy and happy baby girl, I believe, is, uh, I believe that the gender has been uh, announced as well. But, um, yeah, I don't know what's on a pedestal. He's just playing really great basketball. You got to credit him uh, for that. I feel like I definitely avoided any issues there. (laughs) Hopefully, we will be back. But first, I want to talk about my bookie. My bookie is the place you can go to for tonight. The tournament is back Thursday night. We had Five Star on earlier. Not on this show, but on the John Lance show. And if you like his picks or you don't think he's right, you can go to mybookie.ag to put money down on the games. It's a place I keep talking about it. It's a place that gives you help. You don't have you don't have to be an expert. It, they have experts for you to give you up to date odds and their predictions on what's going to happen. Maybe you like props. Maybe you're like John T. Porter and love props. You can bet on who's going to be the top scorer tonight. You can bet on rebounds. You can do all that at my bookie. It's a place to go if you think you have insight on what's going to happen, not just in basketball. We know the baseball season starts tonight, too, or this afternoon, too. So another option for you, and of course, for you hockey people, my bookie's there for you. Just use promo code BET975. If you put in $200, you get $300 ready to play instantly with that promo code. The fun doesn't stop there. I mentioned the up-to-the-minute odds, the props, the week's expert predictions. 
And the best part about my bookie, you can bet on anything, anytime, from anywhere. Use promo code BET975 to secure your welcome bonus today, only with my bookie. Welcome to hour two of the show. We had an interesting segment of callers in the last segment. So if you want to call in 713-780-3776, I'm going to get to Texans news. Not a lot. I mean, Sean didn't even play the horn. Neville Hewitt is back. Their special teams ace, backup linebacker for the Texans. They re-sign him. And we'll see how important Neville Hewitt is with the new kickoff rule. Maybe maybe special teams aces will be a bigger deal than just on punt kickoff coverage, or excuse me, punt coverage, excuse me. Uh, so Neville Hewitt back with the Texans. You don't really want him playing linebacker. Um, he's not, that's not where his strength is, but making an impact on special teams is uh, where you, where you can look for him to be pretty good. So, I mean, if we want to place an importance on that signing, they bring back, a player who can contribute, then that's always good. So uh, that that's the extent of the Texas, Texans news, really. And anything that happens, it'll be probably of that level until the draft and, I guess, the uniform unveil, unveiling. I mentioned in the my bookie spot that the tournament is back. And CBS Sports has ranked the Sweet 16 matchups. And thankfully, I guess, if you don't love upsets, you've got a lot of big-name teams because, for the most part, you had plenty of chalk. We, we know North Carolina State is the one outlier, thanks to DJ Burns and others. They're going to play Marquette, a team that the Cougs would face, or well, the, the winner of that matchup would face the Cougs if they can get through Duke on Friday. Sean, of, of the Sweet 16 matchups, just thinking about it, maybe pull it up if, if you're not sure. Which one excites you the most, and where would you rank it? Of the Sweet Sixteen, if you can, ex- yeah, yeah, if you can exclude being lo- it being the local matchup, and just look at the matchups like Purdue versus Gonzaga, you got Arizona versus Clemson, you got a match, you got a rematch of the title game with Connecticut and San Diego State. I, I won't be picking that one. Don't worry. 
<laughs> you've got uh, you've got North Carolina and Alabama, yeah, uh, Tennessee I, and Creighton. I think Illinois, Iowa State's interesting uh, because it's kind of a clash of uh, styles. Illinois gets up and down a little bit more. They have two awesome uh, scores, and meanwhile, Iowa State plays basketball basically with a two by four in their hand they're just trying to beat you up they're they're just trying to play defense and do all that you know all the all the stuff that it seems like all the good college basketball teams do which is make the game unwatchable get the ball uh, up on the re- on the boards rebound put backs blo- so on and so exactly forth, yeah. exactly so that one just as far as uh, not only is it a clash of styles it's a two versus a three matchup and they're two uh Strong teams, and then Houston Duke might also might be number two, uh, may even be number one, but number two if you're trying to take out the locality of it. Okay, well, the CBS Sports, according to Dave, David Cobb, one of their writers, he does rank those two as his top two, just in different orders. He's got the Cougs versus Duke as the oh, wow. best matchup of of Thursday, Friday, and then I then Iowa State and Illinois following that. We've talked about it before jokingly about the ph- the physicality and what it might mean for Duke. I like Houston here, um, and excluding the uh, a potential bias, and less about me liking Houston and more about me hating Duke. Um, that, pushing that bias aside, I don't think Duke, ha- watching them play, has seen anything like they're going to see. As long as the Coos can stay out of foul trouble, and certainly when you're playing Duke, who knows how, how, how that'll go. I just think how Houston plays, their, their ability to – defend I think they'll give Duke's guards trouble and I don't think Philip Filipowski is going to enjoy the experience and not just not just Juwan Roberts he's just going to he's just going to see a lot of bodies and if the Cougs are allowed to play like they normally play it ain't going to be a good time for for Filipowski or or the Duke backcourt it's just obviously a guy picks up a couple fouls or shots don't fall it can change that's the thing is I I also like the Cougs in this matchup, but, and this kind of like sucks as uh, analysis, but it will kind of come down to the whistle. I feel like, I feel like it will come down to what the refs are calling in that game. How physical are they going to allow the game to get, especially, especially against Duke when, you know, like you said, you have, you have Roberts, you have even just like, the guards on the perimeter, like how physical is Shed and Cryer and Sharp going to be able to guard people or when they come down and swipe down when Filipowski is uh, posting up, trying to get the ball away from them. How how much are they going to call? Are are we going to have a a uh, replay of last the last game we saw the Cougs play where you have Texas A&M shooting 48 free throws and you have three, uh, was it three starters foul out for U of H? Yeah, it was a lot of starters foul out. Of, four players overall, yeah. Four overalls fouled out for U of H. That, th- just how the game is played, because Texas A&M couldn't quite capitalize on all the opportunities that uh, they had at the free throw line and just by virtue of the Cougs being in constant foul trouble. But I believe that, uh, if Texas A&M couldn't capitalize but get the game into overtime, Duke is much more likely to be able to just win the game outright. Yeah, and can the Cougs protect their defensive backboard? It's been an issue. Can they keep Duke off the glass? If they can do that, and like you said, it's not great analysis, and so not so in depth. But, but if it's you can true. Keep, yeah, if you can keep them off the glass and stay out of foul trouble, I don't think Duke wins. Yeah, I, th- I think how it gets called matters the most out of like any – I don't know, like basically any game, <laughs> any game, at least this weekend, probably any game of the tournament. Yeah. It just matters what the refs are going to call and what they're not going to call. Because if they if they call it a certain way, Duke will also get 50 free throws. Yes. That, that, that will happen. And, you know, Duke will travel, but it's in Dallas. So <laughs> there'll be a lot of angry Cougars yeah. um, <laughs> on the on the in, in that building because if Duke is got a parade to the free throw line like if one team's gonna have a parade to the free throw line we expect it to be duke and you're gonna hear a lot of boos er- very early particularly coming off what happened against a&m uh, the coups got to hope for a bit of a friendlier whistle and i think 
uh, let's let's just say I won't say that it's quote unquote cheating or or favoring Duke, but if it's a game where you can play to your normal physicality, I don't think Duke wins this game. I think the Cougs wear them down, uh, but that is yet to be seen. Uh, so we'll see we'll see how that plays out on Friday. Yeah, I'm not even like taking into account like like they're gonna favor Duke is just the way they call the game might favor Duke. It's yes. not even malice. It just might be that they they are just calling foul. They're in a foul calling mood that <laughs> night. You are a foul calling son of a. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we'll we'll see we'll see. Uh, and it's an un- it's unfortunate that that's the level that we're talking at talking about it as. But they play two different styles and the st- the whole old adage styles make fights and. The Cougs fight style is one where they want to get in you and make it difficult for you to operate. And that can't be hampered by foul trouble uh, because despite being able to pull it out, as Sean said against a I think that depth concerns, particularly when you've got, you have guys foul out, will be an issue against uh, a more talented Duke team. I'm still not going with Seth Greenberg, who thinks Duke will win. I'm taking the Cougs. I think they, t- I think they learned from from what happened last year, and learn is probably a little bit too harsh. They played a, a team who shot the ball really well. Uh, I don't think Duke's guards are as good as the Miami guards they saw last year, which I think benefits the Cougs as well, even if the Cougs aren't as deep or talented as they were last year. So that game's on Friday. It is the it is not even the the um, the latest game on Friday. I know people, some people were, were trying to wonder and see when that game will be played. It's eight thirty nine. Locally, and then Creighton and Tennessee follows them on True TV. The Cougs do get the CBS game. Of course, Duke's not going to get pushed to, to True TV during a Sweet, Sweet 16 game. That's that's the benefit. If you were going to have issues searching for True TV, don't worry about it. You're playing Duke. You're going to be on CBS, and you'll get to see the your potential Elite Eight matchup in the first CBS game on Friday. You've got North Carolina State and Marquette. Uh and Tyler Kolick's a really good point guard. Uh, I know Sh- Jamal Shedd is the one we know here, uh, the one who could win player of the year. If they see Marquette, you're going to see a pretty good point guard. They play they play in different styles, but uh, but we talk about guys who could give the Cougs trouble in the backcourt. Tyler Kolick is one of those guys for for Marquette. And Sean's going to be could be excited. He could see Shaka Smart. Not that seeing Shaka Smart on television is such a big deal, but uh, but a, a, a face. People in this area will recognize, will recognize, Shaka Smart is the head coach of Marquette. So if he does beat NC State, and of course if the Cougs can beat Duke, you're going to see Shaka Smart coaching on the sideline. And Shaka Smart is known, at least I know him for, being the sixth defender for Marquette. He spends a lot of time on the actual court, even when his team's playing defense. I'm like, at any point, is the referee going to tell him to get off the floor? I was going to say, you're you're not going to see him exclusively on the sideline. You'll yeah. also see him. You're going to see one of those you'll Jordans. You'll see him on the court. You're going to see his, uh, like, the left Jordan, depending, on the, on the court, playing defense. I I was watching him in the Big East tournament a couple, not this past season, but the year before, and I was like, is anyone going to tell him to get off the floor? And no, they didn't say a word to him. And this is not even, like, if he's there, down there, on, when they're playing offense in the second half, okay, whatever, it's weird, but but he's got to be a bit of a distraction when you're thinking about having to navigate the guy on the court when you're trying to run offense, but nothing is said. And apparently there are no complaints by other coaches. I, there's that, complaints. That would be my first thing. Get him off the floor. There, There's complaints, but there's like, it's, it's one of those things where other coaches also do it. True. So you can't like fully. Yeah, they do it. Like Dan Hurley's loafer might be <laughs> straddling the sideline, but Shaka has a f- whole foot on the floor. Yeah. Yeah. He does. It's, uh, he, he basically closes out on, the, on shooters <laughs> on, on in the three. corner. Yes, because he does like he does mimic that when he wants his guys to close out and, and be sound and have their arms up. He does the same thing. The only problem is you can't be the sixth man because that's not allowed. But apparently it is. Uh, the Big East doesn't care. And really, overall, the NCAA officials haven't warned him. I haven't seen him be warned about it at all. We haven't talked a lot about this story. and We'll talk about it on the other side. Dak Prescott's going to be a free agent, at least according to all reports. The Cowboys aren't giving him a deal. It speaks to where we are with that franchise and what you think about quarterbacks and can they help you get to the next level. We have a a younger, cheaper quarterback here who, by all accounts, everyone believes in. But at points, 
people believed in Dak too until the failures kept stacking up on each other. And now, the guy who I believe led the league in touchdown passes last year isn't under a deal. Well, he, he is under a deal for a year, but no extension talks. And apparently, Dak Prescott will be a free agent in 2025. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about falling in love with the quarterback in the draft because this guy is recently out of college and Sean, Sean Mapes is locked in on college quarterback competitions. <laughs> we'll talk about that too when we come back. The Dell Olalea Show continues on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's your host, Dell Olalea. Welcome back to the show. Earlier this week, and I think I first saw it from Ian Rappaport, that the Cowboys and Dak Prescott aren't discussing an extension. He's going into the final year of his deal. He's coming off leading the league in passing. I think he threw for over 4,500 yards, and we know how it ended because it always ends this, ends this way with the Cowboys. Disappointment. This one in particular was really harsh. They win the division, and Jordan Love and the Green Bay Packers go in there and dominate them. They lose that game. Their team who wins 12 games every year, really, well, at least the last three years under Mike McCarthy, but, but they top out at the divisional round, and sometimes it's a wild card. Just like that, just like this past season. So the question is, and it's not even about can Dak win a Super Bowl because I mean I, I'm going to start with can he win? Can he win playoff games to get them to a title game? 
That has not been something he's been capable of, whether it be under Jason Garrett or now under Mike McCarthy. It, I just think it's odd because of how quarterbacks are usually treated where they don't even allow them to get to this point. Usually there's an extension, and particularly with the younger quarterbacks. Now, Dak's older, so that might play a part. But we, we know Kirk Cousins has done this a couple times, bet on himself, and is he's a great businessman. Lamar did it, and it worked out for him. And I understand the Ravens' reticence to give him a major deal at the price point he wanted, considering how injured he had been over the last couple of years before this past season where they, were, where they had the best record in the AFC. But, Sean, I guess I'll ask you this. Not a question of whether Dak can win a Super Bowl, because is it his fault? I, it, I don't know. I think he's a better quarterback than Brock Purdy, and Brock Purdy can make a Super Bowl. I think the Cowboys have organizational issues, namely Mike McCarthy, um, that might play a bigger part. But knowing the resume of Dak Prescott, knowing that you're going to win a lot of games, would you risk letting him go? It's it's very tough because he is right on that line of he gives you dependable, kind of good enough, eh, not just good enough, but like good quarterback play versus being in the absolute wilderness like you might you might be the Atlanta Falcons you want to be the Giants like think about the teams that obviously Jalen Hurts but the division that has the Giants the commanders have to draft the quarterback they've been dealing with Sam Howell among others Mm -hmm. you have a legit winner as far as the regular season is concerned now of course the ultimate's a playoffs and that always determines guys a legacies I, I think it's an interesting gamble. I, it, it really it really speaks to what what are you all about? Like, do, are you are you about win the division, win twelve games, like you mentioned, and we'll see in the playoffs. Maybe we either get a good draw or just something clicks or whatever, and we can make a run. Or are you this guy? Obviously, isn't. You know, and all these guys are AFC guys, but he's not Mahomes, Burrow, Allen, Stroud, Lamar. He's not one of these guys. So, next, give me the give me someone who can be one of those guys for us, and just by basically by himself lift us to shoot the NFC title game. Yeah, like not even lift us that far. Just Let- lift lift us to the NFC. T- lift us to somewhere. Jared Goff has been twice now. Yeah, uh, let me give you a scenario because let's forget about the 2025 draft and say the Cowboys don't have a great year. They they let him they let Dak walk a free agency, fire Mike McCarthy, they want to start over. And then they look at I don't know, I guess who the quarterback w- would be Shador Sanders or maybe your guy, not even that he's really your guy. We'll talk about that. Quinn Ewers, My who starting kn- quarterback. Yeah, certainly your starting quarterback. Quinn Ewers. Let's say they have their eyes on them or someone else that is less that has less name recognition as a pretty good college quarterback. Let's say they decide, hey, hmm, hey, Vikings, we'll trade you. Dak, you can pay him whatever you want, and we want your your two first-rounders because we have our eyes on who J. everyone McCarthy? loves apparently right now, J.J. McCarthy. Are you giving up Dak and the, and the likelihood that you have to pay him or you're going into 2025 with a new quarterback, a rookie possibly, for JJ JJ McCarthy or or Bo Nix or whatever whoever you love in this draft. Are you doing that? That's the thing. When you actually say, so I'm wait, so I'm trading <laughs> Dak Prescott for JJ McCarthy. Are you doing that? I'm not. This is what I'm this is <laughs> this is what I'm thinking about as far as the Cowboys that, are concerned. And that's what I'm saying where like are you, you let you let you let Dak Prescott walk because they're going to win enough games to where they're not going to be a top. They're not going to have a top pick. Yeah. And so you then become, again, you become the Atlanta Falcons drafting Desmond Ritter. <laughs> like you become Ugh. the Steelers drafting Kenny Pickett. You you become. You don't want to be that team. The team that is desperate for a quarterback, but not in a position to actually draft a, not even a difference maker, just someone you could talk yourself into being a difference maker. Because like we've seen with the 2021 draft, uh, all these guys were in the top 10 or top half of the draft, at least. They're all in different teams now, or they're Trevor Lawrence. Yeah. and Who's good. 
Who maybe who might, maybe he's good. I don't who, know if he's good. Who we might be having this conversation about in when his contract when his next contract comes up, we might be having the same Dak Prescott conversation about Trevor Lawrence. Yeah. It it's it's what what is your appetite for I don't know, let's try this guy. Yeah, you I'm looking at the twenty twenty five a twenty twenty five mock. What, can I offer you some Shador Sanders or Carson Beck or Quinn Ewers as opposed to signing Dak to a long-term extension? You want to re you want to restart the roster with a new coach and one of those guys, or get rid of Mike McCarthy and hope and hope Dak elevates or the team elevates because you have a good quarterback and a better head coach. It's it's such it is such a hard question that I I I think I land on. Do not pay Dak Prescott. So you would rather do not pay him his next contract. Do not pay him, and then hope for Shadur's hope. And you won't even be in a position to draft the guys it I might, just mentioned. It might even be a, it might even be a like veteran stopgap for one year. <laughs> that is, and, and and maybe you try to trade for, or maybe you try to find like your Kirk Cousins or your. Russell Wilson. Are those ugh. guys better or than your, or your Matt Stafford? Like you've tried to get into. Oh, okay, the you trade. You try to find a guy. Yeah, disgruntled uh, star quarterback market. You fail with Dak, and you go, "Hey, Arizona." Yeah, Kyler. Kyler, because Kyler the area. is Kyler better than Dak Prescott, though. I think. Uh, I think that's, it can that's, be. That's the flip. You you're gonna have to have a new coach who thinks Kyler's good enough to win Listen, and get rid of Dak. None of these are great answers. That is why I find this such an interesting thing that they're <laughs> willing to play this out. All, apparently, all of them. All of them. You can go. Okay, so you you want my plan? It's like, oh, okay, so Kyler Murray, that's your fix, or oh, a mid round quarterback because that's that's what they've done. The I mean, shoot for forever. It seems like it is. They replaced Drew Bledsoe with a guy who was drafted in the sixth or seventh round Tony Romo and they replaced Tony Romo with a guy who was drafted in the fourth round with Dak Prescott and I don't know if you can keep doing that <laughs> I, I actually I don't think you can keep doing I don't that think, I don't think you can hit that many times on those type of picks exactly and the way I mean also you haven't exactly had like a ton of success hitting with those guys. Like, true. They've been hits, and they have not been enough. It's Cooper Rush season, I think. Or, or Trey Lance. Trey Lance season. Is that who? Is that who they're going to? <sighs> so you can you can poke hole, you can okay then okay keep Dak Prescott and then it turns into you want to pay Dak Prescott fifty million dollars a year? I, I like that. That's what it becomes. Like all of these are bad options, or at least options that. It, that have a very strong downside. You're you giving your opinion. I'm giving mine. I'm paying Dak and firing Mike McCarthy, and hoping and praying that the next guy you pick is not a Jason Garrett, Mike McCarthy, Mike McCarthy type that can elevate and be a great coach that helps the entire roster. And Dak can be his, his solid and actually very good self regular season wise. And your coach takes you to a level where Dak Prescott isn't can't be considered a detriment to your winning in the playoffs. So that would be the Belichick or Vrabel or... Or even the Kyle Shanahan mo model, but that's no, a better no, quarterback. I mean just someone who's available, like yeah. the coach oh, okay. that is available. Sure, maybe you go Belichick. Maybe Belichick's the Dallas Cowboys coach, but the thought of Jerry Jones seating control to, to Bill Belichick makes me laugh. I'd love to see it happen, to see if they could co co coexist. But that's my mode. I'm not dropping Dak for like you said, a mid-round guy, because you're not going to be bad enough to draft high or yeah. trading trading for Kyler Murray or someone else. I'm I'm saying you're stuck, Cowboys, and hope and hope your coaching hire makes a difference. Oof. That's all. Oof. But and you got to pay CeeDee Lamb. You got, well, going to have to pay Michael Parsons. You got to pay people. You got to pay people. I understand. I understand. I'm just saying you got to pay those guys and Dak. I Prescott. understand it's cost prohibitive. Yeah. I understand why you might want to get away with it, get away from it, but. You, but if you're going to do that, you might as well make a trade now. Trade them now for picks so you can either be really bad this year, you just go with Cooper Rush if you like a really good quarterback in the 2025 draft, or you'd get into this draft because I don't think I don't think waiting for a guy in a second or, or later is going to help your cause. But we ain't the Cowboys, so we ain't really got to worry about it. I just thought it was an interesting thought experiment. Um, neither one of us cares what the, what happens it, to the Cowboys. It is interesting. Yeah, it but is it, interesting because it is the most, like, 
rock and a hard place kind of thing where you can just go, really? That's your plan? Yeah. And, and no matter what the plan is. <laughs> we would be the guys everyone hates. Oh, that's your plan? Do you have a different one? No, but or, that's your plan? Or my plan is equally as like, ugh. Yeah, it's, it's not better than yours, but yours I know is terrible. It involves hopefully you get lucky and are in a position to draft the next Will Levis in the second <laughs> round. That's my plan. Woof. Will Levis. I mean, Jeremy Branham notwithstanding. Will Levis being your being your plan is terrible. It ain't it ain't Dak Prescott level of concern if you're a Cowboys fan and, and he might be leaving. But I do want to talk about what's happening at Texas, mostly because of the fans. Uh, I mean, from all accounts, and we'll talk about it when we come back, Quinn Ewers will be the starter. But Sean and others, seems like they hope it's a different guy. We'll talk about that when we come back. The Del Olalea Show continues on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's your host, Del Olalea. Before we get to the Quinn Ewer stuff and some other college football things that we're interested in, the lineup is out for the Astros. It's been out for a little bit now. It'll be the Astros, their lineup against Nesta Cortez will be Altuve, Alvarez, Tucker, Bregman, Abreu, McCormick, Diaz, Pena, and Myers. And, of course, Fromber is on the mound. So the lineup we all saw coming comes to fruition. Yordan as the two. Myers as your starting center fielder and hitting ninth. And Pena in the eight hole. So we're, what are we, about 
two or three hours away from the uh, opening pitch. A little over that. I think it's a three ten start. I believe is when uh, when Fromber throws the first pitch because baseball. Let's can't can't start at three. Can't start at three. Can't start at three. It's either been three oh seven or three ten. Baseball always has weird times, but a three ten's at least a round number. Um, but that is your opening day lineup. Go and it probably will the lineup will be the lineup you see on most days when all those guys are available. And we'll see how how dynamic Joe Espada is when it comes to his lineup, or maybe maybe it'll be relatively something that we see all the time and very consistent. Uh, so that'll be determined by. I guess performance, but that's the lineup as the Astros try to get off to a good start as they face the Yankees, which I don't think has a lot of juice. I know it's the Yankees, but it's hammer and nail until the Yankees prove a threat. Other than just rooting against something from New York, I don't I don't feel like there's a lot of juice there. I mean, we beat up on them all the time. Yeah, it helps that it's the Yankees. That helps. I know, yeah, bec- the New York thing. I get it. You hate New the New the New York thing. You hate all the attention the Yankees get. Get, but all the Astros do is beat them when it matters most. The Yankees could sweep this series, and all they're gonna. I mean, they're delusional, so their fan base will go crazy. But all you gotta do, all you gotta do, is point to the moments where you felt the same way, and, th- and then the Astros ripped your soul from your body. But but we'll see. It, it begins again at three ten here in town. I mentioned Sean and his love of a Texas quarterback. He texted me yesterday out of the blue about a, with, about a conversation he was having with one of his one of his friends. I just thought you would enjoy the uh, <laughs> the peek inside the the curtain. So it's a it's a tweet from a CJ Vogel, Quinn Ewers and Arch Manning throwing to Isaiah Bond and John T. Cook. You know, it's a ten second clip of watching those guys throw against the air, and whoever this is, who you know, just commented arch is better lol (laughs) (laughs) and you go and you said was quinn's even a completion i didn't see the video this is where this is where college fan bases are at they're throwing against air there is and i responded with yeah but quinn was going against the first team all air defense so you can't you can't judge him he was going against the best air defense out there this is what this is where college fans are at like this is something that'll go on throughout the year quinn yours was the quarterback of a playoff team and Texas people are still having, and Texas, by Texas people, I mean Texas fans, are still having this conversation about where's Arch? Where's Arch? Arch is better. He is, Quinn Ewers, yes, there are some concerns, but I just want to point out, Quinn Ewers was Arch before Arch as far as expectations. But, you know, people are star efforts, and he's got the Manning name, and so that means more, despite the fact that Quinn Ewers, everyone was, depressed when he decided to pick Ohio State. But now, a couple years later, which in, once again involves a playoff appearance, <laughs> you're still talking about Arch Manning. And Arch Manning wasn't even the backup quarterback last year. He wasn't good enough to beat out Malik Murphy, who who saw the writing on the wall. I'm getting out of here because at some point, either they're going to run me out of town or they're just going to give Arch the backup job no matter what. So he left. I think he's at Duke now. Yeah, um, Duke. You have a playoff caliber quarterback. And... Yet a quarterback that played in the playoffs. Oh, see, that's hate. <laughs> that's hate. That, there's that, nothing can be said about that, but that's hate. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I mostly just like to have fun with it and just poke and prod at, at it because Quinn Ewers is not so good that he's like unimpeachable. But Sark is Sark has said starter, right? That's yeah. all. He's a starter. Yeah. Until a, a rough half against season. rough half against Michigan, we'll see, right? Yeah. yeah. Are you secretly ho- are you secretly hoping? Can't say healthy. Yeah. Oh, oh, there you there you go. Are you secretly hoping that you're in the game in the first half, but he throws like two picks, <laughs> and Sarkeesian makes a call because he's forced to, and because he can't let the rest of the team down. <laughs> Is be I'm honest. Not hoping. I no, I'm not. I'm hoping I, for that. What? Is it part of the, the the math for you that hey, he throws a couple picks, but the defense is playing great? No, you know, I, you know, Michigan's lost a lot of guys. They're still in the game, but love, he's throwing I picks. Love, I love for Quinn Ewers to do nothing but raise his draft stock. That's a lie. That's this a season. lie. That's a lie. <laughs> what? I know. Lie? I know. No, you're hoping that game against Michigan, where Michigan's lost a lot. They're in the game, but Sark has to make that tough call. He's got to make the tough call and bring in Arch. That don't don't pretend like that's I'm, not, I'm not part of it. That's not what I hope happens. You wouldn't mind it though. 
That's not what I hope happens. He wouldn't mind it, ladies That's and gentlemen. That's not what I hope happens. I, I didn't say you hope. I, I I've, want, I've, re- I've I, pulled back the I hope. I want to have a stress-free, just, you know, yawn, 15-0, and 0, win the national championship. With, with Arch Manning as the quarterback. Uh, right. With whoever. I'm a team guy. Whoever at quarterback. You kind of want to be validated for your opinion that Arch should be playing. Uh, so that um, – that – video that i sent you or the screenshot i guess of the video that yeah. i sent you that tweet has since been deleted <laughs> you think the texas mafia got after this kid i wanted to i wanted to look for uh i wanted to look in the replies to show that i'm not alone so i, I went, know you're not alone i went to another uh cj vogel uh practice video this one is just quinn yours uh throwing to isaiah bond a, a deep ball uh again um no defense against there and literally all the comments are Bond pulls up that he's got to get fixed. This is an interception. The SEC underthrown. <laughs> Just uh, every comment. <laughs> That's a pick with the DB cover. I going. will reiterate, he was a quarterback of a team who made the playoff, and yet even in practice reps where nothing matters, he is getting criticized. Quinn Ewers lost us the championship. Oh, by the way, deep shots are. Ass. Oh, by the way, I want to point out. <laughs> He was throwing deep balls against an SEC defense last year on the road, and they were just fine. But the practice ones are getting people upset. When people ask why didn't Ewers declare, even though he's eligible, please show him this video in his high school arm and ta- uh, oh. timing. The guy was dropping dimes to Worthy and Mit- and A.D. Mitchell in Tuscaloosa, and yet the practice clips. You know what <laughs> lost you the game against Washington? You- Fumbling. That and my and you could and you okay. Let's get into all the excuses. <laughs> I was just gonna say you couldn't stop Michael Penix, but sure. Let's get into all the conspiracies you want to talk about. The refs. I actually, I actually don't think the ref cheated. The ref favored Washington over Texas in a yeah. game. Yeah. It was, no. It was. It was. Uh. It was the all all first team air defense. Yeah, and the problem was there were 11 Texas guys out there, and they couldn't get stops when it mattered. But Michael Penix looked better against actual defenders than Quinn Ewers does against Air. Oh, that's that's really good. <laughs> <laughs> that's really good. So you're 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 all you're all your first team hater is what I call you. No, it, I again, I just like to have fun with the hating. Sure, but but you're in it, but you're in on it though, and you welcome it. And Qu- this is what Quinn Ewers has to deal with. Hey, man. You made the playoff, but that don't matter. You, we got Arch behind you. You know, the guy who was playing against, like, little kids in high school. <laughs> you watch, okay, you, okay. Don't, you watch Arch highlights. Don't, don't demean Catholic school football, please. I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not saying New Jersey Catholic school football. I'm talking about what Arch was playing against. <laughs> I, oh, yeah, in a league that produced uh, uh, Odell Beckham and Peyton and Eli Manning, among others. I didn't hear you mention any defenders. Which is what Arch was going against. I saw the guys he was stiff arming. <laughs> those guys double. What? Those guys were playing in the band at halftime, and then they had, then they p- let them play because they don't have no. Oh, 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 <laughs> they don't. They don't have on. enough players. Or, stu- those, or those kids are gonna have. Are they're gonna go to D one schools? Sure, not to play sports though. Well, you know they're gonna go to D one schools. They're sure. gonna pl- they're gonna be at so many LSU games this year. <laughs> I'm, sh- I'm sure plenty of those kids will wind up at LSU watching, uh, watching um whoever the backup is at L- whoever the new starter is at LSU this year. Um, is it Nussmeier? Is he still there? I think so. Yeah, sure. Let's go with Nussmeier. Yeah. Give him the job. I hope not for LSU's sake. But before we go, I wanted to talk about more hate. If you want to call it that, Prince, amount a million. I hope I got that right. He is a transfer from. Florida. He's now Ole Miss. And he was asked about his experience. You know, you want to always want to talk to the new transfers, the guys who made headlines going from one school to the other, particularly when he was at an SEC school. This is Prince Princely, excuse me, I call him Prince Princely, discussing the transition from Florida to Ole Miss and what he's learned. My uh, attacking the run game a little bit, but I feel like here I'm getting coached harder for things like that. You know, I feel like at Florida, like, the way I was coached, it was kind of like, it was almost as if like they was just telling me to go out there and use my talent, if that makes sense. But here, you know, Coach Lou and Coach, um, damn, oh, Coach Lou and Coach Joyner, they really on me about the little things, you know, attacking the run. Coach Lou really goes through the progressions of the drops and the routes that are being run when I have to go into coverage. Like when I was at Florida, it was like, they would just tell me go drop to this area and I would have to figure out everything else on my own. But here, you know, they go real into depth. I feel like I'm actually getting, you know, developed here. 
and that's the banger. I I actually feel like I'm getting developed. If if you aren't as big of a nerd when it comes to college football as myself and Sean are, coaches sell development. They sell, come to our program, we'll we'll develop you. They start to list all the guys they've helped either win all conference awards or, or get drafted. This is what you're selling. And at Florida, under Billy Napier, hasn't been a great run. So all he can do is point back to maybe his time at UL and not Louisville, Louisiana, and talk about who who's done well, the guys that got into the league. He probably can talk about, I don't know if he was there for Robert Hunt. Robert Hunt was a guard at slash tackle at and was a raging Cajun, just got a big deal from the Panthers. So all you do is talk about when you don't have wins to sell is development. And when one, one of the guys who you coached and recruited said, you know what, I don't get developed there. It's the banger. It'll be something everyone recruits against Florida with, and certainly what Ole Miss will tell you. That's an SEC school that doesn't develop. Come here. We'll get you to a spot where you understand a defense. It's not just about your talent, and we'll get you ready for the league. So I don't know if I want to call that hate, but it is a shot across the bow when it comes to recruiting. recruiting. And, you know, maybe Billy Napier agreed because he had a first-year D.C. last year. You know what he did? He hired someone to help him. He hired a – and I love the uh, the official title for the new guy, Ron Roberts, who Napier is familiar with because Ron Roberts worked with him at Louisiana. His title is Executive Head Coach for Defense, Co-Defensive Coordinator, and Linebacker Coach. Those are a lot of titles for a guy who's supposed to hold the hand of the guy you hired last year. That's what that's what he's there for because the guy you hired was the wrong one. You don't want to fire him, so you just hire a guy you're familiar with and knows can get the job done. Uh I'm glad it happened to Florida. It couldn't happen to a nicer bunch. We got one more segment to go. I do want to talk about Kelly Oubre. He had a moment last night, uh, and we'll talk about him on the other side.
This is the Dell Olalea Show on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Broadcasting live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's Dell Olalea. Welcome back. Short on time. You heard a promo for what's happening on Friday, but what's happening next is Gallant and George going to be out at the decoy following this show. And also, the Killer Bees will, will be out there too. So if you want to head out there, and uh, enjoy the Astro season getting underway. You can also get $10 Shiner Box, 100-ounce towers, and $2 Mexican candy shots. You can just go watch the Astros and hang out with Galant and George, and then the Killer Bees out at the decoy today as uh, we celebrate opening day. I mentioned Kelly Oubre before, or at least in the last segment. I want to get to him before we go to the break. If you missed it, if you were just focused on the Rockets, understandably, uh, I, I get that. But... Another game going on at the same time was the Clippers and the Sixers. The Clippers are struggling. They went into Philadelphia, were down big early, fought their way back, and Kawhi Leonard took over on the offensive end and on the defensive end if you don't think Faust can be called late because the Sixers would disagree. A couple drives by Kelly Oubre resulted in defensive plays by first Kawhi on a block and then Paul George on what was obvious to be a blocking call. It was, you know, the law of vert- verticality, except it wasn't straight up and down. Sure, his arms were up, but he moved from point B to point A or point A to point B and blocked off Kelly Oubre. No call. The officials even at the end of, at the end in their pool report stuff said, yeah, we should have made, we should have called the foul. Of course, if they don't make a call, there's nothing to review, which is weird with the, with officiating. If they don't, if they don't call it a foul, then they can't take it back. Um, so, the Sixers lose the ball game they they really needed um, as they wait for Joel and B to come back. And because of the non calls, Kelly Oubre went off on the officials. People who could read lips did a great job of trying to speculate what he said. You guys remember Stephen A. Smith talking about Jason Whitlock? Uh, if you don't, here it is. You bitch. And that's what Kelly Oubre said to every official. And he didn't leave it at that. He said that. And then he said, your mama's one, your grandma's one, and your granddad's one. The question is, Sean, at the end of a game, how much do you get fined for verbal abuse to an official? Because it's not in game. And he didn't didn't not leave the court in a timely fashion. All the things we hear about what gets a guy fined. He didn't get thrown out. But when you do that to multiple officials and then talk about the grandma, their mom, and their dad or whatever whatever yeah. he got to, what are we thinking? Somebody said it's $25,000 per bitch. <laughs> I think that's harsh because he said bitch a lot. Should or should, should like your mom and grandma be one in, together? Or does that like stack? Or does like, he? Does it count as more? It's like, whoa, okay. So the rate to call a ref a bitch is X, Y, Z, but to call his grandma a bitch. Are oh we, my God. Do we go up to 35 <laughs> K? Yeah, that's, that's time and a half. Now we're only going by lip reading, whatever. I don't know exactly what he yeah. said, but you could tell he called someone <laughs> that and how many times he did it quite a bit. Do you just go verbal abuse to each ref gets you like 15? Cause we don't want to hit him with 75. So we're going to hit him with, we're going to hit him with 45 cause he verbally abused each ref or we do, or do you think twenty five per ref is a, is a fair number? I don't think you should be call, You should be fined twenty five grand for calling someone a bitch, even if it is a referee. Yeah, yeah. I think hmm. maybe yeah, maybe like thirty, thirty or forty. A total of thirty. Yeah, ten for each ref. I think that's a fair number. And then and then you disrespected one of their grandmas, so we're gonna add a little extra on top. Uh, t- throw a five on. Yeah, top. a five on top. Okay, so thirty five is what we're up to. And he al- and he also gave. Uh, the ref's the finger too. <laughs> uh, okay. This, that, uh, that's this was this wasn't in that tirade. It was oh, okay. before that he he gave that got caught on film. Okay, but still last night. Yes, it was last okay, night. Yes, still last night. Yes. Okay. He had a he had a he had a great night last night. Oh my god. Uh, man, I would hate to be the NBA having to <laughs> having to decipher <laughs> how much is a middle finger. How much? Because there has to be something for when you do. Each of one of them individually. Yeah, he pointed, and then and but no, I'm saying where if you just give a ref a middle finger, or if you just call him a bitch. Well, to, but to, if you do it all in the same combined, night, 
I feel like I feel like it starts stacking up. Yeah, a preponderance of evidence, you'd say. You get a multiplier effect. Yeah, Kelly, Kelly, Kelly Oubre, after a preponderance of evidence, we're going to hit you with the sixty k because the finger, the multiple bitch you is need to chill. And then you call, you talk about the grandma and their dad. We're going to hit you with the fine that encompasses all of that, and hopefully you learn your lesson. Uh, but go w- t- type in Kelly Oubre on Twitter if you missed it. He was on one last night, and if you if you <laughs> and then after the game, he talked about going to a chiropractor. So he had a lot of things to say, uh, but it wasn't great for the Sixers. They lose a, a close one last night. As Kawhi had a couple van ones uh, to in the Clippers' struggles at least for a night as they beat the Sixers in Philadelphia. That'll wrap up the show for us. As I mentioned, Gallant and George are coming up next, followed by the Killer Bees. Go out to the decoy, drink, eat, enjoy the Astros as they get their season started with hopefully a Framber Valdez great performance and a win over the Yankees. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Welcome into a show where we don't do math and sometimes we make sense, but I can tell you this. I can do $2 because that's how much a Mexican candy shot costs today at the decoy. Hell yeah. I can do $10 because that's how much a 100-ounce Shiner Bach costs here at the decoy today because it's Astros opening day and we are live here at the decoy from noon until 6. Come join us when they open up at noon. Great spot to watch the Astros opening day. Great spot to watch March Madness as the the tournament gets back underway tonight. The Cougs, our beloved Cougs, in action tomorrow night. But it's opening day, Paul. It is opening day. We made it. They do open up at 2 o'clock, not noon. Again, your math, suspect. I said so. 2. You said noon. No, I said noon. And they open up at 2, my bad. Yeah. What a strong start to the day. I, I mean, you're rattled by the change to our show open. It just, I, I, was, I was warned a little bit. I got a pre-apology. Uh, okay, but I'm not Joel, so you don't have to apologize. It's okay. I'm not going to be offended like he typically is. Sorry, Joel. Not. Don't but, be sorry. <laughs> that's why I said not. But you apologized before you said not. Sorry, not sorry. 
Okay. I said it out of order. Okay. But I'm not offended by that. I think that's very funny. I enjoy that. Thank you, Brian and Michael uh, Michael Carroll, for doing that for us today. I very much appreciate it. Um, but it's Astros opening day. We finally made it. The lineup is out. It looks a little bit different. Going forward this season, Joe Spada meeting with the media right now. Your top four are going to be Jose Altuve, followed by Jordan Alvarez, followed by Kyle Tucker, followed by Alex Bregman. Back-to-back lefties. It is a new era of Astros baseball. Fifth best offense in baseball last year in spite, as some would say, of Dusty Baker not putting out the optimal lineup on a daily basis. So it stands to reason with a healthier lineup that this offense could be one of the best in baseball, if not the very best. That's very exciting. And it will be fun to throw not just Jose Altuve, but Jordan Alvarez at Nestor Cortez and his mustache as soon as today's game opens and today's season begins. And our, our question of the day today is, yesterday we took the, the little more negative approach or just, you know, what could go wrong for the Astros. Our question of the day uh, that we want you to weigh in throughout the day on Twitch, twitch.tv slash ESPN975, ESPN's Houston, uh, ESPN Houston on YouTube, the text line 713-780-3776. What's the reason the Astros win the World Series in 2024? That's future stuff, though. We got to talk about last night. Yeah. Last night, the Houston Rockets win their 10th straight game. Jalen Green has another phenomenal night. They get the win in overtime. Yes, SGA is not playing for the Thunder, but last night was just another night of Jalen Green has arrived in, in the NBA in, in March, uh, he's playing incredible basketball. And even at the end of the you know end of regulation, when he drives to the bucket and he tries to get the layup for the win, he doesn't make it. He turns around in overtime, and he's hitting step back threes and clutch shots. And they're just playing the best basketball we've seen the Houston Rockets play since 2020. Most importantly, it's the most entertaining. But, yeah, I think the Rockets have become must-watch again. And it's been a while since they have been that. I mean, honestly, it's been since right before I moved to Seattle for two years. But last night's game was one of the most entertaining games I can remember in a long time. It was fast-paced. It was Wild and out of control at times. Lots of sloppy passes and, and, and stolen balls. But the athleticism on display from both teams was something to watch. And as you mentioned, no SGA for OKC. But, I mean, that was a hell of a win by the Rockets, who played not very well in the second quarter and third quarter. But down the stretch, they pulled it together. And, yeah, it is Jalen Green. You're going to look at the stat sheet today, and you're going to see that Jalen Green scored 37 points, 14 to 24 from the field. 7 of 11 from outside. And all of those numbers are very impressive. They do not do justice what he did last night. Joe, I was writing down, truly, whoa, wow, holy bleep level highlights that Green put together. And I think I got most of them. There was at least 12 Mm -hmm. moments where he did things that you didn't know were possible. And it's his athleticism. It's dribbling around Chet Chet Holmgren somehow and getting a layup underneath him. It's having somebody do a spin move and blow by him on a drive only to recover and actually swat the shot at the rim. He had one of the most impressive block shots I've seen in a while. Some step back threes where you're wondering how the hell he got it off. And, I mean, whatever the hell happened a month ago... I hope this continues. We all hope it continues. And there's a part of me that likes it when a guy actually makes critics like us shut up. Because let's be Mm -hmm. honest, I mean, we all wanted to play sports growing up. This is (laughs) the next best thing. Jalen Green stunk for a lot of this year. And now all of a sudden, over the last month, he has answered the call and more. He's carrying himself with a confidence, a swagger that you just don't see from a lot of young players. And you hope that this continues, but man, last night was so, so damn fun, and now I just can't wait for next week, April 4th, Warriors come out to play! I can't wait for that game. Hopefully Draymond Green plays more than four minutes. 
in that game because I would like them to beat the Warriors and cry baby Steph Curry at, at full strength when they play in that he game. He was crying last night. He was night. crying on the court when Draymond Green got ejected. It's insane. Uh, but it, it, one of the, the two guys last night that we haven't mentioned yet because as, as awesome as Jalen Green has been, the other young guys too, the evolution of Jabari Smith Jr. throughout the season has been great. I mean, watching OKC collapse three guys into the paint as Jalen Green is driving to the hoop and then he kicks it to Jabari and he's just knocking down corner threes was super impressive. But it meant Thompson, what he has achieved in March has been incredible too. He's averaging 13.2 points per game, 7.8 rebounds, 2.5 assists. Last night goes for 25 and 15. That guy is awesome too. The athleticism, when Green and Thompson are running down the court together, it's it's oh, it's it's weird to watch because we've seen guys like Ja Morant and you know Russell Westbrook who have like that elite athleticism in the fast break. The Rockets all of a sudden have two of those guys. Oh, they have more than two. I they, mean, they, they Thompson do, yeah. as well. Uh, Smith opened in that corner after not having hit a three all game. In the past, I think Jalen Green would have gone hero ball. I think he would have gone for the two there. You know. Mm-hmm. Even with all those guys collapsing on him, and this time around, he somehow found a way to throw it into the corner. And Green was wide. Or excuse me, uh, par, uh, Smith, Smith Jr. was wide open, hits it, and I mean it was just a lot of moments like that. Dylan Brooks, terrible shooting night. Then in overtime, he hits two threes, and he mm-hmm. has a nice steal in between those two threes. Big block too. Oh yeah. man, Thompson, we haven't even talked about it. just a routine double double. You yeah, know, talking twenty five and what, what was it fifteen? Yeah, twenty five and fifteen. <laughs> it's insane. They got a lot of really talented, athletic players, and yep, OKC was not at full strength last night. But with the way that the Rockets played for a lot of that game, to the point where after the game, immediately afterwards, Jabari Smith Jr. is asked by Vanessa, "Hey, uh, you know, you know what what went right today?" And he's like, "Yeah, we didn't play well." <laughs> and yeah. I thought to myself, "That's even better." I love that the mentality is, "Yeah, I mean, we, there's a lot of things that we could have done better here," and uh, we 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 cleaned it up down the stretch. But if you have that kind of mentality and obviously a very celebratory atmosphere after the game, after a game where you did win like that, I mean, you just wonder how many more games can in a row can they win? And you feel you feel confident even with uh, the next couple of games, um, specifically Dallas on Sunday, not being the easiest before they play Golden State next week. Yeah, I mean, Dallas, I, the Dallas game is going to be fun too because that's a team that obviously has an elite offense and but doesn't play a lick of defense. So that, that's, a, that's a fun matchup for the Rockets where the Rockets have been playing – Really, really good defense in March, and the offense has been there as well. I, I mean, what they scored 98, like 89 points or whatever it was in the first half the other day and last night. The, they're playing efficient basketball. They're, they're not just chucking shots and putting up a ton of points. Like, like the percentages collectively as a team from the field, from the three point line, the free throw percentage has been really good. It, it, you're right. This is the most fun Rockets team. And they are, they are must-watch. The, the Rockets are must-watch television for the first time. And like you said, before you left for Seattle and what we talked about last week, really since what I viewed as like that final stretch before the pandemic hit uh, where Russell Westbrook and, and Harden seemed to figure it out a little bit. It, this is uh, highly entertaining. And the other thing, too, that you know we've mentioned here that I just want to – the, the Thunder were not at full strength last night. It, that doesn't take away from that win to me because you're not either you're missing Shangoon Whitmore and Tari Eason that part is crazy because like, it's not just Shangoon those are three really good players but you're missing those other two and I mean Eason if he was healthy is he's six man of the year candidate and then on top of that I mean Cam Whitmore looks like he might be the steal of, of the draft yeah <laughs> and you did that without those three guys last night what they're doing is impressive that's really all I can say, uh, and and I'm going to continue to watch every single game, and I'll be honest, like earlier in the year, yeah, I wasn't doing that. No. I, there was no reason to do it, but now all of a sudden they've played their way into the playoff conversation, and yeah, they're worth your time, and if Green continues to do this, I mean, they they perhaps made the right choice with that number two overall pick a couple of years ago. I, I still wonder if that's going to happen, but I mean, he's definitely the Western Conference Player of the Month. And he is legitimately playing like the best player in basketball right now, which I never thought we would say a month ago when he was not playing well at all. Yeah, we're we're at the stretch now where I I, I'm, I believe I, I'm. You I, believe? I, I believe. And you know, I I saw saw Skip Bayless's tweet last night, and 
he's praising the Rockets and he's, you know, referencing the fact that, you know, Shangun's out. And so it seems like that's he's going to be uh, having that conversation if they wanted to have it about how the Rockets are better off without Shangun. But you have to remember that th- this, con- this, this stretch started for the Rockets with Jalen and Shangun on the court, you know, together. There was a four-game stretch where Jalen really started to emerge as this player. You don't play this good over a month of basketball and just regress to what you were before. I, I'm i not saying he's the best player in the NBA, but he has emerged as someone that he looks like a superstar. He, he looks like he can be a guy that can lead you to a championship. Like For the first time, I'm watching the Rockets, and I see someone. I've been here for – it'll be nine years officially on Monday that I've lived in Houston, Texas. And this is the first time that I've watched a player play basketball for the Houston Rockets in which I say – that guy can win a championship because I never believed in Harden. I, I was, don't know if I'm going to go that far. I, I think I am. Like, I, I'm not saying they're going to win one. Not yet, 1245. Um, but he, they, he, has, he has the capability of being that level of a player. The possibility is open. And, and I'll at the very least allow that. I'm not going to go so far as to call him Lizan al the chosen one. I was like, Paul, you're gonna have to it's from explain Dune that to me. I'm still not there yet. Yeah, because you're a dork. You haven't even watched that. I'm you a want, dad. You culture slob. No, you're a dork. I mean, forget your kid. You can watch a movie. You know, just leave, leave it, it at home. Just leave it at home. For just leave it at home. Oh, that's what I do with my cat. I'm sure you can do the same thing. Just put him in a little, in a little baby thing. It's the voice from the outer world. I'm not gonna go so far as to say he's like the prophet, the messiah, or anything sure. like that. But what he's done over the last month has been awesome, and I'm gonna continue to watch it because I feel like it's gonna happen every single night. Uh, Monday, I thought that there might be a chance that it was coming back down to earth. He was not very good in the first half against the Blazers. Second half comes back to doing what he's been doing. And then the entirety of yesterday's game. There were long stretches where he was the only thing that was going right for the Rockets. Yeah. And uh, they were doing dumb stuff, dribbling off their shoe, uh, getting swiped, bad passes. Green was a part of that to an extent. And then all of a sudden he just took over. And everyone seemed to feed off of that. And, yeah, very satisfying to win, especially because uh, – F. Josh Giddy, That guy is very annoying. I don't very. know how he managed to score 31 points last night. Did you see the dust-up between he and Jabari Smith Jr.? Yeah, that yeah. was that was weird. That's a weird one. Honestly, uh, that might be a first. To see a player, Josh Giddy walks over to Jabari and just starts yanking on his arm. Right. Smith, I guess if you want to fault him for anything, Smith takes his sweet time to get up when he falls to the court. Sure. He got called for a delay a little bit later in the game. But – Josh Giddy offers his hand to pick him up, and when Jabari Smith doesn't pay attention to it, Giddy grabs his left arm and yanks on it. Yanks on it. So Dylan Brooks comes up, and Dylan Brooks shoves him, and this bastard, Giddy, who obviously has some off-the-court stuff going on too, this guy has just gotten Dylan Brooks suspended because that was Dylan Brooks' 16th technical foul on the year. So I, I, I also enjoy that I'm finding people to hate again too. Because, I mean, I, I would say that I enjoy hating more than I enjoy loving. That's fair. Yeah. Uh, this this does feel like a team we're going to hate, the, the Thunder. There, this There's some juice. There could be some juice to this rivalry. Definitely. I mean, because... if you watch a game like that again, where both of these teams are going a million miles per hour, it was like a Fast and Furious movie, you know? Uh, there's a lot of slop in it. <laughs> Fast and Furious, let's be honest. There's there some moments where you're like, oh, okay, calm down, Vin Diesel. But at the same time, this game, up and down the court, Great energy, lots of athleticism. You had a couple of little, you know, shoving matches with Josh Giddy. I like it. And uh, we'll see what happens next time around if, if Shingun's back and if SGA's back. But uh, if, if I'm the Thunder, yeah, I'm, I'm probably pretty pissed off about this. So I'd imagine if there is a rematch, maybe it's in the playoffs or something like that, it'll, it'll be quite fun. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not impossible to see the Rockets take on the Oklahoma City Thunder in, in the first round of the playoffs. The Rockets would have to do, um, I guess – yeah, I mean, you need the Thunder to catch the Nuggets probably, which they're only a half game back right now. So it's feasible. We could see this as a, as a first-round matchup in the NBA playoffs this year, which is something I, I never thought we were going to say this season. But the Rockets win their 10th straight. It's opening day. We are live here at the decoy. Join us at 2 o'clock when they open. Come watch the Strohs. Come watch March Madness. $2 Mexican candy shots. Uh, $10 for 100 ounces of Shinerbach. So come hang out with the decoy. Get ready for opening day. Our question of the day, what is the reason the Astros win the World Series in 2024? We will address that next year on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5.
It's Gallant and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Broadcasting live from the Mobile Veritex Community Bank Studios inside the decoy in Spring Branch. Here's Paul Gallant and Joe George. If you're looking for a place to watch your Cougs tomorrow night, they'll be having a the uh, Cougs West Houston watch party this Friday. Full audio throughout the decoy. They'll also have a DJ playing during the commercials. Uh, and through March Madness, they have $6 Casamigos. So come out, watch the Cougs tomorrow night, watch the Astros today, and, and, and let the good, the good vibes keep rolling here, Paul. I mean, this is, this is a good time in Houston sports, man. Is it the golden era of Houston sports? Yeah, I remember having that conversation in 2017. So 2017, you have the, the Astros obviously won the World Series. Uh, Deshaun Watson tears his ACL the morning after the World Series. Couldn't be the golden age because he tore his ACL. But you had the beginning of it, maybe. You maybe had the beginning of the massages as I mean, well. That's true. That's maybe that's where it started. Maybe it started at Clemson. Who knows? Hmm. Who knows? I know in 2018 that we had that conversation yeah. with the Texans having an incredible nine-game winning streak. Nine games. Also, the Rockets getting within a game of the NBA Finals, but Chris Paul has the hamstring issue. Yep. Uh, the Houston Astros were trying to repeat, but 18 couldn't be the year. 19 couldn't be the year. I mean, it's on the table this year. It's on the table. Now, what's going to have to happen is you got to, you know, you have to have the Rockets make the playoffs, number one. You have to have the Texans at least make it to the AFC Championship. And number three, you need an Astros World Series. If you could do that all within the next calendar year, huzzah! We are back yeah, in I the mean, golden era of Houston sports, and we can continue to have this hack radio conversation. It's very logical that in 2024 – the Houston Texans, well, they already won a playoff game. The Rockets will make the play-in tournament. And the Astros will maybe win a World Series this year. Certainly possible. So what is the key? What's what's the, what's the why? why? Why do the Astros win the World Series in 2024 for you? Their lineup should be better. To me, it's about that. Not just because of what Joe Espot is doing on a daily basis, but also because going into the year, they're healthy for a change. Bregman's not coming off of... Some sort of injury, which he suffered in the 2022 World Series. You have Jordan Alvarez, hopefully at 100%. Though, <laughs> what happened? Was it ball off of uh, his foot? Was it allergies? I don't know what had him pulled from a game in spring training. Hopefully, everything's okay on his end. Jose Altuve did not get injured in the World Baseball Classic. And on top of that, Jose Abreu, you hope that he's comfortable here in Houston, that he's not dealing with whatever issues he was dealing with last year seemed like there might have been some back issues he was taking some of pilates Mm -hmm. you're expecting to have yiner diaz in the lineup on a more regular basis you're expecting to have Chaz mccormick in the lineup on a more regular basis mauricio dubon's a guy coming off of the bench kyle tucker even if he struggled in the postseason last year still kyle tucker this is a year where the offense that was fifth best in baseball could be significantly better, maybe even the best lineup in baseball. And the lineup is going to have to carry them until the starting pitching gets healthy. And but The sorry. lineup to me is the biggest reason, Joe, why they will win. I, I tend to agree. You know, and the first two th- things we got on the text line uh, are similar to almost the opposite of what we talked about yesterday. In a way, it's just they hit it home. They, they play well at home this year because that's why they didn't make go to the World Series. That's why they didn't win the World Series last year because they couldn't hit at Minute Maid Park. So if they just would have figured that out, they would have beat the Rangers in the ALCS and they probably would have dog walked the Arizona Diamondbacks. Dog walk them. So I, the Astros were right there. And, and, it was on the table. And, and they'll be there again. And, and the, the lineup is, is, a, is a great one because we know the talent. I, I mean, looking at the line, I love the idea – of Tucker and Alvarez hitting back to back, it's it's no offense to Dusty, but it, it is it is antiquated in, in the way. Oh, that, how dare you! Dusty yeah, was our fearless leader. That you view well, he's no longer. So I feel like I can say more mean things now. Yo, what are you? Uh, are you are you Stalin? You're gonna you're gonna besmirch Lennon before us, huh? By you're the way, Photoshop him out of the photos. Uh, my sources tell me we lost that prop bet on the uh, Parker Mashinsky, uh, being upset about that one yesterday. Oh, uh, we Joel did. Blank. Uh, but I've not yet to see Jeremy Branham tweet uh, what's wrong with Joe's lineup. Yeah, so I mean, maybe maybe he's not coward. Gonna, maybe he's not going to commit to the bit this year. Coward, and uh, you know maybe casual racism. Hmm. Dusty Baker, black man, you're going to do that every single day, but oh, you're not going to do it for Joe Espada, huh? 
I thought this was America. I thought we cared about people. I thought we thought everybody was equal. What did Martin Luther King Jr. say? I have a dream. And uh, I have a dream that Jeremy Branham is going to judge everybody's lineup equally. Hmm. I hope so, too. I hope so, too. Why, why did he focus on Dusty Baker? I'm just asking the question. I mean, he might have tweeted it since the last time I looked, but I just don't know. Uh, I, sure. I'm, I'm just asking the question. I think it was just uh, he, he chose Dusty. He chose an enemy for the show, mm. or at least for himself. And Dusty Baker was his target last year. He was, and uh, and you got to wonder why. And you got to wonder if he's the reason why Dusty Baker's not here, and why no one wanted to work, wanted the job. Uh, well, it might have been besides the Joe Spada and the Twitter people, and, and the, the Twitter people, the, the tweeters, yeah. Uh, but the besides the lineup, the the back end of the rotation, uh, regardless of the start of the season or the end of the season, to me is going to be very important. Uh, when you look at Ronald Blanco, uh, JP France, who they will start on. Sunday and Monday, Joe Espada said, it's TBD the order because J.P. France, dad's strength is coming. Mm. J.P. France's wife, uh, MTV's from the challenge, Jess, is pregnant and they're expecting a baby this weekend. What? What does that mean? You've never watched the challenge? I don't even know what that is. Stop it. What is that? You didn't watch like Real World? No. Why would I watch that? That's like prime our era growing up, isn't it? You didn't watch. I'm, that's really surprises me, Paul. I, I mean, I'm, I never watched MTV. I'm, I'm a, honestly, I'm that legitimately kind of, ha, have never watched MTV outside huh. for TRL. That actually, that just and for that like five minutes because I, yeah, I wasn't really into music, so. Huh. I thought I thought you would be a real world guy. I don't know why. No. No. Okay. I'm more. I'm more into The Bachelor. Okay. So the real world was a reality television show in which they've changed it now into which it's more of an athletic competition in which they live in a house. And JP France. So this is what the real world is now. Yes. Yeah, they just gave up on it? Yeah, yeah, now it's just called the challenge. And it's more athletic competitions, but it's still the real world at the same time. And JP France's wife was a cast member on the show for multiple years. Oh. Why haven't they asked me on? I don't know. You really a good show. I think you'd be a good fit on I, this. I, I, I do too. Not I, a good show. So. I was watching Survivor last night and I was like, I think You're Paul. watching Survivor still? Yeah. God, you're a dad. <laughs> What's wrong with Survivor? Uh, who still watches Survivor? There's lots been 70 of seasons. That's why lots of people, because lots of people still watch it. It's fake. So what? So is wrestling. I the, watched that too. The only kind of Survivor that would be a real show would be if people were actually out in the woods and they had to like resort to possibly cannibalizing each other and killing each other. This is not, this isn't real. I think it's Hey, you got to walk over the coals and not be sad when you do it. What a dumb show. Okay, so back to J.P. France and Blanco. <laughs> Uh, whether it's the beginning of the season when they're in the rotation or later in the season, they're going to be a big part of it because they are your solution to the middle of the bullpen. Like, like when, when McCullers, Garcia, Verlander, Arkady all start coming back in throughout the year, the, the bullpen kind of fixes itself in theory with J.P. France and Ronald Blanco becoming your middle relief guys, mm-hmm. especially Blanco because he's done it before. I don't know what J.P. France's stuff would look like in the bullpen, how much he can really tune it up and be an effective guy for an inning, I would hope he can do it a little bit. But they, they can be your problem solver because that, to me, is the biggest weakness of this team when you look at the big picture of the Astros in 2024 is the middle of the bullpen. So those are your solutions. They're your solution at the beginning of the season or pretty much till July to when people get healthy, and they're going to be your solution when you get to the postseason. So that, to me, is the key. I think J.P. France, Blanco, the, the, those back-end guys – they're how you get back to the World Series by they fix your bullpen problems. Yeah, you're because obviously <coughs> most of these guys aren't going to be throwing six innings. Yeah, you know Fromber maybe. I, I don't even know if Verlander's going to get that anymore with what he dealt with this off season. You know, um, and just given his age, do you do you want to make him go the distance? So really, the lineup has to carry you through a very tough opening stretch of the schedule the teams that they'll play they play obviously the Yankees to open things up no matter how you feel about the Yankees last year they certainly added by bringing in Juan Soto you are going to play the Rangers twice you're going to play the Blue Jays you're also going to play the Braves that is a lot 20 games in 21 days without starting pitching depth the lineup has to get off to a great start you get off to a great start you're in great shape Mm -hmm. Because I would imagine the schedule is going to open up a little bit after that. But this is, I mean, a brutal first eighth of the year. And you are without a lot of depth at this moment in time. Yeah, it's and that's where you you look at the offseason. And we just got a text here about the, you know, about Clevenger, if he would be an option. The the Astros clearly, they they believe at least enough 
in, in the depth that they have right now to to carry them through this tough stretch and and I'm sure it balances out throughout the year. I don't I don't know exactly what the last month of the season looks like right now, but you typically play more teams in your you know in your division that last month and a half of the year and you know you'll get the A's a bunch this season. They're not going to be very good. That's one thing that's also nice about the new schedule change too is you are going to play the worst teams in baseball because you play every single team. Yeah, but I it's not a, you don't play them a ton. I'd but. rather play more AL West games, ironically, because what we learned last year when you're playing 13 games against each of those AL West teams. Mm-hmm. All right, that's that's 20 less games against bums. I didn't like the new schedule last year. I thought I was going to a lot. I like the idea of playing every single team once, and one year it's at home, one year it's on the road. And by the end of the season, I was I I just I, I felt that the a, a race like what the Rangers, Astros, and Mariners were going through deserved a lot more baseball games to be played within the division to, to really figure it out. I, yeah. I, I get why they did it, but I, I did not. By the end it might of the have year, actually looked like the AL Central win loss wise at the end of the year. Yeah, it, it was just would have been it would have been nice. All right, uh, Fred here on the Twitch, maybe the most optimistic Astros fan I've ever met now at this point, or at least seen on the Twitch. So he's ready for the most dominant regular season and postseason ever. I hope so. I hope so, Fred. I, ho- I hope that we're going to go on a run this year and we're going to see the most dominant run in the regular season and postseason. That'd be wonderful. Of course. Uh, but when we get back, we, we, we teased this yesterday. We just didn't happen to get to it. But the Athletic gave the Astros a B this offseason. So now that the season's here and you know what your depth is in the rotation, you know what your lineup looks like and opening day roster, how, how do you feel that the Astros did this offseason? That's next year on Galat and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. First, let me tell you about my friends at MyBookie and MyBookie.ag. You go to the website, you sign up with promo code BET975, and guess what happens? They're going to match your first deposit up to $1,000, and you get to play with that money right away. Has Paul been on a winning streak or what? Did I tell you to take the Rockets plus four and a half last night? Yes, I did. Did I tell you to take the Cougs to cover against Longwood, more like Shortwood, last Thursday? Yes, I did. So what am I going to give you today? We're going to bet on the Houston Astros in today's opening day game, 3 o'clock over at Minute Maid Park. I mean, I suppose I could do that. And to take a look, the Astros are one-and-a-half run favorites with Fran Valdez on the mound against Nestor Cortez. The, I mean, the Astros are the Yankees' daddies. And as I said before, is this not the best lineup in baseball? It's damn close to it. They're going to shell Nestor Cortez today. Over under is eight and a half if you want to get in on that. But the Astros, one and a half run favorites against the New York Yankees with vengeance on their mind against these damn heretics from the Bronx who dare question their achievements. Come on. you got to take the Astros. MyBookie.ag, promo code BET975 for that awesome deposit bonus. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere, only with MyBookie.ag.
You're listening to Gallant and George, broadcasting live from the Mobile Veritex Community Bank Studios located at the Decoy in Spring Branch. Jose Altuve walking off the New York Yankees in 2019. One of the best moments. No, you know what? Let me stop that. The best thing I've ever seen in person. That's the best you've ever seen in person. The best sporting event, uh, sporting moment I've ever seen. Wow. I, 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 I really don't have anything that comes close. I, I saw a game winner in the Stanley Cup in like 2010 or 12, but I, I, there was, those moments are hard to find, you know, in your life as you're watching games, but. That one, I was there for it, and it was incredible. What's your favorite Astros-Yankees moments? We'll discuss. We'll put highlights throughout the show because there's so many. There's Chapman, so many good ones. Chapman smiling like a dumbass. Oh, I love it. After he just got smoked also adds to the mystique. And I think it's aged well because it's so deep in the mind of these loser Yankee fans. He was wearing a buzzer. No, Altuve just smoked a pitcher who was on the downside of his career. Because yeah. that's where Aroldis Chapman, as the dominant reliever that we knew, died. He died right there. I mean, look, Aroldis Chapman, closer for the Pittsburgh Pirates in 2024. Did you know that? <laughs> I was wondering where he was because, of course, he was on the Rangers last year. Yeah. It does bum me out that he is a world champion and that he's going to get a ring at some point this yeah, season. Yeah, I'm sure he'll get traded to a team like he did last year, started the season on the Royals, moved to the Rangers. But the, the fact that this guy is on the Pirates right now, thinking Arr. back to what he was in 2019 when Altuve hit that home run, is is incredible. We're live here at the Decoy. Come on, stop in when they open up at 2 o'clock. The Killer Bees will be here until 6 I'll be hanging out watching the Strohs game with them as well. $2 Mexican candy shots, uh, $10 for 100 ounces of Shiner Buck. Great place to watch March Madness. Those $6 Casamigos throughout the tournament as well. Uh, so the Athletic graded the, the Astros offseason at a, a B, Paul. Now, they didn't do a ton. It was a light offseason, to be to be fair. I mean, they, they, they signed Josh Hader to that massive contract, Victor Caratini, but they don't in the offseason, address the depth of the rotation. They really don't address the bullpen besides some low-level moves like, like Dylan Coleman and guys that I'm not even sure if the, who made the opening day roster. I haven't fully looked at it yet, but not a ton. But one big, sexy splash signing when jo with Josh Hader and a good backup for Yiner Diaz. How do you view the Astros offseason? The problem is that they could not get everybody healthy over the course of the offseason. Yeah. What can you really do about that? It would be fiscally irresponsible to spend a ton of money knowing that a lot of these guys should, or worse, could be back at some point this year. But I do think you've got to take a look at the payroll. There is a significant increase in the payroll from – this year um, from last year. I, I think it's ro it's risen from 179.9 to $239 million. So it's not like they're penny-pinching or anything like that. They're spending more money than the Texas Rangers, and we'll see how much of an impact Josh Hader has. But I, I don't know how much better they could have made themselves. So I'll say C. I mean, Josh Hader, great. But losing Hector Neris and losing Phil Maton and – and Stanek. Stanek, I don't care about it. Yeah, same here. I yeah, totally he's, he's I not. forgot I forgot he was on the roster to be perfectly yeah. honest last year. And the Astros kind of forgot about him in the twenty twenty two playoffs. Um but the Maldi change uh, there will probably be some effect at first. Uh, no Brantley. You weren't really expecting Brantley to be back last year. But you bring in Hader and you lost two pretty good relievers in Nearest and Maton, who were both outstanding for you last year. So I I'm gonna say C. Uh, the Hater move is great. Had they not added Hater, I, I would be a little flustered, especially with the injury to Kendall Graveman. Big time. I, you don't you don't have Hater. You, you're in a world of hurt in, in your bullpen right now. I mean, your your bullpen pitchers uh, for the next two days until Brian Abreu comes back are going to be Hater, Presley, Seth Martinez, Rafael Montero, 
Brandon Belock, Parker Mashinsky, and I think his name is Tyler Scott. I think it's Tyler. Tyler? I believe it's Tyler okay. Scott. Is, so that's your that's your bullpen for the next two days until Brian Abreu comes back, fresh and ready to go, and you know maybe dotting up Aaron Judge on set. No, he won't that, do that. That suspension is still so damn so ridiculous. Stupid. Adolis Garcia had a Taylor. temper tantrum. Taylor Scott. Taylor Scott, okay. It's T-A-Y, so I feel like I get a pass there. Adolis Garcia had that ridiculous temper tantrum, and – I, I don't understand how Brian Abreu was the one at fault there and how Garcia got nothing. I mean, if anyone, <laughs> totally agree. if you're going to, and, and I get it, they weren't going to suspend him in that, in that ALCS, but there's nothing for Adolis Garcia who escalated that incident significantly. There was no reason for Abreu to intentionally throw at Garcia in that game, in that moment. And I get it. The Texas Rangers were new to the whole playing in a meaningful game thing. So perhaps, you know, they're not exactly a hundred percent sure of what the hell was going on there, but that moment was ridiculous and entirely Adolis Garcia's fault. Hundred uh, percent. I would go. I, I like the B grade from from the Athletic because you assign such an elite closer and you really you have the best seven eight nine in all of baseball. So you made your team elite in in one category. And yes, you could have addressed other issues, but and and they didn't. But Part of it is if they don't sign Hater, it's it's like they do nothing besides Caratini. I don't know if you factored this in, Paul. Um, part of the, f- the 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 B grade that I'll give them is just the satisfaction of knowing that Jose Altuve is an Astro for life. Right? They signed him to that contract, and he's going to be on the team through what twenty twenty nine. So I I, I want to include that as, as that's well. That's a good call because it, even if there is a trail off at some point, I. I he, hopefully he gets 3,000 hits with the Houston Astros, and there's no, you know, Jose Altuve version of the Hakeem Olajuwon in a Rockets jersey now. So uh, I'll add that in to the equation, but it, they didn't do a lot. And I would have liked them to add, you know, Jordan Montgomery on a one-year $25 million deal or Blake Snell on the two-year $62 million deal. And I know Man, they didn't do it, but... it be close to $300 million on the payroll. If they were I know. Doing I, that. I, it's so much money. I mean, they would be over $250 million with either of those guys, adding them... For those deals. So, you're giving them a B. Okay. Yeah. E- easy grader. Maybe. You're an easy grader. Maybe I am. Yeah. I mean, that's how I got through high school. Well, see, Very see, clearly, we've learned on the show it, in the last couple of weeks. It's crazy how I, – I, I bitch and moan about this all the time, but it's crazy how now when you see grades given out by yeah. people that cover sports, B is now what a C used to be. C is satisfactory. See, and that's, that's why I give them a satisfactory because – I expected them to have Altuve for life. Sure. You had to do that. If you didn't do that, you are going to look bad. But also, while I like what they did with the Josh Hader move in terms of getting Josh Hader, five years and $90 million That's a lot of money. after Kendall Graveman got hurt, it, it screams overreactionary. And let's be honest, like bullpen arms being the same bullpen arm for five years, you're asking a lot. You're asking a lot, a lot I mean, Josh Hader. Right. You're, you're hoping – that this is going to be whatever Josh Hader is the first time you see him, which hopefully is elite, the best closer in baseball, close to the best closer in baseball. You're now basically paying for that for five years, and you already have some contracts on the books that you wish you didn't have. Rafael Montero, which you never should have done. Lance McCullers right now, because of his lack of availability, also an issue. And that's why I say satisfactory. It's not because of adding him. Adding him, they made themselves better. But you're spending a lot of money. It doesn't seem like one that's going to age well. Yeah, so generally, my philosophy on those kind of contracts, Paul, I don't know how, how you feel, is, is that if they win a World Series, I don't really care. <laughs> if the last three years of that contract, he's, he's, an, he's, he's ass. He's not good. He, he's just not the guy you so signed. One but in the world... first two years you win a World Series, I, I'm worth the, I think the move's worth it. Okay. Yeah, it's just because you, you win a World Series. You, you solidify your dynasty if you win a World Series this year and next year. And then if he's not good the three years after that, whatever. Like, the, the, Craneville will get built at some point. There will be more money at some point. We will not have to subscribe to only Fubo, uh, Xfinity, or DirecTV to be able to watch the Astros oh, on television. I wish. I wish. You know what I did? Uh, last night I, I had it. I hate Fubo. Last night I was, having, I was trying to rewind and watch Shame. highlights. They have the worst – Worst rewind feature that there is. Canceled it last night and signed up for Xfinity in the middle of the Rockets game. It was pissing me off so much. Yeah. I Because I already had Xfinity Wi-Fi, so I just was like, you know what? I, I'm done with Fubo. It was just I wanted to go back and watch something. I couldn't figure it out. And I just, you know what? 
I'm canceling this before my next payment. I signed up for the streaming service through Xfinity, and just I'm I'm moving on. I'm going back to I, one cable. It's it's funny. Like it, we've we've gotten to a point in the United States where going back to cable companies makes more sense than streaming, and where taking an actual taxi is more affordable than taking Uber. We've we've gone the complete circle mm-hmm. on so many different things. <laughs> Thanks, Biden. <laughs> yeah, they've gone way too full circle. The amount of subscription services that I have drives me nuts. But Space City Home Network, you know, hey, our TK is on the Killer Bees every year, uh, every week again this year. Um, let's can we just get an app that I can just pay like nine ninety nine a month for, and, and oh. a streaming service? And baseball, like, baseball will never do like, that. Please, baseball well, will never do well, that. Well, they're they're about to start the season. And one of their markets, one of their teams doesn't have a television deal. The Colorado Rockies are literally knocking on television. I think they might have just Wait, really? Figured, they might have figured it out in the last 48 hours. But I read a story this week that said the Rockies don't have a television deal. I, I'm, I'm curious on that front because uh, Houston's own Kelsey Wingert, uh, a friend, I know she's the Rockies sideline mm-hmm. uh, reporter. I did see a post yesterday, so I do think that they have a TV deal for this season. I hope they have a TV yeah. deal for this season well, for they've Kelsey. Been, they've been operating like they're going to get one. But, I, <laughs> yeah. but like, they were like, they were like, we don't have a TV provider because they were part of that group that lost oh, everything. Man, it's it's nuts the, the, the amount. I mean, like, I would have honestly assumed, Joe, that there would be more teams dealing with yeah. Uncertain television well, that's situations. Why that's why the Rangers said they can't sign anyone because of that Bally Sports deal oh, that fell it. apart. Oh no! Oh no! The the, the Rangers can't don't have a television. See for for the Rockies, I'm, I'm upset about that. But for the Rangers, eh, not at all. Whatever. All right, it's Thursday, so it's time for a, an edition of Good Take Bad Take. I'm trying to make it extra spicy to celebrate Opening Day. Uh, that's next year on ESPN 97.5 and ESPN 925. First, let me tell you about my friends at Pendleton Whiskey. All right, maybe you're not going to come hang out with us either here or at the old ballpark. Well, how about you get home, get yourself a glass of Pendleton whiskey. This stuff is fantastic. One, barrel-aged in American oak. Two, cut with Mount Hood glacier water. Three, blended with the finest northern grains. And you know what it does? It's essentially just giving you all that true western tradition. Come on, people. Don't you want to know what it's like to be a cowboy? Well, you know how I do it every single night. I get home after a long day, you know, giving the best sports takes in the city. Give myself a glass of Pendleton whiskey. One big rock, two fingers worth of it. It's smooth. It's refreshing. It's not too sweet. It's exactly what I'm looking for in a whiskey. And there's all sorts of different ish, uh, editions of it. You can get the military edition of Pendleton whiskey as well to show your support for military personnel. It's Pendleton whiskey. It's available at Drizzly. It's available at your local liquor store. It's true Western tradition.
Now back to Paul Gallant and Joe George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Broadcasting live inside the mobile Veritex Community Bank Studios, located at the decoy in Spring Branch. Corey Blazer. Here's a fly ball into right. Back at the wall. This game is over. Carlos Correa, I do miss that man, Paul. I do miss Carlos Correa. The face of rebellion. It's true. In the wake of slander by jealous haters. I did thoroughly enjoy on Monday night, I think it was, when Chandler and all the Astros beat reporters got to just tweet, Correa hits home run at Minute Maid Park, and they all thought the joke was so funny. Because Carlos Correa's <laughs> little brother hit a home run at Minute Maid, but they all welcome did, back. But they all did the same joke, just that Correa hits homer at Minute Maid. Listen, beat reporters know humor. They do. These are some of the sometimes it's funniest, dry humor, most down to earth people that, that there are. Okay. Baseball writers. I do love Chandler though. <laughs> I do too. Uh, we are live here at the decoy. Come on out. Two o'clock is when they open. The Killer Bees will be here until six uh, during all the Astros opening day games. Ten dollar. Shiner Bach, 100-ounce towers, $3 Maker's Mark, and $2 Mexican candy shot for all games during the opening series. So that's what today through Sunday. So plenty of opportunity to come out to the decor. Remember, it's 21 up. Great volleyball courts as well. So get a nice little volleyball game in before or after the Astros game. Hell or if yeah. It's just, it's just taking too long, you know, during a pitching change. You want to go out there. Hit, hit the sand a little bit. Hit the sand. Hit the sand. Is that what they say? I don't know. I'm just going <laughs> to say that's what they say. Okay, I like it. Just hit the sand. You sound so confident saying it, so uh, I'm going to believe you. Okay. You're not talking math, so we're, we're fine probably. Fact. Uh, good take, bad take. Here's my take today, Paul. Okay. That's Thursday. From now until 2030, so I give myself a six-year window, the Houston Rockets, Houston Texans, and Houston Astros – are all going to win a championship. Houston is going to become a little version of title town, and all three teams are going to bring home the trophy in the next six years. If they do it, they're going to have to do something that I grew up in high school seeing every single time that I went to Tampa's airport. Uh-huh. So in Tampa Bay, the Bucks won a Super Bowl. The Lightning won the Stanley Cup. Yep. And the Tampa Bay Storm, the Arena Football League team, also okay. won a championship. <laughs> so there was this sign on the way out of the airport, and it was there for a very long time, and I'm talking multiple decades, Okay, that claimed Tampa Bay as essentially like title town, the Bay of Champions, yeah. something like that. So if that happens, I hope Houston does that. All three teams – And I actually – between now and 2030. I can, I, sh- I should have put the Cougs in there, too. I'm going to add the Cougs in, too. Let's make it extra spicy. I like that, yeah, because we were talking about the yeah. golden age of Houston sports, so, so and we, me, we forgot to mention the Cougs a little bit earlier. So That's me, a bad job yeah. by us. So give me the Cougs, the Strohs, the Texans, the Rockets, all win a championship from now until 2000. <sighs> 30. The Cougs one is hard because gonna, it's win it this so, year, though. I know, it's just so hard to win an NCAA tournament. They need to take care of business because this does seem like it's the biggest opportunity for them to do it. They're the first year in the Big 12 schedule, they got a lot of veterans. Really, UConn is the only team I look at as a serious threat to stopping them. But, of course, sometimes the Cougs offense just completely vanishes. Astros winning the World Series seems very possible the next two years. Texans winning a Super Bowl seems possible. Maybe not this coming season, Mm -hmm. but the year after that and beyond really depends on what the hell the Chiefs are going to look like. It's possible. I I can't say it's a bad take. I don't know if I would follow you. That's fine. Into the vanguard. Yeah, you're not going to. You're not going to join me. Sword. I'm not going to join you, but I I don't think it's a bad take. Okay. Yeah, I, I I feel pretty good about this one. I don't. I don't think this is a bad take either. The Rockets is the tricky one because we are definitely prisoners of, prisoners of the moment right now. What Jalen Green is doing is awesome. It's been a great month, but again, it's March basketball, and you have another reason to put an asterisk against the team that they played against last night. I'm not sure. trying to do that. Last night was awesome. The Rockets are fun to watch, and what Jalen Green is doing right now is effing insane. Last night's statistics do not do him justice. That's the best game he's ever played. He was great. 
both ends of the court, offense, defense. But it's you gotta you gotta wonder. Is Jalen Green going to be one of the best players in the NBA? Because that's the only way I can see the Rockets doing it. Or is it going to be Alperin Shingoon? Let me let, let me sell you on it. So you have you have Amen Thompson, Cam Whitmore, Jabari Smith Jr., Alperin Shingoon, Jalen Green. You have five players that are under 22 years old that are very very talented in the NBA. In which obviously you only have start five guys starting. All you need is two of those guys to be all stars. In my opinion, to be a championship level contender. Whether that's Green and Thompson, Green and Shangoon, Thompson and Shangoon, you have enough talent. And no offense to Tar Easton, I didn't put him in this group for a reason because he's just a he's more well, of a depth guy. But you have five guys that have superstar ish traits. Whether it's bucket getting, defense, just the ability to score in a multiple different ways, like Shangoon. So as long as two of those guys emerge into what they look like they can be, taking the Taking Jalen Green possibly out of this equation, you have a very good core right there. You're going to have cap space. These deals for Brooks and Van Vliet are not that long. You're going to have the assets with the Brooklyn picks and your other young players to make a superstar-level trade. And then you look at the Western Conference. Denver, yes, is at a certain level. Jokic's game is going to age like fine wine. He is not going to significantly get worse. But the Minnesota Timberwolves are a notoriously cheap franchise in which the sale of their franchise for Jeff, Jeffrey Laurie and Alex Rodriguez fell through this morning officially. Oh, it's so done. So they're not, they're not getting full control. Oh, they might move to Seattle of, then. Of the team. So you have the, the cheap Timberwolves, who I don't believe in Cat. Gobert is not that as good as he's playing right now. They have one guy. The Thunder are a notoriously cheap franchise, and no one ever wants to play there. Also, no one wants to play in Minnesota. The Clippers are old. The Mavericks are the Mavs. The Suns are old. The Lakers are old. The Warriors are dead. So the, the West is there for the taking. So besides the Nuggets over the next four years, I, I would put the Rockets in that category with the Thunder and Timberwolves just because of the two guys those that those teams have as the best futures in the Western Conference with the way their roster is constructed. So I feel pretty good about the Rockets. I feel better about the Rockets than I do about the Texans because there's no Patrick Mahomes in the way of the Rockets. Yeah. Yeah, it does feel like the the old guard is slowly fading away. I would say the big challenge, though, is one of the teams you mentioned last night, they're going to continue to improve. And even though you beat them last night, I definitely think that the Thunder are a step ahead of you because they have a player who has emerged, who, mm -hmm. as uh, Sean's brought up a couple of times, is you know, a lot further down the timeline than a lot of the Rockets' young players are. How much better is that team going to be? And then also you got to wonder, okay, like I know the Spurs stink right now. but You have Wemby. They got a, they got a absolute generational player in Wemby. No matter what we want to say about him, the guy, he is unbelievably skilled, especially as a defender. So... I, but I, I'm, I'm not going to tell you this is a bad take. Okay. I, I think all of these things are possible. I, I just, as someone who's a little bit conservative when it comes to things, I, like I want to know it's a short thing. I don't feel any of these are a short thing. Sure. It's a huge window, this six-year window. But, yeah, I'm not going to go with it. Okay, you. that's fine. Uh, 7169, no confidence in the Houston NHL team hosting that's the Cup never, by 2030. It's never happening. Uh, they will have an NHL team by 2030. You think they will? Yes. Why? Uh, Tillman does not go on the record with Bloomberg, Bloomberg News saying that he's talking to the NHL about it. If he's not confident, he's going to get it. Tillman, to me, is the kind of guy that does not, not like to get embarrassed. Hmm. And if the for some reason the NHL expands again, which would surprise me, or a team like the Coyotes relocate and he loses out, I think he'd be very unhappy. So because he went on the record with it, I think they get a hockey team. Okay. But no, I don't have confidence because – it's hard to take another team, another city's trash and make it your treasure. If it was an expansion team, I'd feel better. I just think the people that are calling for hockey here, I just don't think there's enough people for this really to work. Oh, I didn't say it's going to work, but I think Tillman's going to try. I think Tillman's going to try. If I were one of Tillman's advisors, I would probably tell him, as much as I love hockey, I miss watching hockey. Like I just don't even watch it because I haven't lived in a city with hockey for a while. Like, when yeah. Seattle got a team, I, I was out of a job and I was about to leave. So didn't really get back into it there. And honestly, the last time I was super, super into it was the year after the Tampa Bay Lightning won the Stanley Cup when I was living in high school in St. Pete. And then they were locked out the year after that. So 
have a complicated relationship with hockey, but I would tell Tillman for Tita, nah, dude. Right. There's not enough of a specific market, I think, for hockey here oh, in boy, Houston. Yeah. There's like a lot of people that like hockey, but they're all transplants. And are you going to be able to bring them all into the fold? You have to win right away. And what the Vegas Golden Knights did, I feel like that's an anomaly. Yeah. Even though the Kraken, who are an expansion team, have been doing pretty well. well that's because the expansion draft is low. The way they do it in the NHL is wild. It's just a lot. It's a lot easier to, to yeah. actually get up there. But all know. right. Our final Astros opening day countdown. I wasn't sure if we were going to do this, but I just I need to hear the trombone one more time. Give me that this, bone. I need that bone one more time. Bone me. Two hours left until opening day. That's next year on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Live here at the decoy uh, throughout Astros opening the Astros opening series versus the New York Yankees. You get $10 Shiner Bach Towers, 100 ounces, $3 Maker's Marks, $2 Mexican candy shots for all games during the opening series during March Madness, $6 Casamigos, and plus there will be the uh, West Houston watch party uh, for the Cougs this Friday night. Full audio throughout the decoy. We'll have a DJ playing dur uh, during commercial breaks. You don't have to hear the commercials, which I know a lot of people hate. Uh, but you'll be able to enjoy the Cougs game on Friday night as they try to advance in the tournament or just enjoy some Astros baseball as well. The weather outside is perfect. There's a massive TV that is out, shaded on the patio right by the volleyball courts here. I'm assuming that's where the Astros game is going to be on. But if you want to watch the tournament as well, we are in a room that has, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 by my count televisions. Yeah, and this this big one up here can ch is actually like a bunch of televisions, so they have different things. If they, I mean, if they really want to go crazy, you know, so you missed out the first round of the tournament because this could have been a bazillion different TVs. But, hey, like today, you want to watch any games, I mean, you're going to be able to watch them here at the decoy. This is a really cool spot. Uh, five zero four six. Astros hit six home runs today. Okay. I love that. I, I would wanna, love that. Too. I want to just remind the Yankees that they're nothing. <coughs> that 
we don't even think about him. Because we don't. We don't even think about him at all. Like, you see Don Draper and Mad Men say to that dork. I like to think back more than forward about the Yankees. Because it's just, I, I enjoy, I I hope they play in the playoffs every year because there's always a moment that just feels so <laughs> satisfactory well, as here, they just ruin the Yankees' lives. Here, here is my like back of mind thought. They've had so much success against the Yankees that you would think at one point these losers are due. Mm-hmm. But maybe they aren't, and maybe this can just continue. The last time that the Astros played the Yankees and getting to see the Astros take them down um, – officially while flying back from Las Vegas and in game three being at a booth at Circa Resort and Casino, Mm -hmm. a booth right next to a bunch of Yankee fans only to see early in game three, the Astros take control and see these people like the, all the hope just leave their, their bodies. It was great. I just had this big smirk on my face wearing my Nolan Ryan Tequila Sunrise Astros jersey, watching these absolute, like, cretins from probably, like, Long Island. These just human trash. Like, their souls crushed as their uh, fake gold chains and Timberlands, which they were wearing out at the effing pool for some <laughs> reason. These These slobs were reminded that, like, hey, the thing that they love the most... It hasn't mattered since 2004 when the greatest choke in sports history happened. Mm. All right, let's get to our our (laughs) final Astros opening day countdown. I should have added a maniacal laugh to the end of that. Two hours. Two hours, Paul. We, we have arrived to Astros opening day. Uh, expectations for this year. We're taking your guys' question throughout or answers throughout the day. What is the reason why the Astros get back to and win the World Series in 2024? But from a performance perspective, you mentioned earlier that the Astros had the fifth-best offense in baseball last year. Do you expect the offense to be – that much better or pretty consistent with where they were last season? I think it will be better. I don't know how much better, but I do think it will be better. You're playing Niner Diaz more. You are getting a healthy Jordan Alvarez going into the year. You're getting, more importantly, a healthy Jose Altuve going into the year. It seems like you're going to play Chaz McCormick more often than not. And I mean, Jose Abreu can't be worse than he was for much of last year. I expect him to be better with the way he finished the season. Jeremy Pena can't be more disappointing than he was last year. I expect him to be better as well. Dude's yoked. So I think it's a pretty fair assumption to make that the Astros offense will be better this year. Yeah, I mean, last year they were seventh in Major League Baseball in home runs. They were fifth in RBIs, fifth in batting average. And, and I bring up the home runs first because you mentioned Jeremy Pena. He had zero after, like, July 1st. Martin Molinato did not have a ton of home runs. Uh, Victor Caratini and Yiner Diaz will hit way more home runs this year than Maldi and Diaz combined did last season. Like you mentioned, Abreu's healthy. Bregman's swing looks a little bit different. and I mean, he's got some pop early on and or towards the end of spring training, so hopefully that's going to translate. So – I think the home run numbers themselves are, are going to be up for the Astros, and that's just going to elevate the rest of the offense. And if, if, if Pena and Diaz can stop swinging at stuff that's way outside the zone and you just get any kind of contribution from Jake Myers, they'll easily have a top-five offense in, in Major League Baseball this year. Yeah, so, definitely. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, look, they were, they were fifth last year with all the issues. Yeah. They should be better. I, I, I think, uh, as John and Lance said a couple of weeks ago, I think, you know, the only teams that you're looking at as potential challenges are, what, the Dodgers? Maybe the Yankees with Juan Soto aboard now? Yeah, the Braves, of course. Yeah, Atlanta definitely is up there, too. I mean, and the Braves probably number one. I mean, you look at their numbers last year. It's, they were they lapped Major League Baseball. I mean, RBIs, they had 916. The next closest mm. team was the Dodgers at 877. So, How do we know they weren't stealing signs? We don't. I'm just asking the question. We, you never know. You never know. If you're not cheating, you're not trying. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, 100%. I want the Astros to find another way to do Look, it. Man, I don't. I like don't it. care. I don't care. Win by any means necessary, especially if it yes. gets found out a couple of years later, because I want everyone to be mad again. 
I yeah. enjoy everyone being mad at the Astros. I enjoy I, I I've enjoyed being on the seeing like the, the heel turn, taking a wrestling turn from from B Mac over there, uh, of the Houston Astros to where they were everyone's favorite, you know, team in baseball, the young Astros winning in twenty seventeen. I found this article randomly last year. We're talking about the home run derby and there was this push for Alex Bregman in twenty eighteen to be or twenty nineteen to be part of the home run derby. It was just, just forty home runs. Yeah, forty one. It was just glowing about Alex Bregman, this face of baseball and how he was so likable. And then six months later, they were public enemy number one and it hasn't stopped. I I enjoy it. I, I embrace the hate. I, I do believe that <laughs> one of the reasons things didn't work out for me in Seattle is because I never abandoned my Astros allegiance. Until yeah. the very, very end, there were a couple of weeks where I was like, okay, well, the Astros are playing the Mariners, and the Kendall Graveman trade happened, and the Mariners had a ridiculous comeback. So there was like a three-day period where I was like, all right, well, I think I'm going to be here for a while, so I'm just going to pander. And I got canned a month later. <laughs> so that worked out great. Yeah. That worked out great. And I felt like that was God looking down on me and saying, you have forsaken, you have forsaken your religion. Yes, a religion that you joined after the fact, but you know who else joined a religion after the fact? little guy by the name of Saul who became a guy named Paul. Am I the second coming of Paul? I'm just asking the question. I'm just asking the question because my name is Paul. Uh, the Astros uh, rotation <laughs> last year, or the, the pitching staff as a whole, had the eighth best ERA in, in baseball. So just as a, a baseline of that, you know, putting the, the whole group together instead of focusing on the rotation versus the bullpen, do you think the, the collectively the Astros will have a better ERA, a better pitching staff this year versus last year, even with all the injuries? Oh, that is with the start starting mean, the year. That's really the question because of the injuries. You, you don't know when anyone's coming back. I mean, what? Or Katie maybe in May? Verlander, who really knows? Verlander's being so vague about the return. Yeah, they're saying today they're going to make a decision about if he's going to do another live bullpen or if he's going to do a rehab start in either Corpus Christi or Sugar Land. So they'll make that decision today. Mm. But, yeah, it's tough with the injuries. It's just it's so many so many unknowns. I'm going to say no. No? I don't think it's going to be a wide difference. And they still, they still will be top ten most likely in ERA in baseball this year or just outside of it. But I don't know if the pitching staff statistically – Throughout the year, when you look at the end of it, because of the injuries and the middle of the bullpen, will look better than it was in 2023. Hmm. I, but I think it'll be close. I mean, it's going to have to be by the end of the year. That's for damn sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we this season will be looked at in windows with, with the Astros pitching staff. The, the you know, what are you expecting their record to be? Two months into the year. Let's say winning percentage-wise. Don't forget about the win total because, remember, math is not great for either of us <laughs> on the show. So <laughs> winning percentage-wise, obviously, like, a really good team at the end of the year is going to have, what, a 65% winning percentage. Uh, realistic expectation for the Astros, given their pitching issues and a very difficult first 20 games or so. Yeah. So at the end of May, <coughs> I yeah. would – you want to be five or six games above 500 is what I would say. I know that's not a percentage, but. Well, yeah, now that when I think about it, that, so that is like, tricky math, too. So, so I'm going to say five. All right, that worked. That's, a, that's slightly <laughs> easier. Five, five or six games <laughs> above 500. I, I'm going to say three above 500. Yeah. I, I, I think there's going to be a lot of appearances by uh, Panic Man which is a character on this show to sarcastically make fun of all the people who panic about things that aren't going so well for a team. I, I, I think it's going to be a slow start, but do you expect this team to turn it around when they're healthy? 100%. I, I am very curious about the workload of all the pitchers who are being expected to mm -hmm. step up. And, you know, that's, that's going to be Ronald Blanco and JP France specifically in the rotation but then in the bullpen, I, I really do not know what they are going to do from the moment a starting pitcher leaves to the moment where they can turn to Brian Abreu, who suspended the first two games of the year, Ryan Presley, and Josh Hader. Yeah, and, and the thing about their schedule that's, that's hard to predict 
as well is you have some teams that I would say I'm very curious about this season. You know, you have the Tigers who have so much young talent. Uh, Taylor Scoobl was predicted to win the American League Cy Young by multiple people from the MLB Network this year. You have the Brewers who, yes, they've lost Corbin Burns, but there, there's still some talent on that roster. Uh, sorry, Junior Bronco. Uh, the Cubs were just short of missing the playoffs last year. You have an MVP candidate that you'll play right after you play the Rangers and Bobby Witt Jr. So you, you have some teams that are young and kind of up and coming to where they could start on or like they could be hot to start the year or a slow start, just making that opening stretch uh, even more challenging for you. But I'll take anywhere between three to six games above 500 when okay. when May 1st hits. I would feel very okay with that. Yeah, I just want to be about 500. And, and yeah. We ain't going to panic because we ain't scared here. Yeah, we ain't. We ain't Y'all we ain't mean? Not scared. I reckon. Not scared at all. What was that last one? Y'all mean. And? I I'll, reckon. I reckon. Uh, when we get back, uh, Rockets Warriors watch. It's on. The Warriors played last night. Draymond Green played four whole minutes. We'll discuss the, <laughs> the opposite direction these teams are heading in, it seems, next year on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Now back to Paul Gallant and Joe George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Broadcasting live inside the mobile Veritex Community Bank Studios located at the decoy in Spring Branch. Warriors! 
come out to play. Warriors, come out to play. Yeah, it's like that. Sorry, Easton, quickly moving up my favorite Rockets player's power rankings. He's not even on the court. I love it. Uh, last night, the Houston Rockets won their 10th straight game. Did he just go full Lance McCullers? Y- yes, he did. <laughs> uh, it's so when he when he did that, because didn't you make something similar to that? Well, he was the one that first did it. Oh, he did it first? But, okay. but uh, I also did it on yesterday's radio show. If you've ever watched the 1970s movie uh, The Warriors, it's about a bunch of roving gangs of um, – gangs Mm -hmm. (laughs) in new york city and uh, it's just a wild wild wacky movie about this group called the warriors that's just trying to survive and everyone's trying to kill them because they think that they've killed this like super important gang leader so you know the warriors being the warriors you want to fight the warriors like that one guy in the car who's trying to get them to come out so that they can kick their ass that's what the rockets want and i love hearing it and somehow, some way, Joe, the Warriors continue to win despite a locker room that seems to be having issues, to put it mildly. Yeah, Draymond Green thrown out in the, uh, the first four minutes of last night's game. I mean, he knew it, too. I mean, you, you don't say what he said to a ref, which, to put it kindly, uh, even if I could swear on the radio, I'm not allowed to say that word. <laughs> um, so he got thrown out of the game last night. As soon as he got the second tech, he was already gone. Like he 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 said the not nice words to the ref, and he just walked right to the locker room. So he knew he was getting tossed. And then Steph Curry looked like he started crying on the court. He did look like he cried. I think he cried. Billy Bob cried. He, he was a bit of a cry. He he cried. He Steph cried. Steph Curry cried because he was a bit of a cry. So are people going to gut on him more for this than they got on for him for his improper mouth guard usage? I think Big Orthodontia was uh, really not a fan of Steph Curry. I, I saw this morning on, on one of the one of the Speak for Your Pizza shows. Mm. Are you okay that I steal, steal steal that from you? No, I mean everyone should call it Speak okay. for Your Pizza. Uh, so on, on one They're of all the, the same. One of the Speak for Your Pizza shows, um, they one of the guys was saying that his sources are telling me that. Steph Curry has bad leadership in the locker room and that he really is part of the problem with the Warriors right now and, and Draymond Green acting like a petulant child. What's Steph supposed to do? Exactly. Punch him in the face? I mean, I watched the replay of Draymond's latest ejection, which took place four minutes into last night's game against the Magic, with the Warriors somehow won, and rather convincingly. They won it by eight. And if you watch the replay, you have no idea why or how Draymond Green gets teed up because the replay just shows the replay of a foul that Draymond Green was not even a part of. Green complains to the ref for at least 21 seconds straight. Steph Curry goes over to him, taps him on the belly, and I suppose you could argue that Steph should have stepped in there and shoved him away in the same way that some Rockets player shoved Jabari uh, Smith Jr. away from... Uh, Josh Giddy mm-hmm. last night after their dust up. Yeah, maybe Steph Curry should have done that, but I think everyone's kind of gotten to the point with Draymond where you can't really control what he says. But my God, that ref gave him every opportunity to shut up. Dude, just to walk away. He, just he, walk away. He had he he kept going for twenty one seconds after the initial the initial technical foul was called. Mm-hmm. Twenty one seconds. And and that ref clearly was going out of his way to not give Draymond Green the tech. That was Dylan Brooks. Brooks gets that immediately. And it's funny that there's a double standard, it seems, when it comes to players in the NBA. Because Dylan Brooks, obviously, has a reputation. But Draymond Green's reputation is <coughs> much more they high profile. They made him go to therapy this year so he could come <laughs> back to the court. Yes, they did. Get rid of him. And he choked Patty Smith or Patty Mills yeah. uh, the night before. And then he's dropping that stuff to a ref? Like, this is this is where Adam Silver has to show he's got a pair, and and really it, he should set the same standard all the time. Which is if I tell you to do something, which is to get your act together and suspend you and make you do certain steps to get back on the court, and then you break my trust, suspend him for longer. Like that's exactly what he did with Ja Morant. He told Ja Morant, "Hey, Betty, no more guns, please," on Instagram. And then John Morant did it anyway, so they suspended it for much longer. They may, they suspended Draymond Green indefinitely. I think that was actually the, maybe it was even the Warriors who did it. 
made him go to therapy, and then you got this stuff. Like, I'm just, I'm so over it. You can be that much of a villain when you're good. You can be. You can you can cross the line and and you can get away with more stuff because then you just become the villain. Right now, you're just a loser. You're fighting for a playing spot and you're pulling this nonsense. Go away. You're a single triple machine. I do enjoy the car crash from afar cuz it's not my car crash. You would think that this would actually be helping the Rockets out. Mm-hmm. And somehow it's not. And somehow they won last night. I mean, Orlando's not a bad team by any means. They're going to the playoffs if the season were to end today. So I, I don't know how Golden State keeps this up. But, I mean, you got Draymond publicly saying, oh, we're not concerned about the Rockets. Well, the Rockets have won 11 in a row. I think you should start to be concerned about them when your actions are potentially hurting the Warriors. Ejected four minutes into a game where you're one of the Warriors' best defenders mm. against a team that has some good big men. Dumb. Yeah. Very dumb. And I, I if, if you saw afterwards, I think Dream on Green posted like an, a picture to his Instagram or his Instagram story or maybe it was to Twitter where you're saying, like, <laughs> thankful for my teammates having my back. They what don't do you, have your back. What do you think the teammates are really thinking about him? Because that's the public thing that you see. That's a, it's a bit of propaganda for Warriors fans out there. But – and maybe Warriors media. But what are the people truly thinking? They're tired of it. They have to be. I mean, even last night after the game, Steph Curry talked about he was very politically correct when he t- discussed it at, in the post game, and so was Steve Kerr. But they both said last night that they need him out there. And, and they do. Like, it's they need him on the court. They're publicly saying it. And if that's what they're publicly saying, just – to be politically correct, I would imagine behind the scenes, they're done. So as one team kind of is unraveling, the confidence is through the roof for the other team. First we get, as they're boarding the plane, Jalen Green calls his shot, says the Rockets are going to win their 10th straight game. They do win their 10th straight game. And then his confidence just continues because after the game, he said that the Rockets are going right to the playing tournament. It was lit. It was lit. Everybody was happy, celebrating, screaming. Um, I mean, we fought for that one. We worked hard. Um, you know, that's how we should react after a game. That's 10 and 0. Uh, we still keep going. We got, what, 10 more games left? 11 games left? Yeah, so, I mean, ain't nothing to, ain't nothing to go crazy about, but yeah, we're going to celebrate our wins. You're going to have a playing game? Yeah, we're going to get a playing game. We're going to keep going. I love it. I think that's why I've all led all the Rockets. There's something about Jalen. Just I, I'm, I'm in on the, the personality, a I, little bit. I think if it was a little more emphatic, this would have been picked up. Yeah. The thing is, he's been saying this the last couple of nights. Like, yeah, people should be taking notice of mm-hmm. us, but he does it with no energy. Yeah. He this says, is why he'll never be a, a successful sports talk show host. He will like not. Me. He'll never be no. that. Tar- uh, most likely to be a, a successful sports talk show host on the Rockets. Uh, Alper and Shingun because he has a loyal Turkish audience. Yeah, the YouTube numbers for Alpi's YouTube show would be through the roof. Oh, yeah. I mean, Shingun could probably say whatever he wants as long as he doesn't offend Erda Boobs, their dictator yeah. there. Uh, and, yeah, all those all those people will follow I get, I get, sync I get, for everything I get, he says. I, I get Paul Gallant, Tar Eason vibes. Like, Tar Eason just the way the Warriors high come energy. out to play. Got to be a high-energy guy. Yeah. And, I mean, if you're understanding dated references like me and you're younger than me, I mean, damn. You yep. are special. You you are definitely a possible sports talk radio host in the future if you can successfully make a really dated reference that only like the upper echelon in terms of age uh, range of your audience is going to get it. Yeah, and That's but, just me. Yeah, Tari Houston would be my, would be my pick to be uh, the – the best sports talk radio host on the Houston Rockets. Yeah, Dylan Brooks, like, uh, Dylan Brooks. He would just yell. He at walks you. the walk, but he actually does not talk the talk. Yeah, it's, Dylan Brooks. Ironically. Would, Dylan Brooks would have the whole Twitch blocked at he's, this point. He's so, well, he's so soft-spoken. I, I don't know if he would block the Twitch, but he, he, he did have his, you know, little back and forth with the Grizzlies-Lakers series. Yeah. I poke bears. Why is everyone beating me up to be the villain? All right, I guess I'm the villain. It was, it was quite the, like, five stages of knowing what you are. But, yeah, he wouldn't do it. Um, Jabari Smith Jr., you know, not enough self-confidence after last night's game. Yeah, we weren't very good. We messed up a lot. It's like, you just won an amazing game against a really good team, dude. It's like the best one of the year. Well, I like the the, – 
He knows not to over pump it too much at the same time. Well, you got it. You, you got you got to draw a line somewhere. That's All right, we are we are broadcasting live here at the decoy. Come hang out, watch Astros opening day opening up here in about a half hour from now. Throughout all of Astros, the Astros opening day series, they have 100 ounce Shiner Bach towers for ten dollars, three dollar Maker's Marks, two dollar Mexican candy shots for all the games during the opening series during March Madness, six dollar Casamigos, and plus Friday night they will have the Cougs West Houston watch party with full audio throughout the bar and a decoy play, a DJ playing music during the commercials live here at the decoy. When we get back, our 10 minute drill on ESPN 97.5 and ESPN 92.5. Uh, Sauce Gardner. He's got oh, some boy. takes. Sauce Gardner just really. Uh... We actually have the audio of this. Oh, we do? We do have the audio of this. Sauce Gardner was on a podcast, and I don't know why he felt the need to go down this rabbit hole, but he got into a back and forth with this uh, podcast host. I'm going to ask Sean Maves, executive producer of the Kalani George radio program, can we play this? Do you think this is inbounds? Um, well, A, thank you for promoting me to executive producer. I think I'm executive just Executive producer. producer. Hell yeah, um, dude. I mean, 
Hmm. <laughs> okay, uh, that's this. a that's a no. That's a no. Oh, you he, guys are cowards. If he, if he if he if there's a question mark, I trust Sean's judgment. Cowards. Uh, look so, up, just look up if, for everyone out there. Look up Sauce Gardner, Aiden Ross, and it's A D I N Ross. This yeah. will pop up. And he said, <laughs> he said, Paul, you can say it. <laughs> he said, <laughs> Sauce <blame>. Gardner. <laughs> Jets cornerback Sauce Gardner said that Drew's run the world mm. after a dramatic pause. And then afterwards he said, well, hang on. I've learned a lot about a little thing called life and about treating others with respect. Do we think Sauce Gardner's learned his lesson? No, you don't learn a lesson that fast. I, I, I'm going to say this about Sauce Gardner versus Derek Stingley, two men who will always be linked together because the Texans put Stingley before Gardner, Stingley third. Gardner fourth to New York. I'm just so thankful that this guy's not here. He seems like a he's headache a, waiting to happen. There's no doubt he's a great corner, but the man lives online. Mm-hmm. And as part of this living online side of things, probably goes down some rabbit holes. And to go on a podcast and just throw that out after a dramatic pause where it's clear he was wondering whether or not he should say it and then actually saying it, man. I'm just thankful that guy's not here. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it'd be nice to have uh, that have him here as a, a talented player, but frankly, as long as Derek Stingley Jr. stays healthy, the, the difference is not going to be that much. They're they're both going to be two of the best cornerbacks in the NFL if, if both are healthy at this point. So I'm I'm very okay with having Derek Stingley Jr. over Sauce Gardner because you're. The, the need to live online. That's one thing I hope Jalen Green has learned through all of this is get s- offline. Stay off, stay off online. Just to, just to, li- you don't a little need to bit. get in Roosh's DMs. Yeah, just you don't need a sub tw- sub Instagram story every single time no. you see Rockets Twitter talking trash about you. Correct. But like, just back up just a little bit and everything will be fine. Uh, speaking of the Jets, apparently Robert Sala and their head coach, I mean, and their owner, Woody Johnson, had a screaming match at this NFL coaches, owners, GM meetings that happened. Now, they disputed it. Of course they did. But I like Colleen Wolf, and I'm going to trust her side of the story and she, that she got this right. I want the Jets to know it was me. Uh, you leaked it. No, but I told somebody who would make it a bigger deal. <laughs> what do you mean? Oh, I, I, I was listening to the Around the NFL podcast, and I heard that at the end. And let's just say I forwarded this to somebody who cares about the Jets a great deal just because I was like, you know what? F the oh. Jets. I'm not kidding. Okay. I'm not kidding. Interesting. <laughs> Anything that damages the Jets is good for me. Interesting. Yeah. The so, Jets are – they seem to be your number one most hated franchise. No, I don't hate them. Like, they don't matter, but I want – You hate just, their fans. I want them to stay in their place. Yeah. Who is your number one most hated franchise? Yankees. It is still the Yankees? Still the Yankees, Yeah. yeah. They're yeah. the worst. But, yeah. <laughs> okay. It's been very funny seeing that story blow up because I just said, oh, this might be interesting, huh? <laughs> uh, Robert Kraft, speaking of uh, teams that you like, Paul, he made an uh, interesting uh, statement talking about how he didn't seem to love the uh, the Dynasty documentary. I know He kind of he kind of went after his own guys for comments that were made in there, but he also seemed a little unhappy with the, the direction of the documentary, which I found odd. Because yeah, at the end of it, it says craft production. It seems like he was the one who greenlighted it to be produced this way. I am with a lot of the Patriots players in that, yes, there was a lot of drama that took place over the course of this run. And it wasn't going to be all sunshine and rainbows. But there should have been some more sunshine and rainbows. Because there really wasn't much of it. You would barely think that the Patriots won six Super Bowls and went to nine over that stretch. They completely glossed over a 21-game winning streak. They completely glossed over two Super Bowls. You could go back and forth between the success – and the drama, Mm -hmm. and I think still have a compelling documentary. Obviously, you weren't going to make everybody happy. Maybe you're going for the people that aren't Patriots fans more than you are going for the people who are Patriots fans, but a lot of Patriots players, after the fact, are talking about it. It actually led to a point where Julian Edelman was calling out Wes Welker, (laughs) the two uh, holy slot receivers of the scrappy and gritty era of Patriots football. And Edelman was basically saying, yeah, dude, like some of the stuff you were saying about how Bill Belichick allowed Aaron Hernandez to figuratively get away with murder at practice were, let's just say, a reach. Yeah. 
Yeah. It was in, uh, what do you – I'm trying to figure out how to describe this, okay? So yesterday this photo went viral of Jaden Daniels. His I, elbow. His elbow it's, looked like uh, it extended out above in front of his arm. Yes. His elbow looked broken. There's, there's no really no other way to put it. Now, I saw one of these Twitter doctors uh, try to say it was like an inflamed something sack or I don't know. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's a medical condition that he would call a red flag. But the photo is bizarre. It, yeah. it, it literally looks like his elbow is shattered. In the way it's extending past his arm. And you got some doctors online. Because there's other pictures now that people have seen of Jaden Daniels throwing a football. And yeah. someone said, oh, he must have elbow, elbow bursitis. That's what it is. Or, or something like that. Yeah. But it was, just, it, was a, it was an odd one, to say the least. It was the most viral thing about Jaden Daniels Pro Day. Are you a believer? Do you like Jaden Daniels? I, I honestly, I saw his elbow. Now I'm wondering if he's too much of a freak to be drafted. <laughs> his elbow, his elbow is alarmingly it's, I, disgusting. I, I really don't know how to describe it. It's like, just disgusting. Yeah. It looks like someone was photoshopping and did a poor Photoshop with his elbow. But if you take a look at all the pictures yeah. of Jane Daniels' elbow, that is not just a one photo thing. I don't know why Ian Rappaport chose to tweet that photo, <laughs> but. It's crazy. No one seemed to notice this about Jaden Daniels until yesterday when Ian Rappaport just tweets out a photo of Jaden Daniels throwing a ball. And, I, I mean, I get why everybody was like, whoa, Honestly, what is that? If I was Ian Rappaport and I captured that photo or someone on my team captured the photo, I'm like, I'm going to go viral with this thing. You know as soon as you see it that it's going to catch so much attention online because it's mm -hmm. just a, a weird, weird, weird thing. Uh, people are very upset that the uh, – NFL, I saw Mad Dog crying about this at the season opener for the NFL season, or one of them will be on Peacock this year. With the e the Eagles game in Brazil will be will be on Peacock. On the cock? Now. Yeah. Dang. Why are people so? Why are we still getting upset about this? What about Peacock? Just in general, like yeah, they're gonna like Amazon or Peacock's gonna have a playoff game uh, this year. I think it's annoying that it's on all of these apps and that everybody needs to have all of these streaming apps to watch everything. I think that's more the frustration. We all thought that moving away from cable, that we would be able to get a couple of things, a couple of different options, and those few options meant that we would all get everything that we possibly could want. And instead, what we're getting is all sorts of things that you got to pay like seven ninety nine a month for to watch what one game yeah or create a, a, a free trial with an email and stuff like that it, it, we we are literally back to having cable and it's frustrating well it's worse because I have cable and I have to pay a ton of money for all this other stuff the only one I haven't done and I won't do is I'll just take the night off from the Astros or listen to my old friends for a night if uh, they're on Apple I don't do Apple TV. There's been no shows like I don't. What, well, uh, you didn't like the the three headed monster broadcast with you know Katie Nolan yeah. and that one guy and the guy with alarmingly but beautifully white hair. Yeah, that guy. Yeah, I, the I guy just, and the other guy. I, I Apple TV is not for me. I didn't, I didn't watch Ted Last Lasso. Free everyone's, Katie Nolan. Everyone said that, why free from what being bad. Her, oh stop stop. She's got great taste, man. Dan Soder, great comedian. Come on. I loved her show on Fox. Yeah. And then it just. Downhill. I doubt you even like watched a roller coaster. it. I doubt you even watched it. I used it. to watch Garbage Time. You, Is that what you call it? Garbage Time? Mm -hmm. Is that where you got your name for Garbage Time? Uh, probably. Paul the Thief. Here well, on I mean, ESPN. You're, still, you're, still, you're stealing lines from me. You, you, you sexist. I think we're friends now, though. <laughs> said, that's why I said thanks. <laughs> uh, all right. Dusty Baker is in San Francisco, and he's just got to be real upset when he sees the Astros opening day roster because he got no lefties. Joe Spotter gets two. We'll discuss that next year on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. First, let me tell you about my friends at Highway Cantina. Guys, this is your go-to before and after Margarita Pit Stop for any of the big games downtown. Their tall Texan margarita, 975, is one of the best that I've ever had. But there's so many other options at the Highway Cantina. And we're talking about... For from just your traditional Tex-Mex perspective, some of the best chicken fajita that I've ever had. But you can get wood-fired oysters. You can get all sorts of fantastic food at this place. And it's within walking distance of all the great Edo locations. So, you're going to the game? Go here. Looking for a work happy hour to have downtown? 
look no further. Hell, looking to impress your boss with a very cool, clean place. Well, that's what you're going to get with the Highway Cantina. I love this spot. I will be by later tonight after opening day. I hope to see you guys down there. Tell them Paul Gallant sent you by. Back to Gallant and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Live inside the Mobile Veritex Community Bank Studios located at the Decoy in Spring Branch. One of the more remarkable plays that we've seen from Astros Yankees series, Jose Altuve had zero business going home on that play. He was thrown out by a mile, and then Gary Sanchez, that bum, just dropped it. What a lucky play that was for the Houston Astros because Indeed. there was no way that should have worked in their favor. None. That was like the I feel like that's the beginning of the Jose Altuve. What are you doing, buddy, on the base path? Uh, 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 I don't remember if it started before that, but it feels like it started there. I'm just like <laughs> reckless abandon. I hope they're better at that this year. They've been working on it this off season. You know, base running. They're going to be more aggressive this year. <laughs> well, maybe certain people should be less aggressive. <clears throat> Jose Altuve. Yep. It is crazy that he's gone from being the best base stealer in the American League to an absolute <laughs> car crash waiting to happen on yeah. the base paths. I just don't, I just don't understand it. It's just, he's just, it's over aggressiveness at times when a lot of times you don't need to be either. Yes, exactly. And sometimes it works out for him, and we just like, and you kind of ignore it in that moment. Or it's one of those things where, like this play, you go no, 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 and then you scream yes because something good happens, but. Yeah, Jose Altuve, that play, it was it was a fun one. And that was also the end of Gary Sanchez's, like, hype train of being a good catcher in baseball because a lot of people thought he was going to be something special. And then he got exposed as one of the worst just fielding catchers in the game 
And then we realized he can't hit the ball either. Mm -hmm. uh, we were broadcasting live here at the decoy, coming out, watch the Astros opening day game. All the Ast throughout all the Astros series versus the New York Yankees, they're going to have $10 Sharnerbach Towers, 100 ounces, $3 Maker's Marks, uh, $2 Mexican Candy Shots. During March Madness games, they have $6 Casamigos. And then Friday night, the uh, Cougs West Houston watch party will be happening. They'll have the audio going throughout the decoy, and they'll have a DJ playing music during commercial breaks. Uh, so you will do that. So great place to watch March Madness. Great place to watch Asher's opening day. Come on out. If you're coming early, maybe I'll buy you some Mexican candy shots. They're only 2 bucks. I can mm -hmm. afford quite a few of those. Yeah. So, And if you don't like day one, Don us to ask for a beer. If I like you, I might do that too. If you like them. If I like you. Wow, that's friendsist. There's a lot of people I like. Yeah. There's some people who are only worth $2 Mexican candy shots though. Wow. Sorry. It's the truth. They're only worth two dollar Mexican well, candy Well, from shots? my wallet at least. They're worth a lot more. You're, you're backtracking. You gotta no, double down here. No, I'm not no you gotta double down. That's really mean to say someone's only worth two dollars. But you just said it and now you're backing now you're backing down. Yeah. All right. Okay, you're right. You're stand only, in the pocket. All right, stand in the pocket. Defend your take about how some people They're only worth two dollars. Are only worth two dollars. Yep. Like Woody Johnson, owner of the New York Jets. He's pissed. I saw he, him. He just denied it. He publicly. just put. He just put out a tweet. Yeah, I uh, love it. I uh, love it. He said all this nonsense. The He's best like, way to make a story go away is to confront yeah. it directly and deny it. Yeah. So Woody Johnson, owner of the Jets, just at, recapping that story we just told. Colleen Wolf of the NFL Network. I reported stand with Colleen Wolf. That Robert Sala and Woody Johnson got into a heated exchange during the meetings, at the league meetings. Uh, Woody Johnson just tweeted all this nonsense about a heated argument between Coach Sala and me at the league meeting is absolutely false. That's not what my source is telling me. It is yet another irresponsible report from the NFL Network. Hmm. Well, my source, and my source is Colleen Wolf on the great Around yeah. the NFL podcast, is that that is a load of balagna. And then he said, please disregard. <laughs> this is not, you get people to disregard. That's why the Jets are losers. Because their owner is stepping in it. Ignore. This is an organization that so badly wants to stop the noise off the field. Yeah. This is how you keep the noise going. You don't acknowledge it. You, you, you feel the need to deny a report? What are you talking about? Yeah. It's Colleen is right. This happened. Yeah, just this is the most believable story ever. Yeah, just, just literally, Look at just Sala's ignore. picture in the team. Look at Robert Sala in the – Coach's team photo. Yeah. Just look at his face. He looks like a man who's aged more than a president ages in the years that he's been coaching the Jets. Um, he looks miserable. Yeah, he does. Uh, so Dusty Baker's probably upset because the Astros have two lefties in, the, in their bullpen. You think Dusty actually sees this and it's just like, come on, guys. <laughs> like, I'm sure he would have loved Dusty. Josh Dusty is probably like, you know, the Catholic Church and hates left-handed people. Hmm. He's left-handed, sis. You know, I'm just throwing out accusations all show long today. He's, he's, you it be... was crazy that they had no left-hander on the team because it does seem to defy conventional wisdom, and especially the old-school mindset that you have to have a lefty throw against a lefty, which so many teams love to do. And yet, Dusty Baker went in the complete opposite direction on that front, and it didn't hurt them. Yeah. Yeah, it's – it changed a little bit when they when they changed the rules where a relief pitcher has to face three guys. Because a lot of times you will see – I mean, like the, this is why Dusty Baker would stack his lineup with, you know, Jordan and then Bregman and then Tucker or some kind of variation of that order um, because you would want to separate your lefties so that if a lefty comes in, they're also going to face maybe multiple righties. And at, at this point, I, I still think – I think we just overrated – that stuff. That's one of those baseball things that they did for so long, and I don't really know how often the numbers actually verified that it worked to that point. So, I mean, think about the Astros' success that they had versus the in the World Series. The two biggest moments in the postseason run against the Mariners and then the Phillies are when these managers bring in a lefty specialist to face Jordan Alvarez. And then they sm he smashed it out of the ballpark. So, like, I, it's just – it's untraditional, I guess, but I, I am – I'm excited to have at least one good lefty on this team. Hell, yeah. Parker's not that guy. 
Maybe he is. I mean, maybe. Maybe yeah. the spring training stuff actually means something. You're doubting a lefty. I know, but like his biggest fan just walked into the decoy. That's true. Parker Mashinsky. Joel Blank loves Parker Mashinsky. There's nothing wrong <laughs> with using your left hand. I, I wanted to make my see if I could like force my son to be a lefty. Yeah? It's not working. I supposedly was a lefty I, I when I was trying. a kid. I mean, we had the early sign, Sue, where he was eating with his left hand. Mm-hmm. But then we started you know, put a baseball bat in his hand, but he won't do it. It's really disappointing because he's got a height disadvantage like me, I assume. And mm-hmm. I'm assuming he's going to be not a tall person. So I was trying to find just like some way to elevate his game. Who's the shortest pitcher in baseball history? Oh, I bet you there's some guy. There's six guys. Yeah, there's guys under six. There's plenty of guys under shortest six. Shortest pitcher in baseball history. I'm gonna I'm go five. I'm gonna guess five seven. Bobby Shantz. Guess how tall he was. Old Bobby. Five four. Five six. Hey, it's like me. Yeah. Anyone from like I don't know the modern era. Billy Wagner was five ten. Okay. Hall of Famer. I know it's not tall. It's just taller than me. Not yet Hall of Famer. So, uh, uh, how about Jason Frazor of the Toronto Blue Jays? That's not that long ago. Okay. How about five eight? Mordecai Brown. What a name. Wonder if Sauce Gardner likes him. Uh, yeah, I'm curious. I'm curious as to how many other guys were under because it seems like five nine and under. Yeah, because it's like a leg strength thing for how fast you can throw is what they say. Like mm-hmm. the taller you are, the better. All right. Uh, what is the? Is there one thing to point to with the Rockets turnaround? <laughs> we'll discuss that next year on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Before we do that, I want to tell you about my friends at LaBerge Lake Charles. We had an awesome weekend there last week doing the bullpen from there, noon to three this last Saturday. Uh, with myself, Brian, Sean, we teamed up on some Astros bets while we were there at the sports book. We took the Astros over 92 and a half wins. We took the Astros plus 400 to make it to the World Series. So great sports book, plenty of televisions to watch. So if you want to watch your Texas teams, LaBerge Lake Charles is the place to do it. When we were talking to the sports book manager. He said last year that they were they were popping every single Astros playoff game. So it's a great spot for you to travel to, only a, an easy two-hour drive. And before you do, make sure you download the Pen Play app. When you do, you have a chance to win up to $2,000 in Pen Play K. Pen play cash. So when you want to leave Texas, when you want to go bet on games, make sure you head over to LaBerge Lake Charles. Glon George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Last night, the Rockets won their 10th straight game. Jalen Green went off for 37 points. Huzzah. Dylan Brooks had some big moments in overtime. Jabari Smith as well, hitting some corner threes. Very good game. Men Thompson went 25 and 15. And the Rockets are one game back of the uh, the playing stretch or, or of the playing tournament. Mm-hmm. You, are you, feel, you feel as confident as Jalen Green that they're going to make it? No, I don't. The schedule is very difficult down the stretch. It's more difficult than that of the Warriors. I want to believe, but there is a part of me that just keeps on wondering when the other shoe is going to drop because the way Jalen Green is playing, it's incredible. 
Yeah. To the point where it feels unsustainable, not because I don't know that Jalen Green is capable of doing this. No, I think we all know Jalen Green is capable of doing this. Now it's a matter of like, wait a second, are we really going to see this guy for a full month yeah. continue to average like 37 points a game? Yeah, to this level of what he's doing is not sustainable. It's it's not. Now, can he get, he can get close, but these are, you know, some of these are, are Luka Doncic, LeBron, you know, Giannis numbers, like what he, what he's doing from an offensive perspective. So it's such a, a peak right now. It's probably not. Can it be close? I, I would say yes. But, you know, so the Rockets are, what, 12-1 and one in their last 13 games, 10 straight wins. And is there one thing for you that, you, you know, you look at and say – I just saw a guy, by the way, sorry, that was, uh, the Space City Home Network, who was wearing a Yankee hat and an Astros jersey Aww. walking into the Minute Maid Park. I wonder if it's Brad Osmus' family. I, I don't think Brad so. Brad Osmus, bench coach for the Yankees. Just one, just one guy, Yankee hat, Astros jersey. Oh, anyway. by the way, fun fact. I saw this on, on I'd rather Twitter. have a half jersey than that. Uh, Joe Girardi who tried to get into the uh, Astros clubhouse to say hi to Joe Espada. They didn't let him in. Hell yeah. They said, no, no, no. You don't have the right credentials. Good. I love that. I like that the Minute Maid Park security team yeah. is continuously stopping people yeah. from going places, but it's the wrong people. It's actual Astros players. Uh, it's Joe, Joe Girardi. Girardi, the manager of the Yankees. The That's old really manager funny. of the Yankees. My bad. I forgot he's not there anymore. Yeah, Aaron yeah. Boone. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, but Brad Osmus was taking photos with uh, Craig Biggio before the games. I remember once upon a time when – there was plenty of people worried that Craig Biggio, I mean, uh, Brad Osmus was going to be named the manager of the Houston Astros before they officially hired Joe Espada. Oh, no. Those were the stressful days. What, what happens days. What happens two months from now if, if things aren't going so well? Do, do people start wondering if they should have hired Osmus? Uh, the, I don't Astros think so. legend Brad Osmus? I, I think that's the one they won't. Maybe, so. I'll, maybe that'll be my – that'll be baseball Paul Zag if things don't Gross. go so well. Please don't. But, yeah, to bring it back to the Rockets, sorry, I just got that's sidetracked right. by that. I, I I would say that when I look at the Rockets and, and when it turns around, it's it's it is just this month, and what turned it around was their decision to play and and run, but also it does really go back to just Jalen Green, and the fact that he's playing more efficient basketball. Like it, it's not just that, you know, he's scoring more. It's just he's taking better shots. They're more consistently going in the hoop, which is a nice thing. And Ime Adoka was on, on the flagship yesterday, and he was doing an interview talking about Alper and Shangun and Jalen Green. And he said, quote, we went 4-1 and one with Shangun after the All-Star break. Our pace was the same. We wanted to increase that slash get the threes up. Uh, he said Jalen and Alperin can both complement each other very well. And then we talked about Jalen. He said he's getting the same looks he got before. He's just – He's recognizing them. And that's what this really feels like is the Rockets have just matured into a basketball team where they, they understand what's happening in front of them more. They, they understand what's being asked of them by the coaching staff. It's just that they – I think they just get it, and that's what's changed. Yeah, it could be that. It, it could be just – who they're playing still? Yeah, it's the pace. That's the big difference. I saw Adam Spillane put up a tweet yesterday that basically shows that before and after where this stretch, the Rockets are pretty similar in a lot of different metrics. Mm -hmm. I think offensively they've gone from ranking 23rd to 13th. So that's obviously a, a pretty big increase since the All-Star break. Defensively, they've gone from 6th to 8th, so it's been about the same. But pace, they've gone from 17th to 2nd. And I know a lot of people are wondering from a pace perspective about whether or not this pace can continue with Alperun Shingun coming back. And it was pretty interesting to see that Ime Udoka on the – Rockets flagship today said that the Rockets went four and one with Shangun after the All Star break, and that their pace was the same with Shangun. We wanted to increase that and get the threes up. So I guess we expect this to continue when he gets back. I guess I'll believe it when I see it. Sure. This is just the negative side of me checking in because last night we were riding a high, but um, 
Well, they have, they have options now, you know, and that's what's, you know, they have options and styles of basketball that, that they can play when Shangun gets back. So if they want to try to continue to play this way, they can. And then if it's what they want, Alper and Shangun, it's, it's going to be his and the coaching staff responsibility to figure out, okay, how does he fit into it? I mean, is there are certain nights, you know, when you play the Nuggets that you go more of the back-to-the-basket stuff with Alpi and you slow the pace down a little bit. That's where the Rockets have – Not it's not, to me, a question about, like, if one guy has to go or one guy has to stay. It's just they have to figure out how they're going to marry this whole thing together. And yep. Because it, it could be sustainable. I'd like it to be. I do like the Rockets better from a watch a watching perspective at the moment than I do with Shangoon. And there's no disrespect to Shangoon, but I, I love the pace that they're playing with. And the it's way a lot more fun to watch, that's for damn sure. I mean, yeah. last night's game was just a track meet, and there was a lot of fumbling and bad passes and stuff, but the athleticism on display for both teams, these are two of the most athletic teams in the league, it was uh, it was something else to watch. I, I am looking forward to the next Rockets-Thunder game, unfortunately. I think that's it mm-hmm. for the rest of the year. Yeah. So, um, But there are very few teams that I think can match the Rockets at that pace, and I think, you know, just the fact that they're doing this without a couple of their speed burners, yeah. Tari Eason, athletic freak, uh, Cam Whitmore, uh, he has not been as advertised. And the reason he fell in the draft was people thought he had, like, health issues, uh, knee issues, I think. And, and, and Shangoon, you know, I know <laughs> I know some people jokingly call him a stiff, but Shangoon's pretty agile as far as big guys go, too. So they're doing this without some pieces, and they come back, theoretically, if what Ime Dek Udoka is saying is true, it could be even faster. Yeah, so tomorrow night they play the Jazz, and then they play the Mavs, the Timberwolves, and the – Warriors. So that's their next four game stretch. Uh, how far do you think this win streak goes? So they're at ten right now. So they beat the Jazz, right? Mm-hmm. That's eleven. So call call our shots a little bit. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say it gets to twelve. The I'll Mavericks look. game on Sunday is going to be interesting because the Mavericks seemingly would play a pace that runs exactly counter to the Rockets because mm-hmm. with guys like Luka Doncic and. Kyrie Irving, you're expecting a lot of isolation just because they're so damn good at both of it, you know. Uh, Kyrie's got the best handles in the league still, I think, and uh, Luka Doncic is a terrifying scorer who can really hit a shot from just about anywhere. So you wonder if things get slowed down on that front. If you make them run, I I feel like you're definitely going to tire out Doncic. Mm -hmm. Does this you know, I feel like I'm in better shape than Doncic. He's kind of got that James Harden doughy boy. Boss. Yeah, he's got that doughy boy. And listen, we we you know, sorry yeah. to doughy shame, but it's, it's, it's a little doughy. It's a little doughy. I mean, there's nothing wrong with doughy shaming when you're supposed to be a professional athlete and be in peak shape. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, that's very. That's why I always get mad person. about it. That's why I always get mad yeah. about it. Uh, by the way, on YouTube at ESPN Houston, Joseph has a comment. Jalen has only been good because he's shooting over 20 shots a game, while others are barely hitting double digits. Anybody can do that. Is he really a team player? This is no different than what Harden did. Obviously, Jalen Green is a scorer first, but I think there were a couple of moments last night that have shown signs of growth for him, specifically the pass that he had under the basket where he blew by everybody, but everybody collapsed on him. The pass that he made to Jabari Smith in the corner, a guy who had been missing a lot of shots, who had not been hot, that was, I think, the sign of a player who's becoming more mature. And, yeah, I I think for some people it's always going to be frustrating. You see these scorers out there. They're ball hogs. They don't pass the ball. Sometimes they're not having a good night, yet they continue to stay confident and keep shooting. Harden obviously was a big, big offender on that front. At the other side of things, though, that is what Green does best. Mm -hmm. I think Green has added extra elements over the last month. Why? I don't know. But everything is clicking, and you just hope that it continues. And unlike with Lynn Sanity – (laughs) <laughs> which you don't – yeah, yeah. yeah. Jeremy Lin wasn't athletic, uh, as athletic as most other players in the NBA. But with Green, you expect this to go. And uh, someone made an interesting comparison when I did my live stream last night, Joe, where he said that, no, to compare this to Linsanity this in crazy month isn't isn't fair. Maybe it's Anthony Edwards who struggled his first two seasons and at the end of season number three really started to put it together sure. and be the guy that we have seen for the last couple of years. Well, here's the thing about the, the 20 shots per game that I, I'm going to push back on. If you look at, just go to ESPN.com and pull up 
field goals attempted per game. Uh, the list of players that lead the league in shot attempts per game are the best players in basketball for the most part, where they are clearly the best player on their team. So just because you take a ton of shots doesn't mean that you're a selfish basketball player if it's what you are best at and it's what your team needs. Luka Doncic leads the league in field goal attempts with 23.7. De'Aaron Fox, Jalen Brunson, Tyrese Maxey, and Shea Gilgis-Alexander, who we have said multiple times in the last two days, are is a top five player in the NBA – Take 20 at least shots top per, 10. Yeah. yeah, at least top 10. Like, take 20 shots per game. Anthony Edwards, Steph Curry, Devin Booker, Jason Tatum, Trey Young, Kevin Durant, they all take 19 shots per game. Now, the guy after Kevin Durant is Kyle Kuzma, so you don't want Jalen Green to be Kyle Kuzma, but, like, the best players take the most shots. It's just it's the way the NBA works today. So as long as he is efficient in the way he's taking these shots and he's putting up, you know, he's not taking – 20 shots to score 10 points, then I, I have no problem with Jalen Green being the ball-dominant player. It, it, to me, it, it looks nothing like what James Harden ever did. Mm -hmm. He doesn't just stand there and dribble, 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 shoot. There, there's movement. There's action. There's pace. It's, it's so different than anything James ever did. So I, I am very, very okay with this. Uh, I saw this story we've had in the rundown here. Patrick Mahomes eats 10 ice creams a night? 10 ice cream cones per Brittany Mahomes, yeah. That's a lot. Speaking of doughy boys. <laughs> what a take. That's, that's doughy boys. Patrick that's a Mahomes. lot. That's, that's too much. <laughs> that's too much ice cream, guys. What an understatement. I, I can't have more than one scoop without getting the acid reflux like crazy. <laughs> 10 ice cream cones? And uh, on top of that. Uh, what's it called? What's it called? Some gastrointestinal issues mm. as well. What's your go-to? Comes up and comes down. Coffee, ice cream. Oh, Paul, we are Hagen Dazs. Give me the coffee, ice cream, baby. Paul, I. What? We are. There's a reason we're working together. Then. Is your coffee ice cream? I guy love too? coffee. Ice coffee ice cream. ice cream is the best. One hundred percent. It's the so best. good. Brian's shaking his head. Joel's giving the stank face. They they do not approve. Well, I mean, they're our, peasants. I mean, they, I of all the to flavors have. to pick, you're picking coffee it's flavored. So, like you can have any ice cream in the world, and you pick coffee. I, it's, yeah. Well, what, what kind of flavor are you gonna pick, B Mac? Uh, there's Vanilla. Just, there's, just something, there's, there's that's just a basic take. Yeah, yeah. But where's your take? I don't hear it. I, I would pick a, a thousand. Uh, well, just off the top. Well, how you name a thousand? I'm just kidding. We don't want to hear your name <laughs> a thousand <laughs> ice cream all right, flavors. All right, one thousand and one. <laughs> the B Mac name one thousand ice cream challenge. Coming to the bullpen Saturday. I don't even think I could name 20. I don't think I could either. I mean, I, I like Rocky Road. Because it gets Road. into a sorbet. Like, you get to sherbet and sorbet. After Wait, time out, time out. What would you call it? Sherbet. It's not sherbet. It's sherbet. No, it's no. you're wrong. It's sherbet. No. It's not sherbet. You sl you sl God, I, I'm with a bunch of effing savages here. It's Fan sherbet. Fancy Paul no, says that I know No, nothing. it's not. I mean, well, yeah, it's sherbet. It's not sherbert. It's sherbet. Not no, it's not. I think I, I think I'm in the right here. Seven one three seven eight zero three seven seven six. How do you say that? And what's My the reason why the, are the Astros are going to win the World Series in 2024? Uh, opening day is here. What do we like about what's happening today? What do we don't? I think Paul's got some spicy takes about who's throwing out the first pitch, who's singing the anthem, who's doing the play ball. Uh, plus, just what's going to be better or worse than last year on the Astros? As a whole, we are live here at the decoy. Come on out, watch Astros opening day, watch the tournament. $3 uh, or $2 Mexican candy shots, $10 100 ounce Shiner Bach Tower. So come hang out at the decoy with us. We'll be here until 6 o'clock. Before we go to break, I want to tell you about my friends at O Athletic. You can check them out at 767 North Shepherd or OAthletic.com. Over 100 classes per week that they offer from weightlifting, agility training. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Mixed Martial Arts, they have it all for you. So however you want to train, you can accomplish at O Athletic. Even if you just want to work out by yourself, get a personal trainer. My guy Cam, he's been working with me. We just set up our appointment, uh, our, our next physical training for next week to get a check-in on, on my weight loss and all the progress I'm, I'm trying to make. It feels pretty good so far. The, the LBs have been coming off, so we're on pace to what we were looking for in the first three weeks. So make sure you check them out, O Athletic. Dot com 767 North Shepherd and when you sign up tell them Joe George sent you
Batu Gallant and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Live inside the Mobile Veritex Community Bank Studios located at the Decoy in Spring Branch. They asked for Houston, they got Houston. Those fools. Oh, Martin Maldonado. I love I love that moment. And, and yet you hated Martin Maldonado. I don't hate Martin Maldonado. You hated him. I just like Yiner Diaz more. You, uh, uh, heretic Jeremy Branham hated him. Well, he hates everybody. Joel Blank hated him. Everyone hated our fearless leader, Martin Maldonado. Now, now, I mean, are we a right of ship? I don't know. We're going to find out, I guess. We're going to find out. Will the Astros fall and the White Sox rise because of Martin Maldonado? I mean... It's a good question. Yeah. It stands to reason that, yes, that mm. this is the rise of the White Sox is right now. It's because of Martin Maldonado. Mm. Uh, we are broadcasting live here at the Decoy. Come on out, come out and watch opening day if you don't have plans. But all weekend, you know, to watch the Astros, it's a great place to do it. They're going to have uh, $2 Mexican candy shots, $3 Maker's Marks, uh, $10 Shinerbach Towers, 100 ounces during March Madness, $6 Casamigos, and tomorrow night during the Cougs game, we'll have the Cougs West Houston Watch party uh, with full audio throughout the decoy. DJ playing music during the commercial. So from the Cougs to the Strohs, just March Madness in general. Decoy is a great spot to come watch and come hang out. I saw Dewan Donna just got here. Joel and Brian will be here broadcasting until 6 because Jeremy's fancy boy. Got to go be in Dallas. Oh, Jeremy's going to be here. No, yeah, you misunderstood. Man. He's going to be on the show. He's just on the show. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. He'll be, yeah, he's already in Dallas. He couldn't, you know, he couldn't do the show here today and then drive to Dallas to go to the Cougs game. So he had to get there early. Oh, no. You got to get there early for an 849 tip off tomorrow. I, at best. They're saying the game tonight's going to be a 909 tip, the last one of the night. So I think we'll be lucky to oh, see. He, the he does. Tip off. It's not, you know, the reason why he wants to be there early? Because he was there yesterday. Because he wants to watch games? No, because uh, Coach Sampson takes everyone out for a big dinner once they get there. So he wanted to be there in time oh. for the dinner. Unbelievable. And he, went, he, went, he went over the menu for the last gr- uh, trip in Memphis this last weekend, and it was a pretty legendary menu, Again, but he, that's why he's there early. Jeremy is bought and paid for by the Cougs. <laughs> I am a devout follower of the Cougs by choice. I left my religion. I left Syracuse and converted to the one true college basketball religion. And this man is getting wined and dined to the point where he can't even come and hang out with us at the decoy. And this beautiful 73 degree day with people playing dollar Shinerbach Towers. Yeah, there are some pe- people playing volleyball. I might go in and join them in just a moment. You, you got your $2 Mexican candy shots, um, $6 Casamigos. Mm-hmm. And, and, and Jeremy Brandon was like, no, I, I, I want Kelvin Sampson to pay for my dinner. Uh, so today is, today is opening day. Uh, coverage on television is is well underway. Fran Rivaldas will be on the mound. Jose Altuve leads off, followed by Jordan Alvarez, then Kyle Tucker, and Alex Bregman batting four. So that's your top four in the lineup. Mm-hmm. I, I'm very excited. But before the game starts, Uncle Mike. Uncle Mike, who's been in spring training in full uniform for whatever reason, he will throw out the first pitch of today's game. Hmm. <coughs> Do you miss Uncle Mike? Is Michael Brantley first pitch worthy? I, I hate the Uncle Mike nickname. I don't understand it. It's just bizarre. Let's just throw Uncle in front of him. Why? Mm-hmm. Why? Doesn't uh, make any sense. I think because he's the old man of the team. So call him Grandpa. To, and they didn't want to call him Grandpa. Okay. Less but insulting. Uncle does not imply old man. To me, Uncle implies person who has, I don't know, shirked responsibilities of having a child themselves. Me. Uncle Paul. That's my godson calls me. Th- that's what I think of when I think of uncle. I think of somebody who's, like, very cool with seeing the kids just enough. Yeah. But not necessarily, you know, thinking about taking care of them full time. I understand that. But So I've never understood the Uncle Mike nickname. I feel like the Astros, there's a lot of bad nicknames given out. Uh, and on, on the other side of things, too, listen, like, I get it. Like, he's, he's just retired. But, I mean – I don't Retire, know. Retired the number today. Is he? Is should he be the opening day first pitch guy? Well, what else do you want? Um, you want Mattress Mac to try to buy his way in because he got CJ Stroud. You got v, oh, that would be a good one. CJ Stroud. I, I want to bring. I will get the people going. Jalen Green. 
with the way he's been playing of well, late. But I don't know if he's quite worthy yet either at this moment in time. Uh, Calvin Sampson's not here because he's treating Jeremy to dinner. Uh, Jamal Shedd is not here as well. Um, we had Megan the Stallion last year. We had, again, yeah. Megan the, Sp- the Stallion in those white pants last year. We, we can't get somebody of similar status, fourth biggest or third biggest city in the country, and we're resorting to a guy who barely played for the team last year. I'm not trying to besmirch Brantley. I just think we can do better for the I first pitch. I think you pitch. are. Beyonce? This is, this is pretty besmirchy. Why aren't we shooting for the moon? You know? Oh, well, Beyonce might be on the run. Um, <laughs> what do you mean? That you're, you're confusing Jay-Z with P. Diddy. Jay-Z... Some people think he's part of it. He's all oh, okay. And, uh, We're getting some real conspiracies out there. That, How about that Beyonce and her family left their home overnight? We we listen. We could do better than Michael Brantley for the first pitch. Well, speaking of rappers, uh, yeah. Fifty Cent is going to be the play ball guy today. I do like that. I think it's very funny that a guy who used to be known for wearing Yankees hats is now just completely converted, like myself, from Cues to the Cougs. Yeah. He has converted from the Yankees to the Astros. There was some po- uh, post that he put up. I think two to three years ago when he first moved here. And the post essentially said something along the lines of, glad I'm not a Knicks fan, I'm a Rockets fan now, after the Knicks had a heartbreaking loss. And it's really funny to say that, just given where the Rockets probably were when he actually sent that tweet out, because I think it was in 2021. And, uh-huh. You know, in 2021 and 2022, the Rockets had as many wins as they have this year in those two years combined. So Very nice. Uh, that part is pretty cool. But I feel like when it comes to um, this – I'm cool with this. Like, 50 Cent, that's the kind of star power I want for the play ball. But I think they could have done better for the first pitch. I think you could have made Michael Brantley the, the, the game two. You could make Josh Reddick, who's scheduled for game two, game three. You could do better with Michael Brantley for the first pitch. You're the Houston Astros. You're the biggest dynasty in sports right now other than the Kansas City Chiefs. I, I mean, I don't want to, you know, go out of Houston here at all, but they don't have a large amount of A-listers. That seem to support the Astros. Um, what, do I need, what do I need? The Big Bang Theory guy? Sh- yeah, Sheldon. Sheldon. Adult Sheldon. Yeah, adult. Yeah, not baby Sheldon. I got so I'd rather Brantley. No, you wouldn't. I don't believe you. We, I think the Big Bang Theory is the most overrated show. Well, of yeah. Time. I I mean, if if, if you're so talking Brantley him, over Parsons. Okay. Uh, how about? All right. This is. You know what? I just looked it up. Most famous people in Houston. Ten celebrities who live in Houston. Travis Scott. No. Yeah, hard nope. pass. Not after. Not after what happened at Astro World. George Strait. We couldn't do George Strait. I don't think. I don't know if he's ever done it. Uh, made. Fifty Cent comes up third. Yeah. Uh, excuse me. Comes up fifth. Uh, Joel Osteen is one. A hard pass. Nope. Megan the Stallion is two. Did it last year. Ted Cruz is six. Hard pass. Tillman Fertitta is is uh, eight. Yeah, that's a, if he wants to, I guess. I don't know who Lynn Wyatt is. That's seven. I don't know who Billy Gibbons is. That's nine. I don't know who Johnny Lee is. That's ten. So I think I think we're okay. Yeah. My, my, it's Billy Gibbons, by the way, the front man of ZZ Top. Okay. That was a very offensive. <laughs> uh, I'm not really. I mean, I don't know about music. I know. I'm, music and I I don't know. I'm Chicago and. But North that East would be here. that would be better. Clearly, Billy Gibbons. Yeah, I it would be, but I'm going with Michael Brantley, and then Julia, something called the Julia Cole. No disrespect to Julia Cole, is doing the uh, the the anthem. You seem I, upset by this. Listen, I'm not. I'm not upset about the anthem. I don't care about the anthem, but I do we, want to shoot higher. And I mean, we could have gotten Clay Walker. Hard like, pass. Why? Why? He hard doesn't pass? enough. No, he doesn't. He doesn't do it enough. He's there all the time. Yes, exactly. So at this point, like he's a Houston tradition. He's Find part someone of, else. He is. He is one of the greatest athletes in Houston sports history because of the amount of times that he's been used for uh, pregame ceremonies for Houston athletes. At this point, like he's he put a full season together of pregame stuff. That's true. Uh, uh, Fred here says Granado. Uh, we only do Space Cowboys games. I, I, I would like Granado to do the national anthem. Are you going to do the Space Cowboys first pitch this year? If, if they ask me to, yeah. Well, you said no last year. No, you're, I didn't. No, you were out of town last year. I was out of town last yeah, year. Yeah, you are out of town Yeah, I would have definitely done it. We yeah, embarrassed so. ourselves. Well, we had one one good one, one. Joel's was right down the middle. Joel's was very good. Mm-hmm. BK airmailed it by like 50 feet. And, Corey yeah. Lee, and then Corey Lee got traded. I, I, I didn't see Joel's. I did see 
Brad Kellner's and good God, that's the most embarrassing thing I've ever seen. In yeah, my it was life. pretty tough luck. Uh, sh he should have lost afternoons and it should have been given to me right there, no, right he, then. And then he left like a week later, like two weeks later. Um, all right, it's ESPN 97.5, 92.5, Glotton, Georgia. We're broadcasting live from the decoy. Come out, watch Astros opening day. Watch your Cougs tomorrow night. We'll have a watch party going on. Drink specials all weekend during the Astros opening series. $6 Casamigas going on during March Madness games as well. But when we get back, just we'll go back to what's your favorite moment about uh, versus the New York Yankees. We've played some of the highlights throughout the show, but what's our number one moment? And then what's the, what's the reason why the Astros win the World Series in 2024? That's next year on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Now back to the Mobile Veritex Community Bank Studios, located at the Decoy and Spring Branch. Here's Paul Gallant. Huzzah! And the math whiz himself, Joe George. I got 141 and two-thirds chance of winning. See, Joe, the numbers don't lie. All right, I've done my duty. I've made the math joke. Now I'm going back to the Del Olalea show. It's not the Dell show. It's Gallant George here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. But, yeah, math, not my strength. It was uh, something that I think people slowly became aware of on the Killer Beast, but it's uh, it got it's Here's gotten much thing, worse. Here's it's gotten thing. much worse. You it's do sports radio, and you will become worse at it. I legitimately had a 700 on the math section of my SAT, and ever since I have gotten into this, the amount of times that I F up, just minor little math things, 
is insane. I have this thing on my alarm because I have an alarm that's supposed to prevent me from sleeping in, which did not work today. We're supposed to go down to Minute Maid Park early in the morning. Sorry, Nate Griffin, on that front. And it makes me do math problems in the morning. And the alarm keeps going until you do the math problems. And then I have to do 15 squats. And then I have to take 20 steps. These are all things I do so I don't sleep in because I have a massive, massive sleeping in problem. And even with, like, doing these math problems every single day, which are, like, you know, like advanced addition, like adding three uh, two-digit numbers together, I still suck at math. We yeah. all suck at math. We all do. And then when we try to explain it on the air, we sound even worse. It does get worse. Uh, what's your number one Yankees-Astros uh, moment? Is it just 2019, or is there another one? There's so many. I know. The fun part is there's regular season moments that get completely lost in the shuffle. They had an epic comeback. Remember that one? The no-hitter? The, which no-hitter? I know. I mean, there's multiple no-hitters. There are so many. It, it has been so one-sided and not just on the playoff side of things for a while. I mean, I suppose the worst Astros Yankee moment I can remember was when Ken Giles punched himself in the face walking off the was mound. That, he was facing that was the Yankees. I remember that. Yes, because I was about to uh, get on a flight to go to Las Vegas and I saw it happen live on TV. Yeah, that's not a that's an that's not a good moment. <laughs> well, thanks, Joe. That's, that's not, that's not <laughs> thanks, a good Joe. Moment. Great. That's a good call. Ken Giles back. I don't know if he made the opening day roster or not for uh, whoever he signed with, but I've seen him back in baseball just. But punching yourself in the face, that's not good. Like you and I, we've talked about, we have some, we might have some anger moments. Yeah. Please don't ever punch yourself in the face, Paul. I, I, I won't. If I, you do I think it, about it, I think about it often. Though. No, Usually I, I just smash my hand against something and somehow it hasn't broken yet. Yeah, now if you're going to do it, make sure you do it when we're in studio on the Twitch and the YouTube. So, so that everyone we can, can see it and it can go viral. And we can right. clip it, yeah. But right. Like, I and mean, as so, co social media directors we are. I mean, you did really control yourself well the other day. When you spent five minutes filling up your giant water. Oh, yeah. And then you dropped it. Oh, yeah. And Sean and I were losing it. I didn't smash anything that You day. didn't. I thought about it, though. I was, I was mad. I did feel like we were in a cartoon in that moment. I felt like I could see the steam coming out of your ears. Well, you probably did. A little bit. Yeah. I, the, the, the Irish rage inside me scares me sometimes. Yeah. But it was, uh, it was, uh, it was, it was one of those moments. Uh, 2019, it's so hard to beat Altuve sending the Astros to the World Series, but – that, the Javier was a Javier no hitter versus the Yankees was that was a lot of fun because that was like they thought their season was going to turn around in that moment. That was fun, but I I gotta say for me this was such a unique experience. I, I had never watched a full sporting event on a flight before, and when the Astros completed their sweep of the New York Yankees in the 2022 ALCS, we watched this on a Southwest Airlines flight from Vegas back to Houston. So we're all a little drunk mm -hmm. while this flight's taking place. And everybody, for the most part, on this plane was an Astros fan. And since they were Astros fans, everyone was high-fiving random strangers, pumping fists, all sorts of stuff. Probably the rowdiest plane environment that I've ever been a part of. I think part of it has to do with the fact that, you know, we were coming back from Las Vegas, but... That is probably my favorite moment, completing the sweep and seeing it on a flight as opposed to seeing it at Minute Maid Park. Yeah. Um, let's see. 26 curveballs uh, here from 2568. That's obviously a very good one with Lance McCullers. Uh, hopefully we'll see Lance McCullers, you know, throw again against the Yankees at some point this but season. Hopefully we see Lance McCullers throw again. You, can end it, you could end the sentence like that. Yeah, that would be nice. Uh, 6941. It's not my favorite Astro Yankee memory. Um, it's not my most favorite, but Mattress Mac telling the Yankees fans, bleep you. No bleep you. Those were Philly fans. That's what I though. thought. Oh, yeah. Those were Philly fans. Yeah, I thought those were Philly fans. Right. I, 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 I think for the most part, there's really only one fan base that's going to confront you aggressively if you're an Astros fan. Yeah. And it's Phillies fans. I, I don't think Yankees fans want that anymore. I, don't, I think they realize, like, okay, we, we have to actually win something against them before we can start talking trash sure. again. But I think the Philadelphians, you know, I'm half Philadelphian by blood. I think the Philadelphians just have no filter and believe that anyone that is not a fan of a Philadelphia team is a barbaric outsider and they must yell at them. 
Uh, full lineup today. Altuve, Jordan, DH, Tucker and right, Bregman at third, Abreu at first, Chaz in left, Yiner at, uh, catching, Jeremy Pena batting eighth Jeremy at shortstop, Pena. Jake Myers to start in center field and ninth. Jeremy Branham did, in fact, tweet, what's wrong with Joe's lineup? Good for him. So he's not racist. Well, that's, you He's know. Equally questioning everyone. That's that's uh, one piece of proof you could use. That's, that's true. true. That's yeah, true. Uh, from Rivaldo's on the mound tonight. Um, some areas in which you expect the Astros to be worse or better in defense. Let's start there. Mm. I, I would I would assume that they're going to have a much better year defensively if Chas McCormick's going to be your primary left fielder. Jordan's pretty solid in left. But I, I like Jake in center. I like Chas in left. I don't, you know, Yiner Diaz – in certain spots, will be an improvement over multi, Martin Maldonado, we hope, mainly throwing guys out at second base. You're, we're hoping the Astros rotate, or pitchers in general, are just faster to home than they were last year. But I think the defense will be better this year. It might be marginal, but I, I think the defense should be better in 2024 than 2023. I hope so, but it depends on how much they're putting Jordan in the field. Jordan's better than you'd expect, but do you trust him – in left field when the Astros aren't at Minute Maid Park. Yeah. Uh, in center field, Myers is a good defender. I think Myers is supposed to be a better defender than he actually is statistically mm-hmm. based off of the metrics. And I, I definitely have overreacted to the few moments where Jake Myers has collided with the wall and looked like he's died. Yeah. <laughs> and it makes yeah. me a little concerned about him in the field. Um, Altuve is not as good as he used to be in the field. Pena, very good at shortstop. Bregman, very good at third base. Abreu, uh, he's not Yuli. Is Yonder not- Diaz going to be better than Maldi? I, I think it's probably going to be the biggest difference this year. I, I think defensively they're going to be more or less the same, hopefully a little bit better. It, it, but uh, how much of a difference is that going to make? I, I've always felt that fielding, it's it's important, obviously, but I, I think that recently we've, we've started – overestimating it is. You just don't want to be bad like the Boston Red Sox were this past couple of seasons. Where yeah. They're comically bad, where it's just like looks like Bad News Bears highlight reels. Yeah, yeah. E- exactly. Like you, you don't want to be a colossal disaster. Kyle Tucker also, like just the all the statistics, the all the weird advanced defensive numbers would say that, you know, that he didn't have as much success uh, in the field last year as he did the previous year. So Kyle Tucker's another one as well. Uh, base running wise, I expect them to be, I don't know, better, more aggressive. I don't know if they'll be better. Like they'll have more, they might steal the base more. They're going to be, they might do more station to station or less station to station. Uh, as Joe Espada has talked about this off se- or the spring training, but like Jose Altuve's woes are not going to be better this year. He's not going to all of a sudden go back to being not overly aggressive at times. So I, I, I don't, I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that, that, that's base, a hard one to measure, too. The base running is tricky. I mean, he's just got to not fall asleep. Like, he, the amount of times he got picked off in particular. Yeah. You're like, hey, you're Jose Altuve. Aren't you supposed to have – if we're talking about awareness in a video game, wouldn't you expect Jose Altuve to have close to 99 You know, if we're talking Madden or NBA 2K or something like that, I would expect Altuve to have some of the highest awareness that there is. Yeah. Um, The bullpen in general, would you say the bullpen's going to be better this year or worse? Because we kind of focused big picture earlier on the the pitching staff as a whole, but specifically with the bullpen, you'll lose three guys, really four guys because you lost Graveman as well, and then but all you did was add Hader. I still think it's going to be better this year. Why do you think it's going to be better, though? Because 7-8-9 uh, is going to be so good. 7-8-9 is going to be awesome, but the the middle with the starting rotation having the issues it is, yeah. I don't agree with you on that. Yeah, that, and it's fair. It's it, is it going to be bad enough to weigh down the entire bullpen? That's where I'm not so sure. It's just going to They're going to be taxed uh, early on this year, and – do you want a lot of Montero or whoever the hell else you're going to be putting into that middle relief situation? I, I suppose there's a chance for all of these guys to overachieve and, and to succeed in that spot. But right now I am really concerned about what happens after an Astros pitcher leaves a game 
in the fifth inning mm -hmm. or the sixth inning, even if they've had a good outing. I'm concerned about that couple of inning stretch. And you're not going to use all three of those guys every single night, you know? You're not no. going to use a, a, a Breu and then Presley and then Hayter every night. In the playoffs, great. In the regular season, how are you going to manage that as well? Are there going to be nights where, where – um, uh, Presley and Abreu alternate. Is it always going to be seven, eight, nine like that? Like that's something else you got to wonder about. And there's really only one pitcher on this staff that I'm expecting to go seven innings ever. It's Fromber. Yeah. Everyone else, I'm I'm looking at them. And You're kind of hoping for six, right? Exactly. I mean, Javier. Even good starts by Javier. We've regularly seen him pulled out if they're like five and a third, five and two thirds. Yeah, because his pitch counts just get so high. Right. Exactly. He 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 uh, he walks guys, and that is part of the big issue for them right now like they're gonna have to have some overachievers and some of these overachievers might be names that we're not expecting to do it there's been a lot of next man up for the houston astros over the last couple of seasons mm -hmm. specifically last year but is that going to continue you hope so you don't know so uh, the Astros are not the first game in, in action today oh the la angels and the baltimore orioles are in action First home run of the season. Didn't take long. It was Mike Trout. Mike Trout. What's the score? Are the Orioles winning? Uh, they are. It's 2-1. <laughs> uh, but the, the third batter of the baseball season this year in Major League Baseball was Mike Trout, and he hit a homer against the Baltimore Orioles. Took Corbin Burns deep in the other. Yeah, the Orioles are up 2-1 to one very early on. So the baseball is officially underway. Baseball is really underway. Because it's been on the way for a while. It's Trout, been in Korea. Trout, uh, yeah, it doesn't count. It does uh, count. That's racist against Korea. No, no, no. Just they, the games are too early, so it doesn't count. <laughs> but Trout's getting home runs. Astros Twitter is bitching about the roof not being open. It should be open today. Today's a beautiful it's, day. It should be. Look at the decoy right now. There's multiple volleyball yeah, games going to, on. Starting to fill up a little bit. Uh, During the Astros opening series against the New York Yankees, you can get $3 maker mark, $2 Mexican candy shots, uh, $10 100-ounce Shiner box. Uh, we didn't drink the one we were supposed to. I know you got to leave, so I'll just drink my own after this. All right, well, good I'll luck. Just by myself, hanging out. Well, that sounds depressing now when you put it like well, that. Brian doesn't drink beer, and he's throwing his hands up like I'm insulting him in some way. I'll buy you a Mexican candy shop, Brian, but I know you're not going to drink beer. So you're saying I'm only worth $2? Yeah. To go back to the earlier comment. You know what? You can get a maker's mark. You're worth, <laughs> See, you're worth, you're worth three dollars. See, Thank successfully you. shamed. You, 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 but you, you have to stand in the pocket on that one. If if people are worth two dollars, they're worth two dollars. I just he's, he's worth three. Mm -hmm. You would you must be a terrible negotiator. Yeah, but Brian's my friend. I'm, I'm, yeah, it's a, still. a friend so good that I'm worth three dollars. Three dollars. Okay, I'll buy you two maker's marks. <laughs> He was at my wedding, you so know, he gets a bonus. Ooh, okay. Well, see, I mean, you could guilt trip and say, well, I invited you to a wedding. How about uh, yeah. you buy me a drink? That's true. You know? I mean, it's a, it was four years ago, but, you know, <laughs> who's, who's counting at this point? Uh, it's ESPN 97.5, 925, Glant and George. We live at the decoy here until 6 o'clock. Uh, Jeremy, Joel, and Brian will be up next. But, of course, as we end every show, we'll hit on garbage time when we return.
It's Gallant and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Broadcasting live from the Mobile Veritex Community Bank Studios inside the decoy in Spring Branch. Here's Paul Gallant and Joe George. Gallant George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Broadcasting live from the decoy $10 Shinerbach Towers for 100 ounces. That's a lot of Shinerbach. I'm going to get one of the, me one of those right now, Paul. That's what I'm feeling right now. You couldn't get one from me. Uh, three dollar makers mark. I'm $2 not even worth two dollars to Mexican you. Mexican candies. Well, you gotta, you gotta go. You, you think you I suck go like Josh Giddy, huh? Yeah, I said Josh Giddy's gonna suck. Of course, Joel texted me last night. Well, he did score 31 points. Yeah, I know. I'm unstoppable. I'm sorry, game. I don't root for pedophiles. Uh, so, so <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> he does suck on that front, allegedly. Sorry, Josh Giddy. I'm not exactly. And I, no, I don't watch every single OKC Thunder basketball game. No, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not a pretender. Pretending like I'm watching. A pretenda. Every a did pretenda. you just say that? I did. You're getting fairly cocky right now. I can tell. Like you see the outside, you're like, oh yeah, Honestly, I'm about to about to crack a few cold ones, yeah. or perhaps just down a 100 ounce Shiner Bach Tower for ten dollars. Yep, I'm gonna do that by myself. Two dollar like, Mexican candy shots. Well, yeah, I I gotta bolt over. I know. And I'm glad that Sean played that coming in because I do have an Astros playlist. I have an Astros oh, playlist really? on my Spotify. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It features a couple of songs that you hear in the stadium on a regular basis. Sure. Tops drop. Yep. Got to play that. Yep. Want to be a baller. Yep. Got to play that. I don't know if Bregman, Bregman's using that this year. When was that Pena? It doesn't matter who uses it. I don't it generally, they would just play it in the stadium yeah. from time to time. And the stadium generally, Minute Maid, loses its belief whenever yeah. it happens. And the other one that you got to have in, they play this song a ton. Iron Man. They do. They do play it very often. I forget if Iron Man, was, if, if that was still Black Sabbath or if it was Ozzy Osbourne at that moment in time. Be that was Black Sabbath. Okay, cool. Because yeah. I'm musically challenged, as I proved earlier, with my lack of knowledge about ZZ Top Shout musician Shout out to names. Billy Gibbons. Yeah. Shout out RIP to uh, Billy Gibbons. Yeah, we got crushed. Uh, Billy that. Gibbons is alive. Oh, wait. Someone's texted him. <laughs> no, he's dead. No, wait, no. The text line is crushing us for us. So it's the, that's the text Billy line's Billy Gibbons fault. is alive. Is the bass player that died. Dusty okay. May. Okay. okay. So the text line is crushing us for no reason. Well, then. rest in peace to everybody who's yeah. dead <laughs> okay. in the world, uh, especially Ash- in the musical community. Again, I'm, I'm the most musically challenged person there, there is. You, you can't hold this against me. But those three songs are on the playlist. And then um, – the other song, I suppose I have to put it in, but uh, the, the Johnny Cash song. You gotta run, and then, I guess uh, run, Fireman, man. though, it sounds like. I, that's that's going to be the haters walking song. Oh, yeah, by Lil Wayne. No, yeah. sorry. Lil Wayne's not making the cut. Nope. Uh, I'm not going <laughs> to nope. make you do this, but uh, Astros win the World Series this year in 2024 over the Los Angeles Dodgers. Astros over Braves. All right. It's time for garbage time. B. Hannon says I should add still tip into that playlist. I agree. Yep, that's maybe, good. Maybe Southside as well on the way in. Hey, uh, you know, I went to the prestigious SI Newhouse School of Public Communications at Syracuse University, arguably the Harvard of broadcasting excellence. And I like went it. to Syracuse for the wrong reasons. Yeah, why? Why do you, you say that? Should you have been um, a mathematician? No. Now, I wasn't on the basketball team, so maybe my access to celebrities would have been limited. But I should have tried to be a drug mule oh. for Diddy, like former Syracuse basketball player Brendan Paul. I love this. Brendan Paul is an so amateur random. music producer and graduate of Fairmont State University in West Virginia. It's a D2 school. He transferred there. Barely got to play there. But he has also been accused of being a drug mule for Diddy, his employer, in a federal lawsuit filed against the rap mogul. What's really funny is if you take a look through the transcripts from these court proceedings, it seems that he wasn't a very good drug mule. <laughs> no, it does Brendan not. Paul does not seem like he was good. Uh, he was booked on one count of possession and suspected cocaine and suspected marijuana candy, according to an arrest report obtained by the Post. Both charges are felonies in Florida. So that's sad. That's sad, but maybe that's what I should have pursued. A lot of people believe that I pursue this on the side. Did anyone see Caleb Williams at a USC women's basketball game? Yeah. So. Bears fans are triggered. Pink phone. Pink nails. Yeah. Pink wallet. Yeah. Possibly lip gloss. Yep. Does that, Joe George, concern you as a fan of the Chicago Bears? No. Why not? Because why not the best team in the history of Chicago, the best one of the best three players wore a wedding dress. Dennis Rodman, 
Give me a break. I think two things are possible. I think you are allowed to say that Caleb Williams is an absolute weirdo for checking all of Mm. those boxes at a game. Sure. But that's the way he wants to do it. Fine. And if he's good at football, we're not going to care. But I do think it is fair to say it's weird. Yes. Because you don't expect that from a guy playing a hyper-masculine position like quarterback. All right. So Paul Gallant's going to paint his fingernails if Jalen Green and the Rockets make the playing tournament. Mm -hmm. I will get a pink phone and paint my fingernails. If Wait. the Bears win eight games, nine games, well, that's not above happening. 500? That's not happening. It wins one game. No, that's one a game. low bar. The Rockets are making the playing tournament. Well, the, yeah, but the Bears are an embarrassment. So, no, you, you got one game, right? One and a half? Is that the over-under? I know they won seven last year. but like, I mean, I don't know. I, what, if Caleb is, what if Caleb is terrible and, and, and then all of a sudden it's hard? Then I'm not, then I'm not going to be in solidarity with my, with my quarterback. Let's say five and a half. Fine. Five and a half. You guys aren't winning eight. That's too low. They're going to win seven games this year. Why are they going to win seven games? They're better than last year. They're in the same division as the Lions and Packers, who are definitely better than them. I think five and a half is too low of a number. All right, fine, 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 fine. So if the Bears win over seven and a half games this year, I will paint my fingernails and get a pink phone case for a week in solidarity with the quarterback. Should I do pink fingernails? Because Jalen Green's fingernails are black. Yeah, you have to go black. Should I get like little designs? No, on I'll them? let you choose. You can choose. Which, what kind of design should I put on them? I think you should. I think you should get the Rockets logo on at least one of them. Yeah, that would work. That would work. You have a Rockets hand and an Astros hand. Yeah, I like that. Should yeah. I grow one of my fingernails out too to look like super extra, like I'm in a rock band? I don't know if we have enough time for that. If There's only get ten my games left in the season. Uh, yeah. Well, I don't know. Fingernail. I, I I have a lot of collagen. I, I eat a lot of yeah. collagen. Yeah, part of my little uh, pre and post workout shake. Anything left from garbage time? Uh, Jim Harbaugh has been living in an RV. Could you live in an RV? I could not live in an RV. If it was the one that Jim Harbaugh is probably living in, yes. If it's the one from Breaking Bad, no. Well, yeah, there's nothing in the one from Breaking Bad other than, other than, yeah, the meth, 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 uh, and science meth devices, yes. right, and sleeping bags. Yeah, that did not seem like a fun place to live. But in. Jim Harbaugh's RV? Yeah, man. He's probably got three or four TVs, probably a PS5, nice bed. I'm not going to lie. Shower, when I, when toilet. I was a little, when I was a little kid, the idea of living in a mobile home was the coolest thing ever. Why? I don't know why I wanted to live in a mobile home. But I, I wanted to live in a mobile like an actually mobile home, not yeah. like a not like a you know a trailer in a trailer park or something like that. I wanted to actually be able to move around in an RV. But now I'm like, eh, I'm too lazy. I'm mm-hmm. too old. The game has passed me by. Yeah, I do feel like we're past that point in our life. But you never know, Paul. You Still never got know. plenty of life to live. I could be John Madden in my next life. Yeah. RVing from <laughs> <laughs> Division three college to Division three college. Love it. Just Paul Gallant, the mm-hmm. next John Madden for Division three football. I like that. In basketball. I mean, uh, yeah, I'd be qualified to talk about that. <laughs> All right, that does it for us today. $10 for a 100-ounce Shiner Bach Tower. $3 Maker's Mark. $2 Mexican Candy Shots. All Astros weekend uh, here at the Decoy. $6 Casamigos during March Madness. And the Houston Cougars West Watch Party tomorrow night doing the during the Cougs game with the DJ playing music during the commercial breaks. That does it for us. The Killer Bees live from the decoy next year on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Peace. Since Paul didn't do it.
Oh, uh, what up, H Town? Hey, how we doing? He's blank. I am Branham. I am not at the decoy. I'm in Dallas, but the boys are there. Uh, blank hey, what and was Brian. That? Brian's there on site engineering. I don't know, but you bit for the ball fake. You bit for I the what? ball fake. You bit Why? for the ball fake because he he got you to bite. You, you it, it distracted you. It, it threw you off guard. I didn't like it. You okay, bit for I the won't pump like fake it. or the shot fake, oh, whatever, boy. whatever uh, you know synonym you want to use. You you fell for it. Thanks, Jeremy. Good to hear from you. I mean, you admitted it. You said you. you mean, you you could hear the hesitation, and then you said you didn't like it. Didn't. What didn't you like about it? Because even Brian, we all paused. Like, what the hell is this? Like yeah, you know, I, I, we're all, we're all here one way or another, keeping us on our toes. Uh, I thought it was good stuff there. I don't know who writes that stuff anymore. By the way, you <laughs> thought it was you know? good that it didn't have your name in it. Well, I mean, I think I was funny. Yeah, I think it's. I think it was. A, <laughs> it was a chuckle. I mean, hey, where's he, he's blank, uh, Brian, and where's Branham? Yeah, I thought it was pretty funny. I thought it was some good stuff. I thought it was better stuff that Spencer said. Ooh, so the the war with Spencer hasn't ended. Oh no, it'll never end. What um. I forgot what I was going to say. Who writes that stuff now? Who writes that? I don't even know. Oh, that Is would be Joe? Michael Carroll. No, oh, no, really? no, no, Joe doesn't write that. Come okay. On. Well, I was, that's why I was surprised that it was funny. Like, that's why I was surprised that I thought it was comedic and, like, got well, a Michael chuckle out of very me. funny. Yeah, well, that's why, that's why I was wondering. Because I was like, is it Joe? Joe doesn't make no, me laugh. No, no, Michael? No. Oh, okay. That makes some sense. No, I thought that was well played. <laughs> like, I'm the one that the insult was hurled at, and I thought it was funny. Like, it's... What a way to start the show. Uh, we're broadcast, they're broadcasting live from the decoy in spring branch. Astros opening day gets started here in a couple of minutes. Uh, 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 I mean, 6.05. Uh, college hoops at 6 o'clock today, too. Sweet 16 begins tonight. Four matchups. Watch all of that from the decoy starting now all the way into the evening. And they got some drink specials for you. $100 ounce Shinerbach Towers for just $10. Can't beat that. Uh, $3 Makers, $2 Mexican Candy. They got the March Madness, $6 Casamigos. Well, that sounds really fun. Also, if you're looking for a place to watch the Cougs tomorrow, well, it's your West Houston watch party. Uh, they'll have the full audio of the game tomorrow between Houston and Duke, and they'll have the DJ playing in between the uh, in between the game during commercials. Uh, so the decoys your home all weekend long. You can get it started now. The boys are out there now. Uh, Blankers, I'm falling in love with this Rockets team. Um, I'm getting closer and closer to saying the L word with the Houston Rockets. I love that everything what Ime Adoka has done, we're starting to see these young players develop. We're starting to see these young players. I still don't even think they're close to their ceiling, but we're starting to see the arrow trending up with all of these young players. I'm not sure you can point to one healthy player on this team where the arrow is not pointing up, young player not pointing up. I know that uh, SGA didn't play yesterday for Oklahoma City. But this team, not that long ago, had five road wins. They're up to 11. They've won 10 in a row. They go to Oklahoma City. They win a tough overtime game against a 50-win team. I'm enjoying the heck out of this. No, you should. I mean, this is entertaining basketball. This is all we could have asked for and more when we were all, quite honestly, disappointed and, and found the, the Rockets hard to watch a year ago. This is amazing stuff because this is a team growing up right before our eyes. We're seeing these young players not only develop, but, like, show what they can really do. And obviously the easy one to look at is a Jalen Green because the turnaround has been drastic. It has been impressive, and he continues to, to do the things that we wanted to see when he was drafted. But when you look at a Men Thompson in his rookie year, you look at the shots the Jabari's hitting and the double-doubles he's putting up and what he's contributing – Everybody seems to be putting their mark on this streak, <clears throat> on this team. And, and you know, I thought about it more and more because you and I have had this ongoing, you know, dialogue about how valuable it would be for this team to make the playoffs and gain this experience. But even a game last night where you saw for all of the, the greatness of what Amen Thompson did, he screwed up. He didn't foul when he was supposed to. He missed a couple of putbacks. And Adoka was just like, it's a learning. You could just see he wasn't going to bark at him. He wasn't going to rip his head off because he knew this was a learning, teachable moment where he's going to get better, and the next time he's going to remember to do it right, and it's going to be amazing for the development of this team. Yeah, the, the contribution from everybody has been fun to watch. Um, Amin Thompson's so interesting to me, and we'll get to Jalen Green here shortly. Uh, but Amin, he, you know, Drafted like he's a point guard, and I, I still think that he's going to be a point guard someday. 
But it's fascinating to me. He might be a power forward. Like, he can play one through five, especially on the defensive end. He can guard one through five. It's awesome to see. He has a game yesterday where he went for 25 points, 15 rebounds. Like, are you kidding me? This guy's yep. a rookie putting up 25, 15, and four. He's doing it kind of out of position. I don't know if he really has a position. That's... He's just a basketball player that can play anywhere on the floor. Uh, he's awesome. Like, he's so unique relative hit, to the rest of the you NBA. Hit it. Like, this is where it, it, it's the best, most positive thing I can say, and some people would say in other cases it might be a negative. I don't know what position he plays, and quite honestly, I don't care because he does so many things so well. He handles the basketball. His rebounding ability and his ability to defend multiple positions is, is at a very, very high level already in this league. And then when you see his ability – to, to, to affect the game in a positive way. Maybe he's not the greatest outside shooter yet, but he still finds a way to score, and he finds a way to rebound, and he finds a way to find the open man. And, and with his defensive abilities and what he can do in many different ways to fill up a, a, a box score, it's just fun to watch this kid play. And then when you think about his age and this is his rookie year, you're going, yeah, this is going to be a kid you're going to like to watch for a long time. Yeah, he, he's fun to watch. Uh, I think he's already really good, and he's just going to continue to get better. If he can knock down a consistent three-point shot, and I'm not even saying that he needs to be a 40% three-point shooter. If he can be someone who shoots 30% but can knock down the open shot, uh, that's only going to help his game. Uh, Jabari, like my thing with Jabari, rebound the basketball, man. Like rebound the basketball. Whenever you have three rebounds in a game, I don't like seeing that. But he hit that big three in the, mm -hmm. the end of the fourth quarter. He looks more confident with that shot. And he, looked, he was only two for five in that game yesterday from the three-point line. But what I like about Jabari, especially in yesterday's game, no hesitation. Because like in his rookie year, it's like, oh, should I be taking the shot? Should I not be taking the shot? One thing that really stood out to me yesterday, even on the misses, catch and shoot, zero hesitation, and I think that you have to have that mentality to be a good shooter. Well, you look at it, Jeremy, look at it through the history of basketball. Recent history would tell you Ben Simmons is going to triple clutch and think hard, long and hard about any time he's left with an open three. Westbrook got to the point where he was second-guessing himself. You look at Josh Giddy, who, again, is a lot in a lot of ways on the court – he he is uh, he's gone through what a Men Thompson's already you know experienced, which is teams lay off of you. He's had a hot streak recently from three point line, but last night he second guessed every chance he had a wide open three and didn't want to shoot it. You don't see that with a Men Thompson. A Men knows what he's going to have to do and what the defenses are going to do until he does. He doesn't hesitate. The form looks better than average. I, it doesn't look all discombobulated. We're talking about and, Jabari. And, Oh, I'm, I, I was I was talking about a men's ability to hit the three, but yeah, from a Jabari perspective, perspective, look, I, I think everybody we say the ceiling is Chris Bosh, but a double double from a guy that can face up and knock down threes and knock down, you know, uh, consistent jump shots, he's got that in his bag. I, I just think he's still learning as he goes and understanding the the NBA game, but when he understands mismatches to the point where he can put it on the floor, he can put his butt to the basket. But regardless of, of how high his ceiling is, what he's doing for this team and can do on a consistent basis, every team in the league would take in a heartbeat. Uh, Dylan Brooks had eight points in overtime uh, yesterday. He knocked down those first two threes on back-to-back -back possessions and then had that little basket interference. I'm not sure it would have mm -hmm. went in. It looked like he was rolling off of the front iron, but it was a giddy. I think it was giddy it was that giddy. touched off yep. the front iron. And it's like, okay, cool, we'll take it. Eight points for Dylan Brooks. One of the things that I don't think that people talk about enough when it comes to Dylan Brooks, and I know we've had our arguments with Brooks, like he can be a little bit of a goon at times. Uh, he's definitely your best perimeter defender. <laughs> that might be a reach. He, he's the guy you brought in to be that defensive-minded wing that you have him guarding the other team's best player. Um, also to kind of be a veteran, to be a leader, and he's pretty respected in the uh, the locker room. One thing that we're sleeping on with Dylan Brooks is how good he's been shooting the three ball this year. 36% from behind the three-point line from Dylan Brooks. This is exactly what you wanted him to be. If he shot 30, 31, 32, that's not great, especially for what you're paying him. But this is what he, this is what you brought him in for, to knock down mm -hmm. some open threes, to play really good defense, to be your tough guy. And they got into a little minor scrum again yesterday. But I think the most underrated thing this season when, when we look at the Rockets is the fact that Dylan Brooks is shooting over 35% from three, and that's where you got to have him. That's where you got to have him. No, and similar to what we were talking about with three-point shooters, you have to at least have the confidence to shoot them. He has the confidence to shoot them. The guys were talking about when he played for Team Canada and had, I think, 29 points in the game where they beat the U.S., but he was free-stroking from whenever he got an open shot. In this offense, if you're open, you got to shoot the ball. And when he shoots the ball, 
it's been going in at a pretty good clip this year. And, and, and you know, we talked – you, you're right. We've talked about it before. The big thing with me with Dylan Brooks is he's convinced me that – when he came into this league and he's trying to make a name for himself, and you know that's when he did a lot of these antics, and it got him paid. Now that he's paid, I don't think he needs the gimmicky stuff as much and the get under the guy's skin as much as just go out and play your game because he's got basketball skill. Mm-hmm. You mentioned he's an above average defender. He's strong. He can play smart. If he makes the three ball too, I mean he fits in with exactly what they're trying to do, and he's going to get opportunities to put the ball in the basket. Like he's still he's still certainly going to be an enforcer, and I wonder how much Ime Adoka has played into that. Like, because there there were some times earlier this year where Dylan Brooks was kind of making these careless fouls. Uh, mm-hmm. he, I can't remember the game; it was early in the year where like he fouled a three point shooter in a critical time, and Ime Adoka was very very honest in his press conference. Like, yeah, that was a stupid foul. Like, I, I want because we look at the young players with the development and Ime's contributions to the v- development. We look at Jalen and Alpi and Amin and Jabari. I wonder how much of what Dylan Brooks and like if, if we think that he has matured and he's not doing the stupid stuff that he did in the past which I mean he still shows it every now and then and I didn't watch sure. it that closely in Memphis I wonder if we can credit Ime Adoka there a bit I think so and I think Jeremy part of it was they were all learning exactly what was expected of them from a new coach and I think that as much as they had training camp and other things you're not going to get into some of those type things until the actual real games start happening when you can understand, hey, this is what's expected of me of this head coach. This is what he wants me to do in these situations. Last night, he was totally in the right. I, I just feel like the fact that, it, you know, when a, a player is on the ground, he, he wants his teammates to help him up. It's one thing if you offer your hand, he doesn't take it. But for Giddy to grab on to Jabari's <laughs> wrist with both hands and, like, put a, a vice grip on him, I was totally fine with Dylan Brooks pushing him away, going, hey, man, just get the hell away from him. He doesn't want you doing that. And – those are the kind of times when I think that's why Adoka would love to see him doing something like that. He doesn't want to see the before the whistle blows, punching the grapes, or you know some of the extra, uh, extra stuff. But this team, we knew it. We talked about it last year. They didn't have an enforcer. They didn't have toughness. They didn't have a guy that wasn't wasn't going to back down. And they have that in Dylan Brooks. I think and it can all, be a tool. I think they're all kind of. I think they've all adopted a little bit of it. (laughs) It's crazy. Uh, Yeah, Giddy acted like Jabari Smith was 16 years old the way that he was grabbing at him. Seven one three seven eight zero ESPN the HRNP listener line seven one three seven eight zero three seven seven six. Eric the driver says amazing how the Astros always seem to start at three o five back when y'all are in the noon slot. Now they're starting at six o five when y'all in the three slot. Uh, isn't life crazy like that? Isn't it? Isn't it such a coincidence? Was it's it Alanis Morissette? Isn't life ironic? Yes. Isn't yeah. it ironic? Yep. There you yeah, go. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where you know it, good things happen to good people, and we just love the fact that the Astros are willing to help us out. Yeah, they are underway, by the way. Uh, seven one, and you can watch it at the decoy in Spring Branch. Oh, can you? Uh, seven one three seven eight zero ESPN HRMP listener line. Corby Craig from Bet US will be joining us down at, at three thirty to talk about uh, what to play in these uh, Sweet Sixteen games coming up today and tomorrow. Killer B Fight Club bracket will continue. It is a Thursday, so a bad take Boulevard. Who makes the list this week? And we do have a Will of Bits coming up to later today. Might be the first one of the week, I think. Uh, 713-780-3776. At what point do the Jalen Green haters have to apologize? We're on Twitch, twitch.tv slash ESPN97.5. On YouTube, just search us at ESPN Houston. Joel's at Pac-Man Joel. Brian's at Sacked by BMAC. I'm at Jeremy Branham. We are the Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and ESPN 92.5. It's time, basketball betters. It's March Mania. Brand, I'm here to tell you all about BetUS.com. I endorse one. That's one, Sportsbook and Casino, and it's BetUS.com. BetUS.com has been driving to the basket for over 30 years. This year, BetUS has an epic three-pointer, a 125% sign-up bonus on your first three deposits. Not one, not two, but three. The industry's craziest 125% sign-up bonus on your first three deposits, plus 10% gambler's insurance, and even more, BetUS accepts crypto and is offering a 200% crypto sign-up bonus. So gambler's insurance and and crypto, you don't see that everywhere. March Mania basketball can get even more exciting with their live in-game betting. It's also a blast to check out their casino after the game, whether you like blackjack, craps, roulette, whatever, uh, where you could get a 250% casino bonus. Get started by visiting BetUS.com or give them a call at 1-800-MYBETUS to learn all about their bonuses and special offers. BetUS is where the game begins.
broadcasting live from the Mobile Veritex Community Bank Studios. That one threw me off, off guard, too. That was a weird one. Uh, broadcasting from the decoy, the boys are out there. Was that clapping that I heard? Yeah, I was trying to get BMAC's attention. He's a little bit involved in this game right now. Oh, what's Why were you trying to get my attention? Because I didn't, you turned game? my levels down, and I wasn't sure. Yeah, you yeah, your mic was on. I turned it on okay. during the break. I didn't know. I mean, I'm a little <laughs> distance away from you. I got to make sure I'm on the air. Are you beat a diva, Blake? No, not this time. <laughs> <laughs> I like that answer. That was well done. Uh, what's the uh, what's the count in y'all's uh, in y'all's game? I, I'm wondering how close our our monitors are synced here. Uh, judges coming up to. Or, I'm sorry, it's three two for Desoto right now. He just had a foul ball. Oh, uh, he yeah, he just fouled just it now. off right, right right off the plate. Oh, that sounds like I'm a little bit ahead of you then. Okay, I, yep. I won't I won't spoil things. But it looks like Fromber's already getting a little bit a uh, little bit unhappy with the strike zone. Well, I, pitch I, counts I, up. I will say they the 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 shin the cameras caught this right as Glaber Torres walked off after striking out against Fromber. He walked right over to Soto. It seemed to maybe give uh, give uh, Soto a little bit of a tip. So hopefully the Yankees haven't picked up on something. Oh, wow. Maybe it's the fact that his hair looks a little bit different than it did a year ago. Uh, different look for Frommer. Um, that, I was listening to that to the commercials, as we all should listen to the commercials all the time. Uh, that's, I, I didn't realize that that's how you said Dell's last name. I had no clue. Dell Ololea? I thought it was Olole. I There you go. No, Today Olalea. I learned. Yep. Yeah, I heard um, Michael Carroll always says that he knows how to say it better than – because he talks to Dell, so it, he made very well, sure. Well, he also has to make the opens. Yeah, so, <laughs> so he was very know. sure when he made the opens <laughs> to the show, he said it the right way. Yeah, yeah, I, I thought it was Olale. My bad, Dell. It's Olale. There you go. The more you know. Today I learned. Uh, 713-780-ESPN. Okay. HRMP listener line, 713780 Seven one three seven eight zero. Why are they clapping? Double little, play. Little, little double play oh, ball. Oh, you ahead of me then. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. I, I thought you were ahead of us. I thought you already saw it. But, no, yeah, double, double, uh, ending, ending, double play. That was a, a little 5-4-3 nice three three to, George, to Joe George. That equals 64. Bregman getting into the <laughs> hole like that? That was well done. Pause. All right. When do the Jalen Green haters have to apologize? 713-780-3776. When do the Jalen Green haters have to apologize, Blankers? Man, I, I mean, I, I think by the end of the season – I, I, if it's not already too late and they need to start doing it now, player of the week becomes player of the month, but becomes the guy that you saw last night do the kind of things that a guy that's one of the stars of your team is supposed to do and the way he was able to do it. I mean, this is when you start realizing, hey, it's okay to put tail between legs, foot and mouth and say you were wrong because that's what you want. You want this kid – could grow into and become the player that you drafted him to be, and that's what you're seeing right before your eyes. I mean, a guy that has matured in so many ways. We, you know, I constantly was adamant about the. You know, he had basketball skill. It's just can he translate that and mature into what it takes to be that skilled in the NBA? He's doing it now. He doesn't get down when he misses shots. He's sharing the basketball. He's the reason why Jabari got the open three in the corner. He facilitated baskets as well as just getting buckets himself inside outside this is when as a Rockets fan it's okay to admit you were wrong and it's okay to understand that this is who you wanted him to be yeah I think that um, I don't like celebrating before things are fully accomplished but I, we are seeing the the maturation of Jalen Green before our eyes now the criticism that I've had of Jalen Green and I, I've, I've defended Jalen Green is, is the consistency. So, like, okay, like Jalen Green has shown this over a month. Jalen Green, well, you know, it started with the player of the week. He's shown it over a month. He showed it over, let's see if he can do it for two months. Let's see if he can do it for three months. Let's see if he can do it for half a season. Let's see if he can do it for a full season. So, consistency to me is the thing that I always need to see from Jalen Green. But I'm very encouraged that Jalen Green is developing and maturing as a player. This is why – let's be patient, guys. It's only year three. He's only 21 years old. Uh, it's the first time he's ever been coached by a real coach on, you know, making winning plays. And, and you mentioned the facilitating and finding Jabari in the corner. Like, that was one of many times that he did that yesterday. He flirted with a triple-double in yep. yesterday's game. He played good defense, had a, big, like a critical block in that game. So Jalen Green is – is making winning plays. And yesterday he shot it well and he scored 37. He's not going to shoot it well every game. And in fact, he's not I don't think he's ever going to be like a great shooter. Hopefully he becomes a good shooter. He's more scorer than shooter and he's more playmaker than shooter, which is fine. Like know your limitations, know who you are as a player. 
there's going to be night. Like last night, Jalen was seven for eleven from three. That's one of that's an outlier. That, that's that's about as good a game as he's going to have from three mm-hmm. point range. He might have games where he's three for eleven. That's fine. But make those winning plays, make those winning passes, and that's the area where I think Jalen Green has grown the most. I credit Ime Adoka for that, and that's why I'm bullish on Jalen Green over what I've seen over the last month almost. Yeah, I think the other thing too is the fact that. The threes that he's making of uh, of the ones that he made, a lot of them are highly contested, difficult shots, and that just shows you whether he's a shooter or a scorer. When he needs to make shots, he has a, an ability to make them at a higher level than most. I mean, some of the contested step backs that he was taking and making late when they needed him, you're like, whoa. I mean, that's eye opener. Whether you were on his side or not, you know, he, he shows his ability. But you're right. Adoka should get the most credit because this is something that Silas could never do, never reach him to do, and never get him to do the other things that a really good player in this league does. And now we're seeing it all develop in one year's time. And I think to your point on consistency, the biggest thing for me is he had that heater a little while ago where he went eight or ten games. I think it was right around the All-Star break or right after it. And then he kind of he kind of dialed off a little bit. But then he picked it right back up to where you're like, look, in the ebbs and flows of an NBA season, all guys are going to have some highs and lows. The fact that he's able to do this again and then consistently keep it going this time makes me become, believe this is the time where the switch is flipped on and it doesn't turn off. Seven one three seven eight zero three seven seven six. When do the haters have to apologize? Three three one one says never. The hate was valid at the time. It depends on what the hate was. If you were saying that they should have traded Jalen Green from from Mikel Bridges to the Nets at the deadline, then I wouldn't say that hate was valid uh, because that would have been a huge loss for the Rockets. Uh, 3,000 says Mike's contract, though. You don't have to make that decision this offseason. Like, nope, it's, sure it's, be- it's the beginning of it. Like It's the start of when you can do it, but you don't have to do that right away. Uh, so I, I do want to see more before I hand that out because that's not going anywhere. Like it's not, it's not Major League Baseball where the sooner you get it done, the cheaper you can get it done. The max contract's the max contract. It's not going anywhere. You have time to wait on that uh, in, the, in the NBA. The thing too, Jeremy, about the, the, the text before that, if you were, if you were criticizing him and, and hating on him because of some of the things that I, we had highlighted, not getting back on defense, complaining to the officials too much when a shot didn't go in or he thought he got fouled, you know, not moving it, swinging it, and expecting that he'd get it back. Those are fair criticisms at the time. But, yeah, to dump out on him and to want to just unload him for Mikhail, we, we, we both said that's a horrible deal for them. And, and why would you do that now when you don't have to? Then, then that's a different story. Seven one three seven eight zero ESPN. Uh, when do you have to apologize to Jalen? Someone uh, Astros Josh says I'm sorry. Uh, Chris says I'm apologizing for sure. Just hope this is for real and not just another streak. I, I think there is that. You know, mm-hmm. you're kind of the guarded optimism. Maybe uh, Andrew Bryant. They don't. He earned the criticism. Kevin. They won't. They will reappear from the trees. And then Chris says, At what point do we start to wonder if the open floor without Alpi has contributed to this? Well, I think that's a fair conversation to have and that's where the challenge lies with Adoka for next year because now you know we've seen what Alpi can do but we've seen that Jalen has done something and taken it to a different level with Alpi out there now you've got to construct an offense to where you can highlight and and complement both Um, I think it's it's not rocket science no pun intended but it's foot your as a coach and coaching staff in the NBA there's a way to exploit in a positive way both guys and there should be no reason why Jalen can't do this without being on the floor. Yeah, I, I think that they can. I, I think that they can both excel offensively. We've seen them both excel offensively this year. It was before Jalen was playing at this level, though, before he was as consistent as this. He would have some games where he would pop off without being on the floor. Uh, I, I think that they can certainly coexist, and I think it's the job of the coaching staff, okay, what's the best matchup here? What's the best way to attack? Uh, I think Alpi being able to turn into a 33, 35% three-point shooter uh, would make it a lot better as well. I'm not as concerned offensively. I, I think it is fair to question, though, defensively if this team's better with Alpi on the floor or off the floor. Uh, because defensively, they're far better without Alpi. So, like, what is the combination? How much are you gaining offensively that you're not giving up defensively? Because if you watch this starting five, and they did this in the, down the stretch, and they did it in every single play in overtime, whenever you have the five, the starting five on the floor, the new starting five, 
mm-hmm. with Fred Van Vliet, with uh, Jalen Green, with Dylan Brooks, with Amin Thompson, with Jabari Smith. They're they're switching every single screen. Yep. They're switching every single ball screen, which makes you better defensively. It doesn't open up some holes in your defense. You cannot do that with Alpi Shingoon. I think the biggest way that the, the Rockets have improved without Alpi is because they're so much better defensively. Yeah, you're right, and I think that the other thing is when Alpi's on the floor, they'll try to do the high pick and roll, or they'll try and get a switch to where they can get the maximum matchup where he's on their the, the other team's best offensive player. Because you have so much versatility and ability to defend with the, that starting lineup you're talking about now, it, it takes away and it limits the offense's ability to try and find a matchup that works. You, you know, I was thinking about it as you were talking there, too, about – The fact that, look, we've seen when Chris Paul and Harden were on the floor. They started the game, and then quite pretty quickly after that, Paul would come off the floor until James got his run for the majority of the first quarter. Then when James sat down, Paul would be on the floor. The biggest thing was in the fourth quarter when you need buckets, both were on the floor, and they found a way to make that work too. It's just you have to make sure when when Alpi's on the floor that the guys around him are, are capable of playing help defense that you don't have to do as much because because Jalen can defend. 713-780-ESPN, HRMP listener line, 713-780-3776. Corby Craig from BetUS, he'll be joining us next, telling us all the best bets in the Sweet 16 matchups for tonight, for tomorrow. It's the Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and ESPN 92.5.
You're listening to the Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Broadcasting live from the Mobile Veritex Community Bank Studios, located at the Decoy in Spring Branch. The Bees at the Decoy in Spring Branch, your spot to watch all of your sports this weekend. Astros opening day, opening week, college hoops at 6. Drink specials like $3 Makers, $2 Mexican Candy, a 100-ounce Shiner Box Tower for just 10 bucks. Let's go out to the HRMP guest line. Joining us now on the HRMP guest line, our friend Corby Craig, joining us each week at the NCAA tournament from BetUS.com. Corby, thanks for taking a few minutes this afternoon to join us. Four games coming up tonight in the NCAA tournament. Let's start in the West region. Two-seed Arizona, six-seed Clemson. I've seen a lot of the experts here, and it seems like everybody's on Arizona. How do you feel about this with the Wildcats getting six and a half points? Hey, guys, yeah, I I came on here last week talking about how good Baylor was. You know, Clemson just comes out and it looks great. So my my opinion is slightly tainted here. I just don't think Clemson is to the standard of any of these teams. I'm, I'm surprised that they made it as far as they did. So, I'm going to kind of side with the experts here and be on that Arizona bandwagon. I think they have the ability to speed up this Clemson offense. And if you speed up Joseph Gerard, I think that Clemson can have a little bit more turnovers than we've seen. He's used to playing a Syracuse type of zone and slower pace. Now Arizona, obviously one of the faster teams in the nation, does have the ability to, to make that a little more fun. Corby, I've looked at the matchup. I've seen a lot of the experts say if there's going to be an upset tonight, a lot of people are looking at Alabama and Carolina. I was a little surprised by that, but I'm curious your thoughts on Alabama's chances against a one seed like Carolina. Yeah, I I kind of disagree with you. Um, I'm a born and raised Alabama kid, so my my family wouldn't be happy in me saying the fact that I don't know if Nate Oates is as good as people give him credit for. He's he is a very good coach, don't get me wrong. He's turned Alabama in a direction that is quality, and we see all these metrics say they're the best team in the nation at offensively, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, you go and look at the players, and, and you're talking about guys who aren't five stars, guys like Mark Sears, who was great at Ohio. But, like, at some point, you're going to run into a mismatch of talent, and, and North Carolina is that. North Carolina gets basically all the talent they want at this point. Uh, and I think that at the end of the day, when you play the pace this game is going to be played, the total is 173. Uh, talent is what's going to win that game. I think that North Carolina inevitably does have more talent. Corby Craig, Bet U.S. joining us. You mentioned the pace there because you look at all SEC basketball and you're getting tons of uh, tons of possessions, tons of points in these SEC games. How much are you looking at the total of 174.5 in that one? Yeah, it's, uh, it would be really hard for me to try to convince you to bet an under, wouldn't it? Uh, <laughs> I mean, the pace is going to be there. It's crazy to think that an 83-82 game is still well under the total. It's just crazy to think in college basketball, but uh, – Unfortunately, if I was to bet it, I, w- I would look towards that angle of an under. If you think this is going to be a close game, there's not any foul. So I think this number kind of ex- projects in a few late-game foul situations. And we've kind of seen Alabama in these points not go to the free throw line as fast as they can. Like they, they kind of will let the game play out because they know they're going to play so many possessions. They don't need the foul team when they're down with two minutes left as they're going to have seven possessions. So. so I think probably less fouling than people would imagine. Um, now, do I want to bet an under in Alabama, North Carolina? I do not at all. I'm curious, uh, from the standpoint, we're talking about the ones, too, a lot. Everybody's already basically, you know, anointing UConn in a lot of ways, and, and you know, they're, they're, everybody thinks they're going to run, run away with it. Do, do you see UConn having problems tonight at all? I don't. I actually would think the exact opposite. I um I think that if there's a game that's going to be a blowout and I was going to bet on it, it would be this UConn side at 11.5, which sounds crazy to bet an 11.5. I think it might have fell down to 10.5, but to bet that in the Sweet 16 sounds crazy. We have to reference, like, what have teams done to stop San Diego State? And it's been pretty easy. UAB, the easiest case in point is it just went to the zone. San Diego State can't shoot the basketball. It's kind of noted at this point. But the issue is they're so big. Liddy is a massive body. Versus UAB, he's able to have 26 points on pretty easy shots, even in his own. And Yale, poor Yale, they, they didn't stand a chance in the, in the paint. Um, so it, you can allow them to shoot. And I think that UConn does have the bigs to stop it. So if, the only way that I'm proving wrong, I imagine here, is if um, San Diego State can shoot themselves out of the zone. But I imagine UConn, for the first time this year, will go into a zone, which we haven't seen. Uh, but it, it looks like every team is going to at this point. No one believes that San Diego State can shoot. 
Yeah, the, the rematch of last year's national championship game. It, it seems pro, it seems like Danny Hurley's taking a little bit of pride too and blowing out a bunch of teams. Uh, the final game of the day, it's the one that I, I'm looking forward to the most. Uh, one of the best defenses in the country, if not the best defense in the country, versus one of the best offenses in the country, if not the best offense in the country. Iowa State, the two seed against the three seed Illinois. Iowa State's giving a point and a half. How do you see this one playing out, Corby? Yeah, if you ask me to circle an upset, this is the one I am circling as well. This is going to be the best game of the day, in my opinion. You just see two completely different schemas. You see basically a team who wants to run fast, and more importantly, a team with an NBA superstar. Uh, Karen Shannon has played his way into the talk of being a great NBA player. Not great, but like, you know, what I'm saying. as a college kid, you can only project so far. And Terrence Shannon has crossed all the checks that he needs to cross. Um, now he gets to face a coaching nightmare. And also Berger, who has had Iowa State as one of the best defenses, regardless of the talent level, for quite some time. So I think that from a talent standpoint, again, if you're going five guys on the court, this is a this Illinois game to win. Um, and if you're going from a scheme standpoint, Iowa State gets dead. So it's, it's depending on what you think. But uh, in March, I think we've all kind of seen this story play through a few times. Uh, and an elite player will make a team rise to the crop. So we see a Jimmer Fredette type of game. Uh, and madness to allow his team at that kind of high pace to take the stage. And this feels like Terrence Shannon's ability to do that here. Obviously, we turn the page to tomorrow, Corby. Everybody wants to know because everybody's a Coug. Uh, the Cougs grinded one out, gutty, gritty performance, dug deep into the bench, uh, and got themselves a win against AM. Now they take on a Duke squad that's got a, a Filipowski when the, the bigs are kind of hurt and dinged up a little bit for the Cougs. How do you see it playing out? Yeah, I think we talked about that Houston A&M matchup as a scare the first time we talked. I, uh, I, I really like this Houston team. I have futures on them from the preseason. But, I mean, A&M gave them trouble the first game, too. I, I, I don't put as much weight as people were kind of talking about the scare of Houston not being as good. I saw that as a really tough matchup. A&M wants to play the most bully ball they can, and they have a legit score or two, even. Um, and I think Duke just, unfortunately, is not that. Like, we see teams – Teams with success versus Houston are basically teams with thick skin and are able to take that pounding all night and kind of rebuttal it. And then we go look at Kyle Filipowski and you look at him and you're like, well, this guy really wants to shoot the three. Not really worried about ground pound down low. He he does all the things that I think Houston would allow a big man to do. And if Filipowski shoots 26 points from the field and, and their guards are hitting the threes that they've been hitting, Duke could upset. But I think this is a pretty bad matchup for the Blue Devils overall. Being joined by Corby Craig, BetUS, BetUS.com. Uh, the other three matchups tomorrow, two-seed Marquette, 11 seed NC State, and the other South region game. And then the Midwest, you have the, the top seed in Purdue against fifth seed Gonzaga, two-seed Tennessee, three-seed Creighton. Uh, a fun fun group of games tomorrow. Of those other three, do you have a play that you like the most, a game that you're kind of circling is, is one that, you know, you think that you might have an advantage over the uh, the, the sharps that make the lines? Yeah, I would, out of all of those, would be the craziest game to discuss, but I think um, people aren't giving the Zags enough credit. Like, we saw the Gonzaga. The big thing that nobody wants to circle back on is Gonzaga played Purdue in the Maui Invitational earlier this year. So it's not like this is the first time they've ever seen Zach Eady. And actually, they have changed their entire offense due to the fact that they got kind of crushed by Zach Eady. You go back and look at that game, I think Zach Eady, I don't have the number in front of me, but I believe he had 25 points. In a game where, where Gonzaga started a big man who wanted to shoot the three ball, they started Huff, um, and he's not really a physical big, and, and they realized pretty quickly, like, hey, we're not going to be able to win the national championship if we don't have someone who can who can ground and pound versus someone like E or Filipowski or all the bigs that are in college right now, Hunter Dickinson even. They played Kansas, and, and they, they swapped matchups so that they could be better in this matchup. And in that game, we saw a line of five, and in this game, we see a line of five. So do I think... Gonzaga is the same team as we saw in November. I don't. I think they're exponentially better. Uh, and this game feels like much closer to a pick. Corby, we appreciate the time as always. Uh, enjoy the eight games uh, coming up the next two days. And, then of course, the, uh, the four games Saturday and Sunday. And we'll chat again next week. Yeah, guys, I appreciate it. Corby Craig, BetUS, breaking it all down as the Sweet 16 upon us. Four games tonight, four games tomorrow. And if you're looking for a place to watch one of those four games tomorrow, Houston Cougars and Duke, 
Well, you know the spot to be is the Decoy and Spring Branch through your West Houston watch party. Cougs will have uh, the full audio inside the decoy of the game broadcast. And then during the commercial breaks, uh, they'll have a DJ plan. So it's your party tomorrow for Houston and Duke at the decoy. It's also your spot to watch opening day, which is going on now. College Hoops tonight, $100 ounce Shiner Bach Towers for just $10. bucks. 3 dollars makers, $2 Mexican candies, and March Madness, $6 Casamigos. Uh, get to the decoy in Spring Branch now. We'll step aside for a moment. We come back. What's the best and worst case at each Astro position? It's the Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and ESPN 92.5. You're listening to The Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Broadcasting live from the Mobile Veritex Community Bank Studios, located at the Decoy and Spring Branch. He's Blank. I'm Branham. Astros opening day going on today. Uh, Astros touching up the uh, the molester for three runs in the first. Yeah. Yankees uh, threatened in the second. Bases loaded one out. Fromber was able to induce a double play. Good Fromber. We saw a little bit of bad Fromber in the inning, loading the bases one out, and then saw the good Fromber inducing an ending ending double play. Uh, so middle of the second there, three nothing Astros. That first pitch, by the way, six oh five today. Uh, you can watch the Astros at the Decoy in Spring Branch College Hoops beginning at six o'clock today. Hundred dollar ounce Shiner box for just ten bucks. Three dollar makers. Two dollar Mexican candy. Six dollar cast amigos i want one of each please and then tomorrow they're your west houston houston cougar watch party uh, dj during the commercials full audio during the uh during the broadcast in that one um 
We get to the best and worst case at each of these Astros positions because we talk about, well, what do we expect at this? You know, what's the range at each of these spots? Uh, first, though, I, I saw some people today on the Internet at other stations that didn't really have an idea of how 60-day ILs worked. Just uh, <laughs> embarrassing, really, the cluelessness of how a 60-day injured list uh, works. But whatever. Uh, what's your best worst case uh, scenario at the catcher position, Blankers? Uh, obviously, best case scenario is and you're talking about just raw stats, stats for the co- combination of the two guys. Just how you see things going, best and worst case. Oh my goodness! Yeah, I know you're a little <laughs> behind us. I held my breath. You should have seen Joe George. I had an idea. And then Joe George and Brian McDonald just gazing at me like, "There's your boy." Yep. Well, look, he hits if, lefties, I said all though. If like, if that's don't the Jake we lefties. get, I'm excited. Great. Good job. Way to go. Fantastic way to start the season for Jake. Um. Yeah. Don't that didn't sound very don't enthusiastic and happy for no, Jake. I want him to do well because uh, – Great for him. Great. Do you care, him. Blankers, do you care more about Jake or do you care more about your opinion of Jake? No. I, I hope, I, I've said this all along. I hope I'm extremely wrong. I oh, hope geez. he plays his tail off. I know and, I know that you think that. I know you think that. Yeah, and that's a great way to start. If, if you're an Astros fan, that's fantastic. Let's so, start in center field. <laughs> What's your best and worst yeah. case in center field? Best case scenario is that Jake hits righties and lefties – the deer in the headlights is gone that look at the plate and in the outfield, and you get a guy that, look, I don't think he has to overperform. I, yeah. I think that, you know, yeah, it's nice to see that he has occasional power, but if he's hitting in the 260s and, you know, and he's getting on base and he's playing good defense, that's pretty good for a center fielder in baseball. Is, is a 15-15 season possible? I think so. I think I need more stolen bases, because I need, I need him to lead uh, the team. No, oh, come on. Okay, <laughs> well, there's a better, I'll, chance, I'll, there's a better I'll go ahead and up it then. 15 it, home runs than 15 stolen bases. I'll go ahead and up it then. Is the 2020 season possible? No, it's not. No, it is not. The, he's not hitting 20 bombs. He's I don't just think not. he's still. I think he has a better chance to hit 20 bombs and still 20 bases. Like and that's why I think pop. either one of them. I, I don't think either one pop. of them are going to happen. He does. Well, well let, let's just level at 15-15. If he hits for a decent average, decent slash line, and he's 15-15, we're all happy, right? Sure. Oh, yeah. My, my best case is just that he takes over the center field job. Like, he becomes a guy that you can pencil into center field and you're not worrying about upgrading the position for, like, the next three to two, like, two to three years. Like, he just takes the reins of being given this opportunity to win the everyday center field job, and he just takes it and runs with it. And it might not be, like, this huge stat line. Maybe it's just 250 with 15 homers playing really good defensive center field. But that's, like, enough with this lineup, I think. So, best case to me, he just, he just takes over the job. And Jake Myers is the guy. You're not looking for a center fielder constantly uh, my worst case is it's the opposite of that and we're calling for Jake Myers to be benched two months into the season and everybody's saying that Mauricio Dubon should be the everyday center fielder that that's my best worst case without like making it too number heavy yeah I'm great with that I, I'm fine with that just the fact that like you said he can settle in and we know we've got a guy for the next couple of years that you don't have to worry about then that's fine with me because it makes everything else a little bit easier to be able to work with if you're Joe Espada and you're not looking for you know extra outfielders all the time and trying to figure out righties and and doing the things that they had to do with him and Chaz and center a year ago that'd be fantastic all right left field best worst case well, I'll tell you what, I mean, I'd love to see Chaz have another year like he did last year. Just anything that hovers around those lines, maybe even a less than. Uh, even if it's a little less than, I think you're going to get a good defensive outfielder. You're going to get a guy that's above average uh, from an offensive perspective, and you're going to get a guy that fits beautifully with the, this, this lineup. Uh, I, don't think that that's, I don't think that's soft selling it, but it, if he can do that, that'd be fantastic. My left, yeah, same thing. Chaz, it, it, for him to do what he did last year over 150 games is my best case scenario, and that would be like a really good offensive left fielder. And then worst case is that he regresses back to where he was. Like, and he wasn't bad two years ago, but he, two years ago he was probably an average bat in left field as opposed to last year being a good bat in left field. So best case he is who he was last year over 150 games. Worst case he's who he was two years ago, and it's just an average bat in left field. Uh, right field with Tucker. I mean, uh, I, I, obviously, I think Tuck's a guy that, that is capable of putting up massive numbers. And with the way we've been doing our predictions for the year and the screw job in the order that I got and some of the oh, stupid mistakes. Come I, on. I'm just playing around a little bit. I obviously have him in a lot of categories. <laughs> I need him to be great. Um, I mean, I think best case scenario for Kyle Tucker is, uh, again, a, a season like he put together last year. I think this team, this lineup overall is better offensively top to bottom where he doesn't have to have, you know, the same numbers as last year. That'd be nice.
But I think even if they're a little less, I think there's a little bit more in this lineup. And, and they're again, they're fine because he's a good defensive outfielder and offensively he's capable of doing power and average and everything else. I would say with what he showed us last year, his, his best possible outcome would be the MVP of the American League. I mean, I think that's within the cards for, for Kyle Tucker. If he if he gets to the 30-30 season with a good average and maybe even goes above that with the power, we haven't seen 40 home run power, obviously, from him yet. But there's no reason why he couldn't be in the running for American League MVP. Yeah, that's my best-case scenario is that he's going to be the AL MVP. Worst-case scenario, I think he has a high bar. I think worst-case scenario, he still gives you, like, above-average offense. He still gives you a guy who's a contender for gold glove. Uh, his his postseason last year wasn't great. Like maybe you could throw right. that into the worst case scenario too. But I, I do think he's an MVP candidate. All right, to the infield catcher spot, Yiner Caratini is going to get some uh, some good run there too. Blankers best worst case behind the dish. Best case is you get just an offensive explosion from a guy that showed you every reason to believe he's going to be an unbelievable offensive weapon in, in in the American League. And you get a guy that that you know can hit you thirty bombs, and you get a guy that's going to drive in close to 100 runs or, you know, you know, 80 to 100 runs uh, and put pop and the ability to put the ball in play that we we haven't seen with Maldonado in those years. And when he's not playing, you've got a, 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 an adequate backup behind him that brings versatility to the plate that can do things to where I think that you you really improve all across the board. But just Yiner every day giving you the, the ability to break out offensively is, is huge. I could see I think Yiner this becoming is one of the, the biggest, more volatile spots, quite frankly, because Yiner is a good offensive player. Yiner showed that he was a good offensive player last year, but we haven't seen him behind the dish for an extended period of time, obviously, in the bigs. So, mm-hmm. like, does that playing a bunch of defense, does that take a toll on his body? Does that, you know, break him down a bit? Does that, you know, the wear and tear, does that impact his offense? And then also, like, you know, was it a, was it a one-hit wonder? Uh, I don't think that's the case, especially offensively. Defensively. Best case scenario to me is that he takes the reins and can be a good enough defensive catcher where you have no problem playing him 120 to 130 games behind the dish. And his bat's so good that the other games he's DHing. So to me, it's more about the defensive side. Like, is he going to lead the league in pass balls like Maldi did? Hopefully not. Can he handle the pitching staff? So from that standpoint, I, I, I want to see what he looks like over a full season. Best case scenario, that he handles all that stuff nicely, and we're not even talking about it in a year. Worst case scenario, he doesn't do that, and we realize that he's not capable of being a catcher over 130 starts, and they have to move his position uh, because he doesn't handle it. I would bet on the best case more than the worst case, though. I would, too, and I'm curious. I went light on the home run numbers, but do you think that what's what's best case and and good numbers for him for a full offensive season of playing almost every day? It kind of depends on if what they do with him on the days off. Like, whenever he's not – because he's not going to catch 150 right. games. Uh, 130 is probably pretty lofty, too. But if he starts 125 games behind the dish, what are you doing with him in the other 35 games? Is he DHing all of them? Are you giving him a little run at first base? I haven't heard any anything of, uh, to that front on the ladder, so I don't think he's going to play first base at all. So it depends to me on what you're doing whenever he's not catching. If you're just getting him off his feet, giving him a day off, and you're not getting his bat in the lineup, that's different than if he's DHing those other 25 games. Yeah, I, I would just I went light by a thirty bomb, but he's he's capable of more than that. I just hope that he settles in so that we see a guy that's comfortable in, in, in against righties and lefties and just you know is is able to be who we think he can be. It's just his first full season in the bigs. I don't expect him to have monsters that he's capable of later in his career, but I think he's fully yeah. capable of a thirty home run season. Yeah, twenty three homers and three hundred and seventy seven plate appearances yesterday. Yeah, I think he has thirty homers in his bag. Brian, what were you saying? Yeah. I was going to say, I think his upside is becoming the best power hitter at the catcher position in the league. I mean, uh, certainly there – I mean, Salvador Perez used to be that guy, but he's Rushman. fallen off with his power. Rushman is, it would definitely be in the conversation, but I don't think his raw power is as much as Yonder Diaz. Uh, so I think he could become the best power hitter uh, in the American League at the position. What that looks like average-wise, I think, kind of represents his downside in that we saw basically him take practically zero walks last year uh, doesn't have the best place discipline. So maybe if the book is out, the film is out, and the league starts to adjust to him, if he doesn't adjust back, I think we could see the batting average plummet from that 280, I think it was 282 last year. Uh, not obviously down to Maldi levels, but uh, a batting average that would be uh, enough of a problem that we would point it out and have it as a part of the conversation. Yeah, I think he has that in his bag too. First base with Abreu. 
I, I ex you know, what best case scenario is you get more I, minus the power numbers. I just don't think he's going to get power numbers like he had even when he was in Chicago. But I think best case scenario is you get uh, the the late surge that we saw out of him last year is consistent for the rest of this season for an entire season that he feels comfortable that he, he gets back to hitting for average uh, that he has some pop in, in the alleys even if it's just for extra bases. And you get a guy that belongs in the middle of a lineup as good as the Astros lineup, as opposed to a guy that was force fed to us for a majority of the season being in the middle of the lineup because of his contract when he wasn't hitting very well at all. Seven one three seven eight zero ESPN. Um, what are your what's your best worst case scenario with all these players? I'm going to say a Brayu worst case scenario. He's just who he was last year. And maybe without the hot streak in the last two months, he's just who he was prior to getting a little bit hotter when he came off the injured list that second time around. Uh, best case is who he was. He is who he was in the last two months and into the playoffs. So yeah. that's the best worst case there for me. Uh, let's go. Let's take a look at the other three positions: second, short, third, and in the pitching staff. When we come back, seven one three seven eight zero ESPN HRMP listener line seven one three seven eight zero three seven seven six Killer Bees broadcasting live from the Decoy In Spring Branch on ESPN ninety seven five and ESPN ninety two five. You're listening to The Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Broadcasting live from the Mobile Veritex Community Bank Studios, located at the Decoy and Spring Branch. Astros opening day, college hoops, $100 ounce Shinerbach Towers for 10 bucks. That's amazing. $3 Makers, $2 Mexican Candies. You can get $6 Casamigos with their March Madness, $6 Casamigos. And then tomorrow it's your Houston Cougar watch party. Full audio during the game, DJ during commercials. Uh, someone texted us in, 713-780-3776. Um, are you guys working on Good Friday? Yeah, the boy, we are all working. The boys will be at Rose Hill Beer Garden in Cyprus. Have some cold beer while you're there. Um, so, yeah, just uh, – Heads up for tomorrow. Come out to the decoy now, and then tomorrow to hang out with us. Make sure you're at the uh, Rose Hill Rose Hill Rose Hill Beer Garden in Cyprus. All right, second base, Jose Altuve. Best case, worst case scenario, Blinkers. I mean, best case for me is that he stays healthy for the entire season. Because if he does, I fully believe that he's gonna, you know, have obviously the kind of numbers he had last year, but for more games with better results. 
Uh, I think he returns to form for a guy that can give you 30 bombs, that can hit around 300, that can be the guy that we've gotten used to seeing. I don't think he's close to falling off yet. And, and the fact that he was able to put up the numbers he was with it being as hurt as he was last year, I just need him to stay healthy because I believe if he does that, that we'll see those numbers be where we want them to be. Yeah. Um, offensively, I think he's capable of just being as good as he was. Uh, his injuries last year were kind of fluky, so I'm not really concerned about his injury proneness. Like, I, I'm more concerned about a Jordan Alvarez. But we have seen more dings with, with Jose Altuve over the last couple of years. Uh, for me, it's more about him defensively. I think that that's the only place we've, we've seen him age. Uh, we've seen him age defensively where he doesn't have the range that he that he once did back in his earlier days, back in the par- prime of his career. Uh, now that he's past the prime of his career, he's still hitting at the same level. He's just not who he was defensively. I still want him to be capable. Uh, so that best case for me, he's still capable defensively at second base. He gives you what he did offensively last year. Worst case, you see more and more regression defensively to where he's to the point where it's like, not that you're benching him or anything, not that you're trying to DH him or anything, but to the point where it's like, man, don't hit the ball to second base. Or you're giving up more hits because you don't have the range at second base that the average Major League Baseball team does. So for me, it's more about uh, the defense with Jose Altuve yeah. than the offense. That's fair because we, you know, as much as we've said that we haven't seen his offensive numbers start to diminish, we've seen his d- decline at, uh, uh, at second base. And it's, it, it, it happened quickly, and I don't think it's going to get any better. Uh, what about shortstop with Jeremy Pena? Look, I mean, I, I hope Jeremy Pena, you know, continues to do what a lot of people don't like, which is do exactly what he's been doing. I, I hope he, you know, best case scenario is he's he's figured out a way to kind of lay off some of the breaking pitches that have been problematic. But then from that standpoint, maybe a little bit more pop, but just keep doing what he's doing both offensively and defensively. And as we've talked about, that makes him an above-average uh, shortstop in, in American League and in baseball. And you can take that in the middle of this line, I mean, with the rest of this lineup. Pena, to me, at shortstop is the opposite of what I just said about Altuve at second. Uh, I, I trust his defense. His defense is going to be good yes. to great. No, no worries at all about his defense. Uh, it's about offense. Best case offensively for Jeremy Pena is he puts the good of his rookie year and the good of his second year and combines forces and gets the best of it all. His rookie year, he showed good pop. He showed that he could hit the ball hard and out of the ballpark and hit the ball into the air. He was still striking out too much, and he wasn't walking enough. Last year was the opposite. Last year, he improved his strikeout rate. He improved his walk rate. He improved his batting average. He got better across the board offensively with the exception of power. The power flat out disappeared. So best case, he combines that with his defense and turns into a top 10 shortstop in baseball. Uh, The worst case is that he just continues to disappoint offensively. He doesn't put it all together, and he's Adam Everett. Um, And that would be the worst case for Jeremy. Yeah, no, I hear you. I don't think there's any reason to believe he's going to be Adam Everett. But it is fair to, to just, you know, be a little concerned about him offensively. I feel like, you know, he's tweaked his, his, his approach a little bit in his stance. I hope it works out for the best of him because you're right. I mean, look, even even if the offensive numbers aren't great, he is one of the better defensive shortstops in baseball. Yeah, I agree with that. Final offensive one, third base with Alex Bregman in his walk year. Well, this is going to be interesting. Best case scenario is he's, you know, he's in the top top five to six for MVP voting. You know, the extra weight means extra home runs. And he gets more pop. He still has that eye at the plate. He still, you know, hits between 280 and 300. uh, And he earns every dollar that he thinks he's worth in the open market. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I'm not going to be. I'm not going to go up to top five. I don't think that he has that in him anymore. But I'll say top ten. So we're right there. Yeah. Uh, very similar conversation. The defense doesn't go away. Very good defender. Uh, conversation for Gold Glove if it weren't for Matt Chapman, and he has a big year in his walk year. That's best case. Uh, worst case, you know, last time he put on weight, had some injuries, but but maybe he goes the opposite way of of that contract year. Where a lot of players, most of the time, a majority of the time. Uh, players will have a big walk year, but sometimes you see poor years in walk years because that pressure is too much because they want to get paid. That would be worst case, but I would bet more on the best case than the worst case. Uh, starting pitching as a group. 
Yeah, look, as a group, I think that obviously the best case scenario is they're able to kind of keep the ship afloat while Verlander gets back and it's it's just a couple of weeks and he's back. And then shortly after that, everybody falls into place. And you get McCullers, whether it's at the All-Star break or after, you get Garcia right around the same time. But the fact that you get another year like you got out of last year from J.P. France, that you get guys that are, are capable of competing and keeping their ERAs you know, lower. Uh, this staff has too much talent for them not to be one of the top, I'd say, I, I, just to go lightly, but I think best case scenario is one of the top five staffs in baseball. I think that's best case scenario too, but I also think it's a volatile group because you have sure. a lot of guys that could go the other way. Uh, if Verlander can sustain who he was last year, cool. Like that's a that's a two, three starter in any starting rotation. Uh, but he's into his 40s now, and he's had an injury for the second time in as many years. Uh, does What does father time look like for Verlander? Does it push him closer to the back of the rotation than the top of the rotation? Uh, Fromber, when he's going well, he's as good as anybody. First half, Fromber, as good as anybody. Betting favorite to win the Cy Young at the midway point last year. Should have been the a- AL starter. Second half, he was not that guy. So he's volatile. Same thing with Christian Javier. We've seen that. Uh, didn't look like himself last year at all. So do we get good Javier, bad Javier? Hunter Brown has the makings of being a top of the rotation starter, uh, but he didn't show that last year. Does he get closer? Does he get there this year? Don't know. So, like, there's a lot of dominoes to this one. The health, you know, what does the health of Luis Garcia look like and Lance McCullers look like? And if they do come back healthy, how good are they? How much do they add to this pitching rotation? So this could go either way. Like, this this one's extremely volatile for me. I, I think they could have a top three. I, I've said they could have a top one uh, pitching staff in all of baseball. Uh, some of that would be because of the bullpen. But I also think they could fade into the middle of the pack if a lot of these ifs go the wrong way. So this one, this one to me is all over the place. I just think that the biggest thing that is the most volatile of all of that is that in, the, the injuries. I mean, you've got – it's not just one or two guys. You're, you're obviously dealing with four guys right now when you're, you're wondering when they're going to come back, what they're going to look like when they come back to your point. It's one thing to say, hey, they're back. But they have to be effective. They have to be what they what they used to be, at least in a majority of the situa- the, the circumstances with those guys. And so, yeah, that injuries thing makes everything so volatile. All right, last one. The bullpen where they've added Hader, but they lost Neris, Stanek, Maton. The, it's a little bit soft in the middle now. Uh, best worst case for the bullpen. Best case scenario is you get one of the you, you return to being one of the three to five best bullpens in baseball. That back end, that that back end seven eight nine makes you not have to worry as much about the middle. Uh, the starters go deep or deep enough where they're going. They're that you're consistently giving you six. Uh, to where you're getting to a point, and it doesn't matter who's getting all the saves because you have, like in the case of a Presley, where sometimes you know two two in a row, three in four days, not his forte. You can kind of shuffle the guys around enough to where everybody is capable of closing games, getting outs, and, and they you know that bullpen ends up being where it, we were used to seeing it in the top three. Yeah, top three guys, just who they are. Like, And I yep. think that they can be from a best-case point of view. Montero's who he was in the second half last year. Not even two years ago, Montero. Just second half of last season, Montero would be fine enough for me. Uh, and then a couple of those those guys that we, you know, haven't seen a ton. Seth Martinez, uh, Amashinsky, you know, the, the rest of the pieces. One or two of those guys can step up to be like a Phil Maton level guy. Uh, they don't need to be Brian Abreu. They don't need to be Josh Hader. They just have to solidify the middle of the bullpen. You don't need the middle of the bullpen to be a great team. You don't need the middle of the bullpen to win a lot of games. You need the middle of the bullpen to like keep you alive, to like survive a tight game in the middle. Uh, if a starting pitcher leaves early, you put up a, one or two runs – uh, to where you can get into the back end, let your offense go to work. So you don't need a great middle of the rotation, but you do need big league arms in the middle of the rotation. I think they can get there. Uh, so that's best case scenario. Worst case scenario is one of the big three. They, they go backwards. Ryan Presley doesn't handle the non-closer role all that well. And then all of these other pieces that are filling the middle of the rotation are just minor league guys and not very good. And that bullpen just not very good in general because of that. Yeah, my big fear is that they might have to go out and find themselves at least one more veteran reliever, you know, at some point during the first half. Yeah, and the the, the good news with that, like if that's the worst thing that happens, that that's much easier than being able to find like a cleanup hitter. Sure. That's much easier than being able to find like a top three starter. Like you, you can solidify your bullpen pretty well 
at the deadline. We saw that with James Click a couple of years ago. We're like, they were awful in relief. And then all of a sudden, the deadline, he, he trades for like three solid arms. And all of a sudden, the bullpen's pretty solid. So, yeah. yeah was that, you can, that was Graveman. Um, uh, was the first the time boy, with Graveman. Graveman, Na- Maton, and, and – um, Yimmy Garcia, I think. Y- is Yimmy Garcia, of. there you go. Yep. Yeah, yep, like you, you added three guys, and like none of them were huge names, but those three guys were solid, and all of a sudden, like a mediocre to bad bullpen turned into a pretty good bullpen. And that was at one deadline with three different guys. And actually, you, you also got Yiner Diaz and that for Miles Straw, who got DFA right. the other day. So, like, it's not it's not that difficult to spot. Like, the, the two biggest weaknesses on this team, in my mind, are the middle relievers, the bench, but if there's two areas you can solidify the easiest, those are the two. So you can kind of afford to wait and see a little bit. Absolutely. Look, I think that, you know, you look at center field, and if Jake is just capable of doing what we said, that that's a huge uh, sigh of relief because now you can just truly focus on what you need to, uh, to improve on if, in fact, you have to improve anywhere. 713-780-ESPN, HRMP listener line. Get out and watch the uh, the Astros and some March Madness tonight uh, at the decoy with the boys until 6. Decoy will be open late uh, for your viewing pleasure. All right, time for the Fight Club bracket. Who won our matchups yesterday? What are the matchups today? It's the Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and ESPN 92.5.
Michael Carroll's humor humors me. Um, Fromber's gotten two inning-ending double plays with the bases loaded one out. So it's like the good and the bad of Fromber. The good Fromber getting out of these jams. The bad Fromber getting into these jams. Are we going to do the, the theme songs for these pitchers this year? I think we need to. Yeah, I think we, we had need pretty to. good That's success. A good call. With it. Yeah, we need yeah. to talk about that. Yeah, Should and we, then we uh, have to add for where we need. Do we keep the or ones we, that we've had, or? Well, well I mean, the Fromber ones that was, worked. Fromber was pretty sketchy in the second half. Maybe we should revisit Fromber. Yeah, but the whole but thing it, was. I think it's symbolism. Yeah. Yeah, it was ro- love roller coaster because. Okay, actually, you know what? You're right. That, that is still fitting. It, that is yeah. still it tells fitting. his story. You know. All right. Yesterday in the Killer Bee Fight Club bracket, we uh, we got close to the end of the first round. We'll get to the end of the first round today. We had three squash matches. Quite frankly, uh, Landry Locker beat up on Stan Norfleet. Which I don't know about this. Uh, I don't either. I, bad voting, I think. Sixty-four uh, percent to thirty-six percent. I, I think Stan Northfleet's winning that fight. I think the voters got that one wrong, but we honor the vote of the voters. Uh, the other two matchups: John Granado buried Ben Gary, eighty-eight percent to twelve percent. Uh, poor guy. Uh, it was good knowing you, Ben. And then in the final matchup: Seth Payne beat uh, Adam Wexler, eighty-five percent to fifteen percent. Pretty much how we had laid out the last two. The first one yeah. was surprising to me as well. I, I was yeah. surprised Wexler even got 15%, to be honest. I mean, some people. Yeah. Like, the, 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 did the people who voted for Adam Wexler, have, did they not see Seth Payne play? Brian, did they not know who he have is? Have you ever heard the term sympathy vote? Cause that's yeah, maybe from. so. Probably maybe so. No, Seth Payne would it. maul him like a bear. <laughs> we got three matchups today. The first matchup is the final first-round matchup. It comes from the Kenny Hand region, and it features the show co-host on the Clint Sterner Show. And Brad Gilmore, who is a co-host on the Hall of Fame. Who's arguing for Hugh here, Brian? Uh, do, do either of you know the show very well? I do not. I've never Jeremy? met him. Uh, we've had a couple of interactions on uh on All right, Twitter. well, I, that, I guess that'll be enough. So you go, I'll let you go ahead and argue <laughs> for the show, and uh, okay. Joel will argue for uh, Brad Gilmore. Well, you've got Brad Gilmore, the, uh, the, the sharp-dressed man. He is very yes, sharp. Yes, man. he's going to come prepared. He's going to bring the drip. He's going to be, you know, to the nines, top to bottom. And then because of the fact that he's worked with the five-time, five-time, five-time champion, and he is a a, uh, a very detailed-oriented person that's going to get down to the brass tacks of the technique and the uh, skill set to be a wrestler and to be a fighter. And I think he's going to come out swinging. I think he's going to understand how to pace himself. I think he's going to make sure that nothing gets wrinkled, nothing gets out of place, <laughs> and he still takes care of business. Did you say that Brad's going to get better because of osmosis through Booker T? I didn't really say osmosis, but I think that you can't help but learn about the science of wrestling. He's saying he's a student of the game. Work, yes, working with a guy like Booker T. I think it's kind of osmosis y. But uh, if you're going to use that argument, I can use that argument too for the show. Mm-hmm. He's going to, through osmosis, Learn how to fight from the Baytown Batty. Oh, Being a stop. friend of the Baytown Batty means you're a batty in yourself. Plus, the show's been training for this. He's been losing lots of weight with uh, with soda water. So because he's been losing lots of weight, he's gotten better with the uh, osmosis thing with Baytown Batty. He's going to be able to win this fight against Brad Gilmore, but it's going to have to be early. He's going to knock him out early. I don't I don't think that he's got the, uh, the endurance here. Yeah, but, I was going to say, if Brad Gilmore just sticks and moves, he's going to be just fine. Yeah, I think, Brad, I, like I think Brad Gilmore chances. takes this one 10-9. Uh, uh, I, I value the osmosis coming from the five-time, five-time, five-time <laughs> champion a little bit no, a little bit more. And Brad Gilmore also a student of the boxing game. So I believe in his ability to fight. And if uh, he's learning anything, if the show is learning anything through osmosis, <laughs> through uh, the Baytown baddie, that might get fumbled away. So 10-9 for Brad Gilmore. That means the show thinks with an 0-3 count, you still got a chance. <laughs> that station does not know baseball. They no. flipped out today. They flipped out today because Lance McCullers got placed on the 60-day I.O. They flipped oh, out. They flipped out. And then they oh, acted like he, they, I see. I saw acted. that on the rundown. Yeah. I didn't know whose reaction yeah. it was. Okay, they, you'll have to tell me more later. And then they acted like Lance McCullers isn't allowed to throw a baseball while he's on the 60-day I.O. They acted oh, like he can't oh, rehab boy. while he's on this. It's, it's, it's bad. Bad. Yeah, I mean, it, everyone everyone knew he was not going to come back until July. What did yeah. you expect? Not Why everyone. Wait? Not everyone. Well, okay, anyone with half a brain knew. Oh, uh, I like if that. If you're coming if back you know in ball. July, you, you, you're going to go on the 60-day DL. That's just, it's how, a good, that's it's just a math. Good litman. It's a good litmus test if you know ball or not. 
If yeah, you I saw would say that so. news and you just let it like roll off your back because you knew it was coming and you know it's well, just basically a technicality, then you know I ball. Mean, if you don't know that, then you don't know ball. Well, Jeremy, you and I both worked on the show, and I think we have an answer for that. Well, I was talking about the other one, but whatever. Um, yeah. <laughs> Two more matchups in the Killer Bee Fight Club's bracket. We're starting the Sweet 16, so now you know Let's that go. it really means something. It's coming yep. down to the final. Well, it's not coming down to the finals here. We still got Sweet 16. Should, we, we have actually a combatant uh, for the Sweet 16 here. Should I call him over to argue for yeah. himself? Yeah, call hey, him Joe. Over. Oh, yeah. Call Joe, come good. over here. Come here, Joe. He, You've never seen a microphone you didn't like. Get in here. Stick up hey. for yourself. You're, you're up in the brackets. You versus Clanton. You're going to have to argue for yourself. No man. All right, I'm going to hand it over to him. No man. Hey, Joe. Has show has he had any shiners yet? He said he was gonna get a oh, shiner yes, box. Oh yes, he's got power. one right now. Oh, that's, that's this good. thing on. Oh boy. Okay. All right. So okay, who's who's arguing? Joe, you're you're fighting Clanton, the Sweet 16 matchup in All the right. Kalilo region. Do you want me to argue for Clanton first, or do you want to argue for yourself first? You can argue for Clan first. All right. Well, Clan's going to beat you because he wears Affliction T-shirts. He's taller than you. He's got the reach. He's a better athlete than you. He's going to run circles around you, and he was talent whenever you weren't. You're right. He was talented when I wasn't, but here's the thing. He might be taller than me, but he's not faster than me. I've seen that guy move up and down the hallway trying to get a cup of coffee and get back from bathroom breaks on time. He can't beat me. He's too slow. I've got Clay. I might be fatter than him, but I'll be okay. Ground game. Ground game. I can take him down. There's no rules in this league, right? Right. right. Yeah, I can take Clayton down to the ground and make him tap. There's no math test. You got this. What, uh, I love you, AC, but Josh Innes almost made you quit, so I'll be fine. <laughs> what man who? Sheesh. What maneuver wow. are you using to tap him out? <laughs> From way downtown. Bang. Uh, he got, he's, had a, he's had a couple of those towers, I can I tell. Was just going to say, get him more beer pronto. Which you're, you're tapping him out with a guillotine? Yeah, that's all I know how to do. Do you know how to you guillotine? You sound winded right now. Now you got me worried you're winded just getting that out. No, I can do a guillotine. It's pretty simple. Okay. You just wrap your arms around his head, legs around his waist, squeeze tight. You'll be okay. What's easier, a guillotine or mathematics? A uh, guillotine, definitely for sure. <laughs> Not even close. Right. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how you. We'll see how the results turn out today. Oh, He's I'm gonna lose. for a spot to the elite eight. The Why don't elite you hear eight. how BMAC has the card? I'll just uh, yeah. I'll, I'll just send it to Josh Innes and have him tweet it out. Okay, you can't use that joke twice. Sorry. Can't go there twice. It's good the first time. Can't Did go to the twice, Iverson though. tattoo. He no. has an Iverson tattoo. I didn't know that. All right, Brian, how do we see this going? Adam Clanton, Joe George, you heard the arguments. How do you have this one uh, going? Hand it to the judges. Uh, judge. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to disagree with Joe on this one. I, I, I think I'm going to take <laughs> Adam Clanton in this fight. But I do appreciate the effort there, though, with the blast that he put on Adam Clanton in his, uh, in his, the case for his side. But, side. but uh, I'll go with the bigger man in this, and uh, I'll go with a, quite an honorary fellow. And I will go with Adam Clayton to win 10-9 over our own Joe George. All right, final matchup that we'll be voting on today. Another Sweet 16 matchup in the Palillo region. Winner of this one gets the winner of Adam Clanton and Joe George in the Palillo region final. You have Clint Sterner, the Baytown batty, going up against Sports MT Matt Thomas. Oh, man. I, 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 I know what I want to do here. I, I know you know what I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna I know what I want to do do here and I'm gonna do it. Uh, Joel will be arguing for Matt Thomas and Jeremy will be uh, arguing for the Baytown Batty. What should it do? <laughs> um. Well, I, I mean, I, I have a sensitivity level that means that I cannot be beat, which means it's not just me; it's my Thomas Army as well. And I am going to come out swinging from the very get-go because of the fact that I am a major market radio host that is the only the fourth voice of in Houston Rockets history. I bring clout. I bring power. I bring backing. It's like Granado with his Italian army. It, 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 the MT army is just it's it's loaded. And they're coming out of the woodwork to take out take down the Baytown Batty. Well, you don't get tag team partners. This is one-on-one. Yeah. One. Granado is did it. Granado doesn't matter. Ring? doesn't matter where it comes from. Yeah. Granado's the exception to almost everything, though. <laughs> 10,000 people behind him. <laughs> um, All right, what do you mean, got, Jeremy? Sterner is going to stomp a mud hole into Matt Thomas, yeah. and then if, frigs, if frogs get wings, they'll fly, and that's as good a chance as Matt Thomas has to beat Sterner, and 
you know, a lot of other references. Turner drinks his milk. I mean, I don't even really have to do much of an argument here. The Baytown Batty wins this fight. Love him too, yeah. but he's not winning they're, a fight against the Baytown Batty. Now, Matty, he's got. He, if he beats him, if he's going to beat him, it's going to have to be with wit. Well, if this was an a uh, academic decathlon, this would be an entirely different conversation. But in a bat, in a fight, in a fight club scenario, bare uh, bare knuckles, I will go Baytown Batty by stoppage over Matt hmm. Thomas. This is a no contest here. All right, you can get to voting on these at Jeremy Branham. Who do you have advancing in our three matchups today? The show, Brad Gilmore in the final first round matchup in the Kitty Hand region, and then two Sweet 16 matchups in the Charlie Palillo region. Adam Clanton, Joe George, show us some shots after a couple of Shinerbach Towers, and then Sterner, Matt Thomas. Speaking of those Shinerbach Towers, 100, and 100 ounces for just $10. Uh, throughout the day, throughout the weekend, Astros opening day going on now. College Hoops at 6 o'clock at the Decoy and Spring Branch. $3 Makers, $2 Mexican Candy, March Madness, $6 Casamigos, and it's your West Houston watch party for the Cougars tomorrow. Uh, full audio during the broadcast and then a DJ playing through the commercials. It's going to be a party there tomorrow night at the Decoy. We'll step aside for a moment. When we come back, Bad Take Boulevard. What are the hot, what are the worst takes of the week that you've heard? 713-780-3776. Killer ESPN 975, ESPN 925. You're, you're in a predicament, aren't you? You, you want to watch some basketball. You have the holiday tomorrow. You have a holiday this weekend. You're probably looking to hang out, maybe go to the golf course, maybe have a drink. But that grass is too high and it needs to be mowed. Oh, no, not what you want to be doing this weekend. You wouldn't have to if you had Sin Lawn. You don't have to waste your valuable time dealing with your yard because Sin Lawn eliminates all of that. It eliminates the chores and the stress of having to mow your grass, pull in the weeds, the dead spots, all of that stuff that you don't want to do will stop and stop with Sin Lawn. Sin Lawn's here to get your weekends back, get your fun back. Sin Lawn's the evolution story the AstroTurf that was made popular by the Astrodome and now Sinlon, that's S-Y-N Lawn. Well, they want to improve your lifestyle. Stop doing the things you don't want to do, the mowing, the pulling the weed. Stop throwing money into an ugly yard that you're embarrassed of people seeing. You probably you could have probably hosted Easter this year, but you can't because you're embarrassed of people seeing your yard. Sinlon artificial grass is the best on the market. They offer a lifetime warranty with products that are made here in the USA. The quality is all top shelf, and the people are fantastic. They got your back. It's fully insured, fully bonded. They have their own in-house crews. They don't contract anything out. And Sinlon's number one priority is making you happy. Sinlon is perfect for your yard, whether it's for your patio, whether it's for the kids' playground, your pets. Don't let mud come inside anymore. That putting green that you've always wanted, you can do that now with Sinlon. Head to 975sinlon.com to learn more. That's 975synlon.com. 975sinlon.com. Sinlon, control the process from yarn to yard.
All right, it's that time for the worst takes of the week. What belongs on Bad Take Boulevard, 713-780-ESPN, HRMP listener line, 713-780-3776. Popular guy is going to be Jay Williams. Uh, In fact, the first two are from Jay Williams. First one's not really his take. He just kind of relays the message. But here was Jay Williams earlier this morning talking about that Draymond Green ejection yesterday and how it affects Steph Curry. I'm getting texts from people that I really value their decision, right? High level people. And what these texts are reading is, well, how about the leadership of Stephen Curry? I don't know who's sending Jay Williams these texts, but these guys belong on Bad Tag Boulevard. How in the world is Draymond Green acting like a petulant child have anything to do with Steph Curry's leadership? It really shouldn't. And the fact of the matter is, if if you watched anything with that game, Steph was outraged and, and really ticked off that Draymond got ejected. And, and so was the coaching staff and everybody. I don't, I don't know how in the world you try and put that on Steph Curry when Steph's the one guy that's able to tell him, too, that, you know what, that was completely out of line. And if you watched the video last night, he was ticked off. Yeah, I mean, this is Draymond Green. This is not a rookie coming in where Steph Curry's got to take him under his wing and, like, be the mentor and be the leader to him. This is a grown-ass man in his mid-30s at this point. Draymond's been in the league for how long? Ten-plus years at this point? No, there's no way you can put the behavior of a ten-plus-year veteran uh, like Draymond Green, who's been in the league that long, and put that behavior on someone else. He's He's a grown adult. He's responsible for his own behavior. Such a bad take. Uh, Steph, how do you – blasting Curry's leadership over a grown man who's been there forever, who then gets on his podcast afterwards to, like, three minutes into the game, he's talking about it on his podcast afterwards. Uh, yep. I don't I don't like anything about that. And on top of it, he saved his bacon. He would have caught so much more hell if they lose that game. Curry's the reason why they won that game and, and came in and once again saved the day for Draymond looking like a complete you-know-what. Not a fan, not a fan. All right, the next one is Jay Williams' take. Here was Jay Williams' idea on what he wants to do with the NCAA tournament. We got into this before. Let's just expand the tournament. Let's just expand it. So let's just do 112 teams. The top 16 teams get a bye in the first round. L- listen to me, Unc. The top 16 teams get a bye in the first round. The first round, you have 96 teams. 24 games played on Tuesday. 24 games played on Wednesday. Then you have the round of 64. Thursday, 16 games. Friday, 16 games. Then you get to the round of 32. Eight games on Saturday, eight games on Sunday. There you go, 96 games in six days. This way, let everybody get in. Unc, you're not paying attention to the first, the first five, 30 games of the, the thing anyway. There's Jay Williams' <laughs> I mean, idea. I like the thought he put into it, but. I don't like I mean, it. At least, at least put at least put effort into the take. But I love that yeah. he finishes his strong take to add more games to the schedule by <laughs> you're not watching them anyway. Well, if we're not watching them, then why are we adding them? And, and basically, aren't you really cursing the chance for Cinderella's? Because you're going to do the NC State's thing where they're going to be playing games almost every day, and they're going to be yeah. worn Good out. Point. And yeah, they're going to have to play another game, another uh, game in a short short amount of time. Uh, you think that you think that would you think that would eliminate the those teams from having a chance it of winning on a Thursday or Friday? I mean, de- depending on what they did coming into the tournament. I mean, if they're a team like NC State where they're playing five games in five days, they get you know three days off, and now or actually it'd be less than three days because they're yeah. they're coming in on a Tuesday. I mean, and NC State's Williams, still alive though, so like NC State. I know, I know. I don't. I, I don't I, think I it get impacts the, the seeds beating the other seeds that much. But well, all, the, but all the the top sixteen get a bye, so you're not going to see like the the upsets that you normally would in, in terms of like uh, two one like twos and well, threes. Well, you, you still have the one sixteen because he still plays it down to sixty four. He still plays it down to 64, so you would still have these teams. What it, to me, I think you might actually see more of these upsets because, like, these teams that had strong regular seasons that maybe didn't finish strong, you're going to kind of eliminate the teams that aren't necessarily playing well. And then the teams that are playing well, now you're going to get more of them. I, in fact, I think you might see more upsets because you're kind of getting rid of the weak before they even get into the round of 64. 
Well, I definitely have no use for 24 games on Tuesday and 24 games on Wednesday before we get to the bracket that we're used to now. I mean, right now on these opening Thursday and Friday that we love, they're playing 16 games. Uh, to me, it's spread out pretty well, spread out almost perfectly. And you're going to add eight more games on the schedule yeah. for even this worse is, team for even worse teams. This is no. too many. I don't mind 72 or 76. I, I don't mind expanding by four or by eight. And yeah, I'd be adding fine with that. more playing games, but 112 is way too many. I, I don't want to hand out participation trophies. The regular season should still have a good amount of importance. The big thing to me is like what they say this year was the, the highest amount of what well, the committee said, the highest amount of, of teams that were bumped out that were close to the bubble or on the bubble because of the five unpredicted uh, conference yeah, champions. But that's five. So not, that's what I'm saying. Not to like Jeremy's 40 point, plus. Yeah, I'll, I'll go. I'll go as high as like 70, 72. I'm not going over 100. Yeah, it's insane. Yeah. I also wouldn't mind just leaving it the way it is. Uh, I'm fine I, with that. I'm, but if you're going to expand yeah. just 72, just 76, not more than that. Uh, Mike Greenberg, you know, of course, made famous oh, for yeah. Mike and Mike. He has a suggestion in which he thinks that UConn can make the playoffs in the Eastern Conference. If they were in the NBA's Eastern Conference, would they make the playoffs? I think I'm looking at teams that are eight <laughs> games under 500 in the play in <laughs> right now. They're Come better than I'm not doing that. Come I'm on, not doing that, Greeny. I'm not doing that. No. I got a no to pick with Orlovsky. No, no. He suckers yes. me into a bet. I, I got a bet. He's, he's betting me dinner at the polo bar just because I can get in and he can't. And the next thing you know, he's got, and I'm trying to, it's a nine to one odds, and he's like trying to make me a bet on dinner and all of this. It's ridiculous. On, Jay, UConn's an NBA team. Uh, they're Come not. On, Jay they're not. They, they, they execute like one, but their talent level, I would not say, would be able to make a play. I, 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 look, the I, mere fact that we're having this conversation, I think, says they it all. Had no chance. Yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not going to go that way with the green. Here's what I will say about. So it Greenberg, says it all that Mike Greenberg is all about clickbait, and he's always been that way. And he tried to walk this back. I don't know if he saw it. Like a day later, he tried. Oh, I was just joking. Like, maybe. I kind of believe him. him. I kind of believe you think, him. You think you think you yeah may, maybe the tone I, you could you could read I it a little bit. Was, I think this was more of a personal bet between he and Dan Orlovsky. It sounded like to me like it seemed like Orlovsky might have suckered Greenberg into a bet and probably could have gotten odds and didn't. And then Greenberg's like, "Can you believe this guy taking advantage of me? UConn so good they'd make the Eastern Conference playoffs." Possible. That's the way it kind of sounded to me. Green, Greenberg, I, I, I would believe, hope so. Greenberg was one of those guys, though, because I don't know if you remember this coming. Uh, this is going back a few years. But there was a large group of people that seemed to think when Miami football in college, like in the early 2000s, was just at the height of the height of the height uh, as far as just their overall talent, that they could beat NFL teams. And they, guys like Greenberg were a part of that conversation. So it feels familiar to past arguments I've heard. But it doesn't make it any less ridiculous. Hopefully Greenberg, as he said, was only kidding. Yeah, this is ridiculous because kids against grown-ass men and, and trying to see, like, the physicality. Right, because, like, the thing that they miss, like, okay, sure, Miami, or in this case, UConn, has a bunch of pros. You know how many pros a pro team has? All of them. Yeah. <laughs> All of the roster is pros. <laughs> the college team will never beat a professional team. Yeah, like, exactly. Maybe, no. maybe in baseball, like whenever you used to do the exhibitions and stuff, but yeah, baseball maybe the baseball. A's. Yeah, maybe never the A's. In football, <laughs> never in football, never in basketball, ever. Ever. It'll never happen. Totally agree. Just, the, happen. just the physicality and athleticism at a different level. And to, and to Brian's point, like, it's not about just some depth. I mean, these teams are constructed, NBA teams are constructed to go 10 deep with guys that can the worst Kick team in the NBA is filled with a ton. Of, it was filled with an entire roster of guys like that, like what, what, what UConn has. I think mean, of it, the Pistons. It's just, think of the Pistons. Yeah. Like they have Cade Cunningham, right? Who was the first pick of the draft, who was good in college. They have Marcus Sasser, who was on a Final Four team. They have Quentin Grimes, who was on a Final Four team. They have a few more years of maturity. They have like real legitimate bench guys. Like in that the college team beating a pro team, ain't no way. No. Ain't no way. Jaylen ain't happening. And Jalen Duran was pretty good when he was at Memphis too, and a first round yeah. pick. But yeah, it's just it's, it's just a different ball game, literally. Yeah, it's not uh, it's a bad take. Uh, Carl Ravitch, who's not my favorite guy, he's pretentious, <laughs> pretentious fellow. I don't like pretentious people. I mean, I thought you like pretentious people. I do not like pretentious people. I at thought all. you guys Carl's, saw eye to eye. Uh, do not like pretentious people. Carl Ravitch was uh, talking to Greg Rajon. Uh, I guess it's Sunday's game against the. Yankees Astros is on ESPN, so he got the guys or whatever. So Carl Ravitch, Pena at shortstop, that's a huge X factor for them. Who is he, given what we saw in the ALCS and World Series in 22? There was that downward trend last year 
Can he bounce back? Bad take here because Carl Ravitch is not familiar with Jeremy Pena at all, it appears. Yes, he gave up power. Yes, the power disappeared from year one to year two. But Carl Ravitch completely ignores the fact that he improved in average, he he improved in on-base percentage, he improved in strikeout rate, he improved in walk rate. He was actually a more mature hitter in year two than he was year one. There wasn't a downward trend with Jeremy Pena last year other than the power. I'll concede that. But to act like overall he took a huge step back from year one is a bad take, Carl Ravitch, and I don't like you very much. Yeah, it was off. I mean, tell me you don't watch Astros baseball consistently without telling me. I mean, this is a national guy doing a game, looking for something that he can grasp onto. But, uh, yeah, I'm with you on that. He's also one of those pretentious idiots that think he's a baseball elitist that says – plural RBI's RBI when <laughs> we all know that that's wrong oh, based on AP format. I will never agree format. with you on that. Well, you're ignoring information whenever yeah, you say I, that. I, you're, you're ignoring proper way to pronounce things, but we don't have According to According to now. who? I just, uh, man, we don't, do we really According want to get into it? We've, well, we've had this argument since you 2016. According to who? Because it's runs batted in or run batted in. According if you, if you to put who? The, this is your opinion. Just common sense with gramma- normal grammatical co- okay, common sense. Okay, then why sense. does AP style tell you to do this, which is the style of are journalism? We, are we, and why are, are, does, well, you're interrupting so we just me. Have Let, me to, we, Let me finish. <laughs> AP style is what we use as journalists, but we're supposed to ignore that. And then MLA formatting is what we learned growing up in literature. We're supposed to ignore that? We just Well, we just have to agree with everything the AP tells us that is the correct style. When it comes I, I, to our writing, yes, journalists absolutely have to do AP style. And literature students absolutely have to do a MLA formatting. The answer is yes to that question. It's run batted in or runs batted in. If you put the apostrophe on there, it comes off as you're saying runs batted ins. There's and it's not, not apostrophe. Runs batted. It's a capital R, capital B, capital I, lowercase s. Well, ma- maybe a- maybe it's not as universal as you thought then because I see it RBIs is universal. with the apo- Okay, I'm just telling you, you I the see the apostrophe all the time. Wait, even, even, even without the apostrophe, though, you still wouldn't say run batted ins. RBI is an acronym for, for – Run batted in. Run batted in run, or runs run batted, batted in. No, it's run batted in. It's RBI is, is, is an acronym for run batted in. So, so spell whenever, that out. Why would, would that you be? let me finish? <laughs> RBI is an acronym for run batted in. So whenever you put an RBI, you have the acronym, you drove in one run, it's, one, it's RBI. RBI. When you have multiple, it becomes RBIs. MLA, AP, they tell us that. It's just not personal opinion because you want to. Uh, we can argue on this all day. That's all right. All right. 713-780 ESPN. I want to see Caitlin Clark in the big three. I don't know about you guys. Do you? 713-780-3776. Killer Bees, ESPN 97.5 and ESPN 92.5. Uh, I love a good drink at the end of the day. I like Gentle Ben. Uh, love Gentle Ben. Uh, whether it's the vodka, the gin, the bourbon, it's all in the rotation for me. And Gentle Ben Spirits does it better than anyone else. How? Well, they're revolutionary Perseido technology that eliminates impurities for the cleanest, smoothest spirits you'll ever taste. Purification of Gentle Ben is unrivaled. You'll love what's not in it, including undesirable acids. These acids take the enjoyment out of your drinks. Well, Gentle Ben gets rid of that undesirable acid so you can enjoy. Try a sip of Gentle Ben vodka, gin, straight bourbon, or cast strength bourbon. Compare it to what you drink, and you will never go back. I've been a Gentle Ben man ever since I had that first sip. You get all the flavor with none of the burn. So smooth, so clean. Eliminates that burn. Enjoy your drink. Don't work through your drink. Look for Gentle Ben at the liquor store, at the restaurant, your favorite bar. Head to the Gentle Ben Tasting Room. You can get it at Minute Maid Park. You can get it at the Toyota Center. Or you can go straight to the website, GentleBen.com. You can order straight from the site, the vodka, the gin, the bourbon. Add it to your cart. Have it delivered straight to your doorstep. GentleBen.com. Gentle Ben, period.
You're listening to The Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Broadcasting live from the Mobile Veritex Community Bank Studios, located at the Decoy and Spring Branch. He's Blank. I'm Branham. The boys hit the Decoy and Spring Branch. 1-2-2-2. Two, 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 witty. Astros opening day. Astros has squandered a 4 nothing lead. Tied at 4. Yep. Uh, first pitch, 6.05 in that game. College hoops beginning a little bit later this evening as well. The decoys are spot for it all. $100 ounce Shinerbach Towers for $10. Uh, $3 Makers, $2 Mexican Candy. Uh, March Madness, $6 Casamigos as well. A uh, great spot. Uh, Houston Duke tomorrow in the NCAA tournament, Sweet 16. The decoys are West Houston watch party for the Cougs. Full audio during the game. They'll also have a DJ playing during the commercials, so there's no downtime at all. A great spot to hang out, have a little bit of fun. Uh, 713-780-3776. Blankers, you see that uh, the big three in Ice Cube offered Caitlin Clark $5 million to uh, to play in their league? I did. I did. I saw it. Interesting. Um, I don't think that I, – I think there's two different ways of looking at it. If I'm Caitlin Clark, you're not going to – I think the, the – they got away from when I worked in the WNBA – the, they had three or four players. It was Swoops, Lobo, and Lisa Leslie that made like $250,000 a season. And everybody else made far less than $100,000 for a season. I think they said something about being the number one overall pick. She could make like $73,000 this year. That's it. If I have the chance to make $5 million to play in that season for one year, it doesn't matter how good or bad I do. At least I cash in. Yeah, see, and then Portnoy, still Presidente from Barstools, yeah. he offered him $10 million. I don't know exactly what he's asking of her. Brian, do you know? The, yeah, what, he what? said he, he wants her to play in the Barstool Intermural League. league. Yep. <laughs> oh, do they do they have a schedule? Do they, I, do they play people? I, I don't know. Maybe they're adding one in? I don't know. I would, uh, if I'm Caitlin Clark, I'm calling uh, – I think Portnoy is a, bu- is a bluff, but I'm calling the bluff and saying, let's go. Where's the contract? Give me I mean, $10 yeah, million. Have, oh, I, I don't know if you said the number, but the, the – the, the salary coming in for the first overall pick is like seventy three thousand. That's what I said. Yeah. yeah like how said long? Would, I I don't want to do the math. I don't want to call Joe over to do it for me. Uh, but how long would it take making seventy three thousand dollars a year to get to the ten million from Dave Portnoy? Uh, yeah, I, a lot of time. Yeah, would, a long time. I would call. I would call Barstool's bluff on this and be like, "Hey, here's where's the contract? Let's let's start playing some intramurals, baby, um, like that Colorado coach back in the day." I'm doing it. I'm doing it now. I don't think that that was a sincere uh, offer from from Presidente. I think he's trying to clout chase a little bit. But I'm absolutely yep. doing the big three. If I'm Clayton Clark, I'm doing it. I, yes, give me the five million dollars. Let me cash in. Let me be set for life. I know you can make money in your off season playing internationally, but just go ahead and lock in the five million dollars. Why not? I don't think that Clark will do this because I think Clark would be worried that she might get exposed playing in the big three uh, where she wouldn't be, you know, like an average player in the big three. So I don't think that she would ultimately do it. I think she should lock in the finances. I also think it's genius from Ice Cube. Absolutely get her in the league if you can, at least make her an offer because now you're going to get eyeballs. No one watches the big three right now. You get her in there, people are going to tune in at least once. Yeah, and the thing is, is she's going to maintain her endorsements. She's going to get Keep State Farm, and I think Nike, and she has a couple other ones where she's going to she's going to continue with those and put the five million in the bank account. And you know, if it's a one year deal, next year she goes to the WNBA, she's still going to get the same level of attention. You're right. The risk for her is is that you're going to have guys that don't want to be shown up by a female that are going to be aggressive, and they are going to make sure she doesn't do anything. And, and will that hurt her brand and hurt her name? I know it won't hurt her bank account. I think the I think we're all in agreement that the financial good sense is to take the money from the big three or Dave Portnoy, but I think there's a ne- another aspect in here that we obviously can't uh, fully understand, having not been on that side of it. But I don't know if her as an ambassador for the women's game is going to view this as being like t- going to basically play with the men as then as an insult to the women's game that she would then go back to. So I can see her wanting to be the ambassador for the women's game and not taking the money. By, then therefore kind of in a way saying that their game is less than the men's game. I don't think she's going to take the money. I think it's a I don't, bad idea. Yeah, I don't either. I, don't, I, I, would, I mean, I can't fully obviously know what it's like to walk in her shoes. I would take the money. But I could see her saying, look, I have the endorsements that can make up a large gap of what I would miss out on by going to the, uh, to the big three. I, I'd like to be the ambassador for the women's game, not basically put, cast a, a, a less than light on the WNBA by Green to go play See, somewhere else. I mean, look, when you're doing a three-point contest with um, 
uh, Alonsku and, and Curry. I mean, it's not, you know, physical basketball. It's shooting, and, and that was right. that was fun to watch. But I, I believe that the risk here is that it tarnishes a lot of the girl, the women's game because of the fact that they're playing against grown ass. Right, she's if playing she, against grown ass physical men. If she if she goes to the big three and like as you say gets physically dominated, then goes back to the uh, to or go not go back to, but goes to the WNBA and dominates. That's going to cast a light on the women's game that I don't think they would, really would want shown on it. Don't we already have that light on the women's game, though? Like, I'm sorry. Like, I'm looking out for myself. I'm going to cash in $5 million. Like, I don't think no, I'm going right. to $5 million I, I just, in the women's game. And it's already something that exists out there that the women's game is lesser than the men's game, which I think is a fine take to have. So, I I mean, yeah, I agree with you that Caitlin Clark's not going to do this. I don't think it necessarily stains the women's game because uh, I don't think anybody thinks that women, like the champion of the WNBA, would be the champion of the NBA. Well, I'll tell you this: what it, it what it does, no matter what, is it, whoever who's representing her goes to the WNBA WNBA and says, "Hey, let's talk because we need to start talking about certain players, or at least in the case where I have an offer from somebody else. If you feel like this is a big thing for the league, and a lot of people have said this is the female that's going to carry the torch for the WNBA for the foreseeable future, there has to be a higher value on that than seventy three thousand yeah. dollars a year. You have to make her say no to five million. You're right." You're right. Like, if you're worried yep. about that because of, like, that stain or whatever, then you need to make her financially incentivized to where she's not even tempted by a $5 million offer. You're exactly right. It's almost like PGA in a sense, like where they're having yep. to change everything that they're doing because of these, you know, the live golfers and these offers that are out there. How do you think she would perform in the uh, the big three blankers? I, I don't think it would go well. I, I don't because of the fact, like you said, I mean, there's a difference between the two games. It's not just the physicality. These guys are great athletes, and, and even if it's in the, the, the three-on-three game, they don't have to play full court. So they're going to have a little bit more spring. They're, they're going to be able to, you know, put you know, physical on her and also athletic and, the, and, and being able to jump, uh, and, she, and she has to guard somebody on the other end. I don't think it would go well for her. I can't remember who said it today, but they, they said that they, she wouldn't score one point in a big three game. I don't buy that. I, I, I think she I mean, she, she could at least be a spot-up shooter. She shoots she from the logo score. as it is. It is a men's ball, but at the same time, she's going to make a three. Yeah, I mean, yeah, someone would, would be able to set her up for a three. She's somebody who get a rebound, kick it out, knock down a bucket. She, she would be able to score. I don't think she could, like, sit down and, like, break down a defender one-on-one -on -one nonstop throughout right. a game. Uh, but she, she'd be able to at least knock down a shot. I, I want to see it, though. I think it would be highly entertaining. I think it would be a, a I, lot of fun. I mean, I know I it sounds like you don't watch the, the big three time. now. Would that, would that be enough for you to watch it? Yeah, I'd watch it. I'd tune in at least once if Caitlin Clark was in the uh, dub, in the uh, big three. I, I'll tell you what, if you're the WNBA, how you how you try and your best case scenario to fix this is she says what she has to say to say that I'm worth more. They get sponsors to give her money for endorsements that equal what she needs to make, and the league doesn't have to adjust their salary structure because the league can't do this. They can't take on a so couple of So they did this before? Because well, uh, it's kind of – I think what you mentioned before where, where a few players got paid more than the rest. When the league started, because they, league, they needed some people to like – that's kind of the MLS style right now. Like there's a couple of players that get the crazy contracts and everyone else is real low. Yeah, they had Swoops and Lobo and uh, Lisa Leslie. And that was the first where they had to carry the league and be right. the front people. But I think in this case, if you, if you make the precedent change of paying her a, a big sum of money – Whoever's coming up next that's going to be the star star player in college is going to say, I want that deal, and they can't afford – it's not sustainable financially for them to give multiple players that kind of money. I don't think so that he, there's going to be that many Caitlin Clarks, though. Like, I think Caitlin Clark is I mean, Angel Reese, the, maybe. I think Caitlin Clark is to the women's game what Tiger Woods is to golf. Like, I, I don't think that there's going to be many players that can come close to the cachet of Clay, Caitlin Clark. I don't think Ace Reese could. Um I think Caitlin Clark is to is to women's basketball what Tiger was to golf. Uh, Nine seven eight zero. A few other texters. Her shot would be off using a men's ball. I don't think that that has as big a difference as you're making it out to be. Nine seven eight zero. I think there would be a droppage. I think there would be a little bit of that, but not much. Like, I don't know what she shot from three this year, Blankers. Let's just assume it was forty percent. If yeah. she shot forty percent from three this year in the women's game, what do you think she would shoot with the men's ball? I mean. It's more about the defense than the shot and the ball. I, I think that she's probably going to yeah. shoot. You yeah, know, but let's just I, say let's just say the men's ball in a vacuum because the texture's making it seem like okay. You know, the men's just ball the is difference in difference. ball, maybe yeah, 2%. just just ball alone. Would you say probably thirty eight percent? 
Yeah, I had it at 37-38. Like, I don't, I don't think it's a huge drop-off like some people make it out to be. I really You know don't. what it is, Jeremy? It's like in a different way, but it is similar. When the, the NBA players go to play in the Olympics, the ball has shorter, smaller seams. It's a little bit – I don't know if it's a difference in size much, but it's a definitely a different feel. So it's an adjustment, and maybe you go two percentage points down a little bit. But the guys adjust, and if you're shooting with it every day, you get used to it. Uh, Total Arlington says the early WBA stars were paid to keep them from going overseas. Uh, I don't – I vaguely remember that, but I don't know the details on that. I, I know uh, a lot of the women's players now just go overseas, and they go overseas in the offseason. Yeah, they do both, and that's how Brittany Griner got in that situation in Russia. She she had a great deal to play for a good – you know, a nice salary in Russia, and then obviously we know what happened. But, yeah, the fact that the WNBA players can double dip, they play the summer season – with the WNBA, and then they play the regular basketball season of the fall and, and the winter somewhere else. 713-780-ESPN. How many Astros are in the top 100? Who got left off? How much does it matter? What do you think the number is? 713-780-3776. Killer Bees, ESPN 97.5 and ESPN 92.5. Guys, right now, a few minutes to talk about or a little bit to talk about the, the good people at Vanderford Air. Look, Vanderford Air is going to have you covered at the most critical time if you're a Houstonian. We know that the summer months are going to be loaded with 100-degree days. You know you have to be prepared to, to make sure your HVAC system, your heating and your air conditioning, your plumbing, everything is up to snuff. But primarily with air conditioning, you want someone that's going to be on call for you when you call them. If something goes wrong... You want to call somebody that's not going to be there in two or three days. You want to call somebody that's going to be there right away. That's what Vanderford Air does for you. They have a guarantee. Within 24 hours of your call, they will be at your door to help you out when you need them. They have tons of other guarantees, too, which are essential to you because you don't want someone that's going to be not certified or do half you-know-what work and, and they're going to have to come back and then you're going to haggle about price. Vanderford has all the guarantees that you need, starting with the biggest one, 100% money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied 100%, you get your money back. That's what you want from a company, especially with something as critical as air conditioning. That means on all their plumbing, on all their air conditioning, the fact is, they are going to do 100% satisfaction guaranteed work or you will get your money back. They also have the other guarantees, best value, lowest cost to you, comfort assurance guarantees, quality workmanship guarantees, performance guarantees, but, of course, the one that matters most, the 100% satisfaction guarantee is all you want and all you need. Make sure that the parts, whether it's a repair or a complete replacement, are, are adequate. They live up to the billing, and so does the work and the, make, the, the craftsmanship that they put into it. Check them out today. It's really simple. You can go to VanderfordAir.com, or you can call them, and it's an easy-to-remember number, 281-557-COOL, 281-557-COOL. Get that air conditioning unit checked out before the heat really hits and make sure you're prepared call Vanderford Air You're listening to The Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Broadcasting live from the Mobile Veritex Community Bank Studios, located at the Decoy in Spring Branch. He's blank, I'm Branham. We are at the uh, the Decoy. The boys are at the Decoy. I'm in Dallas. Uh, Astros opening day, college hoops coming up a little bit later today. Uh, continues tomorrow, Houston, Duke. 
That's why I'm in Dallas. But uh, if you're in Houston and you're looking for a place to watch the game, West Houston Watch Party inside the decoy. Uh, Cougs full audio on that game, live DJ during the uh, the commercials as well. Uh, fantastic spot if you're looking for a place to uh, watch the uh, the Ash the uh, the Rockets tomorrow. Astros on my mind. Uh, they're tied at four. First pitch at 6:05. Uh, jumped out to a 4-0 lead. Fromber was playing with fire all game long. Eventually, it uh, he got burned as they uh, scored three runs in the fifth. The Yankees would tie with a run in the sixth. And then Ryan Presley is pitching the seventh. Blankers, we thought he would be the eighth inning guy. You don't yeah. have a break with the first two games. And Ryan Presley is in in the seventh inning. Yeah, there's a couple things I, I already don't like a whole heck of a lot here. I didn't like he pinch hit for Jake with Singleton. Uh, with two on and two out uh, at the uh, bottom half of the last inning. Uh, I'm a little bit surprised that Presley came in this early, I guess because Bray, Abreu is uh, on the, uh, suspended for the first two games. Maybe that altered his thinking. Brian and I were talking about where you know where the lefties were coming up and where in the lineup he was going to use Hader, but I'm a little surprised to see him in the seventh but, as well. I don't th- think it affects Abreu. Hold on, Brian. I don't think it affects Bray, Abreu at all because if you had Abreu, like, well, there's your eighth inning guy. Like, if Abreu was in the, the bullpen, it would make more sense for Presley in the seventh. I think it has everything to do with where they're at in the lineup. Uh, you had Judge, Stanton, Rizzo, so three, four, five. So this might be a tell that Espada is going to use his, you know, weapons, whether it's Presley, yeah. whether it's Abreu, yep. against the middle of the order in high, higher leverage situations, or at least, you know, when the opponent has their best spot in the batting order coming up. I think it might be an early Yeah, I think that's probably right. I, I think that I don't think he's going to be – we're so much worried about the individual players and what their stats are. I think he's going to worry about matchups, and he's going to utilize those guys accordingly. If that's the if that's the case, I'm fine. Yeah. The um, the the seventh inning was interesting with the pinch hit thing. Like, okay, I don't love the pinch hit. Myers homered earlier, but Myers hits lefties better than he hits righties. There was a righty in the game. Uh, I okay, like I can understand pinch hitting Myers there. I don't love it, but I can understand it. Questionable thing was to me was you went with Singleton over Singleton. Dubon. Yeah. Yep. How do you not go Dubon there? Uh, that's why I said he's boom or bust, and he's a whole lot more bust than boom. I, I, I don't understand him right there. Because you weren't looking for a bomb. You had runners at first and no, second just, two outs. Just as any kind hit. of hit would yeah, hit or get on base and, and turn it over. That would be fantastic. Fire a spotter. Fire him. <laughs> get rid of him. Get rid of him. Fire him now. <laughs> it's uh, that it was kind of odd, kind of odd. I'll just say that seven one three seven eight zero ESPN HRMP listener line. Speaking of the Strohs, uh, top one hundred players in baseball. How many do you think the Astros have on it? Five. Close. They have seven on the top one hundred. You want me to go best to worst or worst to best from the seven that are on it? Worst to best. Okay. Number ninety. Yiner Diaz. Oh. Does it surprise you that Yiner Diaz cracked the top 100? Yes. I did not have him on, on, a, on a top 100 list because he's got to prove himself for a full season first. I, I got to see I, – I got to believe that people voting on this and the way they calculate this, you'd have to see him for a full season before you're capable of putting him in the top 100. This is, this is the resume talent conversation. I, I don't think he has a resume of a top 100 player, but I think he has the talent of a top 100 player. So, but this is usually resume based. So I'm surprised to see him on here as well. He beats the next guy on the list, Justin Verlander, by four spots. Verlander 86, Yiner 90. I think they went more wow. talent in what they expect this year than what their resume is, because I, I think that's the best example of that. Yiner 90, almost no resume. Uh, right. Verlander, a huge resume at 86. Yeah, I, I'm even surprised there. I would think that Verlander's a guy that not only the resume, but because of the lineup he's got. And the and the the three guys at the back of the bullpen that they would expect that he might he might even be a little higher on the list because of the fact that he might have more success being in this environment. Number forty one's Jose Altuve. I, I don't really have an argument there. Uh, I think that's, that's probably, probably at this point in his career. Yeah, especially if you're going like total game and not just offense. Because if you're going just offensive players, then Altuve's higher than forty one. But if you're going the the complete package, I have no problem with forty one. They have Tucker at thirty five. Ooh. Argument there. It seems a little yeah. low. Yeah, I think it's a little low. I, I, I could see Tuck in the top 25. Uh, I, I think that obviously he doesn't get the, the kind of overall uh, uh, marketing attention that a lot of guys in big markets do, but I think Tuck's capable of being a top 25-ish player. Yeah, I think 35 is a little bit low. They have Bregman at 34. I would have Tucker ahead of Bregman, yep, and I too. might have Altuve ahead of Bregman. Now, Bregman gives you the defense, and Altuve doesn't, so it's probably the difference there. 
I feel like Bregman's a little bit too high and Tucker's a little bit too low. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, but from a complete package, I, I don't know if I hate that he's in front of Altuve. Uh, offensively, Altuve's better. Uh, number For 28, sure. Fromber. Interesting. They're expecting that he's going to bounce back and be just fine Fromber? See, I, th I feel I feel what they look at Fromber, they don't really understand the second half of the season that he had. Right. Like, they don't, the national guys don't realize that as much as the local guys. It's like whenever you pull up Fromber's numbers the last few, like even last year, his numbers overall look fine. And then you add that to his previous two years, and you're like, oh, this guy's a really good pitcher. Yeah. But you don't really understand how the second half of the year, <laughs> including today, how you're kind of walking on pins and needles anytime he's on the mound. Night meet day. There's two. There were two sides to the story. It was night and day, and yeah, it was not. It, it was definitely a frantic uh, watch at the second half of the season. Yeah, I'm a little surprised at that. Last guy they have is Jordan at number ten. Do you feel like that's fair for Jordan being at number ten? I do not. I, I, I honestly, we had this conversation when we, uh, when uh, MLB was doing their top five players in baseball conversations. I, I think Jordan, if he's not in the top five, he's very very close to it. I think 10 is too low. I think he's one of the – if worst-case scenario, I think he's one of the top six or seven players in baseball. See, the, the fact that he doesn't do much defensively, I think, is why he's closer to 10 than he is five on most of the top players' list. I don't really have a huge contention with him being at number 10. Um, he doesn't really do anything defensively. He's average when he plays out there. He doesn't play out there a lot. I don't want him to play out there. I'd rather him be the 10th best player in baseball, according to this list, and never play the outfield than be third and play left field every single game. Uh, I'm willing to make that trade off. But I do think he gets dinged because he doesn't play defenses, one, really that much, and then secondly, as good as some of the other guys that are in front of him, like a Mookie Betts or, you know, some of the, the center fielders that you would have ahead of him. I think Jordan on these types of lists gets dinged because of the defense. You might be right. I just think on the flip side, he's capable of just completely dominating a game like very few. I mean, average power, you know, key moments. He's, he's all that and more. He's so capable of absolutely, you know, putting a game on his shoulders that some guys can and some guys can't do what, you know, depending on like guys like J-Rod or guys that you see uh, in, as being top ten type players. I, I just think he's a little low. Yeah, I would agree with that. Which of these guys do you think is the most likely to outperform their ranking? Yiner, 90, Verlander, 86, Altuve, 41, Tucker, 35, Bregman, 34, Fromber, 28, Jordan, 10. I think I think for sure Jordan's going to, like I said, I had made my argument for why I think Jordan's closer to, like, top five-ish. But I think the other guy, the other two guys, because they don't know enough about Yiner, I think Yiner could have a, a monster season. And because Tucker was, was I think, uh, too low on the list, I think Tucker could, as we talked about, possibly have an MVP-type season. But if Tucker has the kind of season he's capable of having, then I think that that one, for me, is a, a, an assurity that he would move up. Yeah, I would go Tucker, too. I think Tucker can have, like, a top 20-type season. Uh, Verlander... Verlander missing a few starts and the fact that he's in his 40s, it's difficult there. I do think yeah. Verlander's getting slept on a little bit, though. Like, oh, you know, father time, and he's not going to be as good. I think Verlander can be better than what a lot of people were expecting. Um, do you think there was a snub at all? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say the same thing about Verlander. It goes back to what I said earlier. I think with this offense behind him, those three guys at the back end of the bullpen, and he's fully capable of giving you six innings. Uh, th this is, I, I think he has the potential of having a really good season for, for this team. A and a really good season doesn't have to be Cy Young worthy to get out higher on this list than where he sits. Any snubs, you feel? No, nah, not right now. No, nah, I, I, I'm going around the, the diamond and, and thinking, I mean, what, the only guy that – Chaz or Hader, maybe? I, I was thinking Chaz or – yeah, actually, yeah, Hader would be definitely something. I think those are the ERA. top two names that you would bring up. Yeah, it would be Chaz, Hader, and then uh, it's possible it could be Javier if he, if he gets back to where he was. Yeah, 2022 Javier, yeah. I think, would be so undeserving to be on this list. Yep. Yeah, Javier could get back there with his good performance. It, it, it's hard for me to put a reliever as a top 100 player just because they don't pitch the volume of some of these starters. But, but if you are going to rank relievers, Hayter needs to be in that conversation. It is interesting with Chaz and Yiner, though. Like, Yiner being at 90 yeah. and the Chaz being admitted. Like, yeah, I think Chaz has a case to be in the top 100. I, I think that Chaz is still someone that's slept on a bit. Uh, I still agree. Still overlooked a bit. I think everybody thought that that was just like a, a once-in-a-career year for him. And there's a lot of people sleep on the, the fact that he could possibly be consistent. 
but maybe in a year's time, if he does has a similar season, people finally give him the respect he deserves. Because you, like you talk about, Jeremy, defensively, there's an above-average defender that should that should play into it as well. Yeah, he, he's especially in left. I think yep. he's a really good defensive left fielder, and I think he's a solid defensive center fielder. Seven one three seven eight zero ESPN. So Saquon Barkley was on a podcast with the Kelseys today, and he said his number one choice entering free agency was actually the Texans. So if you're the Texans and you're Nick Casario, would you rather have Saquon Barkley on a three-year, thirty-seven and three-quarter million dollar deal, or Joe Mixon on a three-year, twenty-seven million dollar deal? It's the Killer Bees on ESPN ninety-seven five and ESPN ninety-two five. Hey, before we go to the break, a word from a good friend, Doc Linville. Doc Linville, best in the business at the Neograft procedure. If you don't know what that is, but you are struggling with hair loss, you need to find out very quickly because the Neograft procedure is a game changer. It's not the sprays and the creams and the foams that just mask the problem. It's actually your own hair where you need it most because you can take your own hair. And genetically, what I found out from Doc Linville having a consultation with him is the fact that you're never going to lose the hair on the sides and the back of your head no matter how bald you go on top or in front. So, therefore, the bigger thing is he can take some of that hair from the sides and the back, put it where you need it, and suddenly you see results. You have more coverage area, a better overall appearance, and more confidence that goes with it. That consultation I'm talking about that I had with Doc Linville, you get it absolutely free because you listen to me and you listen to this station and you listen to us. All you got to do is go to 975hair.com and set up an appointment. Nothing out of pocket, no signing on the dotted line, no commitment, just you asking questions, getting answers, and seeing if the procedure is right for you too. I did it. I couldn't be happier with it. I see the results every day, and I am ecstatic. You could be next in line. All you got to do is go to 975hair.com. Tell them I sent you by. They are the best in the business. Go see Doc Linville today. You're listening to The Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Broadcasting live from the Mobile Veritex Community Bank Studios, located at the Decoy in Spring Branch. He's blank. I'm Branham. Get to the decoy. The boys will be there till 6. You can hang out way longer than that, though. Uh, Astros opening day today. 
I wish it started at 6.05. Uh, college hoops beginning at 6 o'clock as well. Get a $100 ounce Shiner Box Tower for $10, $3 Makers, $2 Mexican Candy. Uh, March Madness, $6 Casamigos. You can't find that anywhere. And then tomorrow, Houston Duke. It is your West Houston watch party for the Cougs. Full audio throughout the game and a DJ during the commercial breaks. Uh, pretty fun, pretty fun. It's going to be a party out there at the decoy tomorrow night. Party out there now as well. All right, Saquon Barkley was on with the, uh, the Kelseys earlier today. Today, and he talked about his number one destination in free agency, and he, he flat out said that the Texans were number one when the entire process got started, Blankers. So it begs the question, now that you know that Saquon wanted to be here, you know that Saquon wanted to be here, would you have rather given Saquon Barkley a three-year, $37.75 million deal, which is a little over than a $12.5 million AAV, or would you rather give Joe Mixon a three-year, $27 million deal, where the math is easier on that, a $9 million AAV? Easy, Joe. Um, I, I think the, the bigger thing to me is younger, less mileage on the tires, prime of his career. Yeah, it's a little bit more money, but we've seen that you, you know NFL teams are able to kind of get creative and, and shuffle money where they need to to make it work. I, I would have gone Saquon. I, I just think that there were concerns. Obviously, Cincinnati moved on from him. Uh, it, with Mixon because of the fact that they thought that he was past his prime. He was getting a little bit older. They could find better. You're getting a guy that could be one of the premier running backs in the league for the next couple of years that can do the kind of things Mixon can do and maybe better, stronger. I, I, I would have leaned Saquon if that was the case. I think from a Saquon perspective, too, as a sidebar, what are you doing? Philadelphia is the worst town in the world to tell that they that you were their they were your second choice when you signed there. You're going to get eaten alive on a comment like that. Unless you play well. If you play well, they're not going to care. I think before you even start playing for real, you're going to hear about it. Do you think they're going to boo him? Uh, they're going to get on him. I, I think that pisses Philadelphia. Philly fans are so volatile anyway. That's yeah. the kind of thing that they're going to jump on. Yeah, I wonder. Because uh, you're right, they are the worst fans in the world. I wonder just how much they're going to, you know, care about that one. Um, it is weird that he admitted to that, though. I will say that. But I guess, yeah. hey, we like transparency. Uh, we like the honesty. Uh, to me, this is – to me, it's quite easy. And you can make the case that uh, – you know, you, you mentioned that the Bengals gave up on Mixon. You can make the case that the Giants did that with Saquon, too, though. Like, the Giants weren't really on the in the mix for Saquon Barkley. You, they, well, but they, you got the owner, at Mara, afterwards saying, I never wanted to let him go. I wish we would have been able to keep him. Uh, that's why the they kind offer of thing. Him more money? I don't know. I mean, that's, that's on him. But it, yeah, that sounds like words more than actions. Well, I mean, it could be. I, I just think that if you were ready to move on, then you just say that. We were ready to move on, and, and you know, we, we're ready to turn the page. It seemed like there were a lot of guys around that team that would have loved to keep him. Maybe they, he priced them out. I don't know. But, yeah, I, I just think the Cincinnati saw something that was not what it used to be with Mixon, whereas I think that the biggest thing with, with the Giants and, and Saquon was injuries. I would have uh, I would have rather had Saquon on his contract than Mixon on his contract. And I know that Saquon, it's a pretty substantial amount more. You know, a little over 12 and a quarter versus 9 million. That, that's, a, that's over, what, 25% more? So that's pretty, pretty substantial when you're talking about having a salary cap and things like that. But if the Texans at the end of the day have like $5 million in cap space, and I know that you have to leave an, operate, an operating budget and stuff like that, but if you could have spent – $4 million more, a little less than $4 million more on Saquon. I'm going to turn around and look at this as a mistake because I think Saquon has far more left in the tank. I think yep. Saquon's a more complete back than Mixon. Um, you know, D'Amico Ryans was talking about Mixon the other day about how he's really good at in the passing game. Well, Saquon's pretty good at catching the football too, and I don't think there's questions as much about Saquon with his ability to pass protect as there is Mixon. You have every Bengals fan in the world telling you that, that Mixon was almost unplayable in passing situations because yes. he couldn't pass block. So I would have spent more on Saquon Barkley. Uh, that, that number is high on Saquon, but it's also high on Mixon. If I had to splurge for one of the two, I'd rather have splurged on Saquon. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, and I think that a lot of it I touched on as well, and you look at it and you say, hey, he's a more physical guy that still seems to be as quick as Mixon. Um, he, you, get, you mentioned the versatility with Saquon catching the football um, and, and for sure in the prime of his career with less miles on the tires. Yeah, you can, like I said, you can make up for the, the extra money you would have had to spend to have the productivity that probably would have been better uh, for the next three years. 
Of Progs on Twitter, Barkley's a mid running back, just a name, draft a nice backup. I, I do want to draft a nice backup, but you know, it Barkley's a mid running back, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that. And I would say he's a better running back than Mixon. So if yeah, I'd be curious mid, to, what is Mixon? I'd be curious to, to for people who have that opinion, what is it about Mixon's game currently that you would put, uh, if you're you know comparing side by side and you're putting check marks on either side, on what side would you put a check mark for Mixon in favor of over Barkley? I mean, uh, Barkley's younger. Barkley's been more elusive. He, he has uh, fewer carries that, that less spread off the tires. I don't see a reason, uh, and they're both obviously good in the uh, receiving part of the receiving game. Uh, obviously, you mentioned the, the troubles pass blocking for Mixon. Like, what ab amongst the game, comparing directly Mixon and Barkley, not even to mention the off-the-field stuff, What? Yeah. where where along the, uh, the the comparison would you actually give a check mark to Mixon? I can't find a That's place. It's a really good question because, to me, Jeremy, I'm thinking about it, and I'm going, like, you know me, I like to do the whiteboard and the side-by-side. -side. Sure. I can't. I can't realistically find a category where I go Joe Mixon better than Saquon Barkley. I I don't either. Um, salary. The other thing, salary. <laughs> okay. The other yeah. Thing, though, There's is like, one. Casario was was seeking Saquon Barkley. Like they went after Saquon Bar Barkley. They, there was reports out there of what the contract was for Saquon Barkley, and maybe Casario knew that the Bengals were ultimately like shopping Joe Mixon, like. I, I tend to believe that they had an idea that they were shopping Joe Mixon. I, I give them the benefit, of, the benefit of the doubt on that, but maybe they didn't. But we did see Casario go after Saquon Barkley. Yep. Like we saw him give him an offer. So even if they knew that Joe Mixon was available, they even told you that Saquon Barkley was plan A before he priced himself out. Yeah, I and think this is we, and we know now, Blankers, that they that Barkley priced out the Texans at yeah. three point five eight million dollars a year, which. Look, is that substantial? I would say that it is substantial, but I'm not saying that it's enough for me to go to my plan B and Joe Mixon over Saquon Barkley. No, I think you, this is more the scenario of Nick knew who he wanted. He was going to be aggressive in going to get him, but he also had a threshold and a ceiling and a point where he was not going to return to the negotiations. And at a certain point when they went over that threshold and it was looking like it was going to a number that he wasn't comfortable with, that's when he went to plan B. That's when, like you said, he probably either had the conversation or at least knew there was a chance that Cincinnati was going to cut Joe Mixon and there was an option there. And he went. He started you know, just weighing what his other options were and went in the other direction because we know that he's calculated. He's going to go to a certain point, and then he's probably going to cut it off, and I think that's what happened. Uh, 9506 says Noah Brown at $5 million. I don't really know what that means, but maybe it means that's the difference between Saquon Barkley and Joe Mixon. Uh, would you rather maybe. have Saquon Barkley or would you ha rather have Noah Brown and Joe Mixon? Uh, I, I would rather Barkley. have Saquon Barkley. Yeah, I'd rather have yeah, Barkley. Yeah, certainly too. Saquon. Is, 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 it, is this just uh, a, a Casario holding? And jo uh, Joel mentioned this kind of a, in what he was saying just now, but it feel, this feels like Nick Casario just holding a very, very hard line on what he views as the absolute ceiling for what he's willing to play, or, uh, willing to pay a player, because we saw this with Sheldon Rakins. They walked away over one million dollar per year, and now obviously three point five uh, per year, quite a bit more uh, when you're talking about Saquon versus Joe Mixon. But it does feel like in both cases, if this was not a guy holding to a hard line on a number that he's willing to pay a player, I think those are both numbers that you'd be willing to go, okay, I give in. I'd, will, I'd, I'd want to get the guy on my team. I will go ahead and go a little bit over what I was willing to pay you. I think it's. I think there's a lot of that. Uh, I think that Nick Casario draws his line in the sand. I yep. think he negotiates up to that line. And as soon as that line is passed, he's done with you completely. Yeah. Um, before even really thinking about what's the cost of Plan B, what's the cost, and how much we're willing to like, like the three and a half million dollars here, uh, you you might be right with the uh, the Rankins one, like Rankins losing out on it Rankins was, for it was one million, $1 million. Dollar, like one million dollars more. That that's that's worse than the Saquon Barkley. Because look, I understand having your maximum amount. I, I get that. But you also have to talk about what is the second option look like and how much savings are we actually getting? Because yeah, right it's now point. it's like you got Malik Collins for, uh, I'm sorry, Rankins for less than, you know, you don't you don't bring Rankins back and you miss out on that for a million dollars, but then you have to settle with settle. And then the same thing here. Okay, we're not willing to overspend by three and a half million dollars. Now this is over multiple years, so I think it's not as egregious as the uh, the Rankins one, but. 
I rather pay the Saquon three and a half million than the Mixon nine. I rather have Saquon Barkley than Mixon and Robert Woods. I rather or uh, Noah Brown. I rather cut Robert Woods and then have uh, you, Saquon you Barkley. Read my so mind. There's so many different options. That was my response to the texture too. Like, okay, I, I I hear you, and I'll raise you the fact that if you wanted Noah Brown as well, and you're saying that's the difference, then cut Robert Woods, draft another receiver, believe that Hutchinson and and um, uh, Mechie. Mechie are going to be better than they were a year ago and, and ride with that knowing that you got a better running back and the return on investment is going to be the added extra you get at, at running back and you still get Noah Brown. Yeah, uh, like everybody operates with a budget, right? We all, we've all we all had budgets in certain aspects of our life. Uh, you mentioned you, you always talk about the Rockets and if you want to get – you know, five hundred dollars here. Where can you save five hundred dollars? You know, we all yep. have to budget our household. Blah 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 blah. Casario is budgeting an, an NFL payroll. So, like, I get. Well, we only want to spend eleven and a half on Saquon. Not willing to go twelve and a half. Well, how about you spend the twelve and a half on your plan A? Because you've told us that that was plan A. Joe Mixon, you you got cho- you traded for Joe Mixon after you made an offer for Saquon Barkley. So Saquon Barkley was at the top of your list. He was plan A at running back for the Houston Texans. So okay, it's going to cost us three and a half million dollars more. Well, where can you save three and a half million to sign your better running back that you want that's at the top of your list? And I think there is multiple ways to do that with this team, whether it's Noah Brown, whether it's Robert Woods, whether it's Jimmy Ward. So I don't love the way – and I like the Texans offseason, so I don't want people to get that twisted. I, I like what they've done overall, but if we're nitpicking certain things, I don't love how he handled the monetary side of this in budgeting because I could have come up with a way to save $3.5 million to give me my plan A at running back instead of plan B. Yeah, that's how we started this. I, I mean, I, I mentioned it, NFL GMs are creative with their finances. There are ways. The reason why the Saints were so uh, like $80 million over the cap one year, and by the time free agency opened, they were under by $20 million. There's a multitude of ways you can make up for that money if you really fully believe that the player that you're going after is a difference maker for that those years. 713-780-ESPN, HRP listener line. 4280 says Barkley is a cancer, never Barkley, Robert, and Beaumont. Is there anything that I've missed on Barkley where he's – not a good teammate or that he's a problem have i missed something there i don't i, don't I haven't heard of anything no okay yeah i don't maybe he's making a barkley joke i don't know i've never heard that it was not a good joke either 713-780-3776 will a bits what will a bit are we getting today you never know but you know it's gonna be good it's the killer bees live from the decoy and spring branch on espn 97.5 and espn 92.5 Hey, a moment to talk about X-Golf and Katie. If you're a golfer, you love to golf all times of the day and night. Sometimes I said night. Some people say, well, how do you golf at night? You go to X-Golf because they got the best simulators I've ever seen for golf. That means the putting as well as the chipping. And you can play up to 50 courses worldwide or you can just use it like a driving range, so much so that you can even hit your own golf ball that you hit on the course. And then their, their, their uh, shot trackers, unbelievable in terms of being able to accurately pinpoint the distance, the direction, the ball flight, the spin of every shot you hit. You can calculate. You can dial in your irons. You can do all these things in the comfort of an indoor air-conditioned facility. It's phenomenal. And, oh, by the way, it's like the best sports bar you've ever been to, too, because it's a combination of great food and beverage and all the TVs you need and eight unbelievable golf simulators that you can play. It's fantastic, and it's all right there in Katy. Check out X Golf Katy on the Internet. You can book a tee time. You can reserve a simulator, and you can go in and have some fun. Be there once, you'll be there a ton. Because if you're a golfer, you are going to love the fact that morning, bad weather, at night, you can tune in and really tune up your golf, and you can always go there to watch games, eat food, and drink beverages. Check them out today, X Golf Katy.
Choose only one. What an enormous spin. Killer Bees decoy in Spring Branch. $100 out. Schoenerbach Towers for uh, just $10. That's fantastic. Uh, $3 Makers, $2 Mexican What an enormous candy. Tower of Beer. Yeah, th those are fantastic. March Madness, $6 Casamigos. That's fantastic. Uh, also, if you're looking for a spot to watch the Cougs tomorrow in West Houston, well, the Decoy Spring Branch, that spot. Full audio throughout the uh, broadcast DJ during the commercials. It's going to be a party uh, there tomorrow night. All right, choose only one. Question today, Willibich, choose only one. You only get one here, Blankers. 713-780-3776 mm -hmm. if the hide wants to play along. Choose only one, Jalen Green or Alpi Shingun. This is tough, man. Mm -hmm. This is tough. Sure is. You know, man, I mean, what you know versus what you think is going to continue. I, I, I this mean, This might be the question the Rockets are faced with at some point. I hope not. I hope because I believe that they have the right coaches to be able to figure it out offensively. This is a tough question for me, but I, I think, man, because of the fact that it's not a big man's league anymore, because of the fact that Alpi doesn't play defense, because of the fact that I think that you can get by without the numbers that Alpi put up and still be successful, I'm going to say if I have to pick one or the other, Jalen Green's talent is at, is at a notch above. And I would say Jalen Green if I have to choose one, and Alpi would bring you back something pretty darn good. Uh, it's not that tough for me uh, to be realistic. Uh, I'm going to go – I'm going Jalen Green. Uh, it, it's not tough for me. Uh, I think their offensive efficiency is pretty similar. Like, they do it in much different ways. Uh, Alpi does it in the low post. I think he's very creative offensively. He's a good passing big man. He's got some touch. I do want to see his three-point shooting get better. Shot it better last year than this year. He's made a little bit more volume this year, though. Uh, so, I think, like, their offensive – game in terms of production somewhat similar I think they're both good to really good offensive players where I think that Alpi loses in this conversation is on the defensive side and you probably couldn't say that prior to this year because Jalen wasn't a good defensive player either uh, but Jalen has turned the corner there Jalen's a willing defender now and, and Jalen has a skill set and attributes that are that just make him better defensively than Alpi does because he's strong, he's faster, he's quicker, um, he has more elevation, so he can contest shots better. Alpi's a liability defensively, and Jalen Green is not. If I'm if I'm running an offense against the Houston Rockets, I'm trying to figure out how I can attack Alpi Shingun. I'm forcing sure. him to defend the pick and roll. If he's switching up against a guard, then you have a huge mismatch because you have a quicker guard against a slow-footed big man. Uh, you can do that with Jalen Green. I think it's why the Rockets are playing so well right now is because you have five guys on the floor that can all switch. So I think Alpi's a little bit more one-sided. He, he can play on one side of the floor, whereas Jalen Green has shown that he's as good offensively as Alpi, and he can play a little bit of defense. So I, I'm choosing Jalen Green, and I'm not really even batting my eye. I'm not even thinking twice on this. The, the, the big thing, too, is from the standpoint of people are going to say, well, you know what, there's very few bigs that can do what Alpi can do, and they're going to go to MB and they're going to go to the Joker. But the fact is, is those two guys can play defense. The, Embiid and 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 is uh, for sure can play defense. The, the Joker he, obviously he doesn't look like a, a you know a mountain of muscle and but low post he's smart he's savvy he understands switches and, and he and he has more size I think than than Alpi. But uh, you know what it, it's just it's so rare to find the level of talent across the board that Jalen has that I don't think he even realizes how much is untapped still from what he can develop and, and, and polish as skills that he can put in his bag. that That's why, to me, he, he gets the vote. Good news is you have both. Uh, yeah. Brian, where do you stand on this? You can only choose one, Jalen Green, Alpi Shingun. Who are you going with? Yeah, I, we're going to make it unanimous. I just think for a lot of the reasons you guys mentioned, and this is going to sound sacrilege from where we came from just you know about a month ago when Shingun was clearly the choice, and we wouldn't even ask this question a month ago. Uh, but I think Jalen has not only the higher maximum upside, it can be the caliber. Because uh, one of the questions we had about Shingun is, despite how well he was playing, could he be the number one on a championship-level team? And I didn't see that upside for him. Or Jalen Green, if he hits what we've seen, if what we've seen in these last, what, eight, eight nine, ten games – uh, it, it is not only uh, uh, copied, but then upped again as he continues to grow and mature. That I see an upside for Jalen Green. That's absolutely the best player on the championship caliber team. I don't see that for Shingun. You mentioned the defensive problems as well, and I also think the I th look not that he's a Luis Scola type, but I think you can fill 
that sort of role that Shingun might vacate if you were to choose between one of them much easier than a top-level guard that can lead you towards a championship. You're just not losing really any offense, right? Like, Alpi's, Alpi's best side of the ball is on offense. When he's not playing, are you losing offense with this team? I don't think you really are. Like, I think that Jalen and Alpi can coexist, certainly. But because, but since Alpi's been hurt, this team hasn't slipped offensively. You can even say they've taken off offensively. They've played better offensively. Now, some of that's the schedule. I, I think it's more schedule than, like, they don't coexist. Uh, but there are some things that, you know, you clear up space. It helps Jalen Green. I think it's more noticeable on the defensive side than the offensive side. But they haven't slipped. They haven't slipped on the offensive end since Alpi's been hurt. Well, and they've and gotten better defensively. There's no question they've gotten better defensively. No doubt. But here, And here's the other thing, too, Jeremy. It goes to our conversation about the fact that you also have guys that haven't played in, in recently that could actually add to you making up for the offense and then some. If Cam Whitmore, if, if Tari Eason, those guys come in uh, and, and, you know, and they're capable of picking up a ton of offensive slack, the rebounds that Tari can get, the fact that, you know, Cam Whitmer is vers versatile. All you got to do is find a big that can re – and maybe Steven Adams is part of that equation. Steven Adams is going to be a better defender. He's, he's physical. He's strong. He's going to rebound. He doesn't need to score. And like you said, because there are other options for you to score and he's a better defender, it's easier to replace Alpi because he doesn't play defense. I, yeah. I also th I also think a little bit here with Shingun, and I, not that Shingun, you know, can't run or keep up, you know, just can't keep up at all in an up-tempo offense. But some of what we've seen re re recently with Jabari Smith Jr. and uh, and a man Thompson, I mean, the pace last night in the OKC game is unbelievable. So I like the idea of not having to adjust to because you you've built your roster and your offense in a way like as you guys have said in a very fast pace, fast tempo style of play. I don't want to bring back Shingoon and then to make him work have to slow the offense down a little bit. I would rather find someone else who could fit into that system than to slow the system down to fit Shingoon. I've seen some of the numbers on that that don't necessarily back that up where the tempo has been relatively the same uh, for whenever Shingoon was on the floor. So I don't know how much validity there is to that because my eye test tells me the same thing, uh, Brian, that, that it seems like they're playing a little bit quicker a little bit more speed, a little bit more pace, but the numbers actually say that the pace has been pretty similar uh, to when Alpi went out and to where you are now. Um, it, it, so there is it's that. Also, is Steven Adams, Blankers, to me, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, yeah, I was going to say on that point you made too. The other thing is it's, it's deceiving to the eye because it's how quickly you get the ball in transition or, or from yeah. one end to the other. But because it just looks like it takes longer from the high, the, the elbow or the low post to facilitate, it's the it's the the speed of the cutters and where the ball's going that the offense still moves very fast based on the cuts and where the ball moves to. Yeah, it, maybe they're not getting more possessions and stuff like that, but it just looks faster. I would agree with that. Uh -huh. Nine five zero six Alpi fifty days a week. It's a lot of days. Uh, Eight four five eight and Jalen I trust Alpi too slow in the middle. Uh, so there you go. A couple of uh, thoughts on which of the two that you're picking on the Stephen Adams front. Uh, to me, he's a good backup big man. Like I, I don't think that he's going to like necessarily be a guy, even if you were to trade Alpi, I don't think they're trading Alpi, but just for the sake of this conversation, I think Adams is more of your backup center. Cause, like, he is. I was having a conversation with a bud. Like, do you, you, I don't consider Steven Adams a rim protector, even though he is a, you know, a giant of a man. Do you think he's much of a rim protector? No, you know what he is, Jeremy? Because you're right. The, I was just using it as the comparison of at least you have sure. a guy. There's come, not much drop-off. Robert Williams is the ultimate – way you solve this problem, a Robert Williams type, an athletic, long, big, cleans the glass, blocks shots, doesn't need the ball offensively, athletic enough to get up and down the floor so he doesn't slow you down, and he can, you know, get the alley-oops and the putbacks. To your question, I believe that he is an, he's not a rim protector. He is a lane enforcer. He is a guy that will clog the lane and physically keep you out of the lane that way, but he's definitely never going to be known as a guy that's going to, you know, get above the rim, block shots, do those things. Six nine six seven. I agree. It's Jalen. Absolutely wild how the script has flipped in one calendar month. When is the – when did it flip for you? Because, like, Alpi would have been my answer up until about – Yeah. Four weeks ago? Yeah. Three weeks ago? I think ago? It's, 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 it's the last month for sure. It's the fact that we've seen this. We've seen it multiple times now to know that it's not going to go away and disappear – and he's not going to hit this big pitfall downward again. And the fact that what we've seen, too, is it's not just about scoring anymore. It's about getting, the, like last night, getting the open guy the ball when you need a big shot. It doesn't necessarily have to come from you. Not being 
offensive minded with blinders on where if it's in my hands it's to score and then the fact that he's playing defense he's getting back on defense and he's affecting plays on the other end that's what we needed to see and we saw it we saw it consistently now six eight five six all that astro talk be ham they better win this do you understand how baseball works six eight five six do you understand that baseball is a hundred and sixty two game season joe does question if you do yeah, he thinks it's 583. That's right. 713-780. <laughs> I think he got it up over 600. <laughs> yeah, he was. He, he had the over on that number. Uh, car wreck of the day. What are you nominating for our car wreck of the day? 713-780-3776. Killer Bees, ESPN 97.5, ESPN 92.5. Killer Bees of the decoy in Spring Branch. 100-ounce Shinerbach Towers, $10. $3 Makers, $2 Mexican Candy, $6 March Madness Casamigos. And tomorrow at your West Houston watch party, Cougs, Duke. Full audio of the game, DJ, during the breaks. All right, Blankers, what are you nominating for car wreck of the day? 713-780-3776 if the Hive want to nominate some people. But who are you nominating, Blankers? Easy one is Draymond Green. I mean, how many times are you going to put your team behind the eight ball and, and act up and in a case like this where they're obviously in a dogfight with the Rockets for the play-in, the last thing you can afford to do is abandon your teammates four minutes into a game by, by just as, doing something so asinine as to continue to berate a, a, an early foul in a game like that. Just absolute stupidity. He's a bad teammate. Uh, he's selfish. He's a bad teammate. I do not want him on my team. Like, how can you count on him? Like, they're in a playoff race. And I, look, I understand it's a playing game, but like they, they, they're a championship organization. Like that, Steph Curry's won a bunch of titles. That team aspires to win championships, and you're telling me that one of your best players is going to get ejected in three to four minutes and, and cost. Like, well, luckily they won the game for Golden State point of view. It's yep. a selfish teammate, though. It's a bad teammate. I don't like that. I don't want anything like that on my team. You know, the other thing, too, Jeremy, is the fact that everybody's saying, well, at the end of the year, because Steph deserves better, we can blow this thing up. How many teams in the league want Draymond Green on their squad? To Especially your point. Especially the contract. Yeah. It, it, the Lakers, of course, would probably consider it because they think LeBron and, and you know, he just needs wh however he can get the help he needs. But he, he, he's not coming cheap, and, and he's not going to change his ways no matter who else he's playing with, I don't think. 
Yeah, I'm, yeah, I wouldn't want him on my team. That contract's stupid, too. I'm going to try to brand him foot and mouth this and nominate Joe Espada for our car wreck of the day. Maybe it'll change some fortune. He's right. out there managing this game like it's a World Series game. It's game one of 162, Joe. I know it's your managerial debut, but pump the brakes a little bit. He's trying to be the smartest guy in the room. Pinch hitting for a guy who homered in the sixth, bringing Ryan Presley into the game in the seventh, gave up the go-ahead run. Say, hey, it's one of 162, Joe. Take it easy. Can Chill I take out a step a little further bit. and What's ask that? your opinion on that? Yeah. I don't know that I like bringing Hader in in the ninth. That, in a yeah. non-save situation. There you go. That, that's kind of, I forgot about that one because it's kind of what I meant. Like, it's not a, it's not a playoff right. game. It's not a World Series game. It's game one of 162. You don't need your closure to come into the ninth to protect a one-run game here. Like, this isn't, this isn't the game 163. This isn't the postseason. Let's pump the brakes here a little bit, Joe Espada. So I'm going to nominate Joe Espada for our car record of the day. They just win it. They just win it. Oh! Oh, come on! Mm. What happened? Sorry, Jeremy. Dubon got thrown out at the plate. Kyle Tucker uh, hit, a, hit a single to oh right, but Soto threw out Dubon trying to score from second. It's close. I don't know if they're going to – there's – man. The, the throw got there before before Dubon, but the throw was also not completely online, so it gave Dubon a chance, and he was I called out. It. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to nominate Gary Pettis now. Oh. <laughs> That's a bad send. Yeah, Soto's sin. already throwing the ball before Dubon's even rounded third. Yeah, Ooh, that's, that's a bad sin. That's a, he's got a cannon for an arm and right. You have a bases loaded one out situation if you don't send him. You With have Alex Bregman, Bregman coming, coming to the play. Yeah. That's, a, that's a bad sin. Gary Pettis, you're nominated now for our car wreck of the day. Oh. Do we nominate Fromber or, and or Montero? Yeah, you can nominate them both. Oh, I don't know if you got them, Jeremy. I mean, I'm sure they're challenging it, huh? Yeah, they are. They are. 30 seconds in front of me. All right, what are you nominating, I'm just Brian? saying. Uh, I, I will nominate uh, the Killer G's for both not knowing who Billy Gibbons is of ZZ Top and then letting the text line trick them into believing that Billy Gibbons was dead. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a banner day for uh, uh, he, up? Houston music knowledge from the Killer G's. And then just so that Joe doesn't get excluded from his daily nomination, okay. the fact that yesterday – Joe George on the air said that Josh Giddy sucks as a basketball player, and Josh Giddy had his best game of his career against the Rockets last night and went off. Ooh, did Dubon actually get tagged? That's what yeah, I just said. I don't, to I don't think it's conclusive. Yeah, that's the problem. I don't. I haven't seen an angle that's conclusive, but just gut reaction off of what I saw, it looks like the catcher might have missed him a little bit. I don't think it's they can it's super it, close. I don't I don't know if it's close. I think it's probably too close to get overturned. But man, yeah, well, that's Joe all George. that matters. Oh. Um, I'm nominating the Tampa Bay Rays. The Tampa Bay Rays oh, yeah. acquired Nico Badrum in a trade yesterday. In what world does Nico Badrum have any sort of value? Now, because I know the Tampa Bay organization so well, Nico Badrum is going to turn into like a a specialist in one way and, like, shine and excel in that one area. But uh, how are we acquiring Nico Badrum in 2024? How does that guy have value still left in Major League Baseball? I mean, once he learned the nickname, I, I think he earned his permanent spot in AAA baseball. He feels like a classic 4A player for yeah, sure. for sure. What else we got? I, I said do we consider Montero and uh, Fromber? I, I would like to nominate Yankees fans because when uh, when the Yankees went down for nothing, uh, I saw tons of national media and just people I follow on Twitter. There happened to be Yankees fans freaking out, calling this at one point even a disaster. It's you're down for nothing halfway through game one of 162, and they were calling it a quote disaster. Yeah, out at the plate. Get some perspective, uh, that's guys. Yankee fans. They flipped the script. I saw a lot of people upset that Joe Girardi got didn't have the proper credential to go into the yeah. Astros locker room, and people thought like the Astros were being vindictive and all this stuff against the Yankees whenever it was actually Girardi's fault. And then Joe Espada met with him anyways. <laughs> so it's like, what are you getting yeah, all up in arms and, and, and you're getting all mad? Everybody, everybody was celebrating the fact that he wasn't allowed in the clubhouse either. Come on, man. There's more we, other things we can worry about. Yeah, two, 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 three. He's nominating the 800 pounds of crawfish locked it, lost in a wreck on I-10 in Orange County. Rest oh, in peace. I, I didn't, didn't see that. that happen. I mean, 800 That's pounds of crawfish. That's expensive loss right 800 there. 800 pounds of crawfish? Because I mean, you like how much are you paying a pound right now to buy? Isn't it $14 crawfish? a like, pound right now? I have no idea. I think so. 
So like, let's say let's round it down to ten. That's like eight thousand. Like that's that's like cooked crawfish though. Raw crawfish, live crawfish, you can probably get for maybe five dollars a pound. So that's like four thousand dollars worth of crawfish that got lost in that wreck on I-10. I think this might have been a heist. I'm not sure that this was a wreck. This might have been a heist. This might have been Ocean's Eleven. I hope someone Orange salvaged it, like when the the semis crash and all the the like the product goes all over the highway. And people scramble to pick it up. Yeah, that's a lot of crawfish. Astros lost the opener. Yeah. Oh well. Bad send at third. I, I agree with you, Jeremy. I think that's less than two hours. That, that's I think that might be my official car wreck of the day nominee. The, the, the send the send at third to send Dubon when Dubon was just getting the third. Soto was already uh, gathering the ball for the throw. Has a cannon of an arm. Terrible sin there. It looked like Dubon was kind of chopping his steps into third, too. Like he had no – like he didn't think there was any chance he was going to be waived. I'm going to have to go back and watch that. But it looked like Dubon started to slow his steps at third like he was just going to cruise into third instead you know of actually you, turn third and score. <laughs> and you know what you're going to hate for me to say, but, you know, it's what? a hot button with me. It's also that freaking watered down infield that still looks like it's soaking wet and he couldn't slide quickly oh. across the dirt. I mean, it's the ninth inning, though. It's sure, I'm sure it's dried up soft. I don't think so. It looks swampy. <laughs> it looks swampy. Your your obsession to the water on the Minute Maid infield is one of the weirdest things I've ever heard. I hate it. <laughs> I know you, you do. Should it's apply, bizarre to me. You should apply for the job. See if you can uh, regulate the uh, wetness level of the infield dirt. It's like... You know when you try and slide on like uh, uh, like AstroTurf the wrong way, the rubbery stuff, if it's sticky. It, it just seems like he got caught up in the mud. What a terrible <laughs> sin. Gary Pettis bad. doing Gary Pettis things. All right, what's winning the car wreck of the day? Gary Pettis. Any objection, that's my blankers? vote. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, Gary Pettis, congratulations. One game in and you're the car wreck of the day with the worst send I've seen all year. Uh, thanks to the uh, the decoy in Spring Branch for having us out. Uh, get out there for the rest of the evening. College Hoops about to start. The West Houston watch party for the Cougs tomorrow. Full audio DJ. Thanks so much for the hospitality. That does it for us. Thanks to Brian McDonald, our on-site engineer. Uh, Austin Rodriguez doing all the hard work in the studio. For Blankers, I'm Branham. We'll talk to you tomorrow, Houston. Game on with Barry Lamanac, Jerome Solomon. Coming up next on ESPN 97.5 and ESPN 92.5.
Hey, welcome in Houston. This is Game On. No Jerome Solomon. It's me, Barry Laminac, taking you through to 7 o'clock. First of all, happy opening day. Is it, though? Is it? Is it really? Astros lose 5-4. to four. It's over. Damn it. The whole season sucks. Astros go down to the hated New York Yankees, five to four. And uh, yeah, bad news opening day. But you know what? That's okay. One of 162. They are on pace to score. I hate that. I'll never be on pace guy. I promise I'll never be that dude. By the way, if I sound out of breath... Uh, your boy had to climb. I say climb. It felt like a climb. Two flights of stairs. Two whole flights of stairs. Uh, yes, I am in studio. If I sound great, if I sound amazing, if I sound fantastical, it is because I am in studio today. Hanging out with uh, Austin Rodriguez behind the glass. Austin, what's up, man? Not too much. Hey, thanks for turning the lights on, by the way. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. No, it's all good. I walked in. It looked like uh, everything was shut down. Everybody's on the road. So, now, now, usually, they don't expect us to be in studio. So, I get it. It's totally it's totally okay. Not your fault. Uh, yeah. So, opening day of baseball. A fun day for a lot of folks, especially in this town. We are a baseball town. I don't care what people say. We'll see how long that lasts, though. As soon as the Texans start winning. Start making the playoffs more. Uh, I have a feeling that whole this is a baseball town thing is going to start to turn. Uh, and watch out. This might start to become a basketball town. What? Okay. That's probably not true either. But the uh, Rockets are looking good too. We're going to get into a little bit of that as well. We'll talk a little men's basketball. Hey, we might even talk a little women's basketball. Specifically... Caitlin Clark, uh, she got a big offer. We'll jump into that or we'll discuss that as well. But, uh, yeah, if you want to get in touch with the show, a couple ways to do that. 713-780-ESPN, 713-780-3776. That is your phone number. You can hit me up on X. You know what? I'm not even going to say it anymore. I'm not even going to reference the old name. I think it's kind of pointless to do that. I think everybody knows what that is when I reference that. And you hear everybody still doing that. Twitter, formerly known as X, or, or X, formerly known as Twitter. I'm not doing that anymore. We're all we're all grown adults here. You only have to do that for really old people. And I'm not really old yet. I'm 49. So uh, how old are you, Alex? Uh, 26. And I hate you. I'm sorry. I called you Alex. I meant Austin. My bad, Austin. Uh, you're 26? About to be 27 in about a month. So. Oh, well, that makes you old. So yeah. I, I hate you so much. 27? God, what year were you born? That's, God, you were born in 97? <laughs> yep, 97. Dude, I was ending my first marriage. Oh, Jesus. I hate you so much. I just need you to know that. You disgust me with your youngness. Uh, yeah, so if you want to get in touch with the show, hit me up on uh, X at Barry is funny. You can get uh, on the phone line, 713-780-3776. Also on Twitch in the chat, I got to check that. Twitch.tv forward slash ESPN 97.5. All ways that you can get in touch with me and uh, the show game on here on ESPN 97.5. Hey, let's jump into it. Uh, Astros fall five to four to the Yankees. It was looking good. I, uh, I was, I was in town. I was over at the Fox 26 studios shooting an episode of the nightcap. And that's why your boy is down here. I've got a show at the Houston improv over at seven 30. So as soon as this is over with, I'll be, uh, Hopping in the uh, car and heading over to the Houston Improv. Um, if you don't have anything to do tonight, come over, hang out with us. We've got a great show. It's called The Tutson Interruption. Myself, Trey Tutson, my boy Kanice, Slade Ham is on the show, my girl Lotto. Uh, I'm missing one, Jeff Joe. It's going to be a fantastic show. Come hang out with us. But uh, I was down shooting that TV show, and that's why I was here. I went to a cigar bar close by. 
smoking a cigar, watching the Astros. When I walked in, it was 4 nothing, and I was like, ha, yes, suck it, Yankees. That's what you get. And slowly but surely, the Astros found a way to give that lead up. They had a uh, four-run lead going into the fifth inning. Frommer Valdez goes a tidy 4.2 innings, gives up three earnings. And then the bullpen comes in, does a decent job. Montero and Presley both give up a earned run. Uh, Cortez goes five innings, gives up four earned runs, and the Yankees' bullpen holds it down. So, one game in the books. Offense looked good in the beginning and then pretty quiet after that. But you know what? Long way to go. Not even going to worry about it. It's not even worth breaking down. Uh, plenty of season left. It's really not even something that you need to, you know, oh, well, did you, what'd you think of the bullpen? Does it, oh man, is this, uh, is this, do, do they need to get, uh, no, it's, it's none of that. It's, it's too early to tell if they needed any type of help and should they go out and do any of that stuff? Let's, let's give them a month before we get into any of that. But Astros lose 5 4. Um, so there's that. Uh, plenty of baseball to be had around the majors. I mean, one of the worst games to open a season, probably Pirates Marlins. The, somebody sent me, um, it was, a, I don't know, a, a photo, I guess. Uh, and this, I guess it really wouldn't be a meme or is, was it Jim Nance? Is he the one that called it a meme? A, a meme? Wasn't it him? I think it was Jim Nance, right? I think it might have been. Yeah, he was like, Tony, have you seen these memes? It Tony. sounds oddly familiar. <laughs> Tony was just like, oh, Jim. Oh, boy. Um, but somebody had posted one about ticket prices for opening day. And I want to say they posted it on the uh, the Burial Deck Discord that I have for my show. Yeah, here it is. Pirates Marlins. Opening day ticket prices. Um, what would you guess? Sir Austin, what would you guess you could get an opening day ticket to Pirates at the Marlins? What do you think that would cost you? Now, this is all according to TickPick.com. What do you think a opening day ticket might cost you? I'm going to go $25. Okay, that would not be accurate. You would be way overpaying <laughs> for an opening day ticket to Pirates uh, Marlins. In fact... You would be paying too much to get a ticket to the Guardians at the Oakland A's game as well. That one I can see, though, with yeah. it being the A's. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The Pirates-Marlins game, you could get an opening day ticket for $13. Bro, do you know how sad that is? $13. Bro, I can't even get out of Taco Bell Yeah. for $13. Now, you can go watch a whole-ass baseball game. And I can't even get out of Taco Bell because I got to add the little, you know, I got to get the frozen drink and make it a large. And sure, I'll add a nacho or what they call chips and cheese. And that's white people nachos is all it is. It's, yeah, it's, that's insane to me. This The whole price is as, it, as I go up the scale here. Brewers and Mets was 32 bucks. Uh, some other um, ga games that might be of interest to you. Giants at Padres was 72 bucks. Yankees Astros, $83. Does that surprise you a little bit? That seems kind of high. Yeah, I mean, it's not like... I was going to say it sounds cheap, but that's if, like, one of these teams made the World Series last year. Yeah. But then it'd be like, wow, 83 bucks for that? Yeah, it seems a little high, but then at the same time, you got to remember you're right, and then it's the Astros and the Yankees are in town, so that's going to be inflated prices a little bit. Uh, Cardinals at the Dodgers, that was 95 bucks. Surprisingly cheap. Actually, to get an opening day ticket for the Dodgers, especially considering how much money they committed to their payroll, you could get a ticket for 95 bucks for Cardinals Dodgers. Uh, the most expensive opening day ticket on this list was Cubs Rangers. I'm going to give you one guess, Austin. How much do you think the most expensive ticket was? And it's, and it's in Arlington? It was Cubs Rangers, Cubs at Rangers. Okay. How much do you think it was? I'm going to go like 285. I feel like you cheated. You were <laughs> literally right on it, Austin. I feel like you Googled it. I know. I hate you so much. Yeah. I, I was going to go 185, and I was like, 
you know, they did just win their first. Two eighty five is the exact number. <laughs> you did. You get. I now I feel like you're just cheating. To if you would have said like two eighty, that would have still been sus. <laughs> but to be exactly on the number. I need somebody from the bullpen to come check your computer. I really feel like you Googled that. Don't don't minimize the window. <laughs> nope, Not saw nope, that. Nope. Hand off the mouse, sir. Yeah, 285. Um, top three, they were all above a hundo. Everything else, all of the other games on the list were under a hundo. Top three uh, in order. Cubs, Rangers, 285. Nationals at Reds was 164 bucks, And Braves, Phillies. Braves at the Phillies was $147. So... Not cheap to go to those games. Everything else, fairly reasonable. I mean, you could get a Blue Jays at the Rays ticket for 98 bucks. That still seems kind of pricey, especially for a Rays game. But there you go. Uh, there's some opening day ticket prices for you. Um, makes you feel better about only paying 83 bucks for an Astros opening day ticket uh, against the Yankees, considering you'd have to pay $285 to, to watch a game in a stadium that really all it is, it's just if they ordered Minute Maid Park on Timu, that's this, that's all the Rangers stadium is. It's just a knockoff. It's the Equate version of Minute Maid Park. It's just a off-brand version of it. So, yeah, there you go. Hey, uh, shout out to everybody in the chat that is playing along, including Total Dallas, who's a huge Rangers fan, and I hope he has a flat tire. Just not driving. I just hope he wakes up in the morning and uh, and he has a flat tire. Hey, what's up, Sensei? Good to see you. Uh, Flip is in the Twitch chat, so uh, good to see everybody over in the Twitch chat, as well as Joel Hernandez. And, uh, yeah, again, if you want to get in touch with the show, hit me up on Twitter. Uh, at Barry is funny. You can call the show 713-780-3776 and check us out on Twitch, twitch.tv forward slash ESPN 975. Uh, four games on the slate. I believe four games on the slate. Yep, four games on the slate in uh, men's college basketball tonight. And then tomorrow night, another four games. We'll run through those, including your University of Houston Cougars. Uh, I'll talk a little NBA. Draymond Green is at it again. We'll even talk a little women's college basketball. I know. I know what you're thinking, people. If you know me, you know I don't even like talking men's college basketball. And now we're going to talk women's college basketball? Yeah, stick around for that whole minute and a half. Plenty more game on right after this. Don't go anywhere. It's ESPN 97.5.
You're listening to Game On with Jerome Solomon and Barry Laminac. Presented by Big Star Cadillac, Blitzed, and Kroger. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's Jerome and Barry. Hey, welcome back to Game On, ESPN 97.5. You want to get in touch with the show, 713-780-ESPN, 713-780-3776. You can call that number. You can hit me up on X at Barry is Funny. You can also hop into the Twitch chat. That is uh, twitch.tv forward slash ESPN 97.5. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, we'll we'll get in there and chop it up a little bit as well. Uh, so there you go. That's how you can uh, reach out to the show. I will be doing my best to monitor all three. Um, so we mentioned all of the MLB opening day Games, lots of finals already, a couple of games going on, a couple of postponed games. Brewers, Mets got postponed. Braves, Phillies got postponed already. That usually happens first month or so in baseball. You'll see some weather-related postponements, uh, and then after that, it's smooth sailing. So, yeah, uh, only game going on actually right now, Pirates and Marlins. No one cares about that anyways. So, uh, slate of basketball going on tonight. You've got, let's see, uh, where's my schedule at? Where'd it go? Shoot. All right, here we go. Um, Clemson at Arizona, about to tip off on CBS. Actually, it looks like that's going on right now. San Diego State at UConn tips off at 639 on TBS and True TV. Alabama at North Carolina and Illinois at Iowa State. I'll tell you what. That Iowa State team is one of the few teams that I've watched play so far this year besides U of H. And they're very similar to uh, U of H. If you like U of H and you think U of H can go far, you got to like Iowa State's chances as well. You got to like their chances of coming out um, of that side of the bracket. And I know that that's a, uh, that's a tall order with UConn on that side. UConn the favorite to come out of the east side of the bracket. But I tell you what, uh, it 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 could happen. That is a really good Iowa State team. So uh, I could give I could see them giving UConn all they could handle. Uh, again, UConn is the favorite. Uh, and then tomorrow, tomorrow's slate of games, you've got really the only well, outside of the top 10 seed left, I guess. Are we calling that our Cinderella story? Is that... Is that really it? Because today playing, you've got two ones, two twos, a three, four, five, and six. That's who's playing today. <clears throat> Tomorrow, you've got uh, two ones, two twos, a three, four, five, and an 11. So I guess that's your Cinderella story left in the uh, men's tournament. But you've got number 11, NC State playing Marquette. Gonzaga is playing Purdue. That tips off at 639 tomorrow on TBS. Sorry, that Marquette game is uh, 609 on CBS. Duke is at U of H at 839 on CBS. And Creighton plays Tennessee on uh, TBS and True TV at 909. So that is your Sweet 16 matchups. The remaining eight games. Uh, and that'll get us through to the Elite Eight, which goes down Saturday and Sunday. So they don't mess around. They get through it. And, um, yeah, they get us through the week. And then there you go. They uh, they don't mess around. So, um, yeah, I I, uh, I got to say, I, I'm not a huge college basketball fan. But this time of year, I do like to... Um, I, I enjoy watching the college basketball. I, I like, I like, um, I like some of the storylines that they feed to you. Again, you don't get to control the narratives that get, that you, that you get told about the, the, I mean, you got the kid out of Oakland, uh, who everybody was, uh, just fawning over. I forget the dude's name, but it was a pretty cool story. And then you had, uh, my dude out of, uh, Indiana state, who uh, everybody was going uh, crazy about, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, um, who has some of the best nicknames in the history of nicknames. If you didn't know about this, this dude, um, his uh, I, I forget his name. His name is, oh, where did it go? Uh, Avila is his last name. I'm forgetting. I can't find his first name, but he plays at Indiana state and he's got some of the best nicknames. 
his uh his the, the main nickname that he's known by is Cream Abdul Jabbar, but they also call him um <laughs> Larry Blurred. Oh, it's just so oh yeah, Robbie Avila is is his nickname. They've called him Milk Chamberlain. Oh, it's just it's so fantastic. And he's just this he's kind of this goofy looking. They call him uh college Jokic. He's kind of doughy, kind of goofy, wears sports goggles, but he's balling. He was balling, and so many people wanted Indiana State to, to make the play-in tournament. That's the kind of stuff I could root for because, honestly, a lot of people get upset with me for not liking college basketball, but you got to think about just, I mean, you got to think about how many stars are in college basketball to begin with versus how many players and teams you have to watch. I mean, you're not really watching a ton of – next level talent when you're watching it sure it's 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 fine and there's some you know competition and whatnot but it's not like you're watching a ton of great talent but when you get guys like Robbie Avila who (laughs) you know come in with hilarious nicknames and (sighs) doughy looks and I mean they look like me if you can make a dude out there looking like me who's out there getting 35 and he's got a one-inch vertical and he's knocking down threes from the logo, I, I'll watch that. That makes me feel good. That makes me feel like I can go down to the YMCA and throw up some three-point hook shots and and land them. So, yeah, that's the kind of fun stuff. Uh, over in the women's bracket, I got to be honest with you. I have no idea what's going on. I know, uh, I know that uh, Iowa – almost lost to West Virginia, and I believe it was the athletic that said that that, that was real possible. I think they even called it. They, they, they said, uh, take Iowa and the points because that was going to be really close, and it was. Uh, Caitlin Clark, though, um, hung in on that one. And speaking of Caitlin Clark, said we talk a little women's basketball. Don't know if you heard about this. Ice Cube and the Big Three, which – I gotta be honest. I had no idea this was still around. Hey, me neither. I I, I heard about it and I was like, I, I was kind of surprised it was still around. Honestly, yeah. The headline came out. I believe it was yesterday, Austin. And it was uh, Ice Cube and the Big Three League. If you don't know, that's Ice Cube's three on three basketball league. It's predominantly men, although I think they do have a female head coach in the Big Three, or did at one point. But the Big Three. Offered Caitlin Clark a quote, according to the article, historic, and I guess it is, $5 million contract. $5 million contract was offered to Caitlin Clark to join the big three. And my first thought was, oh, wow, they're, they're still around. That's, that's really cool. But I, I mean, I, I dig it. That's a smart, that's a smart move. It's really a no lose situation for Cube. And the big three tournament one, it puts it back on everybody's radar. It's free publicity. If she turns it down, you still got a ton of run right now when the women's game is hotter than it's ever been, right? Everybody's watching men's basketball. NBA is is really in the, the home stretch, getting ready for the playoffs. So basketball right now is really the hot story. I mean, yeah, you have opening day of baseball, but when he did it the day before opening day, it was the perfect time to get the maximum amount of free PR. And uh, so it was a genius move from a publicity standpoint. But but he said, now, you know, depends on who you believe, but he said, we made the offer in private. We weren't ready to announce it. We were waiting to hear back from her. But since cat's out of the bag, yes, we did make the offer. And uh, we're just waiting on her. We were waiting until she got done with the tournament and, you know, waiting to see what she does next. So I guess the question becomes, do you think she's getting $5 million from the WNBA? Honestly, at some point, I do think it could be possible, but I don't think right out of the gate. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm looking up what's the largest salary in the WNBA right now, and I'm on Spot Track. And according to uh, Spot Track, let's see, we'll go total uh, contract value, all positions. Oh man, 
Natasha Howard at eight hundred and ninety eight thousand dollars. That that doesn't seem right, does it? I that doesn't seem right. I somebody correct me if I'm wrong. I know there's somebody listening that knows. Uh, somebody asked Jeeves because I'm googling it and it doesn't come up. What's the largest contract currently in the WNBA? That that can't be right. Uh. Okay, so it says uh, Sabrina Lonescu's two-year contract is the largest in the WNBA in 2024 with an average annual salary of 205000 So, you know, I don't know what the what the specific terms, but she's averaging two hundred and five k. Uh, here you go, highest, 20 highest paid players in 2024. And this goes to number one is Jackie Young. Whose two years contract was worth five hundred and four thousand. I mean, we're talking a half a million dollars for two years. <sighs> They're saying Clark is estimated to be making nine hundred and ten thousand thanks to her NIL deals in college. So she's already almost making a million dollars in college. Then she's going to be coming over to the WNBA, where her endorsement deals are by far going to be more than what she's going to be making from the league. But those endorsement deals, she's going to make that money, whether she's playing in the WNBA, whether she's playing in the big three, whether she's playing overseas in a women's league, like she's going to make that money no matter where she goes. Why wouldn't you go to the big three, take the five mil? I mean, I don't know. That that would be a tough thing to turn down. Now, I don't know what the what the what the years were. I was going to ask, did they mention how long the term was going to be? Yeah, it doesn't say. Uh Yeah, and I'm looking and I I don't see for how long. Um but I mean, what Look, how long would it take her <laughs> in the WNBA to make $5 million? I, she would probably be the first female. She would probably be the first player in the WNBA to make an, a million a year. I think that's safe to say, right? Yeah, I think so. For sure. So she's going to get, she would have to at least, they would have to at least sign her to a five-year deal. So she would have to at least be, you know, signed to a five-year deal to get that. So... I don't know, man. I mean, my guess is that Ice Cube would be willing to beat that and probably has the funds and the backing to do so, knowing that sponsorship-wise, he's going to have way more eyes on the league to begin with, which is going to just generate more revenue for the league as well. So, shrewd move by uh, by Cube. Real shrewd move. So, well, we'll see what happens, but... Honestly, I don't know that the WNBA right now is competing with a $5 million offer from the big three. Really interesting. Um, let's see. Uh, pretty foul said, if it's any equal amount of years, it would be stupid to turn it down. <clears throat> um, I'm not sure what you mean. If it's any equal amount of years, it would be stupid to turn it down. Oh, you mean by not by... by not going to the WNBA. In other words, if it's equal money, where are you going, Austin? If if the WNBA is five years, $5 million, and the big three is five years, $5 million, you're going to the WNBA, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think that's – there's there's definitely more – I don't know. I, I think it's, it's a more traditional route. Yeah, yeah. It's more like – what you're used to instead of like three on three, it's actually five on five, full court and all that. Yeah, and it's it's really more of of a uh, uh, level playing field too, right? You're not you're not playing against a bunch of dudes who you know. I, it, don't don't get me wrong, but it's it's probably not going to work out in her favor playing in the three on three all the time. Yeah, yeah, I can... Trying to be as judicious as possible about this. By the way, who's the first a-hole to swat her stuff into the fifth row? Who <laughs> who do you think that is? It might be Draymond Green if he doesn't get his act together. Yeah. He might be the first <laughs> dude. He got suspended again, and Steph is just like, Gee, bro, what are we doing? Like, what, what are you doing? You're out here making commercials about getting suspended. You'd think that would have been good enough. You're poking fun at it. But, yeah, it might be Draymond, but 
is dude, I always hated that, by the way. I always not that I don't think women shouldn't be allowed to run with dudes, but it was always awkward when you were playing street ball. When you go down to the to the court to just play ball in the neighborhood or whatever, there was always a chick that would run. And it was like, man, I, this is kind of weird. You know what I mean? Like you yeah. didn't want to, like you didn't want to, you didn't want to, like I don't know, you didn't want to foul too hard, or you didn't want to like play too rough, or but then she'd post you up, and then you're like, you don't want to really body her up, but then you're like, well, I don't want you to score on me either. Yeah, like I mean, there's still a game to play. <laughs> yeah, but you know, like when a, it's weird, it sounds kind of weird, but when a dude's like. Got his back to the basket and post you up. You kind of, I mean, let's just, I'm just going to say, kind of hip thrust. You know what I mean? You're just, oh, yeah. it's a weird thing, but that's what you're doing. You're hip thrusting and <laughs> you're, you're, you're grinding on them. Okay. I don't know. Maybe I'm playing it wrong, <laughs> but you're not doing that with, with a chick. You know what I mean? And then you block her stuff and everybody's like, yo, you're a jerk. I don't know. And then they call fouls and everybody's like, yo, why are you fouling her, bro? That's, it's, uh, it's bad. I don't know. I think, uh, I think, uh, I think the WNBA is going to have to is going to have to figure out how to get her paid because if she's getting that kind of offer, that's going to be tough. Oh yeah, definitely. Although I do think there is something to be said for playing against your peers because, man, if you think about it, even if she does go for the five million dollars, let's say she can only make, I don't know, two million in the WNBA. Think about how bad she might end up looking. Playing three on three and oh, yeah. just getting her stuff swatted and yeah, I don't know. That could do more damage than good. And then all the sponsors pull out and now what? Right. All right, we still got a uh, couple more segments to go in the show before we get on up out of here. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you want to get in touch with the show, give us a call seven one three seven eight zero three seven seven six. That's the number. Hit me up on X at Barry is funny or hop in the Twitch chat. And let loose twitch.tv forward slash ESPN 975. We're back right after this. Broadcasting live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, it's Game On with Jerome Solomon and Barry Laminac. Presented by Big Star Cadillac, Blitzed, and Kroger. Hey, welcome back. Game On ESPN 97.5. No Jerome. He was out at the uh, 
Astros game covering opening day and uh, unable to get back here at time, unable to get to a phone, I guess. He was obviously having to get to the locker room and get interviews and all of that stuff. So uh, just me riding solo. I'm riding solo. I'm riding solo. You probably don't even know what that song is, do you, Austin? Surprisingly enough, I do. Oh, wow. Okay. That's good. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, uh, get in touch with the show, 713 780 uh, ESPN, 713-780-3776. 3776. Hit me up on X at Barry is Funny, Twitch chat, twitch.tv forward slash ESPN 975. Um, one more thing from the women's tournament, women's basketball before we move on. I swear to God, I've been doing radio in this town since 2013, off and on in some capacity. And this might be the most women's basketball I've ever talked uh, in going on 11 years this is crazy it's mark it down somebody this is a new new world record for me at least but i think i'd be remiss if i got through a game on because you know i try to cover we try since we only have one hour a week now um to talk about stuff on the show we we, we miss stuff during the week and so we kind of have to go back and uh grab stuff but this this Kim Mulkey thing that uh, she had a press conference this past Saturday where she went on a tirade about the Washington Post getting ready to print a hit piece. Uh, so she kind of had this preemptive strike where after a game, she sat down at a press conference and she went on the offensive and talked about how the Washington Post has been hitting up disgruntled players and asking for negative comments, um, ignoring all of the good stuff she's done for the last, I don't know, what, 40 years or whatever. <sighs> Not 40 years, 27 years. I don't know what it was. Um, but it was very, I mean, it was, it was, it was very cringe to say the least. If you haven't seen it, go find it, get the audio. I don't. We don't have it, but it was pretty awful, pretty telling. Uh, in fact, I kind of went and broke it down. If you want to go uh, find my um, find it on social media at Barry on Deck uh, on most of the social media except YouTube. Find Barry on Sports on YouTube, and I kind of break it down and, and show you where where you get hints that she's guilty, like where she says, "Well, they ignore all the good things I did," which is a dead giveaway that they're going to print something bad that she did and she's kind of admitting it. I mean, she's basically saying, okay, they're going to tell you something awful I did, but they're ignoring all the good stuff. And then and then the, the whole they're asking players for negative things. Well, yeah, that's what reporters and the media have been doing for decades. There's That's nothing new. If, if you do something awful, then they're going to go to every disgruntled player or every person that has known you and say, hey, can you comment on this coach that has done these bad things? That's natural. I mean, that's that, they're not going to go, hey, could you tell me all the great things about this person that did these awful things? That's not the story they're writing. They're writing about the awful stuff you did, Kim. Uh, then she goes on to say how she's hired a defamation lawyer, which all that means is she's going on the defensive early. And she's trying to threaten them to not print this. And uh, hopefully, they if she threatens them with this, that they won't, which I guarantee you, they're going to print it. Uh, they're just going to have to go back and do their due diligence and make sure that they uh, cross all their T's and dot their I's before they run it. But it's going to come out. And I can't wait. And then she, at one point during the press conference, this is the funniest part. She's like, all they're doing is feeding the click machine with these BS stories and blah, blah, blah. And my whole thing was like, you're feeding the click machine because I can't wait to see this now. If she didn't say anything, I wouldn't even have known it was coming out. Exactly, Austin. I was like, I wouldn't have cared about you, about this story. I, I would have literally been a flick of the finger as I scroll past it because, Kim, I don't care about you. I don't care about all the awful things you've done. I really don't care about your sport. I would have not. I would have just been. It could have been like Kim Mulkey has, I don't know, killed 800 players. Like, blah, whatever. Let's just keep rolling. I don't scroll, scroll. Show me a funny cat video, TikTok, whatever. 
but you've made me now. I've got to see this. I need to know what is there like a Kim Island? Like I need to know that what awful things has she done? Is this like Kim Diddy? Like I need to know how bad is this? Was she in cahoots with P Diddy? Is this what it is? Like I need to know now. So Kim, congratulations. You, my friend, are the one that really fed the click machine, dummy. You should have just not said a word and behind the scenes hired your little defamation lawyers, sent them a letter to the WOPO. Hey, cease and desist if you if you post or, or, or if you publish anything. And I mean one thing out of line or that's not true, I'm suing you. And then just wait. But no, you had to go on the defensive and you kind of look like a crazy person doing it. Uh, if you haven't seen it, though, if you haven't heard it, go find it. It's um, it's good for a little weirdness, I guess. So um, there's already been stories about the good stuff. Yeah, Total Dallas on the uh, Twitch chat said there has already been stories about the good stuff. Well, it's weird because I saw a couple of people in different articles and comments and whatnot. They were like, well, I met her one time and she was really nice. Okay, well, that's fantastic. But a, a, a few people that I know that know her and that have worked with her are like, oh, she's awful. Like, she is a terrible person. I was like, really? They're like, yeah. Now, that's just me getting, you know, I'm not, don't, don't come after me, Kim. Don't come after me. My sources tell me you're a terrible person, but if you need me to dis- divulge my sources, his name is Justin. I'll give you his Twitter. <laughs> but that's just what my sources say. Um, so, yeah, it's, yeah. I, I just think it's really interesting. I think what she tried to accomplish, it backfired completely and was the exact opposite of what she was hoping uh, to pull off. So, well done, Kim. That didn't go as planned. Uh, Let's talk a little men's pro basketball. Because I tell you what, if you are not paying attention, and I kind of feel like unless you're a diehard Hoops fan in this city, most people aren't paying attention to the Rockets. Would you agree, Austin? Yeah, I think it feels that way. Yeah, I mean, I don't, there's not the scuttlebutt around town. Like, it's, I feel like it maybe is building a little bit now because yeah. more and more people are like, oh, 10 game, 10 game win streak, hottest team in the league, which they needed Boston to lose. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and they, which they did in magnificent fashion. Uh, but Boston was the hottest team. I think they had a nine game win streak when the Rockets had an eight. Uh, but since then, look, the Rockets have a 10 game win streak and, uh, I was like, okay, this this game against OKC on the road is going to be really telling about how good this Rockets team really is. Now, no Shea Gilgus Alexander, that makes a huge difference. It really does. Don't get me wrong, but they still you got to go on the road and you got to win those, and that's still a really good uh, OKC t- OKC team. They're a half game out of first in the West, and yes, Shea, Gil- Shea Gilgus Alexander is a huge part of what that Oklahoma City Thunder team is. But he is not the entire team. So, you know, you take him off the team, does that make a material difference? Absolutely. But they're still a good and deep uh, basketball team. So it's still a good win for the Rockets, 10 in a row, and they are stalking, they are hunting the Golden State Warriors for that 10th spot in the in the play-in uh, bracket. A lot of people, though, Kind of misspeaking here in town. A lot of sports folks saying, oh, well, they're only a game out of the playoffs. Ah, ah, ah. Let's be real clear. Making that 10th spot doesn't put you in the playoffs. All right. Playoffs are one through eight. That's what the play in games are for. You have to play those play in games and the winners move on to the playoffs. So the playing games are different than the playoffs. Let's be let's be real clear about that. But hey, you got to make those playing games before you can make the playoffs. And and for this team to go from where they were to where they are, uh, just fantastic. It's very Texans ish. It's not quite as big of a leap, uh, especially in one year. But it feels very similar. Ime uh, Udoka has done a fantastic job. This team is tougher. They're uh, more resilient. They're obviously way better on defense. The leadership is there. And uh, I'll tell you what, when Alperin Shingun went out, 
it was, in my mind, I was like, well, that's it. They're done. I mean, Jalen Green was not looking good. And it was like, all right. I mean, I like Fred Van Vliet and Dylan Brooks is great. And, you know, Jalen Green every once in a while can go for 20. But Alperin Shingun was this the soul of this team, it felt like. In fact, I read a stat that when he went out, he was one of only five players in the league to have 1,000 points, 500 rebounds, and 300 assists. Austin, if you can guess who the other four are, um, I will buy you a new car. It'll be a Hot Wheels car, but I will buy you a new car. Well, you can put the car away because I don't think I'll be able to actually. <laughs> the, uh, the other four. So this is good company, right? It was Jokic. Um, it was, oh, now I'm going to blank on the other four. It was, um, it was Giannis, Jokic, uh, oh, dude in Portland, uh, Demata Sabonis, and why am I blanking on the fifth? Luca Don, Don, uh, Doncic. So, Doncic. Why am I saying Doncic? That's weird. Luca Doncic. So, that's the, that's the company that Alperin Shingun was in. Those five players, the only five players in the NBA at the time he went out to have 1,000 points, 500 rebounds, 300 assists. Luca, uh, Giannis, uh, Demata Sabonis, and uh, Jokic, and your boy Alperin Shingun. So that's why I was like, oh, that's going to be tough for the Rockets. But all of a sudden, Jalen Green found out he was a superstar and started playing like one. And the rest of this team has committed on defense. I like the fire. Two nights in a row, they got in, into fights, and I know that's not what this sport is, but I like the feistiness. I li- I don't mind it at all. That is definitely a different team than we watched last year. So uh, if you haven't been uh, paying attention to your Houston Rockets, man, you need to go check them out. Uh, they are finally above 537 and 35, and they are making a run at a play-in slot. So go check them out. All right, we got one more segment to go right here on Game On, and then we will uh, turn it over to... Hall of Fame? Yeah, yeah, Hall of Fame. Awesome. We'll turn over to the Hall of Fame right after this, ESPN 97.5.
Broadcasting live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, it's Game On with Jerome Solomon and Barry Laminac. Presented by Big Star Cadillac, Blitzed, and Kroger. Hey, welcome back. Game On ESPN 97.5. If you want to get in, you better do so. Final segment of the show. And then we turn it over to the Hall of Fame Booker and Brad. Uh, 713-780-ESPN, 713-780-3776. That is the phone number. You can hop in the chat over on Twitch at twitch.tv forward slash ESPN975. You can also hit me up on Twitter. Sorry, old habits die hard. You can hit me up on X <laughs> at Barry is funny. Austin, what's your uh what's your Twitter handles? Do you do you Twitters? Do you or X? Do you Instagrams, TikToks? What do you do? I'm on Twitter every now and then. Yeah, what's your big, uh, what's your big social media uh, platform of choice? You're a youngster. It's probably TikTok, isn't it? No, no, I don't get on TikTok. Oh, thank God. <laughs> what is it? Instagram? No, I, I think it probably would be Twitter. Is it Twitter? Yeah. Okay. It's not Facebook. No. <laughs> that's that's for old people, isn't I it? I can't remember the last time I posted on there, honestly. Okay. You know what? I just... <laughs> Did you just call me old? I didn't mean to. <laughs> I mean, like, I really feel attacked because I just, I mean, I'm all always on Facebook. That's that's where us boomers hang out, bro. Like, that's, you really, you're not on Facebook at all? I have one to, like, remind me of, like, birthdays and everything because I feel like that's kind of what people my age use it for still. <laughs> Is birthday reminders? Oh, yeah, because, like. <laughs> well, God forbid you use your calendar and just put them on there. See, I haven't really used my calendar a whole, a whole lot on my phone. It's just easier whenever it's like on an app and it just pops up like the day of. You're a terrible friend, Austin. Terrible friend. That is, that is, so you're, so, so X slash, so X is your big platform of choice. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, give your, uh, give your X handle out. At Online Austin. At Online Austin. What a stupid ass name. Hey, I couldn't think of anything else. <laughs> At Online Austin. Austin, I'm going to follow you right now. All right. Oh, Sam Houston State alum. Yep. Go Bearcats. Wow. That's the official. That's how you do it, right? Wow. We can go with that. No. Uh, hashtag Browns? Before Deshaun. I just want to put that out there. Uh, you, are you you were born in Cleveland? No, no, no. Okay, so are you from Houston? Yeah, yeah. Okay, can you explain hashtag Browns, hashtag Cleveland Guardians, hashtag let them know? How did you become a Cleveland sports fan? Oddly enough, the uh, Browns were about to beat the Jets uh, in like an overtime game back whenever I was in like the eighth grade. And I just found myself like drawn to that more than the Texans game. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of made my decision at the bar with my dad that day. Like, I'm going to... I'm going to, you know, take the exit here and go watch the Browns now. And it's been misery most of the time ever since. Yeah. You know, you can always just be like, my bad. S screwed up. I shouldn't. I mean, you're born and raised in Houston, Texas, right? Yeah. yeah. You're the worst kind of person, Austin. Like, that's just, you're the worst.